Chapter 10 The Beacon Stone James waited until the goblins finished disassembling the handmade camera equipment, loaded the pieces onto a rough cart and wheeled it away, talking the entire time in a strange goblin language. When they were gone and the rotunda was empty, James jumped up. He peered into the silver-framed mirror, wondering why anyone would hang a mirror behind a statue. The mirror showed merely the shadowy backsides of the statues and James's own face, which was rather wild-eyed. His glasses were askew. He whipped them off and stuffed them into his pyjama pocket. For a moment he was filled with a horrible panic. The mirror portal had closed. How would he ever get back? But then, as he placed his hands on the surface of the mirror glass, the reflection changed. Merlin's office leapt into view, as if summoned by James's touch. Candles had been lit, and Merlin stood at his desk, his back to the mirror. He was turning the pages in the focusing book. He seemed to sense James's gaze, for he suddenly turned his head, peering back at the mirror, his eyes sharp. James leapt aside, throwing himself against the stone wall next to the mirror. The moment his fingers left its surface, however, the reflection changed back to normal. The headmaster's office winked away, replaced by the reflection of the enormous statue and the rotunda. James breathed a huge sigh of relief. All he needed to do was to wait until Merlin left his office again. Then James could simply touch the mirror on this side and wish to go back to his own time. Hopefully he'd be sent back through the Amsera Serth again. Once he got back, he'd still have to escape the headmaster's office undetected, but he'd worked that out when the time came. Quietly, James hunkered down behind the statue plinth and leaned against the wall. Now that he had calmed down a bit, James began to notice the noises and smells of this ancient version of Hogwarts. The rotunda itself was empty, but the rest of the castle sounded like a hive of activity. Voices echoed, overlapping and busy. There was the sound of footsteps and even the clatter of hooves on stone. Clanks and hisses indicated a nearby kitchen. The smells were a mingled potpourri of stew and ploughed earth, sawdust and animal dung. James found that he was curious. If he had to wait anyway, was there any reason he shouldn't explore the original Hogwarts a little? Rose would probably punch him if he didn't take advantage of the opportunity. James climbed up and peered between the enormous feet of the statue of Helga Hufflepuff. The rotunda remained completely still and empty. Cautiously, James crept out from behind the statue and crossed the room. It was just like the old rotunda in the Hogwarts he knew, except that it wasn't old. Every block in the wall was straight and sharp-edged, perfectly fitted in its place. At the archway, James turned back and looked at the statue. He had often wondered what it had looked like before it was broken. The stone figures of the founders were each twenty feet tall, all smiling except for the statue of Salazar Slytherin, which seemed to smirk slightly, the eyes narrowed. On the wall behind them, above the silver-framed mirror, was a gigantic Hogwarts crest fashioned from wood and painted brightly. The overall look was quite imposing. Boy! someone cried nearby. James jumped, wheeling so fast that he nearly fell on the floor. A man in a long fur cloak was standing in the doorway of the rotunda entrance. His bushy eyebrows were furrowed over bright, deep-set eyes. He held the reins of a regal white horse. Stable a pack horse, and send word to your lord that his guests are arrived. We can find our own quarters if none can be bothered to greet us. James was completely flummoxed. Not knowing what else to do, he ran over to the man and tentatively reached for the reins. The man looked him up and down suspiciously, and James remembered that he was dressed in blue and white striped pyjamas. Not the steed boy, the man growled. No one handles this beast but myself. Your charge is yonder pack horse. He pointed out over the portico to a huge pack horse laden with canvas burdens. Hitched to it was a cart with thick wooden wheels. The man leaned towards James threateningly. Are you a stable boy or a jester? What manner of reception is this? Uh, sorry, sir. No problem, James stammered. I can handle your horse, uh, sire, master, uh, your highness. 
The man's face suddenly spread into a toothy grin, as if he thought James was mocking him and was pleased to plan his comeuppance. Amusing, boy. Your lord will surely enjoy the joke as much as I do. See to it that our baggage is brought to our quarters, and I'll personally stop the porter who proves careless. Spread the word. With that, the man flung the reins of his steed over the nearby hitching post and strode into the dimness of the castle, his furs swaying. He left a strange, spicy scent behind him. James turned back to the enormous pack-horse and the wagon. He considered simply running away now that no one was watching, but then thought better of it. Surely he could at least lead the horse to the stables. All he'd have to do was follow his nose. Besides, the task would allow him a view of the original castle without looking too conspicuous. First, though, he needed something else to wear. He looked around quickly. Instead of the weedy hilltop of James's time, the rotunda entrance overlooked a carefully cropped courtyard surrounded by a low fieldstone wall. Running across the centre of the courtyard was a babbling stream, fed through stone gates on either side. There, sitting on a large boulder near the stream, were three baskets of clothing. James ran over, hoping whoever was doing the washing would stay away a bit longer. The contents of the baskets were very rough robes, much larger than James could comfortably wear. He struggled into one anyway, trying to roll up the enormous sleeves. The bottom of the robe pooled around his feet comically. The robe was better than his stripy pyjamas, but not by much. Perhaps he'd find something better later. He turned and ran back to the pack horse, holding up the robe to avoid stumbling over it. He took the reins of the horse, which was easily twice his height. The horse continued to crop the grass of the courtyard, chewing methodically, but it followed amiably as James tugged the reins. The wheels of the wagon creaked as the horse pulled it. James didn't know where he was going, but he assumed if he walked around the castle, he'd eventually come to the stables. He took the opportunity to look around. Hogwarts Castle was much smaller than he knew it in his time. It huddled around the rotunda entrance, which was festooned with a great iron portcullis currently raised. The turrets gleamed in the sunset, their conical roofs looking sharp enough to prick James's finger. Much higher than the turrets was the Sylvan Tower, which James knew well. It looked exactly the way he remembered it, although in this time it dominated the silhouette of the entire castle. As James circled the castle, leading the horse through a rough stone gate, he noticed that the land around the castle was dotted with farms and cottages. James was a little surprised. In his time, Hogwarts Castle stood alone in a large, forested wilderness, secluded and hidden. Here, however, the castle overlooked a bustling community. People moved busily all around, obviously consumed with the business of peasant life. As James led the horse and cart, trying to look like he knew where he was going, he passed people carrying baskets and pots, herding sheep and cows, or pushing wooden handcarts laden with vegetables. Several people shot James careful looks, and at least one woman laughed, but at least no one was accosting him or demanding to know what he was doing. Finally, James caught the scent of fresh animal dung on the shifting breeze. He looked and saw a huge stone barn. He grinned, recognising it. It was the same barn that Hagrid, in James's time, was currently holding care of magical creatures in. The roof was different, and there was something like a blacksmith's shed attached to the side, but it was otherwise unchanged. As James approached, he heard the stamp and wicker of horses, and the clang and hiss of the smith. "'What's all this, then?' a burly man with bare arms called, stepping out of the main barn door and eyeing James. "'Uh, this pack-horse needs to be stabled,' James replied, holding up the reins. "'The owner sent me here. I'm not really a stable-boy.' "'That I can tell.' the man said gruffly, scowling. Seeing as you brought me yonder horse without even releasing its cart, perhaps you expect me to stable it as well. No, James replied. It's supposed to be unloaded and taken to the owner's quarters. He said he'd, uh, strop anyone who wasn't careful with his stuff. Don't tell me how to do porter work, boy, the man said, rolling his eyes wearily. I'd strop you myself if I had the time. Thomas, send for the page. We need this cart returned to the valet before Lord Martin gets frisky. The man looked down at James again, sighing. You're either a thief or you're the youngest cleric I've ever seen. Your mistress will lash you good when she sees what you've done to that robe. What's your name? James's heart jumped, but he couldn't think of a lie fast enough. Uh, James, sir. James Potter. 
The potter boy, eh? Well, then, you'd best run along back to the market and tell your da that the pestle for which we traded him has got a crack on the rim. I'll send the wife down with it at the morrow. The man seemed to dismiss James. He turned and walked back into the shadow of the barn, calling again for Thomas. James sighed in relief. Obviously, the man thought James was the son of the village potmaker. He turned and looked back the way he'd come. The landscape between the castle and the barn was completely different in this time. James could only see the flat top of the sylvan tower poking over a stand of birches. He began to make his way back, ducking through the carts and farm animals. A sort of marketplace was erected around the back of the castle. Wooden stalls, benches and carts were arranged haphazardly, each decked with all manner of goods. People thronged near the stalls, shouting and waving, bartering and arguing. Livestock mingled with the peasants, adding their own voice and smell to the scene. James darted through the fracas, trying to stay out of people's way and avoid stepping in animal dung. Bits of conversation drifted over him as he moved, and James began to sense that these were mostly muggles, although they seemed aware of the magical nature of the castle and its inhabitants. "'This here is an authentic enchanted fork, it is,' a man was saying to a sceptical-looking peasant woman. "'Makes any meal taste like it is fit for a king. My Lars found it in the grass after some of the magical folk had a picnic. Only two chickens and it can be yours.' The woman scoffed and turned away. The man seemed unperturbed. He saw James looking. What think you, lad? Fancy a bit of real magic? Tell your mum to stop on by, will you not? James shrugged and backed away. As he entered the shadow of the castle, James spied a broad doorway. Clanks and hisses emanated from the space beyond, and James guessed by the smells that it was the kitchen. He remembered hearing the kitchen from the rotunda, and decided this entrance was probably his best option for getting back to the statue in the mirror. He sauntered towards the door, trying to look inconspicuous. It occurred to him that he'd look more appropriate if he was carrying something. Near the door, a stack of copper pots sat next to a huge cauldron boiling over a fire. James glanced around, assuring that no one was looking, and then grabbed the pot on the top. As he turned, cradling the pot in his arms, he heard a rattling crash. He glanced back. The rest of the pots had fallen over, the topmost one spilling water onto the fire, which hissed and sputtered. "'What's this?' a woman's voice cried stridently. "'Making off with the wares, are you? That's the coppersmith's lot! Thief!' James dropped the pot and ran. He heard the ruckus behind him as the woman screamed and gave chase, but he didn't look back. He plunged into the darkness of the kitchen, weaving past a man in a leather vest and knocking over a woman carrying a platter. The kitchen was very dark, but for the blaze of the brick oven. James aimed for it and saw another doorway. Thief! another voice called, joining the chorus from outside. Stop him! A burly man with no shirt and a stained apron hanging from his middle stepped in front of James, grinning wickedly under his huge black moustache. He held a butcher's knife in his hand, fingering it like it was a cutlass. James tried to stop, but it was moving too fast and the stone floor was wet. He slipped, fell on his behind, and slid right between the man's spread legs. The man looked down as James passed beneath him. Stand fast! the man cried, spinning. James struck the wall on the opposite side of the corridor and scrambled up. Keeping as low as he could, he bolted down the corridor. The man roared and raised the knife, but someone else grabbed his wrist from behind. Calm yourself, Larkin. He's just a lad. Drop the pot outside, even, a voice admonished. Planning to split his skull for making you look a fool? If that was a killing offence, you'd have to execute the entire kitchen. James sensed the pursuit had ended, but he couldn't make himself stop running. He came to a junction in the corridor and was pounding straight through it when a hand snagged his wrist like a vice. James spun, momentum carrying him around, and tumbled to the floor, looking up at the figure that had stopped him. We do not approve of running in these halls, Salazar Slytherin said, staring down his nose at James. His fingers were still clamped on James's wrist. They were very cold. What manner of revolt is this? A single boy? I'm not part of a revolt, James said, panting. I was just, uh... You are indeed revolting, 
Slytherin growled, slitting his eyes. But only because of your dirty blood. How dare you cross into these halls, muggle! James felt an angry response welling up in him, but with an effort of will he quelled it. Sorry, sir, I was lost. Slytherin leaned towards James, using the grip on his wrist to pull him close. You dare look me in the eye as if you believed me an equal? Slytherin hissed. The soft hearts of my fellows have bred insolence in your kind, but I will not have it. You will address me as master, and you will avert your eyes, or I will have them for my collection. Is that clear, son of dirt? James used Slytherin's grip as leverage, pulling himself to his feet. When he was upright, he yanked as hard as he could, wrenching his wrist from the wizard's grasp. Blimey, James said angrily. The history book sure got it right about you. Slytherin's eyes blazed, and his expression turned wary. He reached for his wand with one lightning-quick movement. James scrambled to find his own, but it was too buried under the ridiculous robe. Salazar? A voice suddenly called. Slytherin froze. James whirled around, thankful for the interruption. The woman James recognized as Rowena Ravenclaw had just walked around a bend in the hall. Her eyes were suspicious as she glared over James's head at Slytherin. We've been waiting for you. The audience with Lord Martin has begun. How much longer do you intend to palaver with this uh, young cleric? Rowena dropped her eyes to James and winked, unsmiling. James turned back to Slytherin, who glared at him furiously. Then suddenly his face changed. He smiled indulgently and patted James lightly on the head. Run along, lad, he said in a sing-song voice. I'm sure we'll have a chance to finish our palaver soon enough. James stared up at Slytherin, thinking that the wizard might simply curse James in the back as soon as he turned away. Slytherin's expression didn't change, but his eyes hardened. Go now or face the consequences, the eyes seemed to say. James risked it. He turned and walked as quickly as he could, taking a corridor at right angles to the one Slytherin and Rowena Ravenclaw occupied. It curved to the right and met a short flight of stairs. When James reached them, he looked back. Slytherin was no longer visible. Breathing yet another sigh of relief, James took the stairs two at a time. As he navigated the corridors, he could still hear the echoing clatter of the kitchens. He had to be very near the rotunda. Nothing looked familiar, however. Torches flickered and sizzled in great iron wall brackets, making shadows leap on the walls, disorienting James. He passed more people, some of them no older than he was, and assumed he was encountering some of Hogwarts' original students. They turned as he passed, their eyes curious or outright suspicious. He began to panic. Finally, as James passed a pair of older boys in green tunics, he turned, meeting their stares. Sorry, I'm new here, he ventured, trying to keep his voice even. Do either of you know where the rotunda is? What might you need in the rotunda, boy? The taller one replied, showing his teeth in a parody of a charming smile. You must know that it's time for alchemy class. Perchance he does not know, the second boy said, his brow lowering. His garb tells me he is a muggle interloper. Lost, are you? Or perhaps not, the darker boy suggested, advancing on James. Perhaps you are up to something a bit more nefarious. Methinks the head of house shall be the judge. No, no, James cried, throwing up his hands. I think I've already met him. He, er, uh, says hello. James spun on his heels, tripping over the oversized robe. The two boys advanced on him. One of them reached for the hood of the robe, but James finally got his footing. He lunged away, yanking away from the boy's grasp. Capture him, the darker boy ordered, giving chase. James bolted down the corridor, his heart pounding. He turned at random hallways, leaping up short stairways and ducking into doorways. After one turn, he encountered an alcove with a statue in it. To James's amazement, it was the statue of Lochimagus the Perpetually Productive. Without thinking, James shimmied into the alcove and hid behind the stooped statue. His pursuer's footsteps echoed closer. They clattered to a halt directly in front of the statue. 
He can't have got far, the darker boy barked. You go on ahead. I'll double back and make sure we didn't miss him. That muggle brat will pay for crossing the path of Slytherin House. James held his breath until he was sure they were gone. Finally, he clambered out from behind the statue. He checked both directions and then darted out into the corridor again. He hoped desperately that he wouldn't encounter any more students. If he got caught now, he might never make it back to the magic mirror. He'd be trapped in ancient Hogwarts forever. James crept around a large archway and gasped. There, across a broad marble floor, were the gigantic statues of the founders. He'd made it back to the rotunda. He could see the glint of the silver-framed mirror behind the statues. James trotted across the floor as lightly as possible, determining to go back through the mirror now, even if Merlin was still in his office. He'd have to take his chances with an angry headmaster and hope he'd give James a chance to explain himself. This ancient world was just too dangerous to muck about in. Even as James was thinking this, however, something began to move from behind the statues. Someone had been standing in their shadow and was now coming out as if to meet him. James tried to stop, to duck into another hiding place, but there was nowhere to go. It was already too late. Salazar Slytherin grinned wickedly at James, triumphant. He had his wand in his right hand and carried something under his left arm. It was covered in thick black fabric. Imagine meeting you here, my young friend, Slytherin said smoothly. You know, I'm beginning to think you aren't a muggle at all. I'm beginning to think you are a spy. Very tricky of you, travelling via mirror. I had made the mistake of believing that was impossible. James shook his head. It's not what you think. I just need to— Slytherin's voice turned icy. He held his wand up, but didn't point it at James. I can promise you one thing, though, my young friend, he said, turning. I will not make that same mistake twice. A bolt of white light shot from Slytherin's wand. It struck the silver-framed mirror, which exploded into sparkling bits. The pieces flew between the stone legs of the statues and pattered to the floor. No! James cried, dropping to his knees. He reached for one of the shards, but it was no use. The tiny fragment showed nothing meaningful. The portal was destroyed. They say it's seven years' bad luck to break a mirror, Slytherin commented lightly. His footsteps crunched on the bits of broken glass as he walked towards James. He grinned maliciously. I guess that just shows what they know, doesn't it? James scrambled away from Slytherin, struggling to extricate his wand from the oversized robe. Slytherin stepped casually after James, shaking his head in amusement. As James finally found his wand and pointed it, the bald wizard was already flicking his. There was a sharp crack, and James's wand flew out of his hand. It clattered several feet away. I had thought that I was one of but two men on earth who knew the ways of the mirrors, Slytherin said, still advancing on James. With a deft flourish, he pulled the black cloth off the object he had been holding under his arm. It was another mirror, small and oval-shaped, its golden frame fashioned into the shape of a coiled snake. This one is particularly interesting, especially to someone in your predicament. No, I'm sorry to say it isn't a portal. It's a bit more one way. Slytherin held the mirror so that James saw himself in it. The reflection showed a boy in a pathetically oversized robe, his eyes wild and fearful. Have you ever heard of the old muggle superstition that if you stare into a reflection for too long, you'll become the reflection? Slytherin asked smoothly, still holding the mirror towards James. They fear that if they then walk away from the reflection, they will simply disappear. James had been inching slowly towards his wand, which was lying on the floor a few feet away. Now he steeled his nerve and lunged for it. An instant later, pain roared up his arm, crippling him. He fell to the floor, screaming. Desperately, he looked to see what had caused the damage, and then gasped in shock. His entire right arm had vanished up to the shoulder. He stared at the place where it should have been, unable to resist trying to grab at it with his left hand. Slytherin was laughing happily. 
He approached James again, and as he did, James's arm faded back into existence. The pain receded. There's nothing so instructive as a practical example, is there, my young friend? Slytherin said, holding the mirror so that James could see himself in it once more. As you've just illustrated, if you choose to stay within the reflection, you will be perfectly safe. If, however, you attempt to leave it, well, I really do not need to say any more, do I? Slytherin flicked his wand again. James's wand lofted into the air, turning end over end. The bald wizard caught it deftly and held it up. Curious, this, such a beautifully fashioned wand, in the hand of a boy who barely knows how to use it. You are not a student of this establishment, and yet you seem to know us. So very many questions do I have for you. And do you know what, my friend? Slytherin pocketed James's wand, and his eyes turned narrow and icy. I have every confidence that you will answer them. Several minutes later, James found himself in a darkened room in Slytherin's personal chambers. The room was quite low, stone-walled, and surrounded by tapestries depicting rather unpleasant scenes of dancing skeletons and flaming mountains. Tables on both sides of the room gave James the impression that this was Slytherin's personal magical laboratory. The table on the right was laden with gigantic books, parchments, quills, and paints. The one on the left was arrayed with a mind-boggling collection of vials, jars, and pots, all arranged on stacked shelves surrounding a large cauldron. Only one candle burned in the room, blood-red and embedded in the top of a human skull. James had the distinct and unsettling impression that very few people had ever seen this room. He sat against the rear wall in a very straight chair with a high ladder back. It was rather uncomfortable, but it was the only chair from which he could see himself in the oval-shaped mirror. Slytherin had positioned the mirror on an easel in front of the double doors, assuring that James could not approach the doors without leaving his reflection. As much as I would enjoy interviewing you immediately, Slytherin had explained, I am a very busy wizard, and you've caught me at a rather bad time. Let me assure you, though, as soon as I complete my evening's appointment, you will have my full and undivided attention. With that, Slytherin had pulled the doors mostly closed, but not completely. Through the gap, James could see a tiny portion of Slytherin's main office. As James waited, he could hear the bald wizard moving about, shuffling parchments and muttering darkly. Finally, there came a single, loud knock on the outer office door. "'How quaint of you to pretend that you are not already in the room, my friend,' Slytherin's voice said. "'I sensed your arrival minutes ago, but I assumed it rude to say so. Please do make yourself comfortable.' Through the crack in the double doors, James saw a shadow move. A figure passed in front of the crack. There was the creak of a heavy footstep, and then a deep sigh. I despise the very stone of this place, a deep, rumbling voice said. The cobbles of its floors are like knives to my feet. I'd call upon the fires of the earth's belly to consume it if I could, and damn your miserable college. In the darkness of the laboratory, James gasped. He recognized the voice of Slytherin's visitor. It was incredible, and yet it seemed to fit all too well. How could he not have made this connection before? His heart pounded, and he strained his ears to listen. I sympathize, Merlinus, Slytherin said. This must be a very disquieting homecoming for you. Still, you cannot imagine that we'd have allowed this castle to go unoccupied. As you may guess, not a single muggle lord wished to claim it after Lord Hayden's unfortunate accident. Ironically, they believe the castle is cursed rather than magically fortified. I join you, however, in despising much of what this place has become. My fellow founders are increasingly double-minded. They coddle the unmagicked and the dirty half-bloods. They plot against me as we speak. I fear that my time here is near an end. What a pitiful shame, Merlin said, his voice oozing contempt. 
and you had once believed this college would be the dawn of your pure-blood utopia, you must be positively heartbroken. My pure-blood utopia, as you call it, will be a reality, whether I assist it or not, my friend, Slytherin said. It is the nature of things. The rulers of this world will only live among the cattle for so long before they rise up. My role in the process is insignificant, although I admit I wish to live to see the day. And do not pretend disgust at my words, Merlinus. You are the greatest proof of my claims, even if you deign to ignore it. You believe that I detest the unmagicked as you do, but I am not so simple-minded, Merlin said dismissively. One rabid wolf doesn't justify killing the pack. Domination is your only aim, not justice. Is it wrong to dominate those unworthy of equality? Slytherin replied, as if he and Merlin had had this argument many times before. One can make the claim that it is a kindness to govern those who are unable to govern themselves. Besides, here Slytherin's voice became silky, it was more than one rabid wolf, wasn't it? There was a long silence, and then Merlin said, I'll not speak of such things with you. Oh, but you do not need to, Slytherin replied. Everyone knows the truth of what happened now, don't they? After all, it happened right here, four moons past. It is the gossip even of the muggle peasants, how the great Merlinus was humiliated by the Lord Hayden and his accomplice. How it must boil your blood to know your name has become a peon to foolish love. I'll not speak of such things with you, Merlin repeated slowly, his voice low and dangerous. I'll be friend enough not to remind you that you were warned from entangling yourself with the muggle woman, Slytherin went on, ignoring Merlin's words. Judith, I believe her name was, known jokingly among the peasants as the Lady of the Lake. Even I implored you not to lower yourself to her affections. Love makes a fool of any man who indulges it, and the greater the man, the greater the fool he must become. You were a very great man, Merlinus, and yet even you were not immune. Love blinded you when your wits should have been at their sharpest. Perhaps, had you not been so enamoured, you might have seen the truth. Hayden gave me her corpse, Merlin growled menacingly. He promised to return her to me. It was the bargain he agreed to if I doubled his lands and fortified this very castle. But how was I to guess that the man would dare cheat me so gravely while still maintaining the letter of his bargain? He gave you a corpse, Slytherin said sorrowfully. But you might have known it was not hers. The body was spoiled beyond recognition. But you were the great Merlin. You could have divined the truth had you tried, but you chose not to. She was to have been my wife, Merlin said, and his voice was like distant thunder. It rumbled the floor beneath James's feet. I could not bear it. I could not bear even to look at that decimated body. And Hayden knew such would be the case. Otherwise, how could he have dared attempt such obvious trickery? He knew you would be too stricken to verify the body was truly your Judith. And finally, when you planned your revenge, when you tracked his coach through the forest, you could have divined the truth even then. You could have used the birds and the trees to look into the coach to assure yourself of who was inside, but you didn't. Your rage, fueled by your love for the poor muggle woman, blinded you, didn't it? If you had but looked, you could have known the truth. You could have saved her, for, as everyone now knows, Lord Hayden loved Judith as well. He claimed her as his own, and she allowed him to. He gave you the body of a dead servant woman, and kept Judith for himself. She betrayed you. She had no choice, Merlin cried, his voice cracking. There's always a choice, Slytherin insisted. She could have died for your love, couldn't she? But no, 
She chose to be with him instead. She chose to be with him that very day, in his coach. She was only human. She believed I would come for her. She was only human, Slytherin agreed, a flawed, weak, unmagicked human, despite your own pathetic attempts to teach her the arts. And then, in the name of your love-blind revenge, she was a dead human, lost along with her new husband, Hayden, in a mysteriously tragic coach accident. Drowned, wasn't it? They say the storm came up with such force of Jupiter himself, washing the coach right off the bridge. It was carried quite some way, they say, and smashed to sticks, along with every person inside. I will not speak of such things with you, Merlin suddenly roared, shaking the very walls. There was a flash of angry light as every candle and every flame in the fireplace suddenly exploded into a blue torch. The flame on the red candle in the laboratory erupted upwards, brightly illuminating the room for one terrifying moment. Then, as suddenly as it had happened, the moment passed. The room plunged back into darkness. In the silence that followed, Slytherin's voice was quiet and silky. Forgive me, my friend. I have decided it is my duty to remind you of what was taken from you, and who took it. I warned you not to trust the muggles. They are beasts, incapable of nobility. Their only role is servitude. We are their masters. It is not only our right to rule them, it is our duty, for their sake as well as ours. You are a lying snake, Salazar Slytherin, Merlin seethed. Snake I may be, Slytherin chuckled, but liar I am not. You are here because you agree with me, although your foolish conscience bids you not to admit it. Merlin said, In fact, I am only here because you have something I need. Slytherin sighed. Yes, I know. I have already spoken to your apprentice, Ostrom Maddox, and for once I agree with him. Your plan is for the best. This world is no longer yours, Merlinus. The kingdoms advance their civilizations. They pass the land and plough it. They tear down the forests and turn them into hovels. They are taming the earth, rendering it mute to you. I alone know what that does to your powers, for you are unlike other wizards, my friend. You are not a wizard at all. You are a sorcerer, perhaps the very last and best of your kind. I'm glad you have accepted my suggestion to step out of this plane of existence. You will return to a better time. Ostromadox will watch for it. There may never again be such a time, Merlin said gravely, but it matters not. You are right about one thing. This world is no longer fit for me, nor I for it. The days are darkened before my very eyes, and by my own bloody hands. I have chosen to remove myself from the realm of men, but for my own reasons, Slytherin. You would not understand them. Your heart is as dark as pitch. And yet it is of something dark that you've come to speak, my friend, Slytherin replied without missing a beat. I have divined it. Don't mock me, Slytherin. I know you desire me to break the boundary of worlds without the stone, for you would then control that which returned with me. You speak of the legend of the gatekeeper's curse. You mustn't take such things seriously. My, what dreams and fancies idle men imagine, don't they? I am not fooled by your guile. You have the stone and the dark bag, for you are a lover of such dark trinkets. If I am to do what no other man on this world is capable of doing, I will do it with the tools no other man on this world could possibly need. Tell me, Merlinus, Slytherin said conversationally, what do you know of these trinkets? As if the stories of them were not plain enough for a child, Merlin sighed. The dark bag contains the last remnant of pure nothingness left from the dawn of time. Its uses are myriad and unique. The stone, however, is the only relic from pre-time. It is a single black onyx whose origin is the void between the worlds. It is immune to time. Thus, it is the beacon of the gatekeeper. 
The holder of the stone may be granted visions of those who've passed unto death, but more importantly, he who possesses the stone is the gatekeeper's ambassador, should that creature ever cross into the realm of men. Surely you do not believe in such things, Slytherin teased, and yet James could tell that Slytherin himself believed them fully. I believe that none have ever dared to test the legends, Merlin stated flatly, but that is only because none have ever been capable of it. It is pure speculation that he who breaks the boundary between the worlds for any length of time will attract the gatekeeper of the void, possibly bringing it back with him. If I do it, and if I return, I wish to be the charge of anything that returns with me. But why? Slytherin suddenly rasped, his voice eager and dripping with hate. Let the destroyer be loosed upon the earth. If man is the scourge of this world, reducing your power bit by bit, eating it up like locusts, then let the gatekeeper be descended upon them. It is their due. If my prediction is accurate, then the realm of wizards will have overcome the muggles by that day. The magical kingdom will be able to defend itself against the gatekeeper and possibly even ally with it. Only the muggle insects and the impure will be destroyed by its hand, and good riddance. The legend says that the curse of the gatekeeper will hearken a new age, an age of purity, of crystalline perfection. So let it be, Merlinus, be the harbinger of the curse. What more fitting way to reclaim your title as King of all Wizards? If I am to be the harbinger of the curse, I wish to control it, Merlin replied calmly. I would have it no other way, Slytherin answered. Without the beacon stone, you might not even gain the attention of the gatekeeper. However... Merlin waited silently, but James, still sitting in the dark of the laboratory, could sense the great wizard simmering, his rage all but smoking off his skin. Slytherin went on. The stone is far too powerful to be removed from the earth entirely. Knowing this day might come, however, I have arranged for it to be split into two equal pieces. The halves have been set into two rings. One ring will go with you, the other will stay with me. You cannot deceive me, Slytherin, Merlin rumbled. You wish to maintain control of the gatekeeper upon hope of its descent. You wish to use it to exact revenge upon your enemies. You and they will be long dead by that time. Slytherin laughed lightly. It isn't of any consequence to you, my friend. My half of the stone will remain, regardless of my own short time upon this earth. It will be passed on. When and if you do return, signalling the descent of the curse, the stone will find its way into the hands of my descendants. I merely wish for them to be prepared. It is only fair, don't you agree? Besides, Slytherin went on, his voice dropping, if you do decide to abandon your course and thwart the gatekeeper, well, are you not Merlinus the Terrible, the last of the line of Merdred? Are you not the greatest sorcerer of all the ages? Surely such a creature as you does not require the use of a mere dark trinket. Merlin was silent again, and James sensed him simmering. Finally he said, As you wish, Slytherin, provide me my half of the stone, and I will take my leave of this place. There came the sound of a drawer opening, and then the clunk of a small box. A long silence followed. I could simply take both halves of the stone from you, my friend, Merlin said quietly. After all, am I not Merlinus the Terrible? You forget the conditions of your lamentable bargain with Hayden, Slytherin replied. There was the clunk of a box closing. You are unable to touch the hair of anyone residing within this castle. Your threats are formidable, but fortunately they are to no effect here. I do, however, appreciate the sentiment of it. You may consider it returned. The floor creaked as Merlin stood. James saw the shadows change in the room as Merlin prepared to leave. 
A figure suddenly blocked the view through the opening in the double doors. It was Slytherin. He opened the doors slightly and peered in at James. A thoughtful look crossed his face. His eyes narrowed. And by the way, Merlinus, he said, not taking his eyes off of James, if you do return in a future age, beware of enemies. Your disappearance will certainly be legend. Some will be looking for you, and not all will intend to welcome you. I am quite accustomed to dealing with enemies, Merlin's voice replied, echoing from the depths of the room beyond. Nevertheless, if you should come across a certain young man, brown-eyed, with short, unkempt raven hair, and a look of constant insolence, beware of him. He is your enemy. I have divined it. You must dispose of him. I dispose of no one without just cause, Merlin growled. Regardless of your divinations, and even those who deserve such disposal, occasionally slip through my grasp whereas some who don't deserve it still fall under its judgment, Slytherin declared coldly, as if twisting a knife. But suit yourself, Merlinus. Watch for the boy, or ignore him at your peril. I care not which. A moment later there came a burst of warm air and a smell of dirt and growing things. Merlin was gone. Slytherin bared his teeth at James. You said history had gotten it right about me, he said, grinning viciously. Somehow, I don't believe history will even know your name, my young friend. Chapter 11 The Circle of Nine With a deft flourish, Slytherin threw back a black cloth over the oval mirror on the easel. James cringed, fearing he'd vanish the moment his reflection was hidden. Slytherin gave him a disdainful look. Obviously the mirror would be useless as a prison if the inmate could not be released by the jailer, you fool, he said. Had you attempted it yourself, your fears would have come true. But if the mirror is covered by someone else, you are safe. You see, even now I am the consummate teacher and you the reluctant pupil. Come to me, my friend. James shook his head, pressing his lips together stubbornly. Slytherin sighed wearily. I am not going to hurt you, boy. I merely require that you stand with me so that we may disapparate together. You can't disapparate inside Hogwarts, James replied. Everybody knows that. I don't know who this everybody is that you speak of, but I am beginning to suspect that the Hogwarts you believe you know is not the Hogwarts we currently occupy. Now come here. James tightened his grip on the arm of the ladderback chair. I'm not going anywhere with you. You wish to get to the bottom of this misunderstanding, do you not? Slytherin asked. We both want the same thing, my young friend. Now come. As Slytherin said the last word, he flicked his wand. The ladderback chair leapt off the floor, taking James with it. It soared towards Slytherin, and then dumped James on the floor in front of him. James scrambled to his feet, staring angrily up at the bald wizard. "'Why don't you just imperio me, you big bully?' James spat. "'That is an unforgivable curse,' Slytherin said, tilting his head in mock dismay. "'I am a teacher at this fine establishment. As such, I obey the law of the land.' I may not always agree with those laws, but nonetheless. Slytherin held out his hand. James stared at it, frowning furiously. He knew that if he didn't obey Slytherin, the man would just force him to comply somehow. Something inside James determined that he'd rather walk into whatever awaited him than be carried to it. With that, he looked up into the wizard's cold eyes and then took the proffered hand. There was a sudden, dizzying sense of speed and darkness. The floor seemed to fall away from James's feet. A split second later, another surface materialized beneath him. James stumbled on it, and Slytherin let him go with a shove, driving him to his knees. 
No disapparition, Slytherin said scornfully, stalking away. No useful spells, no understanding of cunning or resourcefulness. I know not where you come from or who you are, my young friend, but whoever sent you must have been truly desperate. James collected himself and stood, struggling with a sort of residual dizziness. Wherever Slytherin had taken him, it was very dark and cool. Wind blew fretfully, pushing a rafter of clouds overhead. The moon seemed unusually close. Its frosty glow illuminated the round, recessed floor of this strange place. James glanced around. The space was circular, with stone terraces leading down to a central wooden floor. On either side of this, two marble thrones faced each other. James's heart sank. He had been here once before, in his own time. "'You seem to know much about us,' Slytherin said, raising his voice over the moan of the wind. "'Therefore, you must know the purpose of the Sylvan Tower. Its height, they say, places it outside the realm of the laws of men. Here there is no such thing as an unforgivable curse. Here, my young friend, anything can happen.' As if to emphasize Slytherin's point, there was a sudden hiss and a swirl of black smoke. It seemed to stream onto the tower, coalescing on a point to Slytherin's right. It formed the shape of a man in a black cloak. He was hoodless, with sharp features and cruel eyes. Slytherin smiled, not taking his gaze from James. More swirls appeared, hissing into shape, forming figures all around the circumference of the tower's top terrace. Every figure wore a black cloak, their heads uncovered. Each newcomer turned to look at James, their faces cold and calculating. "'Meet my circle of nine, Slytherin cried, throwing his arms wide. "'Fellow wizards who, like myself, recognize the inevitable future of the magical world, and who join me in fomenting it. "'Consider yourself honoured to witness this, boy, for few alive know of us, or could guess at the councils we keep. "'And now, let the summit begin. "'I have convened us this night because we have very important business to attend to.' "'Shockingly, Slytherin suddenly flitted across the top of the tower, soaring, "'his feet not touching the ground, and his robes flapping like leathery wings.' He stopped directly in front of James, towering over him, his eyes fierce and intent. "'You are that business,' he rasped gleefully. He studied James's face triumphantly, almost lovingly. Then, suddenly, he turned away. His feet touched the ground again, and he walked casually out onto the wooden floor of the centre of the tower. James saw that the trapdoor in the centre of the floor was closed and locked. There'd be no escape that way. A moment ago, down in my quarters, I was the teacher and you were the pupil boy, Slytherin said, looking out over the low wall that surrounded the tower. Let us now reverse those roles. My friends and I wish to learn much from you tonight. You have the honourable task of teaching us. Let us start with something simple. What is your name? James felt a strong urge not to answer. If he answered even the most basic question, he feared he would answer all of them. Some latent idea of braveness and nobility insisted he remain silent, no matter what Slytherin or his cronies did to him. "'You are thinking it is courageous to remain silent, my boy,' Slytherin said slyly, looking back at James over his shoulder. "'You are thinking we will not merely kill you and use our arts to extract what we wish from the meat of your dead brain.' You are thinking that such things do not happen to brave little boys, and this proves to me, my young friend, that you are indeed unfamiliar with this age. I know not what happens in the time from which you come, but here terrible things happen to little boys every single day. Moreover, you are unknown here. You are a stranger. No one knows who you are, or even that you exist. If you disappeared, none would look for you. None would so much as notice your absence. Knowing that, 
Do you really wish to stake your life on the hope that I, Salazar Slytherin, might be too soft-hearted to execute you this very night? James met Slytherin's eyes. They glittered in the moonlight like coins. There was no soul in them. In them, James could very well see his own death. James swallowed and then stood up straight. My name is James, he declared, trying very hard not to betray his fear. See how easy that was, James, Slytherin asked, gesturing grandly. James saw that the wizard had his wand in his hand. He flicked it almost casually, and a bolt of stunning, excruciating pain rammed down James's spine. He arched his back and stumbled backwards, landing on the stone terrace. The agony was monumental. In it, James forgot where he was. His vision went white and hazy. All that mattered was that the pain should stop. It seemed to last hours and days. Then, suddenly, it was gone, and James knew that it had been mere seconds. His eyes cleared, and he saw Slytherin standing over him, smiling with interest. "'I did not do that because you only answered the question partially,' Slytherin said. "'I did that because you hesitated. I trust you won't let it happen again.' Slytherin spun, as if to address everyone present. "'And now, loud enough for us all to hear, what is your full name?' James struggled up, grunting. His knees felt watery and very weak, but he got them beneath him. "'James Sirius Potter,' he answered, hating himself for it. The thought of that pain striking him again was horrid. He'd do almost anything to avoid it. And besides, he thought, what did it matter? What could Slytherin do with any information James might give him? It was a thousand years in the past, wasn't it? But the future is built on the foundation of the past, a voice seemed to whisper in James's ear. He thought it was the voice of his father. Be careful, James. Be shrewd. James Sirius Potter, Slytherin said. Such an innocent-sounding name. Where are you from, Master Potter? When is your time? What can you tell us of it? Pray, leave nothing out. I'm from the future, James said grimly. A thousand years from now. I'm a student at this school in that time. Amazing, Slytherin said, his voice eager, and yet this is obviously a lie. I credit your boldness, but it will not serve you well. Answer me truthfully this moment, or face the Cruciatus curse again. What say you? It is the truth, James replied, raising his voice. If you want me to make up something to suit what you want to hear, just let me know. I'll be happy to tell you whatever story you want. Do not tempt us, James Sirius Potter, if indeed Hogwarts College exists a thousand years from now, then it exists in a day when the magical realm has finally subjugated the Muggle Horde. There would be no room in such a college for a student like yourself, a boy of obviously dull abilities and mental weakness. Such a college would put you out where you belong, with the muggle cattle and half-blood dogs. Tell us the truth now, or die with your lies. I'm not lying, James said, growing bold. Your predictions don't come true. In my time, the muggles live alongside the magical world. They don't even know about us. The wizarding world has lived in secrecy among them for centuries. There are laws that make sure no witch or wizard tells any muggle about us. Not only am I a student at Hogwarts, some of my classmates are the children of muggles. In my time, any witch or wizard can attend Hogwarts, no matter who their parents are. Your stupid plans are going to come to nothing. In fact, in my time, you're best known for getting kicked out of the school because you were a mad, power-hungry loon. You lie! Slytherin roared, wheeling on James and raising his wand. "'You have come here to sow deceit and doubt, but you are found out. You have not the slightest shred of evidence that this time you speak of is true, and the evidence of our own very beings proves you false.' 
The wizarding realm could never sink into the shadows of the muggle world. It would be blasphemy and a mockery. If this age that you describe were a reality, it would collapse under the weight of its own absurdity. Slytherin turned again, his robes flapping in the wind as he raised his arms. My friends, we are confronted with a mystery. If the world this James Sirius Potter describes is, in some version of the shifting mists of the future, and against all logic, a reality, then it must be prevented at all costs. And if, as I strongly suspect, this boy is a fraud and a liar, flying in the face of our every attempt to consort with him as gentlemen, then he is our mortal enemy. Either way, our course is clear. Here Slytherin whipped around again and glared at James. The boy must die, he said, grinning viciously. He raised his wand. Without thinking, James ducked and leapt as Slytherin called the words of the killing curse. The bolt of green sizzled over James's head. He scrambled down to the lowest terrace and hid behind one of the two stone chairs. "'Stay your wands!' Slytherin called to his associates, unperturbed. "'I can manage the boy. None of you need bother yourselves.' James wished desperately that he still had his wand. An idea occurred to him, and he called out, "'Hey, you call yourself a gentleman? Not much nobility in cursing a kid, is there? At least give me my wand!' Slytherin laughed in delight. "'Finally! The boy shows some spirit!' he cried. "'As you wish, Master Potter! Let us duel! Come forth and collect your wand!' James peered cautiously around the side of the throne. Slytherin saw him, and his grin widened. He produced James's wand from his robes and held it out. James steeled himself and climbed to his feet again. He began to cross the wooden floor towards Slytherin, carefully and quickly, his heart pounding. Suddenly, surprisingly, there was a loud thump from directly beneath James's feet. He jumped, startled, and looked down. He was standing on the trap door. They come, Salazar, one of the cloaked wizards said. They have sensed our summit. We must depart. Deal with the boy elsewhere. No, Slytherin said, still grinning. They cannot reach us. The tower cannot be breached from outside by any means until the summit is ended. It is the magical law of the Sylvan Tower. Let us finish our work first, and then deal with my fellow founders. It is high time they realize the error they have made in plotting against me. Voices emanated from below, and there was another thump on the thick wood of the trap door. The magical lock rattled, but held firm. "'Take your wand, James Potter,' Slytherin said. "'Let us finish this as wizards.' James firmed his resolve and stepped off the trap door. He heard the stories of how his father had faced off against Voldemort in very similar fashion, but as James had thought so many times before, he was not his father. James had no chance against the sheer malevolent power of Salazar Slytherin. Worse, there was no place to run or hide.' The tower was too high to escape from. James didn't even know how to disapparate. Shakily, he reached up for his wand. Slytherin released it, still smiling. James cleared his throat as he backed away, holding his wand in front of him. <clears throat> Do we bow first? he asked. I bow to equals, Slytherin said, baring his teeth. You may bow when you're dead. He swept his arm forwards. Avada Kedavra! James leapt again, and the spell struck the throne with a blast of green sparks. A small, detached part of James's mind realized that he was making very good use of the physical techniques he'd learned in Professor DeBello's Defense Against the Dark Arts class. He almost groaned aloud. Use magic, not acrobatics, boy! Slytherin taunted, shaking his sleeve back. Let your corpse be the first thing my fellow founders see when they join us here. Face me and die with a shred of honour. James was terrified. He rolled on the wooden floor and scrambled up, waving his wand wildly. 
He pointed it desperately, trying to remember the incantation. It was one of the first he had ever learned, but his mind was a complete blank. That's more like it, Slytherin rasped, striding forwards, coming to meet James. He held his wand casually before him, teasing James with it. Do your worst, boy. Show me what they teach you in this fantasy time of yours. Do it now. James blurted the spell the moment it came into his head. Slytherin spoke his curse at exactly the same time. Both bolts exploded over the wooden floor, lighting it. Slytherin's green bolt pierced James's oversized robe, passing right through it and under James's outstretched arm, barely missing his body. James's yellow bolt struck the lock on the trap door. It unlocked with a burst of sparks, and the door flew open, releasing a beam of light and the sound of voices. It's open, someone cried. Someone unlocked it from above. Beware a trap. Protego! Slytherin roared in fury. He pointed his own wand at the door, but it was too late. Figures ran up the stairs from below, wands at the ready. Spells exploded in all directions, illuminating the tower's peak like fireworks. James took the opportunity to dive behind the marble throne again. The air was suddenly full of the hiss and swirl of Slytherin's circle of nine, disapparating from the top of the tower. One of them remained long enough to approach James, flourishing his wand. He had a black goatee, which bristled as the man grinned. Nice trick, boy, he growled, but we detest unfinished business. James's reflexes had been sharpened by his duel with Slytherin. Even as the man finished speaking, James whipped his wand around and shouted, Expelliarmus! There was a sharp crack, and the man's wand shot from his hand, spinning into the darkness beyond the tower wall. The force of the spell pushed the man backwards. He stumbled and tripped on one of the terraces. With a roar of anger, he spun to see where his wand had gone. Realizing it was lost, he turned back, his hands hooked into claws, and his face contorted with rage. Stupefy! James cried, scrambling backwards, but his aim was off. The spell struck the stone floor to the man's right. You'll die for that, boy! The man roared, pouncing like a beast. There was a flash of purple light, and the man screamed in mid-pounce. He landed hard in front of James's feet, bringing his face down hard enough to break his nose. James heard the crunch and grimaced. He scrambled to his feet, eyes wild, waving his wand crazily. Halt, boy! a voice commanded. A hand suddenly grabbed James's wrist, bringing it up. James struggled against it for a moment, and then looked to see whose hand it was. Godric Gryffindor's stern, narrow features looked down at him. The battle is over, my friend, he said, releasing James's wrist. Whoever you are, you are one extremely fortunate young wizard. He's not just a wizard, a woman's voice said, and there was a hint of an amused smile in it. James looked and saw Rowena Ravenclaw throw back the hood of her blue cloak. He's the youngest cleric in the realm, and he's tussled with Salazar before. Where's he gone? James suddenly asked, looking around the top of the tower. Vanished, Ravenclaw answered gravely. Escaped, assumed his true form, and flown off. What's his true form? James asked, shuddering as his adrenaline wore off. Rowena speaks facetiously, Helga Hufflepuff replied, approaching the tower's low wall and peering out into the darkness beyond. Slytherin is an animagus. She speaks of his animal self as his true form, since she believes him unworthy of the title of human. Is he a snake? James asked, joining Hufflepuff by the wall and peering down. Curiously, no, Gryffindor answered. Salazar's true form is perhaps even more fitting, for he has proved himself to be similarly blind, nocturnal, and bloodthirsty. Salazar's animagus is, in fact, a bat. A groan reminded the assembly of the stricken man with the goatee. He rolled onto his back and struggled to sit up, one hand clapped over his nose. This man is no danger without his wand, Gryffindor said, thanks to our quick-thinking friend here. To the man, he said, I'd not attempt to disapparate if I were you, Lord Morcant. That was more than a bone-lock hex I cast on you. It was also a lanyard charm. 
You'd get no further than a stone's throw before being leashed, and I'm told it can be rather painful. You broke my nose! Morkant cried, showing them the palm of his hand. It was slick with blood. I'll kill the lot of you! Return me my wand this instant! I think not, my lord, Ravenclaw replied. I suspect you won't hold a wand for quite some time. We have many questions for you, and it'd be best if you answered them. You'll torture me, will you? Morkant spat, climbing to his feet. I'm not afraid of what you'll do to me. I'll never speak. Do your worst. We won't need to torture you, Hufflepuff said reasonably. If you choose not to answer our interrogations, we shall simply let you go. Morkant narrowed his eyes. How dare you mock me? I know your kind. Your lies do not deceive me. You know your kind, Morkant, Ravenclaw corrected politely. And you assume everyone else is of like mind. We shall indeed release you if you refuse our questions. And we shall not harm a single hair on that fetching beard of yours. You should beware, however. Your release might result in some people getting the wrong impression. Some observers might interpret your unscathed release as a sign that you told us absolutely everything you know. Gryffindor arched an eyebrow meaningfully. Your associate Salazar Slytherin would not appreciate that, would he? He has been known to deal rather harshly with those who betray him. He would not believe such lies, Morkant scoffed. He knows I am trustworthy. Besides, I'm not afraid of him. Gryffindor approached Morkant and leaned towards him. In a conspiratorial tone of voice, he said, I hear rumors that Salazar's been developing a curse that turns his enemies inside out. Technically, I'd say that was impossible, but Salazar is quite the genius when it comes to such things. Knowing him, he'll simply continue practicing it until he gets it right. He's probably hoping you'll betray him, just so he has an excuse to use you as another test subject. He'll trust me, Morkant insisted again. He knows I would never betray him. Ravenclaw shrugged. Salazar never struck me as the trusting type, she said. But perhaps you know him better than we do? On the other hand, Hufflepuff mused, if you do decide to assist us, we could protect you from any potential reprisals. Morkant scoffed, and James heard desperation in the man's voice. You? Slytherin has twice the power of the rest of you combined! Gryffindor smiled. I'm certain he has convinced even himself of that. But why then did he transform into a flying rodent the moment he witnessed our approach? Why did he flee rather than face us wand to wand? Slytherin does not ask himself such questions, but it would serve you, Lord Morkant, to think about it very carefully. Morkant scowled furiously. Finally, through gritted teeth, he said, He means to overthrow the lot of you. He wishes to control the school entirely and use it as the seed of a magical empire. He knows you have been plotting against him. His intent is to strike first. How instructive, Gryffindor said grimly. He believes we have been plotting against him. But do let us continue this elsewhere. Rowena, Helga... Perhaps you might escort our mysterious young friend back down to the main castle. I will accompany Lord Morkant to a safe place. We can palaver there at our leisure. Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw agreed. A moment later, there was a loud crack as Gryffindor disapparated from the tower with Lord Morkant in tow. Let us retire to the Great Hall, Ravenclaw said turning to James and Hufflepuff. It should be deserted at this time of night. Perhaps our friend would like something to eat as we discuss. Hufflepuff nodded. Indeed, we must determine who you are, young man, and how to return you from whence you came. I can't imagine how we'll do that, James replied, remembering the shattered portal mirror. My only way home was smashed to bits by Slytherin. I'm stuck here. "'Surely this is not the case,' Ravenclaw said cheerfully. "'It may not be immediately apparent, but the solution shall present itself.' Hufflepuff smiled at James. "'The answer is almost always simple, young man, but rarely is it easy.' 
James had begun to walk towards the open trapdoor, but he stopped when Hufflepuff said that. Where had he heard that before? A moment later, he remembered, Merlin had said something like it in the cave when they'd gone to get his cash. Doing what is right is nearly always simple, Merlin had said, but it is never easy. And then, connected to that, James remembered something else the big wizard had said, later when they'd all been in the headmaster's office, examining his unpacked devices and curiosities. James turned on the spot, his eyes wide, wondering. It couldn't be that simple, could it? He had to find out, and quickly. No, James said excitedly. Not the Great Hall. We have to go back to Slytherin's quarters right away, before he comes back. Ravenclaw furrowed her brow. Why in the earth should we go there? And what makes you think he shall return? Hufflepuff added, studying James's face. Because he'd never leave all his stuff, James answered quickly. His dark trinkets, they're too important to him. He'll come back for them, probably right away, before anyone moves any of it. We have to get there first. If I'm right, he has something really important. It may be my only chance of getting back to my own time. Ravenclaw merely studied James, her eyes serious and thoughtful. Helga Hufflepuff, however, nodded curtly. She stepped forward and held out her hand. In that case, dear boy, let us forego the stairs. Rowena, wand at the ready. If we intend to hurry, then let us hurry like witches, and hope that Salazar has not already outwitted us this night. On the count of three, one, two, three! James felt the disorienting jolt of disapparition again as Hufflepuff took him away from the Sylvan Tower. A moment later, a dim hallway appeared around him, and his feet hit the stone floor. Almost instantly, there was a second loud crack, and Rowena Ravenclaw appeared next to James and Hufflepuff. Both women had their wands out. They scanned the hall in both directions. Without a word, Hufflepuff pointed. James looked. He recognized this hall as the one that led to Slytherin's quarters. Now, with a shiver, he saw that the door to the wizard's office was ajar. Light spilled from it, and there was the clunk of stealthy movement. "'What is your name, young man?' Hufflepuff whispered, not taking her eyes from the door. "'James Potter,' James replied, as quietly as he could. Hufflepuff whispered, "'You were right, James.' Salazar is here, returned for his cash as bold as brass. He knows his time is ended here. Rowena and I will face him and attempt to reason with him. If we prevail, we will help you seek what you need. If we are bested, then I am glad to die knowing the name of our mysterious benefactor. You may reason with him if you wish, Helga, Ravenclaw said quietly, obviously anxious for a fight. But I will be negotiating with my wand alone, the sheer bravado of his returning this night beneath our very noses. I want to come with you, James whispered, raising his wand. This is my fight, too. He tried to kill me. Ravenclaw narrowed her eyes at James, smiling thinly. He may well finish what he started if you accompany us, James Potter, but it is your choice. James had expected a bit more resistance than that. He smiled a little nervously. Honestly, he thought, what was the worst that could happen? History proved that all four founders survived this night. Of course, as Slytherin had implied earlier, history didn't say anything whatsoever about a dark-haired boy who might have been along for the ride. "'I'll lead,' Hufflepuff whispered, pointing towards Slytherin's door. "'Rowena to my left.' "'James, you follow. Stupefy Salazar if necessary, but no more. Remember that he is still one of the founders of this college, and deserving of respect.' "'Respect be damned the moment he raises his wand,' Ravenclaw muttered as they inched down the hall. "'He certainly wasn't using stunning spells on the tower,' James whispered. "'Just watch for—' A bolt of green seared the floor next to Ravenclaw's foot. "'Stupefy!' Hufflepuff shouted, aiming her wand at the open door. A shadow leapt aside as her spell struck the lintel, exploding into red sparks. He's weary of us. We must charge him. We're too vulnerable here. James struggled to catch up as Ravenclaw and Hufflepuff ran towards Slytherin's doorway, heads down and wands firing. Red bolts peppered the doorway, forcing Slytherin back. Cease this, Salazar! Hufflepuff shouted. It's not yet too late to abandon this course of action. James still had seen nothing of his former captor. 
As they drove through the door of his office, ducking for cover behind chairs and a bookcase, a shadow escaped into a dark doorway, hissing angrily. "'Where his form?' Ravenclaw cried. "'He can be small and winged. He may hide.' Hufflepuff peered from around the bookcase, her wand ahead of her. "'He is not in sight! To the inner chamber!' James followed the witches as they moved across the room. He was amazed at their movement. It was graceful and flitting, remarkably quick, but utterly controlled. Their wand hands preceded them, steady as stone. James's heart slammed in his chest, making his own wand shake in his hand. He glanced aside as he passed the double doors of the laboratory. They were still slightly open, but the space beyond was dark. Sweep the room! Ravenclaw said as she moved into Slytherin's inner sanctum. Revelio! A beam of soft lavender light spread from the tip of Ravenclaw's wand, lighting the wall. Slowly, she moved it all around the room, letting the light touch every surface. Finally, she lowered her wand, extinguishing the lavender light. He is not hidden here, she said, obviously disappointed. He has fled once again, methinks. James finally took a moment to look around. This was obviously Slytherin's sleeping quarters. It was surprisingly small and cluttered, with gothic pillars and buttresses all around it. A single window was securely closed and locked. "'Let us take advantage of the moment, then,' Hufflepuff said, turning to James. "'What is it that you believe Salazar might have in his possession? What tool might prove helpful to you?' James tried to explain the age he'd come from, and how he'd arrived in this century by accidentally wishing himself through the magic mirror in the headmaster's office. He described appearing through the smaller, silver-framed mirror hung behind the rotunda statue and its subsequent destruction by Slytherin. "'I assumed that that had been a magic mirror as well,' James said. "'But now I don't think so. Slytherin loves things like that. "'It never destroys something really magical just to keep me here. "'I think the Amsera Seth mirror can see through any mirror, "'maybe even anything that reflects. "'So the mirror behind the statue was just a normal mirror after all.' "'That mirror was a remnant from Hayden's occupation,' Ravenclaw nodded. "'There'd be nothing magical about it.' "'But Slytherin knew all about travelling through mirrors,' James went on. "'He said that he thought he was only one of two men on earth who knew about that, "'and then just now, when we were up in the Sylvan Tower, "'I remembered the headmaster saying something like that. "'He said that his magic mirror was one of only two ever made, "'and that the other one had belonged to somebody he knew. "'But now I know who that person must have been. "'Slytherin has the other magic mirror, the twin of the one that brought me here.' Ravenclaw's eyes had grown very sharp and wary. She glanced meaningfully aside at Hufflepuff. "'Let us search,' Hufflepuff said quietly. "'Then we shall know for sure.' Ravenclaw raised her wand and said the same incantation as before. The lavender light appeared at the end of her wand again. She turned slowly. "'In my last pass,' she muttered, "'I was merely searching for sign of Salazar, either as man or bat. Now. Hufflepuff paced around the room, watching the lavender light play on the walls. There! she announced, pointing. Ravenclaw paused, resting the beam on a very large painting. It was a full-length portrait of a narrow-faced wizard in burgundy robes, and it was very nearly life-sized. The portrait slit its eyes at them and scowled. James saw that as the beam passed over the portrait, it illuminated the faint outline of a hidden doorway. Ravenclaw pocketed her wand and stalked across the floor. She grasped the frame of the painting and pulled, but it was stuck tight to the wall. Hufflepuff joined her, but they could not move the painting, even with all three of them pulling it. "'No more kids' gloves,' Ravenclaw said angrily. She stood back, motioning the others away. She pointed her wand at the portrait. "'Rowena Ravenclaw!' the portrait sneered. "'You know not what you are doing!' Convulsus! Rowena cried, interrupting the portrait. There was a blinding burst of white light, and the portrait seemed to vaporize. A moment later, once James's eyes had readjusted to the relative dimness of the room, he saw that the portrait had not, in fact, been completely obliterated. The frame had been destroyed, and the painting had been slashed straight down the middle, leaving a gaping hole. The wooden back of the painting had been entirely blasted away, lost in the dark space beyond. James, Hufflepuff, and Ravenclaw approached the slashed portrait carefully. 
James, between the two women, could see a sliver of light winking back at him from the depths beyond the torn canvas. In the dimness of the hidden chamber, James's own face looked back at him. It's there, James breathed, both elated and frightened. I can see my reflection. It's the magic mirror. Hufflepuff illuminated her wand and held it out. Very carefully, she crept through the shredded painting into the dimness of the chamber behind it. Her wand lit the space and shone on the mirror's frame. As James entered the chamber and peered around Hufflepuff, he could see that this mirror was nearly identical to the one in Merlin's office, except that it stood upright rather than on its side. Also, there were words engraved on the golden frame of Slytherin's mirror. The inscription didn't make any sense to James, but the first word, carved in beautiful, flowing script, was Erised. The mirror, Hufflepuff said simply, her voice awed. It wasn't destroyed after all. He had it this whole time. Ravenclaw's face was flushed with anger. We should have known, but what of its focusing book? Without it, the mirror's power is uncontrollable and capricious, reduced only to its most basic and illusory functions. We must search for the book. Indeed, and search for it we shall. Once we have told Godric of this discovery, Hufflepuff said, for now other matters demand our attention. James has done us a second great service. I suspect he'd prefer to take his leave if he can. I would if you don't mind, James agreed. It's been really cool to meet all of you. Well, most of you, but I'm really anxious to see if I can get back. James Potter, Hufflepuff said, smiling, we'd have a myriad of questions for you, not the least of which would be what becomes of us, and what is this school like in your time? But I strongly suspect that the less we know of such things, the better. There is one question we should ask, though, Helga, Ravenclaw said. She turned to James, her face grim and thoughtful. If this tale you have told us is true, and I have no reason to doubt that it is, then the headmaster of this college, some thousand years hence, has had collusion in this time with Salazar Slytherin. James, answer me this one question as truly as you can. Do you know the real name of this headmaster of yours? Of course, James said, frowning quizzically. I thought I'd mentioned him already. It's Merlin. You'd probably know him as Merlinus Ambrosius. He came to our time last year on the night of the alignment of the planets. I guess you'd call it the Hall of Elders Crossing. I saw him just this evening. Well, heard him, actually, when I was trapped in the laboratory. He was right out there in Slytherin's office. Ravenclaw's face had gone very pale. She studied James and then turned to look at Hufflepuff. He was here this very night, she said quietly. It is all true. We scarce believed it. And this boy is proof that he succeeded. It is far worse than we expected. The legend... Hush, Helga, Rowena said gravely. James needn't hear of the details of that. The two women looked at James. In the wand light, their faces were very pale and deadly serious. Hear me now, James Potter. Beware Merlinus, Ravenclaw said, speaking with great emphasis. The sorcerer has a glamour that bewitches those who wish to trust him. If he has achieved the position of headmaster, then he has already fooled many. It may even now be too late for your world, but you may have been sent here this night for a great purpose. Perhaps you go back to serve as a warning. That which Merlinus bodes upon your world is an evil like nothing the earth has ever known. The gatekeeper of the void may even now be unleashed, and Merlinus is its ambassador. There is no battling the gatekeeper, but if you can find a way to destroy the ambassador, James Potter, you must take it. Do not let him put his glamour upon you. If the moment comes... It will not be the time for discourse or hesitation. It will be the time for action. Do you understand? James looked intently at Rowena Ravenclaw's earnest, pale face. Even here, a thousand years away from the events she was describing, she was clearly terrified. Slowly, James nodded. How dare you! A voice shrieked suddenly, furiously, making them all jump. My chambers! My cash! Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw both spun in the confined space of the hidden chamber. They pointed their wands as a dark figure tore the decimated portrait away. The voice screamed, and it was chillingly inhuman. 
James suddenly remembered the slightly open doors of Slytherin's laboratory, remembered thinking he should warn Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw to check there. Slytherin had fooled them with a shadow, and then hidden there, probably in his bat form, and now, enraged that they had discovered his greatest secret, he seemed trapped halfway between his forms, half bat and half man. His voice buzzed hideously. Great, leathery wings flapped from his hunched back. Go, James! Hufflepuff cried, pointing her wand at Slytherin's grotesque shape. In his blind rage, he beat his enormous bat wings, flailing them against the wall, preventing him from entering. He slavered monstrously, lunging and snapping his fanged mouth at the women. No! James yelled. I mean, I don't know how. I can't think! A bolt of red seared the air, striking Slytherin's wing. He screamed, and the wing flailed limply. Get away from that mare! he screamed, the words sounding alien in that strange, half-bat mouth. Touch it and die! Just go! Ravenclaw urged desperately. Just as you did before! Slytherin lunged again, finally forcing his way through the decimated portrait hole. Both Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw shot him with stunning spells, but in his mutated form they only slightly weakened him. He snapped and roared at them. James turned away and flung himself against the mirror. The moment he touched it, the reflection sank away, revealing the familiar silvery smoke. It swirled dizzyingly before James's face. Go, James! Hufflepuff cried. There was a whoosh and a horrid slashing sound. One of the witches screamed, but James couldn't tell which. I wish I was anywhere else, James said aloud. Then, panicked, he amended that. I wish I was home. I wish I was in my own time, right now. Directly behind him, Slytherin roared, his voice both human and beastly. James felt the air of Slytherin's beating wings and sensed the coming slash of the bat-like talons. And then... All of it was gone. The hidden chamber winked away, sucked into the swirling silvery mists. James felt the same odd sensation of flipping as if he was being reversed through the mirror. There was a rush of noise and speed, and then he was falling. He tumbled forwards, catching himself in his hands and knees, and his wand clattered to the ground in front of him. James looked up. He was in a small, dim room. It seemed to be full of dusty trunks and stacked crates. He scrambled around, looking back in the direction from which he'd stumbled. There, looking exactly the same, but for a thick coating of dust, was Slytherin's magic mirror. The first word of the now ancient inscription was still plainly visible. Eris said, "'James?' a girl's voice asked, startling him. "'Is it you? It is! Wake up, you two! It happened!' Rose? James asked, completely perplexed. She appeared from the shadows near the door, dishevelled and covered with cobwebs. James blinked at her. What are you doing here? Where am I? Ralph was climbing sleepily to his feet. It's the middle of the bloody night. What else matters? He knew, Rose said, almost hopping with excitement. He said you'd turn back up here if we made the mirror ready, and you did. The three of us have been waiting here ever since dinner. We've been worried sick, James. What happened? Where have you been? Wait a minute, James said, climbing to his feet. How'd Ralph know I'd be showing up here? Nobody could possibly have known that. Not me, Ralph said sleepily, clapping James on the shoulder. Although I'd love to take credit for it. No, this was all his idea. Ralph hooked a thumb over his shoulder. James looked and saw the boy getting slowly to his feet, a tired, crooked smile on his face. "'About time, Potter,' Scorpius drawled. "'Have a nice little trip?' Chapter 12 Questions of Trust James insisted that, curious as everyone was, he was too exhausted for lengthy explanations. He told them merely that he'd travelled back to the time of the Founders and that he'd discovered far more than he intended about Merlin. He promised to explain everything in detail the next morning, which was Saturday. Reluctantly, the others agreed, and the four students crept out of the storage room. James allowed Ralph and Scorpius to lead the way through the dark corridors, returning to the main hall. You actually met the Founders, Rose demanded in a hoarse whisper, refusing to wait for details. 
James nodded wearily. I did. They were a lot more real than I ever imagined. Rose shook her head wonderingly. What was Helga Hufflepuff like? She's the one we hear the least about. She was tough, James said, but nice. She wanted to talk things out with Slytherin, even after he'd tried to kill the lot of us. But she wasn't a pushover. None of them were. They were hardcore. I'll tell you more tomorrow. How do you all know I'd gone missing? Well, it's been a whole day, hasn't it? Ralph said in a whisper. Besides, Cedric woke me up in the middle of the night last night. He told me exactly what happened. He thinks Merlin had bewitched the gargoyle to alert him somehow any time somebody used the password to go up to the headmaster's office. Merlin's been stalking all over school, obviously mad as a hornet, but he hasn't said anything. Rose thinks he's been looking for something. I think he was looking for the mirror of Erised, Rose interjected. I bet he sensed it was here, hidden away somewhere, but couldn't find it. It's protected from discovery somehow. I bet it's got him in a total lava. So how did you all find it? James asked as they reached the stairs. Ralph looked at Scorpius, who shrugged. I knew where to look, the pale boy said. And when, more or less. The four stopped at the base of the dark staircases. On the closest landing, the Heracles window had once again changed, Heracles's face reverting back to the caricature of Scorpius. Filch would be fuming. James shook his head. I just can't work it out, Scorpius. How could you possibly know? Scorpius drew a deep sigh. I was told. My father knew all about it. He's been studying the writings of the founders for years. It's a sort of hobby of his. He wanted to learn about Salazar Slytherin, mainly, to see what he was really like. But then he got interested in the journals of Rowena Ravenclaw. She wrote down absolutely everything. Father worked out some of the clues and codes of Ravenclaw's diaries. Apparently, she intended for them to be discovered. She describes a boy who visited her and the other founders, a boy supposedly from the distant future. She discovered that if he was to succeed in returning through the right mirror, someone would have to prepare it on this side in this time. She determined it was her duty to make sure that happened. So she developed the codex and left clues for the right person to figure it all out. My father was apparently that person. The clues gave a time frame and instructions. James's head was spinning. But how could she work that out? How could she know an exact time frame? Scorpius shrugged. That's a question for my father. I can't imagine why it'd matter. The fact is that she did work it out. It's obvious, Rose whispered. You must have told her the time you came from. You must have given clues. I didn't tell them anything like that, James said. But then a thought occurred to him. I did tell them about Merlin's reappearance, though. I told them it happened a year ago, on the night of the alignment of the planets. That's almost all she'd need, Rose replied. They knew how to track those kind of events. She probably factored out the exact date of the alignment, then added in loads of other clues you'd mentioned, like the day of the week or the month, the time during the school term, even the phase of the moon. She was dead smart, you know. James nodded. No doubt about that. But still, how did you find the mirror if Merlin can't even find it? Rose interrupted Scorpius. Ravenclaw gave a sort of magical map. She embedded an enchanted signal in the mirror of Erised and listed the spell required to locate the signal. All we had to do then was follow it. When we found it, we were simply to touch the mirror and wish for lost items to be returned to us. That's what we did. And then we just waited. Finally, bang, here you are again. Pretty neat, eh? Ralph whispered, grinning. And all because of Scorpius here, or his dad, actually. Scorpius rolled his eyes. If we're done congratulating ourselves, I've got plans in the morning. You three can stay here and get cornered by Filch's ancient needle cat if you wish, but I'm off to bed. He turned and began to creep up the stairs. James said good night to Ralph, then followed Scorpius up the stairs, Rose at his side. As the three passed through the portrait hall into the Gryffindor common room, Rose smiled tiredly at James. I'm glad you made it back, James. We didn't know where you'd really gone, or if Scorpius's information was correct. I was really scared. I thought maybe Merlin had got you somehow. 
James furrowed his brow, thinking of the words Rowena Ravenclaw had said to him, urging James not to be taken in by Merlin, warning him he might have to confront the sorcerer if the moment was right. He tried to smile gamely at Rose. I'm fine, he said, but it was close. I'll tell you all about it tomorrow. I'll tell you everything, if you really want to know. For now, let's sleep. I'm nearly dead on my feet. They said good night and climbed their respective staircases. When James got to the darkened dormitory, Scorpius was already in his bed, his back to James. James' pilfered cleric robe had not come through the mirror with him, so he was still dressed in his stripy pyjamas. Wearily he put his glasses and his wand back in his bag and climbed into bed. He lay there a moment and then sat up. Scorpius, he whispered. The boy didn't move, but James knew he was listening. I don't know why you helped me, but thanks. James lay back down. A minute went by, and James was nearly asleep when he heard Scorpius move. Out of the darkness, the boy replied in a whisper, Don't thank me yet, Potter. The time may come when you'll wish you'd never made it back. The time may come when you'll curse me for helping you. James slept very late the next morning, and awoke to a bright glare of snow and frost on the dormitory window. He washed, dressed, and clumped downstairs, looking for his friends. Eventually he found Rose and Ralph in the library, arguing quietly over one of Professor Ravalvier's homework questions. "'You two are pathetic,' James said, "'doing homework on a Saturday morning.' "'Technically, it's hardly morning any more,' Rose replied. "'We've been waiting for you. We're dying to know what happened yesterday.' Ralph closed his book with a thump. "'Besides, it's dead cold outside. Even the lake's freezing over. All the older years are mooning around trying to figure out who to go to the Yule Bull with. There's nothing else to do. By the way, did you get Zane's duck?' James blinked. "'When? The other night?' No, early this morning. Uh, last night by his time. He wants to hear about what happened to you too. He said we should duck him back when you're ready to talk about it and tell him where to meet us. James shook his head and smiled. That's crazy. That's Zane, Ralph shrugged. What about Scorpius? James asked reluctantly. Should we include him? Rose looked uncomfortable. He says he knows everything he needs to know about it already. Whatever that means, Ralph added. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. You got something called a howler yesterday morning. What? James said, frowning. A howler? From who? Your mum, Rose answered. It was delivered during breakfast, but you weren't there to open it. We tried to get it out of the great hall, but it went off before we could. I'm afraid everybody heard it. You really could have told us, James. What are you talking about? James exclaimed. What did the howler say? Rose studied James's face. You really don't know? Bloody hell, Rose, you're killing me here. What did it say? It was your mum's voice, Ralph said. She was really mad, and loud as a trumpet. She said she couldn't really blame you for taking them last year because you were just being your father's son, but she hoped you'd learned your lesson. She said they were dangerous, and what's more, that they belonged to your father, and he was also pretty disappointed in you for nicking them again. Then she said that she hoped everyone was hearing it, including the teachers, so they'd all know that you were sneaking around with the invisibility cloak and the marauder's map, and that they should put a stop to it. James spluttered, speechless. But, but I didn't take them. They're still at home in Dad's trunk. I haven't touched them since last year. Well, Rose said, pointing out the obvious, they aren't at home in your Dad's trunk, even if you didn't take them. They've gone missing, and your mum seemed pretty certain that you were the one who'd done it. James felt both angry and hurt. How could she just accuse him like that? Sure, he had borrowed the cloak and the map last year, but it had very good reasons for it. He had accepted his punishment, hadn't he? He didn't have any plans of borrowing the cloak and map at all this year. But who could have taken them then? And then, with a start, James remembered the morning they'd left for the train, when Albus had been mysteriously late about packing his trunk. That little scroot, James breathed, furious. What? Rose asked. Who? Albus, the little slithering imp. He stole them. It had to have been him. The morning we left for the train, he was moping around half-packed. Then, all of a sudden, he left the room for a few minutes. Mum and Dad were downstairs getting the car around. He must have sneaked into their room and stolen the cloak and the map out of Dad's trunk. He knew they'd blame me. 
"'You can't know that,' Rose admonished. "'I can't,' James agreed, nodding. "'But I do. Just wait until I get my hands on him. "'I'll make him send an owl to Mum and Dad confessing the whole thing. "'See if I don't.' "'In the meantime,' Ralph interjected, "'we're still dying to hear about your wild adventure yesterday. "'Can we put this little detail behind us for the moment?' "'James was still seething, but he agreed. "'He'd just have to see if he could track Albus down later that afternoon.' Maybe he'd take Ralph up on his offer to escort him down to the Slytherin common room. Ralph went on. We've been thinking about it, and we've come up with a great place to meet Zane and hear your story. Go grab your cloak and meet us by the rotunda entrance, and bring your wand. A few minutes later, James once again met Ralph and Rose by the broken remains of the Founder's statues. The huge rotunda gates had been closed against the wintry day, but a small door set into the left gate remained unlocked. Rose led them to it. As James crossed the marble floor, he felt very strange. He remembered the statues as he'd last seen them, intact and new. He looked up as he passed through the main arch. The engraved name of the school was worn, almost lost in the dim recesses of the vaulted ceiling. James imagined that if he went over to the statue plinth, he might still find bits of the broken, silver-framed mirror in the cracks of the floor. He shivered. As they went through the tiny doorway, the three students squinted in the blinding, snowy brightness of the day. The lake was indeed half-frozen, with white edge ice fading to black near the centre, where waves lapped onto the brittle surface. The wind was bitter and harsh, carrying flecks of snow like sand. None of the three spoke as they worked their way around the castle, huddled against the cold and James was amused to see that they were walking towards the ancient stone barn in which Hagrid housed his menagerie. "'It'll be warm in here,' Ralph called, yanking the main door open, "'and we can be pretty sure nobody else will come out here today. Too bitter!' It was indeed quite warm in the barn, thanks to Norberta's occasional flamings. Wall-mounted lanterns lit the dirt floor gaily, contrasting against the cold, white light which streamed through the barn's small windows. The beasts in their cages snuffled and barked as the students passed. There are benches over by the larger pens, Rose pointed out. Let's have a seat. I've packed a flask of hot chocolate and some cockroach clusters. Blimey, Rose, Ralph said appreciatively. You think of everything. Rose unpacked her bag, setting out the flask and some cups. Too bad for Zane, she commented. He can't have any, not really being here. I brought my own, Zane said happily, appearing in midair between them. The three students jumped back and then looked up at the suspended shape. Zane floated two feet off the ground, apparently seated on nothing, and happily munching a chunk of sausage on a fork. It's barely breakfast here, you know, and I'm not normally a morning person, but I wouldn't miss this for anything. Good to see you made it back, James. Uh, thanks, James replied, but this is a little weird. You're, uh, off a bit. Zane glanced around, munching the sausage. Ah, yeah. Hey, Raphael, what do we do when the doppelganger insists on levitating? There was a pause as Zane listened. He nodded. Sorry, guys, it's apparently part of the doppelganger's basic intuition. It wants to make the apparition float. It's supposed to be creepier that way. Maybe it'll calm down in a little while if it gets bored. You've harnessed a doppelganger of yourself and are using it to project messages, Rose said incredulously. You didn't explain it to her? Zane asked, looking at James. She's pretty quick, though, isn't she? But that's patently and completely impossible, Rose spluttered. Doppelgangers are just myths. This is worse than the bit about the chaos butterfly. It's a little late to be claiming it won't work, Rosie, Ralph said, munching a cockroach cluster. We can maintain this as long as we need to, Zane said, putting his fork down. It seemed to float alongside him, unsupported. Just so long as you occasionally shoot me with a stinging hex or something. Just to boost the magic a little. Truth is, Franklin's glad for the testing time. So go to it, James. Tell us all about your adventures in the Stone Age. James plunged into his tail, trying to remember everything. He explained his trip through the mirror and where he'd ended up, becoming, against all probability, the mysterious ghost in the plinth, as Ashley Doon had joked. This required a little further explanation, as Zane had never seen the photo of the founders, nor heard of the conspiracies about the shadowy face hidden in the background. James then went on to explain his capture at the hands of Salazar Slytherin, and the subsequent overheard conversation between Slytherin and the Merlin of that time. 
He described the duel on top of the Sylvan Tower and the adventure of finding Slytherin's twin of Merlin's Amsera Serth. Finally, he relayed the words of Rowena Ravenclaw, warning what Merlin's return meant and how he was the ambassador of the gatekeeper. To cement her words, James produced the tabloid clipping Lucy had sent, obviously alluding to the work of the horrible entity. By the time James had finished, the hot chocolate and cockroach clusters were long gone, and the three had had to shoot stinging hexes at Zane nearly a dozen times. Sounds like there was something going on with that mirror back in the Founder's Day, Zane commented, based on the way Hufflepuff and Ravenclaw responded when he found it. It does, Rose agreed. It sounds like they'd known about it, but believed it had been destroyed somehow. Obviously Slytherin staged that so he could hoard the mirror for himself. In the end, though, the other founders got it back, but without the focusing book, apparently, which Slytherin had probably hidden elsewhere. James, you affected history. He couldn't have, Ralph said, frowning. Obviously they'd captured the mirror of Erised back from Slytherin even before James went back in time. It figures pretty importantly in your dad's story, doesn't it, James? James nodded. Yeah, I've heard him talk about it lots of times. He saw his dead parents in that mirror. It really meant a lot to him, almost too much, according to Dumbledore. That is why time-turners have been outlawed, Rose sniffed. Time travel is just too complicated and weird. If James travelled back in time, then I guess it stands to reason that he'd existed in the past all along. He was the reason the mirror was captured back from Slytherin on the night he was found out. That's why his face appeared in the shadow of the Founder's photograph, even before he went back. Ralph screwed his face up in concentration. That doesn't make any sense at all. No, using doppelgangers to relay personal messages doesn't make any sense, Rose replied, glancing aside at the floating figure of Zane. This is just improbable and complicated. But we did learn what we needed to know about Merlin, James said sadly. We can't trust him. He's the ambassador of this gatekeeper creature. We might even have to fight him if we hope to send it back. Not me, Ralph said vigorously. I've got part of his staff as my wand. It'd probably turn on me. Rose shook her head. It doesn't work that way, Ralph. It's yours now. It obeys the wizard that wins it. It may not come to fighting Merlin, Zane said, his expression thoughtful. It sounded like Merlin wasn't really excited about the descent of the gatekeeper, but he knew it was possible. He took the beacon stone from Slytherin so he could control it if it followed him back. Maybe he means to send it back. After all, like I said before, the fact that you three are still breathing means he can't be all evil. He knows you know, especially now. He only has half of the beacon stone, Rose replied. Slytherin had the other half. He meant to pass it on so that whoever was still alive when the curse descended would be able to control it. The fact is that neither Merlin nor this other person can control the gatekeeper completely. Somebody would have to put both rings together to banish the gatekeeper back to the void. Or to unleash it fully on the world, Ralph shuddered. This thing's out there even now. That's what we saw that day in the magic mirror talking to Voldemort's grave statue, isn't it? It's already happening. So maybe Merlin's trying to find the other half of the stone, Zane mused. I just can't buy that he's gone over to the dark side. He wouldn't need to go over, James said suddenly. Ravenclaw said he was dead dangerous. Rose was right. Merlin was just a magical mercenary. He only stopped killing and cursing for hire when he fell in love with the Lady of the Lake, and that turned out completely horrible, and Merlin went mad with revenge. He ended up killing her without even knowing it. After that, he hated the whole world, magic and muggle alike, so he took Slytherin's beacon stone and allowed the descent of the one creature who could end it all. We're fooling ourselves if we don't believe that. Zane shook his head gravely. I hope you're wrong, James, but if you aren't, you three better be very careful. The whole world better be careful, James answered morosely. Not that it'll matter much. There's only one thing we can do to help now. What's that? Rose asked. Watch Merlin, James answered meaningfully, and try to find the two halves of the beacon stone. With the Christmas holiday fast approaching, James found time slipping by in a blur. He had been determined to ask Ralph to take him down to the Slytherin common room so James could confront Albus about the missing invisibility cloak and Marauder's map, but each evening seemed to magically fill up with homework and studying, preparations for the week's defence club meeting, play rehearsals and costume fittings. By the evening of the last Quidditch match of the year, James had still not spoken to Albus. 
he determined he would do it that night after the match. As an early winter dusk descended over the grounds, dark, ominous clouds were pushing in from the east. By the time James and Rose were sidling into their seats in the Gryffindor grandstand, fat snowflakes had begun to fall. The snow made a thick, white curtain, transforming the pitch into a ghostly shadow play. Across the pitch, the Slytherin grandstand was nothing but a tall, grey monolith. The players streaked from their holding pens, foregoing the traditional displays of aerial acrobatics for fear that they might crash into one another in the fog of snow, even before the match began. Far below, barely visible, Gryffindor captain Davindar Das shook hands with Tabitha Corsica, Slytherin's captain. Shortly thereafter, the two captains kicked off, joining their teams in the air. Cabe Ridcully, the match official, released the bludgers and snitch and tossed the quaffle into the waiting team formations. The team sprang into action, and the match was underway. James found it a very difficult match to watch, and not just because of the thick, blinding snowfall. He was still smarting from his failure to make the team for the second year in a row, and especially because he'd simply been too distracted to remember when tryouts were. He cursed himself repeatedly, thinking it should be him out there facing off against Albus as Seeker. It was nothing short of completely humiliating that Albus was showing him up on the broom. Fortunately, being a Gryffindor, James could legitimately cheer for Albus's opponents without it seeming like sour grapes. When Noah swatted a well-placed bludger at Albus, striking him in the back and nearly throwing him off his broom, James leapt to his feet, hooting derisively. A moment later, he felt slightly guilty. Then he remembered that, most likely, Al had nicked the invisibility cloak and Marauder's map and left James to take the blame for it. He hooted some more, shouting for Noah to aim for the head next time. In the end, despite a very closely played match, Gryffindor had won. Tara Umar, Gryffindor's seeker, did a victory lap around the grandstands, snitch held high, while the air rang with cheers and raucous commotion. James clumped down the stairs two at a time, meaning to catch Albus while he was still on the field. He ran out onto the snow-dusted grass, looking left and right for his brother. Finally, he saw him with his broom slung over his shoulder and his head down, apparently in deep conversation with Tabitha Corsica and Philia Goyle. Feeling a mixture of triumphant spite and righteous anger, James charged directly towards them. "'We have to talk, Albus!' he yelled over the noise of the departing crowd. "'Mum sent me a howler that should have been addressed to you, you know!' Albus didn't respond, but Tabitha and Philia looked up. Philia scowled at James but Tabitha's eyes were strangely bright and expressionless. She saw James approaching, but didn't say anything. James stopped a few feet away, his face going red. He had the distinct impression that he was interrupting something and felt infuriatingly awkward. He was supposed to have the upper hand in this situation, wasn't he? He cleared his throat loudly. I hear you, Albus declared without turning around. Tabitha glanced away, out into the strangely silent snowfall. After a moment, she took Albus's broom and walked slowly towards the Slytherin holding pen. Philia followed, throwing a black look back in James's direction. "'Your timing is pretty rotten, James,' Albus said, turning around but not raising his eyes. "'Well, I'm terribly sorry. Shall I make an appointment with your scheduler? I assume Tabby would be in charge of that, yes?' This isn't about me, you prat, Albus said, finally looking at James. Tabitha is going through a very hard time. The loss tonight is sort of the last straw. It meant a lot to her, but I'm sure you couldn't care less about that. You only care when Gryffindors have problems. James narrowed his eyes and spread his hands. What are you talking about, Al? I've hardly seen a speck of you ever since you disappeared into that Slytherin dungeon. So who exactly doesn't care what's going on outside his own house, eh? And not that you'd care, but I have very good reasons for hating that two-faced viper. Where were you last year when she was calling our dad a liar and a fraud? Albus shook his head, not meeting James's eyes. That was then. The point is, James, you're a Gryffindor. You just don't understand the way she grew up and the things she's had to deal with. Of course I don't agree with everything they say down there, but you have to understand the way they've been taught. They have reasons for being angry, especially Tabitha. James could barely listen. He stomped his foot on the field and nearly cursed. It doesn't matter. Albus, they're just using you. How can you not see it? They don't have hearts. They don't care about you, especially that silver-tongued minx. 
You'll regret ever being taken in by them. And don't say I didn't warn you. Albus lowered his brow and looked hard at James. I promise I'll never say you didn't warn me, James. But I'll tell you right now that Tabitha has never talked to me the way you're talking to me right now. Nor has she ever talked about you the way you're talking about her. She's my friend. And to be honest, she needs friends right now. A lot more than I need a brother. James wanted to spit with rage. How could Albus be so completely obtuse? Albus stared at him as if he was simply waiting for James to go away. You took the invisibility cloak and the marauder's map, James finally said, resorting to the one thing he knew he could feel indignant about. Albus's face changed. He looked truly puzzled and a little wary. What are you talking about, James? Don't play all innocent with me, Al. You heard the howler Mum sent me. Rose said everyone in the Great Hall heard it the other day at breakfast. She thinks I stole them just because I borrowed them last year. You have to tell Mum the truth. What truth, James? Albus said, angry and exasperated. You do have them. You must. I didn't take them. Of course you did. Don't lie to me. I can always tell. Well, then maybe you don't know me like you think you do. Don't pin this on me, James. I'm not letting you make me into the bad guy just because you hate that I'm a Slytherin. James spluttered. What? That has nothing to do with it. I just don't want Mum to think it has everything to do with it, Albus yelled, and his voice seemed oddly flat in the thick curtain of snow. The pitch was nearly empty now, except for the two boys. You were so worried about getting into Gryffindor so you could be like dear old Dad and Mum. You tried so hard that you wouldn't let yourself be you. Well, I'm being me, and only me, Albus Severus Potter. Slytherin. You can be jealous all you want, but don't try to ruin it for me. I've been warned that you'll try, but believe me, you'll be sorry if you do. Albus turned and stalked away, disappearing quickly into the dense snow. Ow, wait, James called, starting to follow his brother. He stopped after a few steps. Look, Al, that came out totally wrong. I don't know what to say to all that, but blimey, there's no reason we need to go to war, is there? We can't let something stupid like our houses come between us. James could see that Albus had stopped. He was barely a grey shape in the silent snowfall. You're the one making it a problem, James. Look, James said awkwardly, forget it, all right? But honestly, you really didn't take the map and cloak? Albus's grey shape stood silently, looking back at James. He seemed to shake his head, but James couldn't be sure. Then Albus said, Are you going to go home for the holiday? James blinked. Why wouldn't I? Mum obviously thinks we talk more than we do, Albus said, as if in explanation. She sent me a letter the day you got the howler. The burrow's been sold. The family is moving everything out over the holiday. It's the only time everybody is available to help. Makes for a pretty awful holiday, though. I told Mum I'm staying here. I don't want to see Grandad's world taken apart bit by bit. James felt as if he'd been punched in the stomach. They sold the burrow? The hazy silhouette of Albus seemed to nod this time. Some old couple by the name of Templeton bought it. Not muggles, at least. They're going to tear it down and build a little summer cottage on the property. Mum says at least they're keeping the orchard. There was a long silence between the two brothers. Finally, James said, I didn't know. Mum didn't say anything to me. Like I said, she thought I'd tell you. And I just did. I'm not going home for that. Happy bloody Christmas, eh? James couldn't help chuckling a little hollowly. <laughs> Go talk to Tabitha, Al. We'll figure everything out later. Without a word, Albus turned and vanished completely into the snow. James looked around. The grandstands were almost completely invisible. He seemed to stand in an island of snow-covered grass, surrounded by silently falling flakes. In the darkness, the curtain of snow looked more like ash. James brushed off his shoulders, sighed, and trudged off the pitch. Rose was equally upset about the sale of the burrow, but she seemed to reluctantly understand the necessity of it. Together, she and James determined they would also stay at Hogwarts over the holiday. She even managed to make it seem like it might be a fun adventure. She immediately wrote a short letter to her parents, asking if it would be all right for her to stay over. James added a note to Rose's letter, asking Aunt Hermione to pass the word on to his mum and dad that he had decided to stay over as well, as had Albus. They'll let us, of course, Rose nodded as she sealed the letter. 
They know it'd be awful to see the place broken up over the holiday, especially since we've all spent so many happy Christmases there. Honestly, it'll probably be easier for them to manage if we aren't around anyway. As a distraction, James returned his attention to the threat of the gatekeeper and the mystery of Merlin's involvement. He reminded Ralph and Rose that they were to be looking for the two beacon stones. He knew that they might be very difficult to trace, but as it turned out, the first half of the beacon stone was very easy to locate. James, Ralph and Rose were taking notes in the last Wislet class before Christmas holiday when Merlin knocked peremptorily on the door, interrupting Professor Revalvier. Ah, Headmaster, Revalvier said, smiling. We'll be just speaking of you, in a sense. You do tend to crop up from time to time in the books of the kings, although in a much exaggerated manner, I'm sure. Merlin approached the professor's desk. Indeed, it is that very detail that I've come to discuss, briefly, if I may. The headmaster lowered his voice so that only Revalvier could hear him. The class sensed an unattended moment and immediately fell to hushed conversations and shuffling of papers, preparing to dismiss for lunch. Rose nudged James hard with her elbow. James looked over at her, irritated, and then saw her wide eyes and furtive glance. He followed her gesture. Merlin was standing very close to Professor Revalvier, whose smile had vanished. The headmaster's hand hung at his side, very large and powerful-looking. He didn't have his staff with him, but that didn't mean anything. Merlin seemed able to produce it as necessary, as if he kept it in an invisible cupboard that followed him wherever he went. What? James whispered, not seeing what Rose was hinting at. Then, with a start, he saw the black ring on Merlin's hand. It sparkled dully, as if it reflected light only reluctantly. He shouldn't have been surprised. He'd been there on the night a thousand years ago when Salazar Slytherin had presented the ring to Merlin. And yet seeing it now, glinting evilly on the sorcerer's finger, made it all too real. Up until now, he had been able to convince himself that it had all been a sort of dream. Revalvier nodded curtly, obviously unhappy with what Merlin had said to her. Merlin turned and left the room without sparing a glance at the class. It seems that there is to be a slight change in this holiday's reading assignment, Revalvier said, closing the book on her desk. The headmaster feels it would be more beneficial for us to skip the last century of the Dark Ages and proceed directly to the Renaissance. He may have a point. The Renaissance is, as its name implies, the golden age of wizarding literature. Thus, you may disregard the rest of the current chapter in your textbooks and omit Hrung Hrindvein from your holiday reading assignment. Perhaps you'll choose to spend that time getting an early start on Waddlejav's Book of Nameless Tales. If so, do keep a written record of the actual story names, since they will surely change by the time we reconvene. As the class clambered towards the door, Rose pushed in between James and Ralph. Did you see it? she whispered. Yeah, Ralph replied. I guess there's no doubt about Merlin and this gatekeeper thing any more, is there? Why do you suppose he doesn't want us reading Crindvane's Chronicles? It's obvious, James said in a low voice. He knows there are things in there about him. He's trying to manage everybody's perceptions about the kind of wizard he is. Revalvier can tell us all she wants about how those histories are exaggerated into legends, but if people keep reading about how Merlin buried this army and flooded that camp and whatever else, there are bound to be people who start to question him. Like Ravenclaw said, he has a way of entrancing people who want to trust him. He needs to make sure everyone keeps wanting to think he's all noble and good. As the three crossed the library, Ralph angled into a narrow aisle, turning to face James and Rose. So, if Merlin has the stone, does that mean we're all done for? Not exactly, Rose said. Remember, there were two rings, each with half of the beacon stone. Whoever has the other ring also has some influence over the gatekeeper. As long as Merlin doesn't have both halves, he can't fully control it. So our only hope is that the other half of the stone is in the right hands, James replied. As long as one keeper of the stone is trying to hold the gatekeeper back, its power will be limited. Rose looked worried. For a while, yes. I hadn't had a chance to tell you what I've learned since we last talked about it. According to all the legends, once the gatekeeper finds a human host, a host who was willingly killed to prove their worthiness, the stones won't influence it at all any more. The beacon stone is the gatekeeper's foothold in this world, but only until it becomes one with its human host. When that happens, it won't need the stones. Nothing will be able to send it back to the void. 
When did you read this? Ralph asked, his face going pale. Last night. I've been studying everything I can find about the curse of the gatekeeper. I compared notes with Cousin Lucy by Owl, and she's right. A lot of it is pretty horrible and fantastic, but all the writings agree on the main details. The beacon stone summons the gatekeeper when the bearer suspends in the void for a long enough time. The gatekeeper follows the bearer of the stone into our world, and the bearer becomes its ambassador. The ambassador can use the beacon stone to send the gatekeeper back to the void, but only as long as the gatekeeper hasn't entered its human host. Once that happens, the beacon stone is useless and the curse of the gatekeeper is unleashed on the earth. When that happens, nothing can stop it. James frowned, trying to examine the legend from every angle. So, since the stone's been split in two, neither of the bearers can send it back even if they wanted to. But what does the gatekeeper want? Ralph asked Rose. Why does it want to destroy everything? Rose's face had also gone pale. It's really very simple. It hates us because we aren't it. It has always believed it was the only living thing. Now that it has discovered the world of humans, it refuses to share existence with us. Also, even more awful, it feeds on despair and agony, like the world's hungriest and most powerful Dementor. But where Dementors only call up your own memories of the worst things that have ever happened to you, the gatekeeper creates all new feelings. It can manipulate a person's mind at the most basic level, creating raw, sourceless panic and terror. That's what we read about in the tabloid article Lucy sent us. It was trying to figure those humans out, trying to work out the best way to produce what it hungers for. For now, it can only affect a few humans at once. But once it connects with its human host and becomes a part of the community of mankind, it'll be able to affect thousands and millions at once. It'll just suck the terror out of everyone until there's nothing left of them, then leave them like husks and move on. It'll move over the earth doing that until there's no one left at all. No one but the host, Ralph squeaked. Not even the host, Rose whispered. In the end, it'll turn on them too. It wishes to be entirely alone. In the end, it'll break its own tool. The scariest thing is that the host may even know it. The host may be so full of pain and sadness and hate that they won't care. They may even wish for it. Something had pricked James's memory. Rose saw it on his face. What, James? You look like you just swallowed a hippogriff egg. My dream, James replied, touching his forehead. What you're saying sounds a lot like the words of the voice in my dream. There's this black-robed figure standing in the corner, talking all the time, telling the person in my dream that justice will be served, and the day of balance is coming, and it always says that the person in my dream is to be the hand that brings it about if they're willing, if they're up to the task that will prove their worth. And the person in my dream does seem to be willing. They seem to be very sad and very angry, all at the same time. It's as if they felt a loss so great that it makes the whole world meaningless. Worse, that the whole world shouldn't even exist anymore because it's the world their tragedy happened in. It's a very vengeful, hateful, hopeless feeling, but mostly it's just sad. So sad that it's like a black wall that goes on forever with no gate or corners or top to climb over. Maybe the person in your dream is meant to be the host of the gatekeeper, Ralph said, his eyes wide. It almost sounds like Merlin, doesn't it? I mean, he ended up killing the woman he loved most in all the world. You said he left his own time because he couldn't bear to live in it anymore, knowing what he'd done, right? Maybe coming to this time isn't any better for him. Maybe he'd be happy to let the gatekeeper destroy everything and everyone, even himself. Rose nodded slowly. It does certainly sound like what he might be feeling. The gatekeeper's host doesn't have to be its ambassador, but there's nothing that says it couldn't. James was thinking hard, trying to remember his dreams. He shook his head. It's not Merlin, though, in my dream. I've never seen the person's face, but I'm sure it isn't him. It just feels all wrong. It's someone younger and different. Definitely not Merlin. Rose gasped and covered her mouth with both hands, her eyes going wide. Ralph jumped at her sudden movement. What? he exclaimed. The bloodline, Rose said in a very high voice. They even mentioned it in that scene in the mirror. 
at Tom Riddle's grave. Don't you remember? The gatekeeper went looking for the best host it could find and sensed Voldemort's body. It knows almost nothing about humans, so it didn't realize Voldemort was dead until it got there. Then it made the statue talk, somehow tapping into the ghost of Voldemort. The statue told the gatekeeper that there was another host for it, one with Voldemort's blood in its veins. Remember? It's obvious. The gatekeeper's host is to be the bloodline of Voldemort. But who is it? Ralph asked. We don't know that, so we're right back where we started. We don't know it yet, Rose said, smiling a little nervously. But we have a way of finding out. She looked at James. James pressed his lips together and sighed. <sighs> My phantom scar. But we don't even know where it's coming from, or if we can trust it. Rose shrugged. It's all we have. All we can do is hope it's not a trick of some kind. Pay attention to your dreams, James. They're probably our only clue. Maybe you'll finally get a good look at whoever it is, and we'll learn who the bloodline is. And who the mysterious speaking voice is, too, Ralph added meaningfully. Yes, that too, Rose agreed. Good point, Ralph. Maybe it's Merlin himself, don't you think? Ralph heaved a great sigh. <sighs> I don't know. I hope not. But the alternative could be worse, couldn't it? I mean, a known enemy is better than an unknown one, right? After lunch, James hurried across the castle to the amphitheatre, where Muggle Studies would be meeting for the rest of the term. When he got to the archway leading outside to the terraced seating, he was quite surprised to feel warm air, despite the snowflakes which fell like a curtain over the distant hills. Damien Damascus met James near the base of the stage. Fortunately, he said, smiling, Curry isn't such a slave to doing things like the moguls that she isn't willing to magic a little atmosphere for us to work in. Nice, eh? Now I just have to get the hang of this thing. He held up a hammer and studied it at arm's length. It's a bit brutish, don't you think? The atmosphere around the stage was indeed strangely pleasant. James took off his cloak and flung it over a seat in the front row. He looked up, smiling in wonderment. The sky was thick with grey clouds and drifting, skirling snowflakes, but the snow seemed to vanish as it fell into the air over the amphitheatre. The light near the stage even seemed brighter, as if an errant sunbeam had simply bypassed the cloud cover and jumped directly into the bowl of the amphitheatre. James remembered his technomancy classes from last year and knew that somewhere, strangely, a small, dark pocket of snow was falling on a warm, sunny hillside. Ah, James! Curry cried, walking briskly across the stage. My little Treus, you're here after all. I trust you have your script. Do join us. We're simply blocking out scenes for now, but it helps to have you read through the lines for timing purposes. As James read aloud through his lines and walked through Act One with the rest of the actors, he found he was truly enjoying himself, despite his earlier worries about Merlin and the gatekeeper. It felt a little strange acting out the parts amidst the clatter and shouts of Jason Smith's hard-working stage crew. As James read through a scripted conversation with Noah Metzger as Donovan, Damien and three other crew members were raising a gigantic wooden mock-up of a castle wall, complete with a rampart, a turret, and a balcony. Their shouts and grunts of effort nearly drowned out James and Noah's words. As they moved over the stage, Curry followed them with a roll of thick yellow tape. Occasionally, she'd move James by the shoulders, positioning him on the stage. Hit this mark when you read that line, she'd instruct him, bending down to tape an X on the stage floor. We'll arrange a spotlight for this position. Mr. Metzger, do go ahead and make sure you don't turn your back on the audience. But James is over there, Noah said, gesturing. I'm supposed to be talking to him, aren't I? "'You're an actor, Mr. Metzger,' Curry trilled. "'You're speaking to the audience first and foremost.' Noah frowned and looked out over the mostly empty seats. "'But they aren't the ones threatening to run off with Astra, are they?' Curry sighed. "'Just read the lines, Mr. Metzger. We'll work out who's running off with whom later.' As they prepared to read through Act Two, James realised he'd been feeling a dull throb in his forehead. He reminded himself not to rub it, but it was definitely getting worse. He glanced out over the amphitheatre seating, squinting through the glare of the spotlights. There, sitting near the back, almost lost in the shadows, was Merlin. James couldn't make out his face, but he could easily see the large man's shape. Merlin seemed to realise James was looking at him. 
He raised a hand and tapped his forehead slowly, as if he were making a sign. James's eyes widened, and then, suddenly, his forehead burned. It was as if a hot poker had been pressed to it. James squeezed his eyes shut, turning away. He bumped into someone, nearly knocking them over. "'James, what is it?' Curry called out. "'You nearly knocked your leading lady off the stage!' James looked up, the pain in his forehead receding again. Petra was looking at him with a concerned expression. "'Are you all right, James?' "'It's just the lights,' James lied. "'They're pretty hot. I'm fine now.' He tried to grin and shrug. Curry turned and began calling for the rest of the performers for the second act. Petra moved close to James and lowered her voice. "'I know what you mean about the lights,' she said, smiling. "'These muggle electric spotlights are like death rays, aren't they? Too bad we didn't have one to use with the walk hit last year.' James grinned and flushed. "'Yeah,' he said, and then didn't know what else to say. Uh, "'Do you know all your lines yet?' "'Not at all,' Petra admitted. "'Frankly, I feel a little bad about getting the role.' Poor Josephina's been forced to work in the costume department. She can't sew at all, either. They just have her ripping seams when the others make mistakes. I hear the vertigo hex is still so strong that she can't even climb stairs. She's moved into the hospital wing until they can figure out a way to get her up to her dorm. Petra's voice sounded concerned, but James saw that she was smiling a little. He realized it was a little funny. Josephina had been rather insufferable about getting the part of Astra, and James felt strongly that Petra would play the part better anyway. He decided to say so to Petra. It is a shame about Josephina, I suppose, he said, but I'm really glad you got the part. I'd much rather play Treus for you than for her. Places, everyone, Curry called. Mr. Potter, Miss Morganston, this way, please. Petra glanced away at the sound of Curry's voice. Come, James, she said, striding away. Our public awaits. James felt himself blush. He watched Petra walk across the stage and then ran to catch up. "'Are you sure you don't want to come to Dad's flat with me for the holidays?' Ralph asked James and Rose as the three lurked around the halls late on Saturday morning. "'I came to your Christmas last year, so it'd be a fair trade. Dad's going to cook a goose and everything. Of course, there won't be any singing elf heads or winkles and augers or anything.' That's all right, Ralph, James answered. I rather prefer a Christmas without singing elf heads, actually. But really, I think it's best for us to stay here. It's all right not to have magic for Christmas. There's no shame in your father being a squib, Rose said, putting a hand on Ralph's shoulder, which was rather a reach for her. He's quite an important man in the wizarding world these days. Head of security and precautionary interference for Hogwarts, Diagon Alley, even Gringotts Bank, isn't he? "'Nobody else but him could do that, since nobody else understands both muggle electronics and magic like he does.' "'Yeah, I know,' Ralph said, grinning sheepishly. "'And he's really good at it. He's helping the Ministry develop a new kind of disillusionment charm that only works on muggle global positioning devices. I mean, the greatest flaw in the regular disillusionment charm is that a GPS device doesn't have a brain to fool. He's calling the new spell an... Artificial Stupidity X. He used to work on artificial intelligence software, so he says this is the next logical step. Once the X is in place, he makes any muggle positioning device see detours, roadblocks, heavy traffic, even cyclones and floods around any magical place. That way, both the muggles and their technology will find those magical places invisible. That's brilliant, Rose said. I mean, older generations of wizards never could have predicted the development of things like satellites and GPS devices and game decks with online chat capability. The wizarding world really needs a man like your dad to develop magical protections against things like that. He really was a godsend. Still, Ralph said, his face falling a little. Dad has taken his old name again, Doloff. He says he isn't going to let the selfishness of his father rob him of his magical heritage. But I know a little bit about that heritage, and it isn't all that great. Your father's right, Rose said firmly. You aren't responsible for anything your distant relatives did. I think it's very cool that your dad is changing the way people see the name Doloff. Ralph shrugged. He's not changing it for everyone. Lots of people still hate the Doloff name. Some of them are right here in school. Everybody knows what happened here. I mean, my uncle killed Ted Lupin's dad right downstairs. The Doloff name is the name of murderers and traitors. It was awful that some of your family were so bad in the past, Rose replied. 
But that was a long time ago. People shouldn't blame you for that. Ralph sighed. I suppose not, but they do. And honestly, I can't blame them. It's why I still go by the name Deedle. I hate my own grandparents, even though they're long dead. Dad remembers them, and he wants to believe they weren't as bad as they seem. He's sort of trapped between loving them and hating them. But what kind of parents abandon their kids because he's different? What kind of people make that kid swear to never seek them out, or even talk about them? Rose didn't have an answer to that. The three wandered the halls aimlessly, passing tall windows, moving in and out of pools of cold winter sunlight. After a few minutes, James told Ralph and Rose about his conversation with Albus after the last Quidditch match. He says he didn't take the invisibility cloak in the Marauder's map, Rose said. Do you believe him? James shrugged. I don't know. He certainly seemed honest about it. But he was really moody. Apparently he's pretty tight with Tabitha and her Fang and Talon's cronies, and they've been telling him that I'm jealous of him, that I'm going to mess things up for him somehow. And are you? Ralph asked. What? James replied. Oh, yeah, I keep forgetting you're a Slytherin too. No, Ralph, I'm not jealous of Al, and I'm not going to try and sabotage him. I just don't want him to fall for any of Tabitha's lies. She's already got him convinced that she needs him because she's going through some mysterious personal tragedy. Rose arched her eyebrows. Really? What tragedy? I don't know. She was all upset after the match, and not just because they lost. She has been pretty ugly around the common room lately, Ralph said. She's not been her normal, polite ice queen self at all. She's snapping at people a lot and stalking around, or sitting all by herself in a corner, mooning over parchments and books. I've even seen her send Philia and Tom Squalus away. But she doesn't send Albus away. It looks a little odd, really. I mean, she's a seventh year and a foot taller than him. Not a likely pair, if you ask me. Curious, Rose said, narrowing her eyes. I wonder what's going on with her. But what about the cloak and the map? Ralph asked. If Albus really doesn't have them, and you don't have them, James, then who does? James slumped. <sighs> I don't know. Honestly, I don't care. Maybe Dad misplaced them somehow. Maybe Creature hid them away in his cupboard. He used to do that all the time in Grimmauld Place with all old Mrs. Black stuff. You should tell your mum to check there, Rose said. It's not my problem, Rose, James snapped. It's your problem if she keeps thinking you stole them, Rose replied smoothly. But whatever suits you, maybe you prefer letting everyone think you're a thief. The three stood by a window overlooking the courtyard. At the bottom of the main steps, Hagrid was loading trunks and bags onto a carriage, preparing to transport a group of students to the Hogwarts Express for their trip home. James sighed. I'd better go and pack, Ralph said. Dad's picking me up at the station tonight. We're spending the night in Oxmead so we can meet with some store owners there, and then we're going back to London tomorrow. Sounds fun, Ralphinator, James said, trying to buck up a bit. Have a good holiday. Stay out of the Shrieking Shack. Count on it, Ralph agreed. I avoid anything with the word shrieking in it. Chapter 13 Christmas at Hogwarts By the next day, the school had emptied almost entirely. The corridors seemed eerily dark and silent, with most of the classrooms shut and locked. As James made his way to breakfast on Sunday morning, he saw Cedric Diggory's ghost at the end of a long hall. He seemed to be in conversation with the Grey Lady. Both were floating slowly down the hall away from him. James decided not to interrupt them. Was it possible that Cedric fancied the Grey Lady? She was pretty enough, in a ghostly way, and she didn't appear to be much older than Cedric in human terms. In another sense, though, she was several centuries older than Cedric. But maybe that didn't matter in the ghostly realm. Either way, it was far too bizarre for James to think about. He continued on his way to breakfast, shaking his head. In the great hall, Rose was sitting at the Slytherin table with Albus. As James joined them, he heard them talking about the sale of the burrow. It was a thoroughly depressing conversation, and James stayed out of it. Later, he suggested that the three of them go out and build snowmen in the courtyard. This was heartily agreed to, and the three spent the noon hours happily laughing and romping in the new snow. They succeeded in building a rather ridiculously large snowman, using their wands to levitate the enormous snowballs into position, since they were far too heavy to lift. 
James and Rose attempted to levitate Albus himself up to the snowman's head to attach the carrot nose, but they were unable to keep him upright. Albus rolled over in the air until he was floating upside down. His hat fell off and plopped into the snow twelve feet below. Don't drop me! he yelled, flapping his arms like an awkward bird. On the ground, wands in hand, Rose and James laughed so hard that tears squeezed from their eyes and rolled down their red cheeks. The carrot owl! Rose cried breathlessly. Stick it in! What's the matter? Can't you fly? Give me a broom and I'll fly, Albus griped, kicking his legs to turn himself upright again. Next time you get carrot duty, Rosie. The three finally blundered inside as the sun lowered towards the horizon in a blaze of orange and pink. They left their snowy cloaks, hats and gloves in a dripping trail as they made their way to the great hall for cocos and afternoon snacks. James was glad of the break and the time to spend as a family. He purposely avoided talking about Merlin or the missing invisibility cloak and Marauder's map. We should do this again next year, Rose said, smiling over her cocoa, her cheeks red. It's sort of fun having the place to ourselves. Next year we can get Hugo and Lucy and everybody else to stay with us. What about Louis? Albus asked, smiling crookedly. He can stay too, I suppose. Just so long as he doesn't talk, Rose said magnanimously. He probably wouldn't want to stay, James commented. He went home this year with Victoire, you know. Of course, she wants to see Ted. Louis is just along for the ride. Are they spending all their time out of the burrow packing? Rose asked. Albus shrugged morosely. Packing's all finished. Grandma Weasley managed that all by herself. I mean, how hard is packing for a witch like her? The big job is dividing everything up. Grandma and Grandad had an awful lot of stuff. And then there's the ghoul to take care of. Who's going to get that? Rose asked, frowning a little distastefully. It better not end up in my mum and dad's attic. I bet it does, James replied, stirring his cocoa. In fact, I bet your parents just move it into your room while you're at school. After all, it still looks quite a bit like Uncle Ron when he was our age. They may even like it better than you. Rose rolled her eyes. You'll have to try harder than that to get a rise out of me, James Potter. I bet it's in your room even now, Albus said thoughtfully, wearing your makeup and trying on your knickers. Rose nearly knocked her cocoa over, lunging for Albus. James and Albus hooted laughter, earning an annoyed look from the house-elf cleaning a nearby window. Time crept by surprisingly slowly as Christmas approached. James, Rose and Albus spent the time playing winkles and augers in each other's common rooms, exploring the snow-covered grounds and visiting Hagrid in his hut. Meals were taken in the company of the few remaining students and teachers, among whom were Fira Hutchins, Hugo Paulson, and, to James's surprise, Josephina Bartlett, whose vertigo was only slightly better. She could manage sitting on a bench at the Ravenclaw table, although if she happened to drop a bread crust or a fork, she was completely unable to bend over to retrieve it. James felt a little sorry for her, but then he saw her yelling tersely at one of the house-elves to retrieve a new fork for her, and determined that her arrogance and general insufferability had not been greatly affected by her predicament. On Christmas morning, James was rather shocked to be awakened by the smell of fresh kippers and a deep bullfrog voice. A merry Christmas to you, Master James, the voice said. Lays there like a stone, he does. Like his breakfast will stay hot by pure and simple magic until he decides he's ready to eat it, which it will, of course, but only because Creature works so hard day and night to hone the best warming charms for it. <gasps> Creature? James asked blearily, rubbing his eyes and sitting up. A tray of immaculately prepared breakfast had been laid over his legs. A black rose and a candy cane protruded from a tiny alabaster vase in the corner of the tray. What are you doing here? Sent by your dear mum, Master James, Creature said, bowing low. He was standing at the end of James's bed, dressed only in his tea towel, despite the cold of the room. Already served Christmas breakfasts to Master Albus and Mistress Rose. Your presents await you below. 
James, Albus called from the common room stairs. Come on! Creature won't let us unwrap anything until we're all together. Orders from Mum, of course. So eat up already! James bolted a few bites of the kippers and drank his pumpkin juice, thanked Creature, then flung himself out of bed. Rose and Albus were seated by the fire below, drinking tea and wearing green hats with jingle bells on the tips. Rose grinned and shook her head, wringing the tassels. Festive, eh? Hey? They came from my mum. She knew we'd not have decorated or anything. Put yours on. She tossed one of the hats to James. He smiled and jammed it onto his head. Creature came slowly down the stairs. He had also donned one of the hats, although he wore it like it weighed a hundred pounds. The hat covered his eyes. He pushed it up with a thumb, peering at James, Rose, and Albus with one eye. All present and accounted for, he said to himself. Merry Christmas, masters and mistress. He snapped his fingers. There was a change in the light of the room, and James sensed that a sort of protective field had been removed from the stack of presents. Albus whooped and leapt off the couch, attacking the biggest one with his name on it. James grinned happily and joined in. Creature remained with the three until all the presents were unwrapped. Then, dutifully, he collected all the cast-off wrapping paper and ribbons. He rolled the debris up, compressing it into a remarkably dense, colourful ball, and then strangely stuffed it inside his green-tasseled hat. He put the hat back on his head while Rose struggled not to giggle at the silliness of it. Creature has been asked to inform you that your parents will speak to you tonight via flu network, the elf warbled. Creature takes his leave of you now, masters and mistress. Do have a pleasant Christmas. You too, Creature, Rose said, around a mouthful of gingerbread witch. Indeed, Creature replied. He raised a spindly arm and snapped his fingers. The elf vanished in a puff of greenish smoke. Always like that elf, Albus proclaimed. Knows how to keep it business like he does. No beating about the bush. Rose said, I feel a little sorry for him. What does he get for Christmas? Oh, Rose, you're as bad as your mum, James replied. Two Christmases ago, mum and dad tried to give Creature a Christmas present. It was just a little basket with a pillow in it for him to sleep on. They bought it at a muggle pet store because the little brute refuses to sleep in a regular bed. He didn't want to accept it, though, and when they insisted he keep it, he wouldn't even use it like he was supposed to. He's been using it ever since as a basket for carrying around the laundry. Honestly, Rose, Albus agreed, Creature isn't made to be happy. We try, we really do, especially Dad. Creature and him have a sort of history. I know, Rose said. He just seems so miserable. Ha! <laughs> James exclaimed. This is ecstatic by Creature's standards. I've heard about what he was like when Dad first inherited him. Creature sent him a box of maggots for a Christmas present. He didn't, Rose gasped, covering her mouth. Albus pulled a homemade green and silver scarf out of one of his unwrapped boxes. He threw it around his neck. Trust us, Rosie, this is Creature happy. Otherwise we'd have got leeches for breakfast instead of kippers. That afternoon, Albus took James and Rose down to the cellars and showed them the Slytherin's spellcasting range. Just as Albus had described, the room was long and low with clockwork dummies installed against the far wall. Albus illustrated how the range worked by whipping out his wand and shooting a stinging hex at one of the dummies. It lifted its wooden arms and shook them in a parody of pain, as if it were being peppered with bee stings. Albus repeated the spell, laughing. James laughed as well, but a little nervously. Rose didn't laugh at all. She looked distastefully at Albus and crossed her arms. Christmas dinner in the Great Hall was as resplendent as any dinner James had ever attended, despite the fact that the room was only a fifth full. Professors Knossus Shirt and Lucia Heretofore, the new potions teacher and head of Slytherin House, were seated at the table on the dais. Hagrid sat between them, talking loudly and looking like what he was, a half-giant between two rather slight people. Heretofore looked obviously disgusted by Hagrid, although she marked it behind a thin smile. To James's surprise, Petra Morganston was seated in the middle of the Gryffindor table, smiling slightly as Hagrid attempted to lead his fellow professors in a round of Christmas carols. "'I didn't know you were here for Christmas,' James said, sitting down at the table across from Petra. Yeah, Rose agreed. Where have you been? 
I went down to Hogsmeade for a few days, Petra answered. Did a little shopping. No point in moping around here all holiday. Why didn't you go home for Christmas? Rose asked. Petra shrugged, still smiling up at the dais. No point, really. I already got my present, didn't I? James raised his eyebrows. You mean that box that came by Ministry Owl last month? We were all wondering about that. It came from your dad? Petra nodded and sipped her butterbeer. Madame Rosemurta had this ship from the three broomsticks for tonight. Did you know that? I talked to her yesterday. So what did you get for Christmas? Albus asked. I got a new scarf, a box of sweets, and a remember-all. Honestly, Mum should have given the remember-all to James so we could keep track of Quidditch tryouts. He grinned at James. Petra looked at Albus, still smiling. It was just some stuff. It wouldn't mean much to anyone but me. So that's why you ran off to open it by yourself, Albus commented. Rose kicked him under the table. Petra shrugged. It's nice to have some time by ourselves, isn't it? I'm taking the time to learn my lines. Would you like to rehearse a little, James? Professor Curry would probably put us in her will if we came back from Christmas knowing all of our lines. Sure, James said, a little too enthusiastically. He modulated his tone and added, I mean, whatever, if you want to. I don't have much else planned. You don't have anything else planned, Albus smirked. What, you have an interview with the Minister of Magic we don't know about? Ow! And Rose, you can stop kicking me under the table! Petra grinned at Albus, then James. I'll see you later in the common room. Bring your script and we'll read through it, all right? James nodded, not trusting himself to speak. Petra left, walking slowly, thoughtfully. James is in love with his leading lady, Albus mocked, making kissing noises. I'm not in love with her, you prat, James scowled, pretending it was the most ridiculous thing he'd ever heard. Oh, James, you're not fooling anyone, Rose said, shaking her head. It's obvious. It's kind of cute, actually. Shut up, James said, blushing furiously. Just because I have to pretend to be in love with her for the play doesn't mean it's happened for real. Maybe I'm just a very good actor. Rose tried to mask a grin. Well, then, you really are getting into your role, aren't you? I had no idea you were so dedicated to the craft. It's a good thing you aren't scripted to murder anyone. James rolled his eyes dramatically. You're both completely daft. Think whatever you want. Albus studied James for a moment and then made more kissing noises at him. Oh, Petra, I'm just a boy, but you make me feel like such a man. James grabbed a roll and hurled it at Albus, who collapsed in delighted laughter. When James returned to the common room a little while later, leaving Rose and Albus singing Christmas carols with Hagrid in the Great Hall, he was pleased and a bit flustered to find Petra sitting in a chair near the fire, script in hand. He ran up the steps to his dormitory, retrieved his own copy of the script from his satchel, and tramped back downstairs again, telling himself the entire time not to be a fool, that Rose and Albus certainly couldn't be right about his falling in love with Petra, and most of all, that even if it was true, it was preposterous to think she could ever return those feelings. She was nearly five years older than James, smart as could be, and totally stunning. Girls like Petra simply did not fancy gawky younger boys, who still hadn't managed the knack of an anti-pimple charm. James's face was flushed by the time he rejoined Petra, popping onto a nearby couch. "'Alas, my dear Treus,' Petra quoted, turning a page in her script, "'thou doth set mine heart aflutter. Shall we start from the top?' James began to answer, but his voice came out as a squeak. He cleared his throat. Mm, "'Yeah, sure. I'll read whoever you're talking to, and you can do the same for me. I can do a pretty good Donovan,' Petra agreed. "'I even consider trying out for the part.' And I suppose Noah could have played Astra, James grinned. Petra nodded. A century ago, men often played the roles of women in these kinds of plays. Some places didn't even allow women to act at all. What goes around comes around, as they say. Besides, sometimes I think it'd be fun to act the part of the evil rogue with the awesome powers. Women are always the pawns in these stories. James thought she was possibly the prettiest pawn he'd ever seen, but he determined not to say it. He cleared his throat again and began to read aloud. Two hours later, once they'd finished the read-through, James noticed that Albus and Rose had entered the common room. They were seated at a rear table with Hugo Paulson, who was teaching Albus some Winkles and Augers techniques. 
James caught Rose looking at him furtively, a small smile on her lips. Hey, James, Albus called, pocketing his wand. Remember we're supposed to be talking to Mum and Dad via flu network tonight? Or should I tell them you have more pressing matters to attend to? James glared at Albus, who simply grinned back at him. It's fine, James, Petra sighed, closing her script. I've had enough of this for tonight anyway. I'm going to head upstairs and write some Christmas letters. Thanks for the help. It was fun, James agreed. See you around, Petra. As James watched Petra cross the room to the girls' dormitory stairs, Rose joined him on the couch. You really should be careful, James, she said in a quiet voice. James barely heard her. What do you mean? I mean, Petra's not in a position to respond the way you'd like her to. I don't know what you're talking about, James insisted, finally turning around and closing his script. We were just rehearsing. It isn't just the age difference, you know. That's not that big a deal in the long run. You need to realise that Petra's heart is obviously elsewhere. James furrowed his brow and looked at Rose. What's that mean? Well, it's obvious, James, Rose said, lowering her voice even further. Petra didn't go down to Hogsmeade to do any shopping, no matter what she said. She was hoping to catch Ted before he left for the burrow. Why would she do that? James asked, blinking. Rose rolled her eyes and shook her head. She's still in love with him, you prat. She's broken-hearted that he left her for Victoire. But Noah said that she never really loved him, James said, frowning. He said she knew all along that he wasn't a good match for her. She may say that, but the heart does what it wants, doesn't it? She loves Ted, it's obvious. I just don't want you to do or say anything that could ruin your friendship with her. I don't want to see you get hurt. James slumped back against the couch. What do you think I am, Rose? A complete idiot. Even if what you say is true, I'd never say anything about it to Petra. Sorry, James. Unrequited love is as poison to the soul, isn't it? Ha ha, James replied crossly. That's Treus's line in Act Two. You're very funny. Look, Albus yelled, jumping up from the table in the corner. The Great! Hi, Dad! Happy Christmas! Happy Christmas to you, son, Harry Potter's face grinned from the coals of the fireplace. Hi, Uncle Harry, Rose chimed, climbing off the couch to kneel in front of the grate. How's everything going at the burrow? Harry seemed to shrug. As well as can be expected, I suppose. It's not the way any of us would prefer to spend Christmas, but today was all right. Lily is staying with Andromeda Tonks, and everyone here sends their love. Creature says you all looked well enough. Did you like your presents? I love the scarf. Albus replied, and the remember all, and the sweets were great too. Don't tell me you ate them already, son. I did, but don't tell mum. I'm a growing boy, dad. Got to keep bulked up for Quidditch. Albus and Harry spent a few minutes discussing the Quidditch season, and Harry congratulated Albus on making Slytherin Seeker, even though he admitted he was glad Gryffindor had so far edged them out of the tournament. There's a whole line of people who want to say hi, Harry said. Quit pushing, Hermione. Harry's face sank out of the coals and was replaced a moment later by Hermione's distinctive features and thick hair. Happy Christmas, Rosie, she cried. And you too, James and Albus. Are you all doing well? Well enough, James said. It's been a mad year so far. It's a lot to explain. Rose grinned at her mother. James is right. We have an awful lot to tell you about. Our first week here, Merlin took us for a hundred kilometre walk through the woods to go and get this magical box of all his stuff. And just a minute, Rosie, Hermione said. Ron, I'll ask in a minute. And do you really want to eat that biscuit? How many have you had? Hermione's face vanished from the grate. A second later, Ron's grin surfaced. Hey, Rosie, are these two taking good care of you? Because if they aren't... Hi, Uncle Ron, Albus said happily. Ron had always been Albus's favourite. I'm a Slytherin. Hi, Dad, Rose grinned. How's Hugo? Everyone's fine here, considering everything, Ron said, his grin fading. Ted and Charlie got in a fight over something Victoire said, although nobody seems at all that sure what it was. George drank a little too much fire whiskey, tripped over the ghoul and broke his left pinky finger on some trunks. And your grandmother is either yelling at everybody or breaking down in tears. It's a glorious Christmas all round. Come to think of it, do you blokes have a spare bed there? I think I'd even be willing to bunk out with you in the Slytherin quarters, Al. Yeah, Albus agreed instantly. Come on over by flu. You can have Ralph's bed. From behind Ron, Aunt Fleur's voice said, You're not going anywhere, Ron Weasley. 
It was a joke, Fleur. Bloody hell! Ron's face sank out of the coals. There seemed to be some commotion. Then Ginny appeared. Hi, boys. Hi, Rose. Happy Christmas, she said, smiling. What's going on over there, Mum? Albus asked. Sounds like quite a ruckus. Ginny sighed. Ah, you three are lucky you aren't here. It's just not a very nice way to spend Christmas. Fortunately, most of everything is packed and moved out. We saved the beds for last so we can spend the night, but tomorrow morning we'll take them away too. How are the three of you doing? James, Rose and Albus told Ginny they were doing fine. Rose asked, So what's it like? I can't bear to think of the burrow all empty. What's Grandmother going to do? It's fine, actually, Ginny said, but not very convincingly. I mean, yes, it's sad. Most of us have been coming here all our lives. But it's for the best, really. Everybody knows that. Grandma will be staying with us for the time being. We have plenty of room, especially now that you two are out of the house. She indicated James and Albus with her eyes. But still, your father packed up Grandad's garage all by himself. I couldn't bear to look at it all. He was very strong about it, though. I'm... I'm very proud of him. Ginny stopped abruptly. She sniffed and looked down for a moment. Then, with a different expression, she looked up again. How Slytherin treating you, Albus? Do they feed you well? Albus laughed. Mum! We all eat together in the Great Hall. You know that. It isn't like Slytherins have a secret dining room or anything. Well, I was never in the Slytherin dungeons, you know. I didn't know they had a spell-casting range either. But they're taking good care of you. Sure, Mum, Albus said, smiling. I like it there. And what about you, James? Ginny asked, turning to her oldest son. I'm fine, James answered blandly, not quite looking at his mum. I got your howler, sort of. I'm sorry, James, Ginny said. I was very angry when I sent that. There was more to it than just the missing cloak and map. I know that now. This is a very stressful time for us all here. It just wasn't a good time to pull something like that again. I didn't take the mum. James said suddenly, desperately wanting his mum to believe him. I thought Albus must have done it, but he says he didn't take them either. Ginny studied James's face for a long moment. Well, if neither of you took them, where have they gone? She asked reasonably. How should I know? James answered, a little mollified. Maybe Creature hid them away in his cupboard. You know how he used to do that with old Mrs. Black's things when he thought they needed protecting? Have you checked his cupboard? Ginny exhaled wearily. No, honestly, it didn't occur to me. I hope you are right, James. Are you absolutely sure you're telling me the truth, son? Yes, Mum, I promise. I didn't touch them this time. And you, Albus? You don't know anything about it? Albus shrugged. First I heard about it was when James's howler went off at breakfast. Then James nearly tackled me after the last Quidditch match, accusing me of setting him up. That's all I know about it, Mum. Ginny shook her head dismissively. Then I'm sure they'll turn up. I'll ask Creature about it. Maybe he took your doll, too, James. He may have them all together down there in his little collection. My doll? James asked. Yes, Ginny answered, distracted by something going on elsewhere in the burrow. The little James doll you gave me last year at the end of school. It went missing at the same time as the cloak and map, but I just assumed I'd misplaced it. I wasn't as worried about that. I mean, why would you sneak your doll back to school with you? Rose had turned to look at James, her eyebrows raised in alarm. Oh, and James, Ginny said, interrupting herself. Did you talk to Zane? James blinked, his thoughts racing. What? Zane? No, not lately. He showed up in the burrow earlier today. Well, I say showed up. He sort of, uh, materialised. We had to shoot him with stunning spells to keep him visible. Those Americans have some really curious methods of communication, don't they? Anyway, he thought you'd be here along with Rose. He said he really needed to talk to you. He asked me to tell you to keep an eye out for him. James nodded. Sure, Mum. OK. Well, I really should go, Ginny said. Grandma says Happy Christmas. And she'd love to chat, but we already packed the floor rug, and kneeling on the hearthstones is too hard on her knees. Take care of each other. Rose, make sure those two eat something green every now and then, and be sure to keep up with your studies, you two. Yes, ma'am, Albus and James said in unison. Ginny smiled mistily. I love you, all three of you. 
Good night and happy Christmas. Ron and Hermione each made one more appearance in the fireplace, saying their goodbyes. Finally, Harry appeared once more. He smiled wearily. Take care, you three. You're not getting into any trouble, are you? No more than you would have, Albus smirked. Dad, James said, I didn't take the cloak and map this time. I know, James. Your mother already told me. I believe you. But who has them, then? You leave that to me, Harry smiled. I'm head aura, remember? What kind of aura would I be if I let something like the invisibility cloak slip out of my hands? If you don't have them, then they're probably lost under the bed back at home, or in the bottom of the laundry basket. They'll turn up. But, Dad, James said, lowering his voice, what about the voodoo doll I got from Professor Jackson last year? That's me. Mum says it's gone missing, too. Harry seemed to understand James's concern. Those things don't work like they show in the muggle films, son. You'll be all right. Your mum liked it a lot, though. She squeezed it every night. I know, James said, smiling slightly. I felt her squeezes a little. Harry's smile widened. Don't worry about it, James. It'll turn up. Things always do, no matter how lost they seem. It's a rule of life. James nodded. Thanks, Dad. Good night, all of you, Harry said. Happy Christmas. Now go and get some rest. You too, Rose answered. Give everyone our love. Give Lily a hug from us when you see her next. Harry nodded. I will, Rose. He glanced at James and Albus, smiling proudly. Then he was gone. The coals reverted to a senseless strew. Sounds as if we made the right choice staying here, Albus commented, climbing to his feet. I wonder what will happen to all of Grandad's things. What about his flying Ford? James sighed. What's it matter? Grandad's the one that gave all those things any meaning. Without him, they're all just stuff. Albus glared at James, but didn't seem to know what to say. Rose stood up and brushed off her knees. I'm sure your dad won't just throw it all away, she soothed. Grandad spent years collecting those things. It's all part of our memory of him. Uncle Harry will find a place for it all. Nobody found a place for the burrow, Albus said quietly. Now it's empty, and pretty soon it'll be torn down. There was no response to that. A moment later, Albus went on. I'm heading back downstairs. I'll see you both tomorrow. Good night, Albus, Rose replied, nodding. As Albus disappeared through the portrait hole, Rose turned to James, her eyes sharp. Your voodoo doll's gone missing too. This could be serious. You heard Dad. He says it's all right. He says they don't work like they do in the muggle flicks. It's not like anyone who finds it can use it to pull my arms off or make me do things I don't want to do. Voodoo is a really secret art, Rose said, shaking her head. And Madame Delacroix is one of the best voodoo witches there is. You don't know what that doll is capable of, and neither does your dad. Not really. You have to be really careful with things like that. What do you think I'm going to do, Rose? I can't just magically find the bloody thing. It probably did just fall down behind the headboard in Mum and Dad's room. I wouldn't be willing to take that chance if I was you, Rose said gravely. Not until you know for sure what that doll is capable of. You make it sound like it's alive, James said, grinning a little nervously. Rose merely stuck her hands on her hips and cocked her head as if to say, How do you know it's not? I'll look into it, a voice said from behind Rose, causing her to jump a foot into the air. Zane Walker, she cried, spinning and clutching her hand to her heart. Stop doing that. You scared me half to death. Sorry, Zane said. It's hard to knock with doppelganger hands. They just go right through things. Hey, Zane, happy Christmas, James smiled, turning on the couch to face the half-transparent form. You need a zap? Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm managing this message all by myself. I didn't want anyone else to hear it. James produced his wand and shot the ghostly figure of Zane with a stinging hex. The doppelganger pulsed to something resembling a solid shape. So? Aunt Ginny tells us you were looking for us at the burrow, Rose said crossly, plopping back onto the couch. What's so important that you need to interrupt us on Christmas Day? I was worried about you, Zane said seriously. I wanted to warn you, but then I found out that you'd stayed here at the school, and I knew everything would be all right, for now at least. James frowned. What are you talking about? Why wouldn't we be safe? I mean, relatively speaking, considering the gatekeeper is loose on the earth and all that. Zane's face was very pale and grave. 
Remember when we talked in the barn a couple of weeks ago? Rose, you told me all about how Merlin had been tricked by that guy Hayden a thousand years ago. He said Merlin would get his fiance back if he doubled Hayden's lands and fortified his castle, making it so that Merlin himself couldn't even attack anyone inside it. Yeah, James said, shrugging. So? So Merlin knows somebody broke into his office a few weeks ago. He knows that person zapped themselves into his magic mirror and probably found out some not-so-nice things about him. And Merlin probably knows that that person was you, James. So haven't you wondered why he hasn't said boo to you about any of it? Well, James answered slowly, like you said that day in the barn, if Merlin was evil, he'd have come for us. The fact that he hasn't must mean he isn't as bad as he could be. Maybe, somehow, he's on the good side after all, and he knows we are, too. Maybe he's letting us go because he knows we're trying to help fight the gatekeeper. Even as James said it, it sounded false to him. In his heart, he didn't believe it, but he couldn't think of any other reason that Merlin wouldn't have come for them. Zane was shaking his head. That's what I thought at the time. But then I thought about the conversation that happened between Slytherin and Merlin back when he had you locked in his laboratory. You said that they talked about the deal Hayden had tricked Merlin into making, and they made it pretty clear that Hogwarts is the castle Hayden lived in when he made the deal. Don't you see what that means? Rose's eyes widened. It means Hogwarts is the castle Merlin fortified. It can't be breached from outside, she said, nodding. That would explain how even Voldemort and his forces were kept out for so long, back during the battle. Merlin's protective spells were still in effect, although they were probably weakened a bit after a thousand years. It would also explain how the secret entrances just keep opening up again over time, James agreed, awed. Like the one beneath the Whomping Willow. It's like the castle heals itself when it's been damaged. Merlin's magical fortifications are still at work after all these centuries. Even the new parts seem to have got it. Even the parts that were built after Merlin cast his spells over the castle. The new bits have inherited his protection. Zane was still shaking his head somberly. You're still missing the most important part. We've been assuming that Merlin hadn't attacked you three because he was on your side, or he was letting you figure things out for some reason. We'd assumed he was letting you go because he was essentially good. But we forgot the most interesting part of the deal Hayden made with Merlin. Rose suddenly gasped and covered her mouth. James's eyes widened, remembering. It had been right in front of him the whole time. Slytherin himself had said it that night in his office a thousand years ago. You are unable to touch the hair of anyone residing within this castle, Slytherin had said. Your threats are formidable, but fortunately they are to no effect here. He can't hurt anyone inside the walls of the castle, James whispered. It was the last part of Hayden's deal, because Hayden knew that Merlin would try to have his revenge on him. That's why Merlin had to wait until Hayden was on a journey in his coach. Only then could Merlin attack him. James looked at Rose. Her hand was still over her mouth, and her face had entirely drained of colour. May I be so bold as to suggest, Zane said, looking very meaningfully at both of them, that none of you go on any journeys for the time being? James's first concern had been Ralph, who was indeed travelling over the holiday, staying with his dad at his flat in London. Zane assured them that he'd already been to see Ralph, warning him to keep his wand handy and try to never be alone. He wasn't very happy about it, Zane explained, especially since his wand is a chunk of Merlin's staff. He thinks he won't be able to use it on Merlin if it comes down to it. He might be right, too, but I didn't tell him that. But it's his wand now, Rose insisted. He won it. It's his to use however he wishes. Zane wasn't so certain. This is old magic, Rose. It isn't like Ralph battled Merlin and won his wand. The staff was broken up, and Ralph only got a part of it. It still remembers when it was whole, and knows Merlin is still master of the rest of it. You might be right, but we can't assume that what is true of a whole wand is true of a partial staff. Definitely don't tell Ralph that, James said. He's nervous enough already, and he'll never know the truth unless it comes down to a fight. It'd be best if he truly believed his wand was his entirely. It might actually help make it true. Zane nodded. In the meantime, I'll check with Madame Delacroix about your voodoo doll. I'll try to get her to tell me what it can do. 
After all, she's the one that made it. Rose asked. You can talk to her? Sure. She's right here on the grounds, on the psychiatric floor of the Poe Medical College. They keep her under lock and key, but she's allowed visitors. She's pretty dotty after that whole experience in the Grotto Keep, but I bet she remembers me and a big chunk of log. Zane grinned a little wickedly. I doubt it will come to that again, Rose said, rolling her eyes. But it might help loosen her tongue. After all, it was one of your presidents that said to speak softly and carry a big stick. Yeah, Zane agreed. Big sticks are a specialty of mine. After that, Zane wished James and Rose a good night and Merry Christmas. He apparently had a Christmas party to go to himself, since it was quite a lot earlier where he was. He broke into a rather rude Christmas carol and vanished halfway through the chorus. James and Rose said good night as well and went their separate ways, climbing the stairs to their dormitories. It occurred to James that he had the second year's dormitory all to himself during the holiday, and it worried him a little. He reminded himself that if what Zane said was true, Merlin couldn't harm him inside the walls of Hogwarts. Still, the thought that Merlin might actually desire to harm James, as well as Rose and Ralph, was slightly terrifying. It was one thing to have a nebulous, generic enemy floating loose on the earth, but it was another thing entirely to have a specific enemy under the same roof as you, and to know that that enemy was one of the most powerful sorcerers ever. Fortunately, after the day's activities in the snow and the stresses of his conversations with Petra and his parents, James was exhausted enough not to care. Besides, James had a vague sense that Cedric was watching out for him. If Merlin came for James, Cedric would find a way to warn him first. Thinking that, James fell into a deep sleep. He had the dream again, and it was clearer than ever. There was the flash and swish of blades and the rattle of old machinery. There was the flickering pool and the sad faces of the young man and woman. Worst of all, there was the keening voice of the dark shape in the shadows, constantly enticing, promising, instructing. A sense of deep sadness pervaded the dream, but under the sadness, like sharp knives under a soft blanket, there was anger. It was a cold, pulsing rage, broad as the sky and deep as the ocean. And finally, for the first time, James saw his companion. Reflected in the rippling surface of the pool, a silhouette and a hint of a face. He still didn't know where the pool was or where this secret, hidden place was buried but he finally had a sense of who this tormented person was. Long, raven hair hung past piercing eyes. The eyes were like coals, hard and cold, but concealing a fire that could burn anything and everything. You have cursed, the voice of the shadows said softly, evilly. You have tested the waters, yes. But you must perform the ultimate rite to become truly worthy. You must make a sacrifice so great that there will be no turning back. You must take from those who took from you. It will be a hard and painful path, and only you can walk it. But it is the price of balance. You must be willing to tread that path for all those who will come after you. And for that sacrifice, they will honor your memory. They will sing of you. Your story will become legend. And through that legend, you will live forever, no matter what happens to your mortal form. Through your trials, justice will be achieved. Those you've lost will be returned. Their blood will be repaid in the only way that it can be, with more blood. It is your duty and your honor. It is my honor, the raven-haired figure answered in a cold, calm voice. A tear dripped from the figure's chin and struck the pool where it steamed. James slept on, and in the morning he barely remembered the dream, but his phantom scar throbbed worryingly and James wondered about it, knowing it meant something, but unable to quite work out what.
He made his way down to breakfast, and by the time he entered the great hall, the pain in his forehead had gone entirely. Albus and Rose were seated at the Gryffindor table with Hugo and Petra, and all of them were engaged in raucous conversation. James joined them, smiling happily. By the time breakfast was over, he'd completely forgotten the dream. Chapter 14 Artis de Certo The Christmas holiday ended strangely for James, since neither he, Rose, nor Albus had gone anywhere, and there was no doleful return trip. Instead, it felt as if school returned to them. On the Sunday when most of the students arrived back from their travels, James and Rose sat in a sunny window seat overlooking the courtyard. Silently, they watched bundled classmates unloading their bags and trunks, lugging them up the steps to the main entrance. The enormous snowman James, Rose and Albus had erected was becoming soft in a sudden thaw. Its carrot nose drooped sadly, and one of its stick arms had fallen off. Melting snow dripped steadily from the castle roofs and balconies. James felt rather glad that the holidays were over and looked forward to resuming classes and drama rehearsals. Strangely enough, none of them had seen Merlin at all during the entire holiday. James had passed Professor McGonagall in the hall outside her office, and she had informed him that, as far as she knew, Merlin had spent the holiday at the castle. It isn't as if the headmaster has any family, you know, she'd commented, and one can only assume that his Christmas traditions would be rather different than ours at any rate. Besides, headmaster Ambrosius is a very private man, as you may have noticed. If he had any plans, I doubt he'd have told any of us. Classes began again, and James noticed that the second half of the year had a rather different tone than the first, especially with the older students. There was a noticeably more serious attitude about homework and studies. All in all, it made James glad he was not yet old enough to participate in OWL or NEWT examinations. As Defence Against the Dark Arts classes resumed, Professor de Bellows introduced techniques from a form of magical martial arts called Artis de Certo. James's attitude about such things had been rather transformed by his encounter with Salazar Slytherin on the top of the Sylvan Tower, where he'd surprised himself by putting de Bellows' physical defensive techniques to very good use. He paid close attention to the new moves, which looked quite a lot like dancing, but were actually a method of keeping one's body light and flexible, allowing for impressive displays of spell-dodging. As an example, de Bellows invited the class to form a line and make their wands ready. One by one, each student was to attempt to disarm, stun, or sting de Bellows. Your choice, the professor said, grinning and hopping lightly from foot to foot. This is finally getting good, Trenton Block muttered, fingering his wand. As the first spells began to fire, de Bellows dodged them with amazing, almost effortless ease. He barely seemed to be watching the line of students. He simply glanced once as each person in the line raised their wand. Then he'd turn, lunge, duck, or even pirouette, allowing the spell to flit past him harmlessly, usually missing him by mere inches. James had to admit that it was a rather amazing display, but he was determined that his spell would strike its mark. He decided he would aim directly for de Bello's feet, since they, at least, were usually attached to the floor. When his turn came, James raised his wand, aimed fleetingly for de Bello's chest, and then, as quickly as he could, pointed downwards and fired. Even as the spell shot from his wand, de Bello's was in the air, turning lightly. James's stunning spell snuffed itself out on de Bello's shadow. A moment later, the big man came down on its hands and the tips of his toes, as if he was doing a push-up. With a heave and a grunt, he flung himself upright again, landing easily on his feet. Deftly, he caught his own wand, which he had lobbed upwards during his leap. "'Bloody hell!' Graham Wharton cried. Amazed applause rippled over the students. Kendra Corner raised her hand. "'How long before we can do that?' "'Patient students!' de Bellows called, chuckling and mopping his brow with a towel. "'Artist de Seto is a lifetime study. It is much more than a physical art. It is a mental discipline.' 
It incorporates the skills of levitation, divination, and even apparition, allowing the wizard to know when and where his opponent is going to strike, and not to be there when it happens. Only the clumsiest wizard relies solely on the strength of his spells. The ablest wizard knows that if he plays the game well, he need not use spells at all. James decided that, as unlikable as DeBellos was, Artis de Certo was a technique well worth learning. He devoted himself to the practice drills and mental exercises de Bellows prescribed, even though they seemed hopelessly difficult and abstract. Know your opponent better than he knows yourself, de Bellows commanded. It need not take years of study. Most wizards know very little of themselves. Gauge them in an instant. Take their measure. If you succeed in this, you will always have the upper hand, for you will know what they are going to do before they do themselves. You will already be preparing your defense, and eventually your counterattack. When do we get to that part? Trenton said, lowering his wand in frustration. I'm sick of trying to read the other bloke's mind. I want to magic something. In time, Mr. Uh, young man, de Bellows replied, waving a hand. First, you must understand the logistics of battle. No action should be taken unless you have already foreseen the outcome. Planning and deliberation are key. Magic is but one of the choices available to the cunning wizard. At every stage of the battle, there are three options a warrior may choose. The first choice is to curse his opponent. Kevin Murdoch pointed his wand at his drill partner and mimed a killing curse. Kapow, you're dead. That's what we've been waiting for, he said cheerfully. A wholesale and clumsy response, my friend, de Bellows said. "'Perhaps you'd like to try that technique on me!' Murdoch's face reddened as he remembered the way de Bellows had dodged the myriad spells. He shook his head quickly, lowering his wand. De Bellows nodded once. "'Good choice, boy! You've just illustrated the second option a wizard may choose in battle. To wait and watch for his opponent to make the next move. The cunning warrior will be able to exploit his opponent's action and use it against him. If any of you ever see battle, you will likely find yourselves facing an untrained and undisciplined enemy, an enemy who believes that either bravery, power, or enthusiasm will be enough to see him to victory.' Get the measure of this enemy, wait for him to make his move, and know it the moment he does. If you succeed in those things, then the battle is already in your hands. Trenton Bloch rolled his eyes, obviously unsatisfied. What's the third option, then? The third option, my friends, de Bellows said, raising his eyebrows, is to turn around and walk away. The third option is to retreat? Morgan Petonia asked, frowning. De Bello shook his head, smiling grimly. Not at all. A true warrior never retreats, but a true warrior does know when a battle is not worth fighting. This might be because the enemy is too great, or because the enemy is too weak. Either way, there is no valor in such a battle. The sign of a true warrior, students, is knowing when not to fight. Inspiring stuff, Trenton muttered, unimpressed. James glanced at him, then back at de Bellows. He understood Trenton's annoyance, and yet, after the duel against Salazar Slytherin in the distant past, James realized he wasn't quite as quick to dismiss de Bellows' methods as he had been before. As spring began to descend on the school grounds, Neville Longbottom started taking his herbology classes on wandering field trips, teaching them how to identify certain magical plants and trees in the wild. The class slogged reluctantly behind as he led them along the perimeter of the forbidden forest and into the marshy shores of the lake. Many magical plants have adapted to muggle environments by disguising themselves as something rather more innocuous, Neville called happily, kneeling by the edge of the lake. For instance, this breed of spinous wort has acclimatized to life in muggle areas by disguising itself as stinging nettles, thus assuring no muggles will attempt to pull it up or harvest it. You can tell the difference by the slight purple hue on the bottom of the leaf. Once the plant is pulled up, however... Neville gripped the stem and gently tugged it, drawing the root out of the wet earth. You can see the characteristic taproot of the spinous wort plant, useful for any number of potions and elixirs. I'm not seeing the taproot, Ashley Doon said, examining the uprooted plant in her own hands. Just a big root ball. 
Neville looked up. Uh, that's because that particular plant, Miss Doon, is not so much the spinous work disguised as stinging nettles as it is stinging nettles disguised as uh, itself. Yeah, Ashley cried, dropping the plant and brushing her hands violently on her robes. To the hospital wing, Neville announced, sighing. Madame Curio has a salve for repelling the stings, but you'd best hurry, or you'll be smarting for hours. Ralph and James watched Ashley bolt off towards the castle, her robes flying. Ralph said to James, Are we all set for defence club tonight? I guess, James answered. I've barely seen Scorpius since the holiday. Frankly, I think he's running out of things to teach us. You think so? I've learned loads of useful spells from him. That grandfather of his really must have known his stuff. Yeah, well, that grandfather of his was one of the worst people my dad ever knew, James replied. Lucius Malfoy was a Death Eater. He's one of the few who never recanted either, even though old Voldy's long since dead. He's in hiding now, probably still waiting for the rise of the Pure Blood Empire. He knew plenty of dark magic, including all three unforgivable curses. Ralph shrugged. Well, wherever Scorpius learned it from, I'm glad he did. Considering what's going on with Merlin and this gatekeeper thing, I'm glad to learn as many curses and exes as I can. I dunno, James said, lowering his voice. I'm starting to wonder if we're going about this all wrong. What do you mean? I mean, James said, sighing, what if de Bellows is right about what makes a great magical fighter? What if we're spending too much time just learning curses and hexes and disarming spells? Maybe we should start practicing some of those artist deserto techniques he's been showing us. Ralph shook his head. I can't do stuff like that, James. Look at me. Same was right. I'm a brick wall. You're no bigger than de Bellows, and you saw what he did, dodging all those spells, moving like he knew exactly where every bolt was going to be. He made it look really easy. Yeah, I know about things that look really easy. Turns out they aren't. He said Artis Deserto was a lifetime study. So what else you got planned for the rest of your life? James asked, grinning. Do you want to be great at something, or what? Ralph smiled crookedly. You think Scorpius can even teach us that stuff? Only one way to find out, James replied, arching an eyebrow. But neither Ralph nor James saw Scorpius for the rest of the day. As they walked to the gym for the defence club meeting, Rose was rather enthusiastic about using the club to practice artist Deserto techniques. You know, he's hardly even teaching it to the girls, she fumed. De Bellows is a first-class cretin when it comes to women in combat roles. Some of the best fighters in history have been witches. Hasn't he ever heard of Cloris the Clobberer or Gia von Guggenheim? Or for that matter, Bellatrix Lestrange and the woman who defeated her, Grandma Weasley? He may not have heard of Grandma Weasley, Ralph answered thoughtfully, but you have a point. A woman is arguably more inclined to being good at artist Deserto, Rose went on. We are more graceful by nature, and more intuitive. Maybe you should teach it then, James said with a straight face. Maybe I should, Rose replied, glaring at him. The three turned into the gymnasium and stopped. Most of the club members were cheering and shouting, gathered in a raucous throng near the line of clockwork dummies. Green flashes lit the group, but James couldn't see where they were coming from. James and Rose ran forward, pushing into the throng. James, being taller than Rose, saw what was happening first. The assembled students had formed a semicircle around Tabitha Corsica, Philia Goyle, and Albus. The three Slytherins were smiling happily as they fired green bolts at one of the mechanical target dummies. The dummy thrashed and writhed, spitting tiny cogs and springs, racking loose of its frame. Stop it! Rose yelled, her cheeks bright red. What do you think you're doing? Stop it this instant! Tabitha whispered an incantation, shooting one more spell at the dummy, and then raised her wand easily. She turned to peer back over her shoulder at the newcomers. Good evening, Rose, James, she said. Is there a sign-up parchment we should attend to? We'd hate to bypass any of the necessary formalities. What kind of spells were those? Rose demanded, planting her fists on her hips. Calm down, Rosie, Albus said, pocketing his wand. We were just having a little fun. It's just a dummy, you know. You were using killing curses, Rose said, wheeling on Albus. How dare you! You can't just come into this club and start using unforgivable curses, especially that one. You'll get us all expelled. 
The law is rather vague when it comes to practicing unforgivable curses on inanimate objects, Rose, Tabitha said, smiling indulgently. Besides, what's the point of a defense club if you aren't going to practice useful defensive techniques? Killing someone is your idea of a defensive technique, James spat. Tabitha blinked at him, adopting a puzzled look. Can you think of a more effective one? she asked. She's right. Nolan Beetlebrick, one of Tabitha's fellow Slytherins, called from the crowd of students. The bellows is a numpty. He's not teaching us anything useful. I want to learn how to fight for real. There was a chorus of agreement. We hardly wish to usurp control of your club, Tabitha said, pocketing her wand. We are here to learn, as are the rest of you. But if someone doesn't teach the lot of you how to do a basic cruciatus curse... Philia interjected. How do you expect to deal with those who won't give a second thought to using a killing curse on you? The crowd of students babbled excitedly. That's right, someone said. You have to be ready to fight fire with fire. Are all of you Slytherins completely daft? A voice declared. James looked and saw Joseph Torrance push to the front of the group. That's the way you're kind of always been, isn't it? Go straight for the dark magic. You lot are just a bunch of one-trick ponies. There was another babbled response from the crowd. A few people moved away from Joseph as if they believed Tabitha might curse him where he stood. If the one trick is powerful enough, Tabitha said, smiling her most charming smile, it might just be all a pony needs. That's enough of this, James called as the crowd began to get agitated. He raised his hands, turning towards the assembled club members. We started this club, Ralph and Rose and me, and it's supposed to be just for first to fourth years, he said, glaring back at Tabitha and Philia. De Bellows is teaching magical defense to the older years, like those two. This club was meant to be a place where we could practice the basics of defensive magic. It was never the plan to learn any unforgivable curses. Why not? Beetlebrick interrupted, his face stony. Why is everyone trying to make sure we don't know how to defend ourselves? A chorus of agreements and arguments erupted from the crowd. James called for order, but the noise of the babble was too loud. The group seemed about to dissolve into complete chaos. A loud crack echoed through the room, surprising everyone present. James looked up, trying to see where the crack had come from. A dissolving trail of smoke led down towards the main door where Scorpius stood, his eyes narrowed and a small smile curling his lip. You want to practice unforgivable curses, do you? he drawled. In case you've forgotten, I am the teacher for this club. You Slytherins are new, so I'll let it slide, but you surely wouldn't want anyone to get the impression that you were trying to take over. Tabitha's charming smile turned decidedly shark-like as she looked at Scorpius. So it's true. First year Scorpius Malfoy is going to teach us everything he knows. Does that include how to be a traitor to one's family values and traditions? Scorpius sighed and walked into the room. Not until next term, he answered breezily. Although, when it comes to underhanded tricks and backstabbing, I'd hate to repeat anything you lot already know. I'm sure that's an examination you can already pass quite successfully. Scorpius threaded to the center of the group, moving between Tabitha and Albus, who stared at the pale boy with unmasked disdain. Excuse me, Scorpius said, bumping Albus with his shoulder. He turned to face the group, pulling his wand from his cloak with a flourish. You wish to learn the most powerful curses, do you? You wish to know how to defend yourselves, and even more, to take the fight to the enemy, is that it? Well, contrary to what you may believe, I won't stop you. You will learn such things, and I will be the one to teach them to you. Scorpius narrowed his eyes again, staring hard at James, as if daring him to argue. I may only be a first year, but my family tradition, as Tabby has already mentioned, is rich in the deadly arts. I'll teach you just as I was taught by my father and grandfather. You little prat, Philia hissed. We've been practicing defensive magic for years. What can a greasy turncoat Gryffindor like you teach us? 
The first thing I can teach you is to shut up when the teacher is speaking, Scorpius said, turning to Philia, his face unflinching. Outside this room, you may be a fifth year, and I may be a greasy turncoat Gryffindor. But in this room, you are the student, and I am your instructor. Or perhaps you're having second thoughts about joining this club. Philia's face had gone beet red with anger. I'll teach you to speak to me that way. You do stop, Philia, Tabitha interrupted, amused. Scorpius is right. This is their club. We must abide by his rules. While we are in this room, let us see what he can teach us, since he has apparently been so well educated. Scorpius glared at Philia, daring her to defy Tabitha. After a moment, Philia's face hardened. She pocketed her wand and folded her arms. Just as I thought, Scorpius said, turning to face the gathered club members again. First things first. You must learn to defend, parry, and stun before you can learn to make good use of anything more powerful. Skip the basics, and you will be target practice for any git with a wand. Fortunately, we are well on our way with those skills, and I can only hope that our new Slytherin friends can keep up with us. But later, once you have mastered those techniques, you will be ready to learn this. Scorpius spun on his heel and flung out his arm, aiming his wand at the broken clockwork dummy. Avada Kedavra! he roared, baring his teeth. The bolt that shone from his wand was so bright and so green that it lit the entire room. It struck the dummy in the chest, and its arms and legs flailed full length, trembling violently. Then, with a clank and a rattle, the dummy fell off its frame. It clumped to the floor in a heap. Scorpius stared at it, his eyes slit and his teeth still bared. Nolan Beetlebrick stepped out of the perimeter of the crowd and kicked at the dummy with his foot. A cog tumbled out of it and rolled across the floor. Well, the boy said, nodding, you definitely killed it. There was a round of nervous, scattered applause. Rose looked over at James, her eyes wide and worried. Her expression seemed to ask, what have we done? James simply shook his head slowly. This could be better than I thought, Albus said, nudging James. Way to go, big brother. As they left the gym a while later, James caught up with Ralph. What happened to you? Where were you back there? he demanded. Ralph glanced at James defensively. What? I was there the whole time. You didn't say a word when Tabitha and Goyle showed up and started killing the target dummies. Well, Ralph replied, shrugging and walking quickly, it looked to me like you and Rose had it under control. Under control? You call completely losing our grip on the club under control? Scorpius is planning to teach unforgivable curses. Ralph didn't say anything as he walked. James stared at him angrily, his eyes narrowed. You want to learn them too, don't you? he demanded. Ralph pressed his lips together, refusing to reply. James turned in front of him, stopping him in the hall, but Ralph spoke first. Don't, James, he said, dropping his eyes and shaking his head. Look, you're my best mate in the old school, but we come from two different worlds. You Gryffindors can be all sweet and courageous about things like the unforgivable curses, but frankly, yeah, it does make sense to me to learn them. I'm sorry. James's mouth dropped open. Ralph, there's a reason they're called unforgivable. We can't even use them to fight the gatekeeper if it comes to that. That thing isn't even human, so there's no excuse for learning them. Isn't there? Ralph said. James knew Ralph hated confrontations, but the bigger boy forced himself to look James in the eye. Are you telling me you wouldn't have used an unforgivable curse to stop Voldemort from killing your grandparents? James backed up a step, speechless. He started to reply, but Ralph went on, cutting him off. What about when my uncle was getting ready to murder Ted Lupin's dad? Would he have used an unforgivable curse to stop him from doing that? Or even my own grandparents, when they were driving my dad to a muggle orphanage, telling him they didn't want him anymore, that no squib was good enough to be their son? What if someone had been there to imperio them and force them to take him back home and make them love him the way parents are supposed to love their kids? Are you telling me you'd have decided not to do it because only bad people use unforgivable curses? 
James stammered, shocked at the quiet ferocity in Ralph's eyes. Ralph, I... no, I'm, I mean... Ralph shook his head and looked away. I can't blame you for not understanding that, James. But honestly, if using an unforgivable curse could bring back the people you'd thought were lost forever, wouldn't you do it? If it could return the things that were taken from you by people who were stupid and selfish and mean, wouldn't you? Ralph looked at James again, his eyes bright. "'Cause I'd do it, James. I really would. Without a second thought." With that, Ralph pushed past James and walked into the dimness of the corridor. James knew there was no point in following him, but he was frightened by the things Ralph had said. He'd never seen such passion in the big boy before, but apparently it had been there all along, just under the surface. Rose caught up with James, shaking her head worriedly. "'We'll have to corner Scorpius in the common room.' she said. He's still back there, surrounded by everybody. He's showing them how to do the levy corpus, Jinx. What's the matter? James shook his head, still looking after Ralph. I don't know, Rose. None of this is going the way it's supposed to, and to tell you the truth, I don't have any idea what I'm supposed to do about it. I'll tell you what you need to do about it, James, Rose said seriously. James glanced at her, furrowing his brow. And what would that be? "'Same thing you did last year when you ran into trouble,' Rose replied, arching her eyebrows. "'Go and ask for help from somebody who does know what to do.' By the beginning of the next week, James had still not spoken to Scorpius about his speech at the last defence club. It wasn't that he hadn't had the opportunity, it was more that he simply didn't know what to say. James knew Scorpius only well enough to know that, if he demanded Scorpius not teach unforgivable curses to the club, Scorpius would probably begin the next meeting with them. He considered simply removing Scorpius as teacher for the club, but the fact of the matter was that Scorpius was a fairly good teacher, and he did seem to know an awful lot. The worst part was that James was unable to discuss the problem with Ralph, since Ralph apparently wanted to learn the curses. James could sort of understand the things Ralph had said, but all the reasons Ralph had listed for learning the curses were already in the past. Learning the curses now wouldn't bring back James's grandparents or Ted's dad. Perhaps Ralph thought there were more such tragedies to come, and he wanted to be prepared for them. Either way, it was worrying. Ralph had been moody and quiet ever since the conversation in the hall, and James decided it was best just to leave him alone for a while. Fortunately, James was completely distracted from all these things for a short while during Tuesday's Care of Magical Creatures class. Hagrid led the students around to the back of the barn, shushing them and keeping them behind him with one enormous hand. Grop's getting rather good at this, Hagrid whispered, but we don't want to distract him. It's ticklish work walking a dragon. As the group crept around the edge of the barn, James peered past Ralph, struggling to see. In the near distance, just at the edge of the forest, Grawp was walking very slowly, looking back over his shoulder. He seemed to have something like an iron door strapped to his left forearm like a shield. A very thick chain led from Grawp's upraised right hand, ending at a collar on Norberta's long neck. Amazingly, the dragon was ambling docilely behind Grawp, sniffing at the trees and occasionally rooting her snout into the ground, snapping at something. "'Norberta likes a nice fat mole, she does,' Hagrid whispered. "'And she can smell him right through the earth. "'She'd be great pest control if she didn't occasionally set the trees afire. "'Today's nice and wet, though, so I knew it'd be safe to give her a walk, eh?' "'What happens if she flames on grope? Morgan Petonia asked. "'Is that what the iron door is for?' Hagrid shook his head. "'She loves grope even more than me. "'She'd never flame him.' The shield is just an extra safety measure. Last year, Headmistress McGonagall insisted he always wear it when he took Norberta out. It's just a habit now. Grawp tugged at the chain lead as Norberta hung back, sniffing at a tree trunk. Ponderously, she leaned against the tree and rubbed on it, as if scratching an itch. The tree shuddered and groaned, leaning noticeably. I wonder who'd win in a fight, Graham whispered, grinning. The Womp and Willow, or North Butter? That's stupid, Ashley replied, shaking her head. I'd pay to see it, Graham said. Battle of the Magical Titans. Just imagine it. Ashley rolled her eyes. I am imagining it, and it's stupid. 
Don't let her knock that tree over, Gorby, Hagrid called as quietly as he could, cupping his hands to his mouth. That's a Grimlock elm. Not many of them left. Grawp tugged harder on the chain lead, but Norberto was stubborn. She wrapped her tail on the hillside in annoyance, producing a perceptible shudder in the earth. She seemed to be sniffing at something just inside the perimeter of the trees. She clawed at the ground, pulling Grawp and pushing the trees apart with her massive shoulders. She snorted a small burst of yellow flame. "'What's she after?' Hagrid asked worriedly. Uh, "'Maybe you lot should head back around the barn again, just for safety's sake.' None of the students obeyed. Instead, they pushed forward, curious to see what was happening, although none ventured in front of Hagrid himself. Easy, Groppy, Hagrid called in a strangely small voice. Not too hard. Give her just a little slack. We don't want to make her mad now. What the... Something small and yellow had suddenly flown out of the trees, as if frightened by Norberta's rooting. It fluttered between her legs and arced up, streaking into the grey sky. Oh, no! Hagrid said in a worried voice. I wondered where she'd got to. With a violent, serpentine lunge, Norberta spun, her entire body trailing behind her head and her open, snapping jaws. Grawp was yanked entirely off his feet, refusing to let go of the chain. He landed with an enormous, muddy thump and slid along the wet grass, pulled by Norberta's wild thrashing. Everybody inside! Hagrid yelled, shooting out both arms protectively. It's a wargle I got from Victor Crumb, and Norberta's just daft about it. It got loose a few days ago, but I figured it'd be halfway back to Bulgaria by now. Grarp! Hold her down! Don't let go! No matter what! The ground shuddered as Norberta thundered after the yellow creature, pulling Grawp along behind her. Great muddy streaks tore up the hillside in their wake. None of the students had budged. James stared at the spectacle, wide-eyed, unsure if it was amusing or frightening. The wargle was about the size of a cat, but canary yellow and with four fluttering wings. A long, tufted tail trailed behind it, whipping the air. James thought the creature looked almost impossibly cute. Norberta thrashed and leapt, snapping her jaws wildly, barely missing the fluttering, swooping shape. Thumping along behind, Grawp was heroically pulling himself up the chain, trying to reach Norberta's neck. That's it, Grawpy! Hagrid cheered, beginning to trot uncertainly out onto the hilltop. I'll grab her tail if I can! You get her by the neck! Oh! The wargle suddenly angled upwards, streaking into the sky beyond Norberta's reach. With a massive flourish, the dragon unfurled her wings and brought them down with a single thunderous thrust. She leapt off the ground, roaring and pulling Grawp with her. I thought she couldn't fly, Graham exclaimed. The students began to shuffle nervously backwards, moving towards the relative shelter of the barn. As if sensing a hiding place, the wargle arced downwards again, angling towards the crowd of students. Norberta thrashed her wings and lunged. She was amazingly fast for her size, despite her injured wing. Students scattered in all directions as her shadow darkened the sky overhead. Hagrid ran back and forth, arms outstretched, as if he meant to catch the enormous dragon. Hold on, Grarp! he called to his half-brother, who swung gamely from the chain lead, leaving a trail of mud gobbets. You've got her! Don't let go! Norberta roared again, struggling to stay airborne. Her tail thrashed as she flapped, striking the chimney of the barn and obliterating it to flying bits of stone. The wargle circled in a panic. Finally, the yellow creature seemed to sense that Norberta couldn't properly fly. It swooped upwards, aiming for the distant clouds. Grorp! Hagrid called suddenly. Shield! She's gonna flame! Norberta gave one last thrust of her massive wings, stretched out her long neck, and roared. This time, the roar produced a long stream of blue-white flame. Heat blasted out over the hilltop. James felt it ripple through his hair, and then, with a reverberating thump, the dragon landed on all four claws. Grawp came down right next to her. 
He was covered in mud and bits of grass, but he instantly leapt up and threw his arms around the great dragon's neck, holding her down. The dragon didn't seem prepared to attempt flight again. She raised her head full length, jaws wide open. A moment later, a small black shape tumbled out of the sky, trailing smoke. It fell straight into Norberta's gullet, and she swallowed audibly. Hagrid shook his head. Shame about that, he said. Wargles is hard to come by. I wonder I did. Ah, oh, well, so long as nobody's hurt. Grorpy, are you all right, then? Grorp tentatively let go of the dragon's neck and stepped away, still holding the chain lead. He glanced back at Hagrid. Grorp got muddy nose, he said ponderously. Sorry about that, Grorpy. Let's go ahead and put the old girl back in her pen, eh? He turned back to the students, his face red and imploring. It's probably best if we uh, keep that between ourselves, if you don't mind. James glanced aside at Trenton, who had earlier threatened to write to his parents about Hagrid's rather frightening menagerie. That, Trenton said, noticing James's look, was totally bloody awesome. As James and Ralph were heading back from the barn, they passed the greenhouses where Professor Longbottom's first-year herbology class was just getting out. James spied Scorpius. I'll see you at lunch, Ralph, James called as he trotted away. Places to go, people to see. Ralph didn't reply, and James knew why. The bigger boy knew what James was up to. Scorpius heard James coming and stopped, turning back. I wondered when I'd be hearing from you, Potter, he said, staring up at the low clouds. Yeah, well, I wanted to talk to you about Defence Club. Of course, Scorpius smiled thinly. Come to talk me out of teaching the hardcore spells, did you? Actually, no, James replied. I've been thinking about it. I can't stop you from showing people what you learn from your family. And besides, if people don't learn those things from you, they'll learn them from Corsica and Goyle. I came to you because... James couldn't quite bring himself to say it. He knew Rose's advice had been right, but he just hadn't known when or where he was supposed to use it. Now he did. Finally, he took a deep breath and said through gritted teeth, I came to ask for your help. My help? Scorpius replied suspiciously. With what? With getting Tabitha and the rest under control, James answered. Look, you know it even better than I do. They don't want to learn jinxes and hexes and curses to fight the bad guys. They just want to use them to be bullies and get power over people. The Defence Club was supposed to be a way for people to learn basic fighting spells and techniques, but I think it can be even more than that. I think we can use it to practice the things Professor de Bellows is teaching us about, how to be real fighters. We can practice the artist deserto techniques he's showing us and get really good at them. Then we can put those skills together with the spells we've already learned. And later, when everyone is ready to know how to use them, James gulped, you can teach the unforgivable curses if you still want to. Let's see if I understand this, Scorpius said. You started the defense club because you didn't like the fact that de Bellows wasn't teaching any defensive magic. And now you want to turn the club into a place to practice the silly stuff that he is teaching us. James sighed. Yeah, all right, you make it sound totally stupid, but that's pretty much the truth of it. Either way, if Corsica and Goyle and even Albus keep coming to the club and killing the target dummies, they're just going to push for the unforgivable curses and bypass everything else. Maybe some people can handle knowing the unforgivable curses, but not everybody can, and definitely not without learning the basics first. So kick them out, Scorpius shrugged. You run the club. You decide who's in it. It isn't my problem. I can't just kick them out, James said, exasperated. Anybody who wants to come to the club can. But you know how to talk to them. It was totally brilliant the way you handled them in the last club meeting. Your family understands the way Slytherins think. I need you to help keep them from taking over. Scorpius narrowed his eyes. Just because my father convinced me to help you through the mirror of Erised doesn't mean I'm your mate, Potter. I teach your club because I want to, not because you asked. Who are you to decide who gets to know the unforgivable curses or not? James stared at Scorpius thoughtfully. I don't think you even believe that yourself, 
he said. You're just trying to make me mad at you, and I don't even know why. If you thought everyone who wished should be able to learn the killing curse, you'd have taught it last class, or let Corsica and Goyle do it. Instead, you spent your time distracting everybody with stuff like the Levy Corpus jinx. Admit it or not, you agree with me, Scorpius. You're delusional, Potter. "'Scorpius said, turning on his heel. "'Why would I agree with you?' "'Because,' James called, watching the pale boy walk away, "'you're also a Gryffindor, and I think the Sorting Hat knew what it was doing.' "'Scorpius didn't stop. "'He simply continued to walk away, heading towards the castle. "'James watched for a moment, then sighed and followed. "'He could only hope that despite Scorpius's attitude, "'he'd at least think about what James had asked.' Eventually, Albus told James how it happened. Thursday evening came, and Tabitha, Philia, and Albus were on their way to the gym for defence club. While they were still several corridors away, Scorpius met them coming from the other direction. "'Just turn around and walk with me,' he said in a low voice, trying to put his arms around both Tabitha and Albus. "'Remove your hand, or pick it up wherever it lands,' Tabitha said, pointing her wand at Scorpius's wrist. "'Touchy, touchy,' Scorpius replied, pulling his hands away. "'And here I am, trying to help you.' Albus scoffed. "'As if we needed your help, you prat. "'Believe it or not, I am indeed saving you a bit of bother,' Scorpius growled, looking Albus in the eye. "'Your brother's little club is about to be disbanded, "'and I don't expect it will go well for those who are in attendance when it happens.' Philia's face was etched with suspicion. What do you mean? Some concerned individual has alerted Professor de Bellows that students are being taught defensive magic and curses, all in an effort to undermine his teaching technique. They also allowed it to slip that some students have even been seen practicing the killing curse. Tabitha studied Scorpius's face. How perfectly devious! But tell me, why would you do such a thing? Did I say it was me? Scorpius asked innocently. He's lying, Albus said. He wouldn't do that to his housemates. You might want to step aside a moment, Scorpius said, glancing down the corridor. Voices were approaching quickly. De Bellows stalked around the corner, herding Rose ahead of him. She looked extremely worried. So you and James Potter are responsible for this, eh? De Bellows said gruffly. He's the son of the Ministry's head aurer, is he not? I should have known he'd be trouble. I understood there were three of you, though. Well, Rose quavered, there are, in a manner of speaking. I guess there's no point in hiding it any more. You'll see for yourself soon enough. As De Bellows and Rose passed Scorpius, she gave him a wilting look. Scorpius grinned crookedly. As they swept on, Albus glared angrily at Scorpius. Why would you do that to my brother? Is this how you repay me for my warning? I guess blood is indeed thicker than water, isn't it? Why, Scorpius? Tabitha asked. You're only making things harder for yourself with your housemates. My housemates are a bunch of arrogant sissies, Scorpius growled. They don't have the spine to learn real magic. It became obvious to me last week that you lot are the ones I need to partner with. Yes, yes, he said, raising his hand as Philia opened her mouth. I'm a Gryffindor. What do names mean? If names meant everything, little Albus would have to duel to the death with both of you. Slytherins and Potters have always been mortal enemies, haven't they? Obviously we're past that, and for good reason. I'm not asking to be a member of your silly Fang and Talons club. I am merely suggesting that perhaps we start a new club, and perhaps it meet in the Slytherin casting range, where we can feel free to practice whatever we wish in secrecy. And you deign to teach us? Philia demanded, smiling grimly. I think not, Scorpius answered. The fact is, I'd not be able to attend regularly. Besides, I imagine it as more a group practice session. We can all learn from one another, and no one will be there to tell us what we shouldn't know. I would, however, require access to the Slytherin quarters. It seems like small payment for today's favour. Besides, 
As you implied last week, Tabitha, my family does have a rather long, slithering history. You little rat, Phileas said. All this just because you hate that you've been made a Gryffindor? Having a ring key does not make you a member of Slytherin House, Tabitha said, tilting her head and smiling. No Gryffindor can be allowed free access to our quarters. However, I suspect we can come to an agreeable arrangement. That's all I ask. Scorpius answered brightly, and now I should be running along. It will look rather suspicious if I am not there when the hammer falls on James's little club. We'll chat soon. Tabitha, Philia, and Albus watched Scorpius turn and trot off in the direction that de Bellows had led Rose. A few minutes later, Scorpius passed the closed doorway of the gymnasium. He could see through the pebbled glass window that it was dark inside. He stopped and listened. A moment later, he heard voices further down the corridor, echoing. He followed the sounds, turning left at the next passage. It opened onto a high hall with windows on one side. James and Rose stood with de Bellows in the centre of the marble floor. They were all staring straight up, craning their necks. De Bellows had his wand upraised, aiming it carefully. Overhead, Ralph hung by his ankle, suspended high in mid-air. We were just trying it out, James explained. It's called the Levicorpus Jinx. I didn't know it'd take a counter jinx to get him back down again. Hold on, Ralph, Rose cried, wringing her hands in a parody of worry. De Bellows shook his head disgustedly. This is exactly the reason I do not teach defensive magic to younger years, he snapped. No concept whatsoever of the consequences. It's a good thing you didn't accidentally learn the bat bogey hex. That was a favourite in my day. Libera Corpus! De Bellows flicked his wand and Ralph spun upright. A moment later he drifted clumsily to the floor. Whoa! Ralph said shakily. Dizzy! I apologise, Professor De Bellows, Scorpius called from the doorway. It's my fault. I learned that jinx from my grandfather. I should have known better than to show anyone how to do it. I've certainly learned my lesson. I should hope so, de Bellows said gruffly. If I was a less gracious man, I'd subtract points from whatever your houses are. But I'll take your word for it that it'll never happen again. He pocketed his wand and turned to Rose. You interrupted a perfectly good pipe, I'll have you know, young lady. But never mind. Are there any other magical mishaps I might address before I return to my quarters? All four students shook their heads enthusiastically. Thank you, Professor, Rose said breathlessly. It really is a pleasure to see someone of your stature at work. Well, de Bellows replied, smoothing his robes, of course I understand. Good evening, students, and like I said, don't call me Professor. The name's Kendrick. Kendrick, Rose said, as if enthralled with the very syllables. Thank you, sir. Good night. When de Bellows finally left, Scorpius came alongside Rose, James, and Ralph. I think I'm going to be sick, he said. I'll say, Ralph agreed. You were supposed to act appreciative, Rose, not like you worship the ground under his feet. It was nothing, Rose replied, as if she'd been complimented. I mastered that technique years ago with my father. James grinned. You're a little scary, Rose. Come on, let's get to the gym. Scorpius, how'd it go with Tabitha, Philia, and Albus? As well as planned, Scorpius said, shrugging. They believed my story the moment they saw de Bellows march past. They won't be back. James reached the door to the gym first. He yanked it open and stepped inside, lighting his wand. In the darkness, the club members sat in groups, whispering excitedly. They looked up as the four entered. All right, James said, holding his wand over his head. Hi, everybody. Like I said a few minutes ago, we have an announcement today. After last week, there was a lot of talk about learning the three unforgivable curses. Scorpius is the teacher, so what we learn is up to him. But before we get to anything really scary powerful, we're going to get better at what we do know and spend some time practicing the techniques Professor de Bellas has been showing us in DADA. Why in the world will we do that? Nolan Beetlebrick said, standing up. I thought the whole point of this club was to learn the stuff he wasn't teaching us. 
Scorpius answered, The point of this club is to learn defensive techniques and become the best at them that we can. Some of you just want to learn a few quick incantations and curses? Be my guest, but if you think you'll be able to duel half as well as the rest of us after we've mastered the kind of skills De Bello showed us the other day, I think you'll end up very disappointed. Ralph surprised James by speaking up. I know it isn't very exciting to practice all the drills and exercise De Bellows have showed us. That's why we're going to keep working on the spells and magic too. But James is right. We have to learn it all together. It's the only way we'll really be the best we can be. But maybe some of you aren't happy with that. If so, remember it's just a club, not a class. You can go any time you want. Nolan Beetlebrick was still on his feet. He saw that everyone was looking at him. He shuffled his feet a little. So who's going to be teaching us this artist to set those stuff? Him, he exclaimed, pointing at Scorpius. I doubt his grandfather taught him any of that. No, James said, glancing at Scorpius. We have another teacher for that. He didn't learn it himself, but he'll be working alongside someone who knows it very well. Together they'll be leading that part of the club from now on. Yeah, Beetlebrick said, putting his hands on his hips. And who's that? Me. A voice answered. Beetlebrick jumped and took a step backwards as two ghosts flitted through the wall next to him. And her. James smiled as Cedric moved into the centre of the room, emanating his own soft light in the dark space. Next to him, the grey lady floated gently. Beetlebrick sat down on the floor again, staring in awe at Cedric and the tall, pale woman. Rose cleared her throat. Maybe it'd be helpful if you explained a little background, Cedric. Cedric glanced back at Rose and nodded. Of course, he said to the assembled club members. I'm Cedric Diggory, and I guess you all know who she is. This is the Grey Lady. She says she'd prefer that I not tell any of you her real name. But the point is, she knows Artis de Certo. Apparently, it was common for ladies to learn the defensive arts in her time. And, well, her mother thought it might be very helpful for her to be very well trained. The grey lady spoke in a thin, faraway voice. I was tutored under the very best teacher of martial magic in the world. He confided that I was one of his most gifted pupils. Most of those in the room had seen the grey lady flitting morosely around the halls, but few had ever heard her voice. Graham Wharton raised his hand tentatively. Who was it that taught you, Artis de Certo, miss? The lady looked at him and tilted her head slightly. My father, he invented the art. Look, Beetlebrick said, I don't mean any disrespect, but I have to ask. If you were all that great at dodging spells and curses like de Bellows did the other day, then how'd you end up getting killed so young? The grey lady seemed unperturbed by Beetlebrick's question. She opened her ghostly shawl, revealing the front of her dress. An ugly knife wound stained the dress, still as red as the day it had been inflicted. As you can see, she answered, it wasn't a spell that killed me. James leaned towards Rose. You've got your wish, Rose, he whispered. We've got a woman teaching us artist de Certo after all. I'm really enjoying the new stuff we're learning in Defence Club, James, Cameron Creevy said as he followed James down the stairs late on Saturday morning. Whoever would have thought that the Grey Lady had a seventh-degree mastery of martial magic? She always seemed so calm and feeble, didn't she? And with Cedric Diggory's ghost helping her to teach? I mean, wow! Who would have thought it? Yeah, Cameron, James said, walking as fast as he could. I'm glad you like the club. They passed a group of older students by the main doors, all of whom were dressed in jeans and jumpers or jackets, babbling excitedly. Professor McGonagall stood at the head of the queue, accepting and inspecting the small parchments each student handed her. Yes, yes, Mr. Metzger. No point in making a show of it, she said, as Noah flourished his permission slip. Off you go, and if I catch you with any more of those awful Peruvian ballistic beans, it'll be more than deducted house points, I can assure you. Who's next? Pity you can't come, James, Damien called, as James pushed past the queue, heading out into the courtyard. Hogsmeade weekends being only for third years and older, you know? He waggled his eyebrows and grinned. Sabrina elbowed him in the stomach. I wish I could go to Hogsmeade, Cameron said wistfully, staring after the departing students. Still, I'm sure there's a very good reason younger years can't go. Yeah, James said, stopping at the courtyard gate and turning to the younger boy. 
Well, anyway, Cameron, I'm sure you have other things to do today. Don't let me keep you. Cameron shook his head happily. No, actually, I don't have a thing to do. I was sort of hoping that... James! Rose called, panting as she ran across the courtyard to meet him. Ralph's coming! He insisted on borrowing a sneakers coat from Trenton Block. The blighter. That warning from Zane certainly got him on high alert, especially today, since, uh, hi, Cameron. Hi, Rose. Cameron grinned cheerfully. What's going on? Rose glanced at James, frowning a little. Oh, what? Nothing. You know, Saturday, this and that. Same as usual. Boring, really. What's your friend Ralph need a sneakers coat for? James put his arm around Cameron, trying to steer him back towards the front entrance. You know, Cameron, today would be a great day to practice up on some drills and exercises. The gym's open all day. I bet you could even find some other club members to join you. Well, why don't you three join me? Cameron said, ducking under James's arm. Since you don't have any plans yourself. Rose cleared her throat. It isn't that we don't have any plans exactly, Cameron. They're just, uh... Secret, James interjected, at exactly the same moment that Rose said, Boring. Secret, uh, boring plans, James went on, nodding. Club stuff, scheduling and counting members and, and, and planning field trips, Rose added, brightening. We're going to go on a defence club field trip, Cameron asked, furrowing his brow. Sure, James replied. It's a secret, so keep it to yourself. But we're going to go to, uh, uh, Rose chimed. The Forbidden Forest, with Hagrid, to practice artist asserto against some... Some centaurs, James supplied. He nodded. Yeah, that sounds about right. Cameron looked vaguely puzzled. Centaurs know about artist asserto? Sure, Rose said confidently. They practically invented it. I mean, they didn't really invent it, obviously, but practically... Anyway, it's a big secret, so don't tell anyone about it yet. All right. Hey, everybody, Ralph said as he approached, shouldering his satchel. We're all ready to go to Hagrid's, James interrupted, nodding at Ralph fervently, to talk about the field trip. Yeah, I suppose he'll be expecting us any minute. So, anyway, see you around, Cameron. Cameron looked at James, Rose and Ralph in succession, his eyes slightly narrowed. Then he smiled cheerfully. Yeah, sure. I'll keep it a secret. I've never seen a centaur in person. That'll be excellent. Centaurs, Ralph said, turning to James. You never said anything about... Cool, James interrupted. Yeah, thanks, Cam. Hush, hush, right? See you later. Cameron nodded and backed away. Finally, he turned and headed back towards the castle entrance. What in the world was all that about? Ralph asked as the three students ran around the corner of the gate. James's secret admirer, Rose said. We had to come up with something fast so he wouldn't tail us around all day. Do you think you can remember the secret knot? James asked, changing the subject. Rose answered. Jennifer marked it with a spot of green paint. It looks like moss unless you get up close. Should be pretty easy to find if you know what to look for. As they crested the hill and came in sight of the Whomping Willow, James found a long stick beneath a birch. He smiled, showing it to Ralph and Rose. Rose nodded seriously. You're on secret knot duty then, James, she said. Just give it a good poke. We'll follow you into the entrance between the roots once the willow goes still. James gripped the stick and approached the tree. The willow seemed to sense his intent. It reared slightly, creaking its roots and whipping its thinnest branches threateningly. Stay low, Ralph called. You'll need to get just inside the shadow of the tree to reach the knot. The big branches can't reach you, but those little green ones might if you're too high. James hunkered as low as he could until he was crawling forward on his hands and knees. The tree swished and groaned over him. A whip-like green branch swung at him, trying to wrench the stick out of his hand. It missed, but James felt the breeze of its passage. Careful, Rose cried in a thin voice. Just right there, slowly. James reached as far as he could, staring down the length of the stick at its wavering tip. He could see the spot of green paint applied earlier in the term by Jennifer Tellus. This close up, he could see that she had painted it in the shape of a tiny, smiley face. The whomping willow creaked ponderously, and James felt its shadow leaning over him. He lunged and poked with the stick, striking the knot dead on. That's it, Rose cried. James heard both Ralph and Rose running forward. He scrambled up, slipping on the wet grass. 
Clumsily, he hurled himself forwards into the dark crack between the willow's massive roots. He landed with a thud in the mossy hollow beneath the tree. A moment later, he heard and felt the entrance of Ralph and Rose. They landed on either side of him, barely missing him in the damp darkness. James laughed in relief. He began to climb to his feet when a fourth shape hurtled through the entrance, bowling directly into James. A knee bounced off his chest, knocking the wind out of him. There was a chorus of angry and surprised shouts. What the? Ralph cried, scrambling up and snatching after the intruder. He caught the figure by the collar just as Rose whipped out her wand. Lumos! she cried, holding it up. The wand light sprayed over the skinny shape of Cameron Creevy, held suspended by Ralph's grip. The boy had dirt and bits of bark on his face. He grinned gamely. Hi, guys, he said, panting. Some field trip, eh? Chapter 15 Out of Hogsmeade I couldn't help it, Cameron said as the four traipsed along the length of the tunnel. I just knew you were up to something exciting. I saw you heading out towards the Whomping Willow, and I remembered reading that there had been a secret passage there back in our parents' day. They say it was all sealed off after the battle, but still, I knew you three could find a way through if you wanted, so I followed along. I was about to call out to you, but then the tree stopped moving, and you all ran towards it. I did the first thing that came to mind and ran after you. It was a near thing, too. The willow came back alive just as I got under it. It swiped at me and barely missed. Stupid, lazy tree, Ralph muttered. Cameron, that was a very reckless thing to do, Rose said reprovingly, still holding her wand aloft to light the way. Well, you can't blame me, can you? Cameron protested shrilly. I've read all the Harry Potter stories at least a dozen times. When I saw you sneaking off, I knew you were going on some big secret adventure. I just wanted to see it in person. I promise I won't get in the way. Those stories are all rubbish, Cameron, James grumbled, not really believing it. My dad says that he couldn't even read them all the way through. They make it all seem like an exciting romp, but it was mostly really scary and people dying and buckets of dumb luck. Oh, I know, Cameron enthused. Believe me, I understand all that. I know Revalvier's books are cleaned up a little bit. I mean, they were written to be children's stories. But still, my dad says they got the main parts all right, and your dad really did fight Voldemort and defeat him, all because of the protection his mum gave him when she died to save him. That part wasn't made up, was it? Look, Cam, James began a little angrily, but Rose cleared her throat and nudged him. We weren't the only ones to lose relatives in the fight against Voldemort, she said softly. James remembered. Cameron's Uncle Colin had been killed during the Battle of Hogwarts. James sighed. All right, Cameron. I guess you've got as much right to come along as any of us. But trust me, there aren't going to be any grand adventures. There better not be, Ralph said darkly. I told you, Ralph, Rose said. The tunnel to Hogsmeade is technically a part of Hogwarts. It's under the protection Merlin gave the castle. We're safe here. Ralph didn't seem particularly relieved. Yeah, well, what about when we get to Hogsmeade? Are you going to tell me that somehow the old village is technically a part of Hogwarts? Arguably it could be, she answered. It's probably the last vestige of the fief that once surrounded the castle. But either way, there will be loads of people there. Not even, uh, someone really powerful would attack us with all those crowds around. Besides, no one has seen the headmaster for almost two weeks, have they? I saw him yesterday, Cameron piped up. He was in the hall outside the common room, just walking along like he was on a stroll. James glanced back at Cameron. You saw Merlin in the castle. Are you sure it was him? I thought he was off travelling somewhere. That's what Professor Longbottom said. I guess he got back, didn't he? Cameron replied. What? I thought you all liked Headmaster Merlin. Sure, Cam, Rose said. We like him well enough. We just, uh, wouldn't want to get caught sneaking off the grounds like this. Cameron grinned. Oh, you three won't get caught. That wouldn't make a very good story, would it? James was becoming rather annoyed with Cameron. This isn't a story, you know. Merlin knows when things are going on around the school. If he's here... Let's not spook ourselves, Rose said soothingly. We're not doing anything terrible. We just want to get a look around Hogsmeade, that's all. Nothing bad is going to happen. Cameron's probably right. 
It wouldn't make a very good story if we were all captured and horribly dispatched by some waiting enemy in the shrieking shack. Her voice trailed off uncomfortably. Uh, would it? Depends on what kind of story it is, Ralph said gloomily. They walked in nervous silence for a while. Eventually, the tunnel began to slope upwards. It ended at a jumble of broken crates and bits of furniture, all covered with dust and cobwebs. Beyond was only thick darkness. We must be at the shack, Rose said in a whisper. James, can we make it through? Just barely if we move some of this rubbish around. James gingerly began to stack some of the fallen crates. Dust puffed up at his efforts, clouding Rose's wand light. Spiders skittered on the walls. So we're at the Shrieking Shack, then? Ralph asked in a quavering voice. Should we be expecting it to, you know, start shrieking? Rose answered. It doesn't do that, Ralph. It's a long story, but there's nothing to be afraid of here. At least, not any more. Ralph gulped. Then why are you whispering? There, James said, wiping his brow with his sleeve. I can see through. It's really dark, but if you duck right here, we can get into the next room. James led the way, clambering through the small opening on his hands and knees. He could see that the tunnel entrance had once been larger, but the shrieking shack had deteriorated quite a lot in the years since the tunnel had been used. Much of the wall had crumbled around the opening, and the ceiling overhead had partially collapsed. Whoa! Cameron said in awe as the four students dusted themselves off. This is where it all happened. This is where Harry Potter learned the truth about Sirius Black. I bet it was right over there that Black almost killed the rat Peter Pettigrew. Thanks for the play-by-play, -play, Cam, James muttered. Come on, let's get out. Cameron gasped, causing everyone to jump. It must have been right here that Voldemort ordered his snake Nagini to attack Professor Snape, Cameron said breathlessly. He probably died right where you're standing, Ralph. Can you, like, stop talking about who killed who in this very room, Cameron? Ralph exclaimed. It's not like the place needs any more ambience. Oh, Cameron said sheepishly. Yeah, uh, sorry. Slowly, the four made their way upstairs, stepping carefully through a strew of broken furniture and collapsed ceilings and walls. The deterioration of the shrieking shack was severe enough that James worried the place might simply collapse on top of them. Wind whistled and moaned through cracks in the walls, making the entire house creak. As they reached the main floor, broken windows let in enough daylight that Rose could finally extinguish her wand. There's the door, Cameron said, pointing. Remarkably, the old door was still intact, and fit snugly enough in its warped frame that the four of them had to pull the handle simultaneously to budge it open. I'm really glad to be out of there, Ralph said, jumping off the sagging porch. I think the only thing holding that place up is force of habit. James glanced back at the shack. Let's just hope it holds up for at least a few more hours. It occurs to me, Ralph said, looking at James and Rose, that this is an awful lot to go through just to get some Drubal's best blowing gum and say hi to Ted. Rose shook her head and trotted along the path leading towards the village. Oh, come on, Ralph. Where's your sense of adventure? I think I used it all up last year. James smiled. The worst part's behind us, Ralphinator. Come on, it'll be fun. Hurry up, you guys, Cameron called, halfway between Rose and the two boys. I have to use the toilet. Ralph rolled his eyes and then grinned at James. Come on, I'll race you. James, Ralph, Rose and Cameron found their way to the high street and wandered along it, happily enamoured by the various shops and bustling crowds. James and Ralph were debating whether to visit Honeydukes or Weasley's Wizard Wheezes first, when Rose exclaimed in delight, pointing. Scriven shafts, James said as Rose hurried forward. You want to go to the quill shop first? I know I won't be able to afford much of anything, Rose replied, pushing through the door and jingling the bell. But I can't wait to see what the new Heddlebum self-inking dodo tips are like. Oh, look, they have an actual working recalls it all pen. It remembers everything you write and can duplicate it perfectly. Now that would be handy, James said, his eyes widening. A pen that can take your tests for you. How much? Rose glanced at James disdainfully. It's really amazing how hard you'll work to avoid the simplest schoolwork, James. Yep, James answered. Uncle Ron would be proud. 
The four of them worked their way along the street, stopping in at most of the shops along the way. Cameron bought a new wand holder at Hiram and Blatwart's Leathers and immediately sheathed his wand in it. He showed it to James and Ralph. Protects the finish while simultaneously enhancing magical properties, Cameron proclaimed proudly, reading directly from the tag. The inside is lined with suede and enriched with whim knots, wand polish and enchant enhancer. It cleans and empowers my wand every time I put it away. That's great, Cam, Ralph nodded. Uh, looks really dashing, too. Thanks, Cameron grinned. Hey, can we stop at the newsstand? I want to see if the new issue of Stupendous Stories is available. The newsstand stood on the corner of the High Street and Guddy Mutter Avenue. It was the only two-storied newsstand James had ever seen. A spiral staircase on the side led to a narrow, wrought-iron walkway that encircled the second level. The walkway was packed with wizards and witches browsing every type of newspaper and magazine imaginable. The very peak of the newsstand was a noisy miniature owlery, twittering with birds of all sizes. They seemed to be coming and going at every moment, each owl attended to by a small man installed at a round desk in the centre. As each owl arrived, the little man spun on his chair to receive its parcel. Most of these seemed to be small strips of parchment, rolled like scrolls and inserted into brass tubes on the owl's legs. As the man removed the message, he had turned to a speaking tube and read its contents. The speaking tube carried the man's voice through a complicated curlicue of expanding pipes and bellows, eventually broadcasting his every word out over the high street. Breaking news from Turkey, the man read in a surprisingly deep baritone voice. The Grand Vizier of the Wizarding Caliphate, Rajar Hasajar, has died unexpectedly to be replaced in interim by his assistant, Ahmed al-Mustafas, International Wizarding Bank Authority, to freeze all transactions with the Caliphate until said crisis is satisfactorily managed. Updates as events warrant. Oh, look who's on the cover of this month's Quibbler, Rose cried delightedly, pulling a copy off a shelf on the lower level. James leaned over Rose's shoulder, studying the tabloid in her hands. Daughter of Quibbler founder to wed read the cover headline, alongside a photo of Luna Lovegood happily accepting a ring from her new beau, Rolf Scamander. The picture was obviously staged, but Luna's smile was genuine enough, and the look of happy affection on Rolf's rather bug-like face was unmistakable. In the photo, Luna took the ring and then held it out to the camera. It seemed to be made of amber with an insect embedded in it. That's been done, Ralph sniffed. Well, I'm happy for her, Rose said, replacing the tabloid on the rack. Luna's hoped to get married for a long time. She wants a family. How do you know that? James asked, furrowing his brow. I've known Luna all my life, and she's never said anything about that. Rose looked aloof. That's because you haven't been listening in on the right conversations. Overhead, the owlery announcer spoke through his amplifying apparatus. In an update to previous reports, the mysterious sightings of swarms of Dementors throughout central London have only increased, although no amount of investigation has been able to pinpoint the hive's origin or predict the locations of any future oppressions. Further, the range of the infestation appears to be increasing daily, reaching into neighbouring vicinities at an alarming rate. Muggle reportage of the incidents is gaining precedent, although attributions of the effects are extremely varied. In a breaking development, the Ministry of Magic has announced the creation of an aura subdepartment to locate and subdue the hive. Meanwhile, many concerned citizens of the magical world are departing the central London area until the unexplained oppressions are brought under control. Continuing updates as events warrant. Ralph's face had gone pale. I heard something about those Dementor swarms when I first went home for the holiday, but I didn't think anything of it. It seems to have got a lot worse now. Do you think this is connected to the descent of the gatekeeper? It must be, James said, remembering his earlier conversation with the headmaster. Merlin told me that the Borleys were basically baby Dementors. Maybe the gatekeeper is something like the ultimate Dementor. Maybe the gatekeeper has assembled all the uncaptured Dementors and is using them to begin its work on the earth. Rose shuddered. That's an awful thought. If it's true, James, then our parents might be in danger, since they work at the Ministry. Especially your dad. 
"'If he's in charge of that Aura sub-department, "'he'll be chasing the gatekeeper, and he won't even know it. "'We have to warn them!' "'James knew Rose was right. "'He nodded. "'I'll send Dad an owl as soon as we get back tonight. "'I'll tell him everything we know so far.' "'But why would the gatekeeper be using Dementors?' "'Ralph asked. "'I thought it could affect humans directly.' "'Rose answered. "'It can, but only a few at a time, for now. "'It feeds on fear and terror, "'so it's using the Dementors to get what it needs, "'but this proves that it hasn't found its human host yet. "'Once it possesses the host, "'it won't need the Dementors any more. "'It'll become directly connected to the community of mankind. "'It'll be able to affect loads of people all at once, "'and nothing will be able to stop it.' We need to get both halves of the beacon stone before that happens, James said fervently. Whoever has the whole stone can still send the gatekeeper back into the void, right? We don't even know where Slytherin's half of the stone is, Ralph lamented. And the half we do know about is on the finger of the most powerful wizard in the world. This makes stealing Jackson's briefcase last year look like a walk in the park. James was unperturbed. At least we know where Merlin's beacon ring is. We just need to find out who might have inherited Slytherin's beacon ring. Well, no problem there, Ralph said sarcastically. We just need to trace some mystical black ring through three dozen generations of dark wizards. That should be a breeze. What mystical black ring? Cameron asked, returning with a newsstand sack. Rose rolled her eyes. Nothing, Cameron. We're just trying to save the world here. We do this every day, you know. Oh, Cameron said, frowning a little. I just thought maybe you were talking about the gaunt family ring Headmaster Dumbledore gave your dad. As one, James, Ralph and Rose looked at Cameron. He blinked at them a little nervously. What ring, Cameron? Ralph asked. Cameron smiled crookedly, as if he was being teased. You know, the ring with the resurrection stone in it. It was one of the Deathly Hallows in the last book. Headmaster Dumbledore captured it and gave it to Harry Potter inside the Golden Snitch. You remember that, uh, don't you? Rose, Ralph and James exchanged looks. Rose said, Could it really be that simple? James's eyes widened thoughtfully. Cameron, you know those books pretty much frontwards and backwards, right? Tell us everything you remember about that ring. Cameron looked at James, a little puzzled, and then shrugged. Well, according to legend, the ring once belonged to death, so it allowed the holder to see and speak to dead people. It was passed on through generations of Salazar Slytherin's relatives until it came to the Gaunt family. Voldemort took the ring and used it as a... a... a horcrux. Cameron whispered the last word as if it were a sort of swear word. He went on in his normal voice. Later, Dumbledore captured the ring and cracked the stone with Gryffindor's sword, making it useless to Voldemort. After Dumbledore died, he willed the stone to Harry Potter, hiding it inside his snitch. In the book, Harry uses the resurrection stone to speak to his dead parents when he's going to confront Voldemort in the forest. After that, no one knows what became of the stone. Anyway, when you said something about a mysterious black ring, I just thought that might be what you were talking about. My mistake. Cameron, Rose said seriously, I could kiss you, you silly geek. That's brilliant. Cameron blushed fiercely and hugged his newsstand sack, grinning. Ralph asked, Do you really think the resurrection stone and the beacon stone are the same thing? It certainly seems to fit, James replied. It was black and set into a ring, and it was passed on by Salazar Slytherin through loads of generations. Rose added, and it allowed the bearer to see and communicate with dead people because it came from the void that all departed souls pass through. Ralph shuddered. So whatever became of it, what happened to it after that night in the forest? It's just like Cameron said, Rose sighed. No one knows. If I remember rightly, it was purposefully left out of the books so that nobody would be tempted to search for the stone again. It was presumed lost forever. Nobody knows where it is, or even if it still exists. James narrowed his eyes, thinking. He decided not to say anything, but he knew of at least one person who did know what had become of the Resurrection Stone, and James was one of the only people on Earth who could ask that person and possibly get an answer. Eventually, the foursome made their way to the Three Broomsticks, affectionately known among some of the older students as the Triple Sticks. They ordered butterbeers and had a light dinner. 
Hogwarts students packed the tables, talking boisterously and calling to each other. Sabrina, Damien, and Jennifer Tellus jostled through the door, just as James was finishing his sausage. Damien grinned as they pushed their way through the throng. Made it through the tunnel, I see, Damien called. I'm a little jealous, you know. We discovered that passageway first. I was hoping to be the first to see the inside of the Shrieking Shack. How was it? Barely standing, James answered. You'll be lucky if it's still upright when you go through yourself. Where's Noah and Petra? Rose asked. Jennifer rolled her eyes. Oh, they're having a lover's spat over at Madame Puddyfoot's. I told them it'd be nothing but trouble if they started dating. They aren't really dating, Sabrina said, pulling up a chair and sitting down. They're just snogging. It isn't exactly the same thing. James glanced up sharply, surprised that he had somehow missed this development. How long have they been, uh, snogging? It started about a week before Christmas, Sabrina replied. It's probably all that rehearsing as lovers for the play that did it. You can only pretend to fancy one another for so long before it leaks over into real life. James knows all about that, Ralph said, popping the last of his sausage into his mouth. James sighed. So what are they fighting about? Rose asked. Damien gestured dramatically. Noah saw Petra having some big, heavy conversation with Ted behind Weasley's. She was crying, and Ted didn't look too happy either. Noah's quite the jealous type, you know. He should have known what he was getting into, dating his best friend's former girl, Jennifer proclaimed loftily. Spell trouble any way you look at it. Sabrina said, I just don't understand what Ted sees in Victoire anyway. He was lucky to have Petra. Victoire's a bit of a stuck-up powder puff, no matter how you look at her. No offence. Rose waved a hand. Oh, you don't have to apologise to us. We think the same thing most of the time. James felt suddenly hot and angry. He stared out of the window, confused at his own thoughts and emotions. Something about the fact that Noah and Petra were suddenly dating needled him mercilessly. He'd always liked Noah quite a lot, but now, all of a sudden, he wanted to go and find the older boy and push him down. The irony of it was that he knew where to find Noah. He was sitting across from Petra at this very moment, just down the street in the ridiculously pink and fluffy Madame Puttyfoot's tea shop. Worse, James now knew for certain that Noah wasn't the main problem. Just as Rose had said, Petra was obviously still in love with Ted Lupin, despite the fact that he had moved on to Victoire. The whole affair was hopelessly complicated, and James was frustrated to realise that there was absolutely nothing he could do about it. Eventually, the conversation moved on to other topics. James, Rose, Ralph and Cameron said goodbye to the gremlins and made their way out to the street. The evening was cooling as the sun lowered, bringing a restless wind through the village. Bits of newspaper and sweet wrappers scurled across the street as students began making the journey back to the distant castle. The foursome began to make their way to the shrieking shack, stopping only once along the way to pop into Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, where they hoped to say hello to George and Ted. The old tunnel is open, eh? George said, grinning over the front counter. That's excellent. Fred and I only tried that route once, since everyone was afraid of the ghosts in the shack. We didn't make it all the way through, though, but we got far enough to leave some graffiti on the walls, as I recall. Rose nodded. Yeah, I think I saw that. The drawing of Professor Snape was particularly amusing. Oh, those were Fred's, George said, sighing. He was a good one for a quick caricature. He said it was all in the hook nose. James asked, So how's business been? Oh, really excellent. Ever since we bought out Zonko's, we've been rolling. They had a pretty loyal clientele, you know. I've even considered making this Weasley's flagship location instead of the shop at Diagon Alley, but Ron says I shouldn't. He says the original location is still the best. Rose looked around appreciatively. I bet Ted loves working here. This place is right up his alley. Yeah, George agreed. It's good having him around. He's a hard worker, and he has some great ideas for some new products. Some of those new every flavour beans were his ideas, although even I drew the line at a flavour called guanamole. The blight has been no use to me today, though. These Ogsmead weekends are like a family reunion for him. He's been in and out all day doing who knows what. There was a loud snap. James and Rose turned to see Cameron shaking his finger violently, trying to dislodge something that had apparently clamped onto the end of it. You snapped it, you bought it, my friend, George said jovially as he came out from behind the counter. 
Just kidding, really. Those are the finger-snapping galleons. Always a laugh, those. Just lay one on the ground and wait for any unsuspecting person to come across it. They certainly look real, Cameron admitted as George pried the fake coin off his finger. Up until the point that it chomps on you, I mean. That's uh, great, thanks. If you like those, you'll love our disapparating knickers, bomb. George said, leading Cameron to another shelf. Now with an expanded effectiveness range of three metres. Great for parties. As James browsed around, he peeked through the backroom curtain and saw Ted sitting on a pile of crates. Lately, he had taken to using his metamorph major skills to change the appearance of his hair again, just as he had when he'd been a baby. He had made it quite long today. It hung in dark curtains, partially obscuring his face. James thought he looked a bit like the long-departed Sirius Black. Hey, Ted, James said. How's everything? Ted looked up, although James still couldn't see his face. Oh, hi, James. It's all right. How's practicing for the National Quidditch team coming? Hmm? Ted said. Oh, yeah. It's all right, I guess. I've been really busy here at the shop, but other than that, yeah, it's fine. Ted, James said, slipping past the curtain. Uh, what's going on? Ted's voice was strangely flat. What do you mean? I mean with Petra. I know it's none of my business, but... What do you know about it? Ted asked, a little sharply. I know Metzger's all in a tizzy about it, and the rest of the gremlins are probably talking it up, but I don't think you'd be in on it too. In on what? James asked, stopping just inside the backroom curtain. Look, I... Whatever everyone is saying, it's all rubbish, James. You lot just need to leave Petra alone, especially Metzger, and you can tell him I said so. Ted, James began, but didn't quite know what else to say. Ted stirred, climbing to his feet. I see you got Doll off with you. You're still chumming around with him, eh? James looked hard at Ted. You mean Ralph? Uh, yeah, I guess. Why? Oh, no reason, really. After all, it wasn't his people that killed your parents. James shook his head. Ted, you... You can't blame Ralph for that. He wasn't even born then. His father was just a kid when the battle happened. Ted sighed wearily. Don't tell me who I can and can't blame, James. Look, I'm sorry I brought it up. I'm not in a very good mood tonight. Maybe you and Rose and your friend should get back to the tunnel. It's getting dark. James nodded slowly. Yeah, I guess you're right. He turned to go and then looked back. See you later, Ted. Ted waved. See you around, James. Be careful. By the time the quartet came out of Weasley's Wizard Wheezes, the sun had dipped below the horizon, leaving a fierce orange and purple sky behind it. Quickly, they made their way back towards the shrieking shack. The protective fence around the property had long since fallen into disrepair. James led the way through the same break in the fence they had used earlier in the day. At the top of the hill, the ramshackle shack stood in black shadow, looming ominously. I was really hoping to get through this part before it got dark, Ralph said fervently. I can't even see the front door. It's right there, Rose said, lighting her wand and pointing it. Just like we left it. Rose's voice trailed away as her wand light played over the front of the shack. In spite of her words, the door didn't, in fact, look exactly as they'd left it. I thought we pulled the door closed again, Cameron said curiously. Didn't we pull the... Yes, Cam. James interrupted. We certainly didn't leave it like that. The front door had been shoved open so far that the top hinge had broken. It leaned awkwardly inside its frame. Beyond the entry was impenetrable darkness. Does that look like someone was going in or coming out? Ralph asked, trying to keep his voice even. What does it matter? James asked. Well, for one thing, it tells us if we were followed or if we're walking into a trap. Ralph answered reasonably. Cameron asked, Who tried to trap us? Nobody, Rose replied firmly. Come on, it's probably just an animal or something. Let's just get this over with. She climbed onto the sagging porch and shone her wand light into the dark doorway. James clambered up next to her, his heart pounding. Together they walked through the doorway with Ralph and Cameron following close behind. The interior of the shack had obviously been disturbed. Some of the old furniture had been shoved aside, leaving scrapes on the dusty floor. Worse, the stairway leading to the cellar looked all wrong. The doorway was splintered and bowed, and the stairs beyond seemed unnaturally steep. 
Wait, James said, grabbing Rose's arm. This isn't right. Look down there. All four students hunkered and peered down the rickety staircase. By the glow of Rose's wand, they could clearly see that the room below was virtually gone. Broken hunks of wall and sections of collapsed ceiling choked the stairs, completely blocking them. How could that have happened just today? Ralph asked breathlessly. I mean, it held up for twenty years, and then decides to come crashing down right after we came through. Maybe we dislodged it somehow, Cameron reasoned. James shook his head. No, someone did this on purpose. Someone knows we're here and is forcing us to go home by another route. Cameron looked at James, smiling quizzically. Why would anyone do that? Because they want to keep us out of the tunnel, Ralph answered in a small voice. Because the tunnel is part of Hogwarts. Come on, Rose said quickly. If we hurry, we can catch up with some of the other returning students. Cameron looked alarmed. But we'll get caught when we go back, he exclaimed. Professor McGonagall will see us coming back with the older students. We'll get into trouble. Let's seriously hope that that's the worst thing that happens, Cameron, Ralph said, following Rose back out of the decimated front door. As quickly as they could, the four retraced their steps back along the high street. As they walked, James could occasionally see the spires and turrets of Hogwarts Castle looking teasingly close against the darkening sky. A side street at the end of town seemed to angle in the right direction. James led the troop down it towards a stand of intervening forest. This doesn't look right, James, Ralph worried. Isn't there a path that leads straight through to the castle? James answered, Yeah, we have to be getting near it. Watch between the cottages. I wonder where everyone else is, Cameron commented, looking around at the narrow, deserted street. A dog barked nearby, and something squeaked in the cooling wind. Shouldn't there be other students heading back along this route? Hogsmeade weekend officially ends at dusk, Rose said quietly. They were already heading back by the time we stopped in to see George. Or is that? Ralph suddenly asked, spinning on his heels to look behind him. What? James whispered, his hair prickling. Ralph's eyes darted over the street. I... I thought I heard something behind us. Rose shook her head. Get hold of yourselves, you two. It was probably just a dog or something. I heard it too, Cameron said. It came from over by the alley. Come on, Rose said firmly, pulling the bigger boys by the sleeves. You're spooking me, and I was spooked enough already. Let's go. A few minutes later, the side street turned a sharp corner in the wrong direction. James peeked between the cramped cottages, looking for some sign of the castle. There's a little footpath, he said. It winds back through some trees. Is it the path to the school? Ralph asked. I don't know, but it's going in the right direction. Let's give it a go. James led the troop between the cottages, past a tiny fenced garden, and into the darkness of a stand of trees. The trail wound between bushes and tall grass. This is just getting worse and worse, Ralph said quietly. I thought the old point was for us to never be alone. We're not alone, James said as he plodded further along the path. We have Cameron with us. And whatever was following us back there, Cameron added cheerfully. Cameron, Rose said warningly. James was growing increasingly worried. The path was winding deeper into a stretch of forest that separated Hogsmeade from the grounds of Hogwarts. The trees blocked the light of the dusky sky, reducing the path to a dim patchwork of shadows. Occasionally, James thought he heard the sound of footsteps along the path behind them or further ahead of them, but he determined not to call attention to them. He pulled out his wand and illuminated it, holding it up as high as he could. The wand light starkly lit the nearby trees, but only made the deeper depths seem all the darker by comparison. No one spoke for several minutes as they walked. Finally, thankfully, the path turned towards a thinner patch of trees. Through them, James could see the indigo of the evening sky and the pale yellow face of the full moon. Look, Rose said, pointing, just beyond the edge of the trees. I think that's the main gate. I can see the silhouette of the two boars. James squinted. He didn't have his glasses with him, so he couldn't quite make out the distant shapes in the darkness. Yeah, Ralph said. I see it. Wow, that's a sight. Come on. As the four students trotted forwards, the trees parted overhead, revealing the night sky and a scattering of stars. 
the moon shone its pale yellow light all around. Sure enough, the ancient wall and the open gates stood nearby. The two famous stone boars arched their backs at the sky, bearing their tusks. James breathed a great sigh of relief. In a few moments they would be safely within the grounds of Hogwarts again. <laughs> Cameron laughed nervously. See, I told you there'd be a great adventure. Wait until my dad hears about... Cameron's voice cut off as a noise of running feet approached swiftly. The boy turned to look back, his face curious. Something large and dark loomed out of the darkness, flying low over the ground. Rose screamed, lunging backwards and reaching for her wand. Ralph and James ducked as the figure hurtled over them. It landed on the path between James and the gate, skidding on the dirt and turning back to face them. A low, ferocious growl came from it, and it began to advance. Stupefy! Rose called, pointing her wand, but it was too dark to aim properly. The red bolt struck the ground in front of the creature, lighting it for an instant. James saw teeth bared along a narrow snout and bright, terrible eyes. It's a wolf! he called, scrambling backwards. The wolf responded to his voice with a loud snarl. It lowered, coiling close to the ground, and then pounced. James covered his face, shielding himself from the teeth and claws, but instead of being mauled by the beast, he was knocked roughly aside by it. Then, directly behind him, there came the noise of a violent struggle and a scream of pain. It was Ralph. James scrambled to his feet, reaching for his wand. With a gasp, he realized he'd dropped it when the beast had attacked. Stun it, Rose! James called. I can't! Rose cried, pointing her wand wildly. I can't tell them apart! If I stun Ralph, it'll kill him! The wolf rolled with Ralph as he wrestled it. It seemed to have his wrist locked in its jaws. It shook its head violently, tearing at Ralph's arm. Ralph screamed again, trying to kick the enormous beast off of him. Without thinking, James lunged at the creature. He threw his arms around the matted fur of its neck, pulling as hard as he could. Suddenly, intensely, James's phantom scar burned. He squinted against it, willing himself not to let go of the wolf's neck. The beast scrambled and thrashed, still not releasing its grip on Ralph's arm. James could feel the muscles pulsing beneath the wolf's fur, could smell the dank smell of its pelt. Suddenly it got a paw on James's chest. It dug in its claws and swiped, tearing ragged strips in James's sweatshirt. He felt something hot and sticky immediately soak into his shirt, but there was no pain. Instead, the pain in his forehead throbbed and pulsed, distracting him. The wolf thrashed again, knocking James loose. He scrambled after it, but it was too fast. The paw swiped, barely missing James's face. Suddenly there was another voice calling out, No, Ted! Stop! This isn't the way! Let him go! James rolled and got to his knees. He looked around wildly, squinting past the throb in his forehead, and saw a tall figure lunging onto the wolf. James was too stunned to immediately recognize who it was. The newcomer pulled at the wolf's ears, forcing it to release its grip on Ralph. The beast flailed its head back and forth, snapping. Stop this, Ted! the newcomer cried, and James finally recognized it was Petra. You don't know what you're doing! This isn't the way to fix things! Not here! Not now! The wolf lunged mightily, hurling Petra off, but it didn't renew its attack on Ralph. The beast snarled at him and then leapt away, snapping and slavering its bloody jaws. It seemed confused, almost as if it were at war with itself. Finally, it threw back its head and howled long and loud. It chilled James's blood because he could sense the humanity in that howl, almost as if Ted's voice was buried under it, crying out in anguish and despair. Petra climbed to her feet and slowly approached the great wolf. Remarkably, she knelt next to it and stroked its fur. She spoke to it quietly, soothingly. Ralph, Rose rasped, dropping next to the big boy. Are you all right? How badly are you hurt? Ralph moaned and rolled over, struggling to his knees. James scrambled over to him. I think my arm's broken, Ralph said with remarkable blandness. It feels all loose and up. James could see the mangled mess of Ralph's wrist. 
blood soaked through his shredded sleeve. Ralph! James exclaimed. You look awful! You look pretty horrible too, Ralph said. Are all your guts still inside? I think so. Uh, I hope, James replied, looking down at his bloody chest. Let me look at your wrist, Ralph, Petra suddenly said, kneeling next to him. Ralph held it up. Petra gingerly peeled back the torn fabric of Ralph's sleeve, revealing his forearm. Artemisai, she said, touching her wand to the cuts and punches. That'll stop the bleeding until we can get you to Madame Curio. What are you doing here, Petra? James asked, as she turned to examine his chest. I was walking back by myself, she answered. I was just coming up the path when I saw what was happening. Rose was trembling visibly. But, but how did you know that the wolf was... was... It's a full moon, Rose, and Ted and I... we talked a lot. He told me about his... condition. Petra performed the same technique on James's scratches, which, she assured him, looked a lot worse than they were. Finally, Rose and Petra helped James and Ralph to their feet. Where'd the wolf go? Ralph asked, shaking. Is it gone? Petra nodded, looking back towards the forest. He's gone. Rose gasped and covered her mouth with her hands. What about Cameron? she said through her fingers. A cursory search found Cameron lying on his face in the grass, the bag from the newsstand covering his head. He had a very large, muddy paw print on his back, but was otherwise completely unhurt. What happened? he asked woozily as they dragged him upright. I think I fainted. Did I really faint? I missed the whole thing. James sighed, finally feeling some pain in his chest as the wound stiffened. We'll tell you all about it later, Cam. Let's just get back to the castle. Limping and bloody, the group of five made their way through the gate, heading towards the welcome glow of the castle windows. After a minute, James trotted back, holding one hand over his chest. He looked around for a few moments, cursing under his breath. Finally, he found his wand in a tuft of grass. He tucked it into his jeans pocket and ran back, yelling for the rest to wait up. In the dark distance, somewhere between the gate and the village of Hogsmeade, a wolf howled a long, sorrowful note. Chapter 16 Unexpected Confrontations Just as Cameron had feared, Professor McGonagall was awaiting the returning students. She sat in a portable chair with a cup of tea and her tartan shawl, a long parchment across her lap. Petra climbed the portico steps first. McGonagall looked up as Petra came into the light. You're rather late, Miss Morganston. Yours is the last name on my list. Perhaps you'd... The professor's voice cut off as she saw the others climbing slowly up the steps. Her eyes widened, immediately taking in James's bloody shirt and Ralph's mangled wrist. She leapt up, spilling her tea. Mr. Porter! Mr. Deedle! What in the world is the meaning? She began, and then stopped herself. Miss Morganston, please collect Madame Curio from the Great Hall and ask her to meet us immediately in the hospital wing. It was a... Ralph began, holding his wrist in front of him. Some sort of wild animal, Petra interrupted. It came out of the woods while we were on our way back. It's all my fault, Professor. It probably smelled the half-corned beef sandwich I was carrying home from Madame Puddyfoot's. I should have known better. We'll determine who should have known what later, Miss Morganston, McGonagall huffed, herding the troop towards the hospital wing. For now, please hurry, Madame Curio. Madame Curio met them shortly after their arrival. She clucked her tongue as she gave James's chest a cursory look and then turned to Ralph. Miss Morganston, you did a very satisfactory job halting the bleeding on these boys, she proclaimed in a businesslike manner. Would you be so kind as to assist me? By the time my nurses arrive, we'll probably be finished. Hand me that bottle of arthroset and that box of dermamend bandages, please, and perhaps you'd be so kind as to clean Mr. Potter's wounds. Petra scrubbed her hands and filled the basin. James hissed through his teeth as she began to gently sponge off his scratches. You mustn't tell anyone about Ted, Petra whispered as she worked. The world isn't a very forgiving place for werewolves, even half-werewolves like Ted. I know, James answered quietly. He told me about it last year, but he wasn't transforming then. He was just getting really restless and hungry around full moons. 
Petra nodded. He still doesn't transform very much. He's only got half the blood of a werewolf. If he'd been a full werewolf, I'd never have been able to talk him out of attacking Ralph. He only looks fully lycanthrope because he's also a metamorph magus like his mother. You mean he purposely transforms himself to look like a wolf? Petra shook her head, but more out of confusion than denial. It's very complicated. I don't think he really means to. Usually he can control it, but when a full moon comes, part of Ted really wants to change into a wolf, even though his father's blood isn't enough to force the physical change. Since he's his mother's son, though, he can transform himself, and the more upset he is, the harder it is for him to keep it under control. James sighed, and it hurt his chest. He was about to ask why Ted had only attacked Ralph, but he knew the answer already. Ted had made it very clear when James had talked to him earlier in the day. Ralph was a Dollarhoff, even if he hadn't formally taken the name, and it was a Dollarhoff who'd taken Ted's parents away from him. Quietly, James asked, Do you think it was Ted that destroyed the tunnel entrance in the Shrieking Shack? Petra shrugged slightly. It might have been. He had reasons to be upset today. I'm afraid I reminded him of his loss, although it wasn't what I meant to do. I just needed to talk to him. James studied Petra's face, but he could tell that she wasn't going to say any more. Truthfully, James didn't want to talk about it any further. His forehead still throbbed worryingly, and what he wanted to do most of all was simply rest. Madame Curio insisted that James and Ralph spend the night in the hospital wing, sleeping on the wonderfully charmed beds. Neither boy minded, since it meant breakfast in bed the next morning. It also postponed the inevitable meeting with the headmaster, whereupon they would have to explain their unsanctioned misadventure. James's chest had been bandaged rather densely, but he could tell that the werewolf's slashes were already healing swiftly. They itched as the skin knitted together. Living in the wizarding world was a remarkable thing, he thought. Nevertheless, despite all their magic and potions, he reminded himself that Grandfather Weasley had still died of a stupid heart attack. James would have gladly dealt with weeks of slow, painful healing if the alchemists who had invented Dermamen's skin-knitting bandages had spent their time instead working on a magical cure for heart attacks. "'What are we going to tell Merlin?' Ralph whispered to James the next morning as they ate their breakfasts in bed. James shook his head nervously. "'The truth, I suppose, except for the part about Ted. Like Petra said, as far as anyone else is concerned, we were attacked by some wild animal, that's all.' Ralph shuddered. I thought he was going to rip me to bits. It sure looked like he wanted to, James admitted. Ralph, Ted wasn't in his right mind. He was all wolfed out, half because of his dad's werewolf blood and half because of his mum's metamorph magus blood. I mean, like Petra said, he was still Ted inside, but without any of Ted's self-restraint. He wasn't really trying to kill you. He was trying to avenge his parents. You're just the closest thing he has to somebody to blame. I know. Ralph answered sadly. Really, I don't blame him. But still, does this mean I'm going to turn werewolf too? No, James replied. Ted isn't werewolf enough to fully transform without using his metamorph magus abilities. He definitely isn't werewolf enough to spawn any more werewolves. You got off lucky. Ralph nodded thoughtfully. Still, I think it'll be pretty awkward next time I see him. How'd you get along with someone after they nearly rip your arm off with their teeth? Deal with that when the time comes, Ralph. We've got enough to manage at the moment. Late that morning, Madame Curio pronounced James and Ralph fit to go back to their dorms, although they'd have to return the next day to have their bandages removed. No sooner had they left the hospital wing than they met Rose. We've been summoned to the headmaster's office, she said, her face very pale. Right now? Come on. Silently, the three made their way through the castle, finally approaching the gargoyle that guarded the spiral staircase. Password, the gargoyle said, as if bored. Uh, they just changed it, Rose said to James and Ralph. Professor heretofore told me the new one when she told me we were summoned. Let me think. Oh, yes, Kerth Hwinworth. Blimey, Ralph said as the three climbed onto the rising staircase. I'd never remember that. Rose nodded gravely. I guess that's the point. Maybe it won't even be Merlin, James whispered hopefully. He's been travelling all the time lately. Professor McGonagall's been filling in for him. Rose just looked at James a little hopelessly. 
She rapped on the huge wooden door leading into the headmaster's office. Enter, a deep rumbling voice answered. James and Ralph both gulped simultaneously. The door swung ponderously open, creaking slightly. James tensed, waiting for his phantom scar to burn, but it didn't, or at least not much. He resisted the urge to touch it. Merlin was seated at his massive desk. In front of him, sitting in the only chair, James was surprised to see Damien Damascus. Damien looked chastened and meek, but James couldn't be sure whether the look was sincere or an act. "'Mr. Damascus and I have been discussing yesterday's unscheduled departure,' Merlin said, leaning back in his chair and lacing his fingers together. "'He has been so kind as to come to me of his own accord, claiming some degree of responsibility for your actions. Is it possible that you three will corroborate his tale?' "'Er,' uh, James began, looking from Merlin to Damien. "'Er, uh, yes?' Merlin nodded slowly. "'Do go on, then.' Tell me your version of the story, Mr. Potter. Merlin's eyes bored into James, and yet James couldn't recognize any specific malice in that gaze. James cleared his throat, glancing at Ralph and Rose for support. Rose nodded at him, eyes wide. James said, Well, we just wanted to see Hogsmeade, sir. We knew we weren't of age to go on Hogsmeade weekends, but we didn't think. I mean, you didn't think that the rules applied to you. Merlin nodded. That is the crux of your story, is it not, Mr. Potter? James swallowed past a large lump in his throat. His face heated. I... I guess so, sir. Tell me, Merlin said, sitting forward again in his chair. How did you manage to find your way to the village unseen? James glanced at Damien again. Damien's face remained a mask of chaste repentance. Suddenly, James remembered what Damien's role in the Gremlins was. They had discussed it at the very beginning of term. Damien was the official Gremlin scapegoat. Up until now, James had not quite known what that meant. Uh, Damien showed us away, James said, still looking at Damien and frowning nervously. He found the secret passage, uh, right? Merlin sighed. Yes, that is the way Mr. Damascus tells it. Damien nodded miserably. I teased them, sir. I told them they didn't have the guts to sneak into the village next Hogsmeade weekend. I simply wasn't thinking. I should have known they'd get caught. I should have known they'd get attacked by a wild, ferocious beast on the way back, all because of an innocent half corned beef sandwich. I'm just sick with guilt. Damien crumpled, burying his face in his hands and sobbing with woe. Merlin simply stared at Damien, his piercing eyes mild, his brow raised slightly. After a long moment, he returned his gaze to James. Regardless of Mr. Damascus's purported challenges, the three of you should have known better. I am not inclined to go lightly on you. This sort of careless behavior cannot be tolerated in an institution that prides itself on order. Merlin looked down at his desk again, ticking his quill over some notes. James glanced at Ralph and Rose. They would certainly get points deducted from their houses, and while that was bad enough, it wasn't the end of the world. Damien looked at James sideways, still managing to look stricken with guilt. Without looking up, Merlin said, Your punishment shall be the dissolution of your so-called defense club, effective immediately. James boggled at Merlin, his mouth dropping open. Rose spoke first. You can't do that, sir, she exclaimed. That would be punishing all the members of the club as much as us. As I recall, you convinced a first-year member of that club to accompany you in yesterday's debauchery, Merlin said, glancing up sharply. Cameron, Ralph said, he followed us. We tried to get rid of him. In either case, this does not incline me to trust your leadership abilities for such a club. James frowned angrily. But it isn't fair to the rest of the club. Fair is a strange concept which this age seems to prize above all else, Merlin said, sighing. In the age that I come from, a fair was a place where farm animals and servants were bought and sold. You may choose to remember what the word means to me before bringing it up again. But, sir, Rose began. Merlin silenced her with a raised hand. That is my final word, he said flatly. You may go. That includes you, Mr. Damascus. 
Rose turned away, and Ralph followed. Damien got up. He looked as if he wanted to say something to the headmaster, but then thought better of it. As he turned to leave, he gave James a warning look. Merlin watched James, his face inscrutable. Finally, James also turned around and walked towards the door. James, a mild voice said from the rows of old headmaster's paintings. James glanced up. The portrait of Severus Snape was empty, but the portrait of Albus Dumbledore had raised its head. Dumbledore looked at James through his half-moon spectacles, smiling a small, curious smile. Wait just a moment, if you would. I believe the headmaster wishes to speak to you alone. The office door thunked as it closed, making James jump. He turned around, and Merlin was right behind him, towering over him. I've been meaning to have a little chat with you, my boy, the big man said, his voice low and dreadful. Your friends may believe they know what is happening, but I suspect you agree that the main question exists between you and me. James didn't know what to say. He stared up at Merlin's impassive face, his heart suddenly hammering. Merlin went on. As you no doubt suspect... Very little happens within these halls that I do not know about. You've been through the Amsera Serth, and I can only imagine that you've learned much about me and what has happened in this castle. Thus you have me at a disadvantage, for while I have been to and fro throughout this new age, learning much and loving little, the one thing I cannot be sure of is your convictions and intent. You worry me, my boy. And that is no doubt, not because I fear you, but because I fear what you might choose to believe. There is only one thing that keeps me from stopping you in your tracks this very instant. Would you like to know what that is? The question was rhetorical. James didn't bother to answer. It is this, Merlin rumbled, raising his hand and pointing directly at James's forehead. Yes, he nodded. I can see it. I know not from whence it comes, nor by what art it has been conjured. Perhaps it means you are my ally, strange as it may seem, but perhaps again it marks you as my foe. It is that question, and that question alone, that stands between us, James Potter. That question, resting like a lever on the fulcrum of one very small stone. And do you know what that stone is? James didn't. He started to shake his head. But then he remembered something. Perhaps it came to him directly from the headmaster's eyes, since it was a memory of another time he and Merlin had stood like this, talking in private. It had been in the cave of Merlin's cache, after the test of the golden cord. Trust, James said, his voice very dry. It sounded right. Merlin nodded slowly, meaningfully. I will be watching, James Potter. As you know, I have eyes everywhere. He looked aside, indicating the empty portrait of Severus Snape. Trust only lasts until the final evidence is revealed. I will be watching for that evidence. There was a soft click, and the headmaster's door creaked open. James glanced at it. He was dismissed, but he couldn't quite bring himself to go yet. He looked up at the headmaster, stealing himself. Is it true that you can't harm anyone inside these walls? Merlin smiled very thinly at James. He turned back towards his desk, gesturing towards the Amsera Serth, which sat in its frame, covered in the thick black cloth. "'Ask Lord Hayden,' he said, crossing the room. Then, in a lower voice, he added, "'Or oh, Lady Judith!' The black cloth suddenly flew off the mirror, revealing the swirling mercury smoke. The smoke began to clear as the pages in the focusing book suddenly riffled of their own accord, flipping past as if in a hard wind. Run, James! The portrait of Dumbledore whispered harshly. You do not wish to see this! Run! James turned as quickly as he could and bolted out the door. It slammed after him, shaking the hall. He stopped at the top of the spiral steps, panting and frightened. He was completely confused by the things Merlin had said. The headmaster seemed to think James might be his enemy, and yet he wasn't sure. It was certainly a terrible thing to know that the only reason Merlin hadn't attacked him yet was because of the protection of the castle and the mysterious phantom scar on his forehead.
Somehow Merlin could see it, and he didn't know where it was coming from. But if Merlin wasn't causing it somehow, then who was, and what was it trying to tell him about the headmaster? James! Rose's voice called up from the bottom of the spiral stairs. What are you doing? What's taking you so long? James glanced back at the headmaster's closed door. He didn't know what it all meant, but he had a dreadful feeling that it was all going to become clear very soon. That fact alone scared him more than anything. Thinking that, he ran down the spiral steps to join his friends. That night, James sat at a table in the corner of the common room and took out a sheet of parchment. He dipped his quill, thought for a moment, and then began writing. Dear Dad, how's everything going at home? I hope Grandma is having fun staying in my room. Make sure she doesn't look under the bed, because that's where me and Al hid all those dogger pillars we found, and I don't think we ever got them all cleared out. Also, tell her not to look on the top shelf of the wardrobe. In fact, if she stayed out of the wardrobe altogether, everybody will probably be a lot happier. I heard the news about the Dementor attacks going on all over London, and I heard that the Ministry is starting a new aura department to go and put a stop to it. Look, it's too much to explain in a letter, but that job is going to be a lot more dangerous than it seems. Something really evil called the Gatekeeper came back with Merlin, and we think it's using the Dementors to feed on people's fear. If you want to know more about it, ask Cousin Lucy. She looked it up at the Wizarding Library for us, so she knows loads about it. You just need to watch out for it, because it's really, really powerful. Way more powerful than any regular old Dementor. And it's looking for a human host to give it all the power it needs to stay here for good and ruin everything. That reminds me. Dad, do you remember a ring that Dumbledore gave you? It might not have been a ring, but a stone. I think I've heard you talk about it from back when you had to go into the woods to fight V. Somebody here says he read about it in those books that came out about your life, and he says it was called the Resurrection Stone. Anyway, I need to ask, what happened to that stone? Rose and Ralph and me think that it might be really important for getting rid of the gatekeeper. I promise not to tell anyone, except Rose and Ralph, and maybe Zane if we think he can help, and maybe Cameron Creevy, since he's the one that remembered about it in those books. But nobody else, OK? Thanks, Dad. Love, James. P.S. Have you and Mum found the M-map and the I-cloak and my voodoo doll yet? James sealed the letter into an envelope and began to stuff it into his satchel. He stopped, suddenly wondering if he had time to send the letter tonight instead of tomorrow. He checked the clock and saw that it was only nine. He had time to get to the owlery, and he knew he'd sleep better knowing that the letter was already on Nobby's leg, winging it along to his parents' house. Rose had already gone up to bed, and Ralph was down in the Slytherin rooms, so James decided to go by himself. He stuffed the letter into his pocket and climbed through the portrait hole. By the time James ascended the narrow steps into the owlery, the moon had risen to a huge, full orb. Its frosty face illuminated the interior of the owlery with silvery light, bright enough to see by. James found Nobby and paused to stroke him. "'They feed you all right up here?' James asked. Nobby clicked his beak and ruffled his feathers luxuriously. James noticed that the corners of the owlery floor were cluttered with the bones of rodents. I guess you get along just fine up here, don't you? James said, smiling. The great bird seemed to agree. He ducked his head under James's stroking hand, preening. After a minute, James took the letter out of his pocket. He attached it carefully to Nobby's leg with a bit of string. This is really important, Nobby, James explained. Get it to Dad as soon as possible, all right? And wait to see if he writes anything in return. If he does, bring it with you when you come back. Nobby clicked his beak again and shuffled on the perch, obviously anxious to depart. As soon as James released his leg, Nobby spread his wings. He balanced for a moment and then thrust upwards, flapping towards the owlery's huge windows. He circled, disturbing some of the other owls on their perches, and then, with a flick of his rudder-like tail, he was gone. James felt much better. He retraced his steps out of the owlery and down the narrow stairway. When he got to the corridor below, he stopped. The halls had been almost entirely empty during his walk to the owlery, but now someone was standing in the dark corridor, looking out of one of the tall windows. James thought this was particularly odd, since the owlery was nowhere near any of the common rooms. The figure was in silhouette against the low, full moon outside the window. James could only tell that the figure was a girl with long hair. 
He had a strange, fleeting hope that it was Petra, but he didn't think so. James made his way along the hall, and the girl didn't move as he approached. He had almost passed her when she spoke without turning around. A little late to be sending post, she mused. Must be rather important, James. James's blood cooled. It was Tabitha Corsica. What's it to you? he asked, not breaking his stride. He meant to leave her with that, but her next words brought him to a halt. The gatekeeper won't be stopped, you know, she said idly, half turning to look at James over her shoulder. No matter who you tell about it, it's too late for that. James was stunned. His mind was racing so that he didn't know what to say. How could Tabitha know about the gatekeeper? Neither James, Rose, nor Ralph had told anyone about it. But even as he wondered, he realized that the answer was all too obvious. Tabitha knew about the gatekeeper because she was a part of the plot to control it, to unleash it on the earth. There was simply no other explanation. Tabitha turned back towards the moon. She leaned comfortably on the stone windowsill. You believe you grasp what is happening, don't you? You've convinced yourself that you understand the full implications of the curse of the gatekeeper. She laughed lightly. That's what I love about you, Potters. You all see the world in the plainest terms. You somehow manage to miss the essential details and the big picture. Never has it been more obvious than now. James started to speak, but his voice was hoarse and frightened. He cleared his throat and tried again. Are you here to stop me? Stop you, Tabitha replied, still not turning around. Stop you from what? Didn't you hear me? It's too late to stop anything. The descent of the gatekeeper is accomplished. Its day is at hand. There is only one more task to complete, and that task is very nearly done. I'm only here now to gloat, James. I wanted to see your face when you found out that your world was about to end. Finally, Tabitha turned fully around. James took an involuntary step backwards. He'd never seen Tabitha this way. Her hair was lank, and her face looked very pale, even gaunt. Her eyes were tinged with red, avid and hungry. Yes, she breathed, leaning slightly forward. That's the expression I was hoping for. You see it now, don't you? The curse of the gatekeeper is finally at hand, but it isn't a curse for everyone. It will end your world and the blighted world of the muggles, but it will not be a curse to those who have remained pure of heart. It will be a blessing to us. Salazar Slytherin knew it in his time when he orchestrated this day. The descent of the gatekeeper hearkens the age of pure blood perfection. No longer will we be shackled by the laws of weak governments. No more will we live in the shadows of the muggle drones, hiding like beetles under a rock. For us, the gatekeeper is a harbinger of supremacy. James took another step backwards, wilting in the ferocity of that mad gaze. You... you can't really believe that, he stammered. No one controls the gatekeeper. It'll bring doom to everyone and everything. Even its human host will be killed by it in the end. Tabitha smiled slowly. How curious that you believe no one can control the gatekeeper. And yet I know why you have clung to that belief. You persist in trusting Merlinus Ambrosius, whose very presence in this age is your doing. You convince yourself that, in the end, he will not side with us. This offers you a shred of hope, doesn't it? James nodded. He hadn't known it until this moment, but Tabitha was right. In the deepest part of James's heart, he did trust Merlin. He didn't know exactly why, but he did. Despite his doubts and fears, and despite all the evidence to the contrary, James simply didn't believe that Merlin would use the beacon stone for evil. He believed that Merlin would use it instead to battle the gatekeeper, even if it was a losing battle. Tabitha's smile grew indulgent. Cherish that hope as long as you can, James, she said, almost whispering. And when the gatekeeper is ours, when Merlin hands the stone over and joins us, I hope I can be there to see the light of that hope die in your eyes. I really do. James finally began to feel some anger. 
He drew himself to his full height and took a step forwards. You're lying, he said firmly. You're just trying to scare me. You know that your plans can still be stopped. It isn't too late, no matter what you say. You can tell whoever put you up to this that you've given me your message for all the good it did. But I'm not going to back down. We'll find the other half of the beacon stone. Tabitha's smile vanished as James said this. She looked at him with something like open bewilderment, and then, slowly, the smile resurfaced, dawning on her face like a sunrise. The other half of the beacon stone, she said in an amused voice. You don't yet realize it, do you? No wonder you've been so full of vim and vigor. My dear James, we already have the other half of the beacon stone. It's been in our possession for years. We used our arts to seek it out. It wasn't particularly difficult, you know. Your father simply dropped it in the Forbidden Forest. He left it for anyone to find if they had an inkling of where to look. I was there on the very night that it was pulled from the earth. Tabitha laughed again, lightly, and yet James heard a tinkling madness in it. She stopped, inhaled, and shook her head. How dreadfully unfortunate for you, James. But, oh, that's what that letter to your father was about, wasn't it? You were asking him where the stone had gone. Oh, I really am so sorry that you've wasted your time. But now you do see how precarious your situation is, don't you? It really is only a matter of Merlinus's rather famously fickle loyalties. How deliciously exciting this must be for you. James's anger hadn't abated in the face of this revelation. If anything, it had intensified. I don't believe you, Corsica. You'll say anything just to keep me from working against you. It won't work. Even if your people do have half of the beacon stone, Merlin won't join you. I won't let him. So tell your cronies that I got your message, and that I told the lot of you to stuff it where the nargles don't bite. With that, James turned on his heel and began to stalk away. After a few steps, he stopped and looked back. And I'll tell you one more thing. And this is just for you, Corsica. I know you think you've got my brother wrapped around your little finger, but if you get him involved in this in any way, I will personally come for you. Don't think I don't mean that. Albus, Tabitha said, the smile now gone from her face. I think he's big enough to make his own decisions, don't you? James narrowed his eyes and nodded slowly. You bet he is. As James turned again and stalked off, Tabitha called after him, her voice echoing in the corridor. Cherish that hope, James. Cherish it for as long as you can. James was shaking by the time he climbed back through the portrait hole. The encounter with Tabitha had completely unnerved him, despite his brave words. It was all too overwhelming. Was it true that James's dad had simply dropped the resurrection stone in the forest before his confrontation with Voldemort? If Tabitha and her secret cohorts did indeed have half of the beacon stone already, what hope was there? James now realized that, in spite of everything, he did trust Merlin not to side with evil. But was it that Merlin was trustworthy, or that James simply couldn't face the possibility that the famous sorcerer might betray them? With a shudder, he remembered that Judith, the Lady of the Lake, had also trusted Merlin, right up until the point that he'd killed her. Strangely, in the face of all this, all James wanted to do was go to bed and sleep. He climbed to his dormitory, stripped off his clothes, and fell into bed. The moon shone in through the small window across the room, needling at his eyes. James rolled over, pulling his pillow over his face. It wasn't until he was almost asleep, just as all of his racing thoughts were finally quieting, that one final, strangely worrying question popped into his head. James sat up, staring out the window at that bright, silvery moon, while the question repeated itself in his mind. How had Tabitha Corsica known that he was at the Owlery? James stared hard at the moon, but it offered no answers. He flopped back onto his pillow. Finally, eventually, he fell asleep. Chapter 17 The Bloodline the next week seemed to shuttle past with the inertia of a freight train. As the end of the term loomed, the library grew busier and busier. The older students moved about in a sort of harried fog, studying and drilling each other on topics James could barely understand. Even the gremlins seemed tense. 
Noah, Sabrina, Damien and Petra sat on the couch before the fireplace, surrounded by loose parchments, books and sweet wrappers. James waved at them as he passed, heading down to the library. "'Hey, Damien,' he said. "'Thanks for helping out in the headmaster's office the other day.' "'Just doing my job,' Damien muttered, his nose buried in a huge book of star charts. On the way down to the library, James considered the events of the previous days. It was all moving so fast that it was becoming hard to keep track of. On Monday, James had informed Scorpius that he, Ralph and Rose had been ordered to shut down the Defence Club as punishment for sneaking into Hogsmeade. Scorpius had been strangely unperturbed. A pity that you won't be able to keep attending, he said blithely, looking up over his glasses from the book he'd been studying. I don't think you understand, James said, sitting down. The club's been disbanded. Merlin ordered it. Scorpius looked down at his book again, turning a page. I understand it as well as I wish. As far as I'm concerned, you three have been banned from leading the club. As co-teacher, I've no intention of shutting it down. We'll rename it if necessary. We'll call it, oh, Scorpius's Army. That's not funny, James said, shaking his head. No? Scorpius replied. Well, I sat up all night thinking of it. So, drat. James thought about it for a moment, and then asked quietly, You'll really keep teaching the club, even though Merlin thinks it's been shut down? I'm sure I don't know what you mean, Scorpius answered. If the headmaster has determined that the defence club should be dissolved, then dissolved it will be. It's pure and simple coincidence that I, along with the Spectre of Silence and the Grey Lady, will be teaching an entirely new club that happens to meet in the same place at the same time to study the same topics. Surely the headmaster would recognise the difference? James shook his head, smiling crookedly. You really are a chip off the old Slytherin block, aren't you? You're as twisted as a corkscrew. "'Being twisted simply means being able to think around corners,' Scorpius said, returning to his book. "'My father taught me that.' James started to get up, then stopped and looked back at the pale boy. "'Cedric actually has you calling him the Spectre of Silence.' Scorpius adjusted his glasses. "'Who am I to argue with a ghost's choice of name?' Apparently Scorpius had been as good as his word. On Thursday evening, James, Rose, and Ralph had hovered in the halls near the gymnasium. Sure enough, as they passed the pebbled glass doors, they could hear the sounds of the club practicing and drilling under Cedric's and the Grey Lady's patient tutelage. Preparations for the Triumvirate were also coming along swiftly. Jason Smith's props crew was working double time, having produced most of the sets and prop elements, including a huge wind machine that worked on treadle power. Jennifer Tellus was feverishly commanding her costume department, managing all the adjustments, alterations, and last-minute costuming details. Josephina Bartlett had recovered from her hex-induced vertigo enough to climb onto the stage, although she couldn't approach the edge without getting dizzy. Nevertheless, a contingent of Ravenclaw girls had begun a rather snarky campaign to reinstate Josephina in the role of Astra. To that end, they had painted a slew of signs and pinned petitions onto several notice boards. The petitions hadn't accumulated many signatures, however, and apart from Josephina's entourage, even the rest of the Ravenclaws seemed to quietly support Petra in the role. For his own part, James was impressed to realise that he had now learned almost all of his lines. There had been a time when he hardly believed it was possible, but the persistent rehearsals and late-night script readings had apparently paid off. Noah and Petra seemed by turns affectionate and cold during rehearsals, obviously reflecting the ongoing tumult of their relationship. James had still not practised his kissing scene with Petra, although they'd read through the lines a dozen times. Professor Curry assured them that it need not be a real kiss, but simply that they leaned towards one another and touch cheeks. They'd be in silhouette to the audience, and the lights would go out the moment the kiss occurred, thus ending Act Three. To James's great dismay, however, he was forced to obey Tabitha Corsica's direction whenever Professor Curry wasn't around. 
Tabitha seemed to take perverse pleasure in forcing James to recite his monologues over and over, constantly critiquing him and belittling him in front of the other actors and crew. As James sweated in the bright stage lights, re-reading his rallying speech for the ninth time, his dislike of Tabitha's pretty smug face slowly intensified into a bright little furnace of hatred. The Quidditch season had finally ended with a smashing victory by Hufflepuff over Gryffindor, resulting in days of merciless taunting by the Hufflepuffs and surly retorts from the Gryffindors. To commemorate Albus's first season as Slytherin Seeker, Tabitha had apparently given him the broom he'd been flying all season, the same mysteriously hexed broom which had caused James, Ralph and Zane so much trouble during the previous year. James could hardly believe that Tabitha would relinquish the broom, but he also knew it would only serve to endear Albus all the more to his Slytherin mates. Besides, if Tabitha was turning over something as powerful as that broom, it would only be because she had something even more powerful in her possession. And then, this very morning, James had finally received a letter back from his father. He'd read it over breakfast with both Ralph and Rose peering closely over his shoulder. Dear James, Sorry about the late response, but I've been terribly busy with this new Aura sub-department. We've called in Kingsley to give us a hand with it, and he's been a great help both in organising and preparing the field team for what they'll be up against. Believe it or not, even Kay de Bellows has offered his assistance. Turns out the Harriers faced a Dementor Hive like this once in Hungary. Victor has his squad on standby just in case, so that's a relief. Spot on about this gatekeeper business. Our researchers at the Ministry had already begun to piece together some details about it. We have old Dung Fletcher in protective custody, and he has an inkling that the people who orchestrated last year's conspiracy were working towards something big like this. We're quite confident that this whole curse of the gatekeeper story is just a massive scare tactic. The P.E. is still at work trying to secretly destabilise the magical world, and what better way to do it than to invent a grave new threat that the Ministry isn't able to contain, eh? Don't worry, we've got the best people on it, including me. Still, be sure that we won't be taking any chances, all right? If there really is something behind this, besides a load of rogue Dementors, we'll be on the lookout for it. Regarding the R. Stone, you can always ask me whatever you want, James. Tell your friend Cameron I remember his uncle well, and that he's right about the stone. After I used it in the forest that night, I dropped it. I didn't need it any more, and it was best lost to the wizarding world forever. I'd guess it's still out there somewhere, but even I could probably never find it again. I strongly recommend that you not go looking for it. It'll only mean trouble. Let it stay lost, all right? Love, your father. P.S. No, still no sign of what's gone missing, but honestly, I haven't had much time to look for them. Mum and Grandma say hello. Grandma is staying in Albus's room, so you don't have anything to worry about. See you in a few weeks. James arrived in the dim library and wandered through the aisles and shelves until he found Ralph and Rose, who were deep in conversation. He plunked his satchel onto the table and sat down next to Rose. We spoke to Zane a little while ago, Ralph announced. He popped up right here in the library, made Professor Eertefort ten shades of mad. She refused to let us zap him with any spells to maintain his projection, but he did give us a quick message. James leaned in. What was it? Apparently he went to see Madame Delacroix in person, Rose said in a low voice. She's pretty dotty, but he got some useful information out of her about what the wrong people might be able to do with your voodoo doll. What? James asked fervently. Tell me. Exactly zilch. Ralph replied, curling his hand into the shape of a zero. More or less, Rose added, glancing at Ralph. Your dad was right, James, when he said that voodoo wasn't like what the muggle films show. It's apparently mostly psychological. Pinning a voodoo doll in the heart doesn't kill the subject, but it might make them sad or lonely. Or give them heartburn, Ralph quipped. Rose rolled her eyes. The point is, no one can physically hurt you with a voodoo doll. They may be able to make you believe you feel pain or certain emotions, but that's all. James breathed a huge sigh. <sighs> well, that's a big relief, I guess. Still, Ralph asked, who do you think might have it? Probably nobody, James answered. It wasn't with the cloak or the map. It was just on my mum's bedside table. It's probably just lost at home, like my dad said. 
Maybe Tabitha has it, Rose whispered conspiratorially. Maybe she doesn't know she can't hurt you with it. She's probably going mad wondering why it isn't working. James shook his head. That's daft, Rose. Tabitha wouldn't have any way of getting it, even if she knew about it. I never told anyone other than you, Ralph and Zane about it. Besides, Tabitha doesn't need a voodoo doll to get at me. She could have fought me that night in the hall. Obviously, she's not meaning to attack us with magic or anything. At least not yet, Ralph muttered. Suddenly, a low whistle pierced the air. It wasn't particularly loud, but it was noisy enough to disturb those studying nearby. At the next table, Ashley Doon glanced up curiously, looking for the source of the whistle. What's that? Rose rasped. Ralph, I think it's coming from your bag. Ralph scrambled around in his seat, retrieving his bag. As soon as he unzipped it, the noise grew louder. It's Trent and Snakerscope, Ralph said, pulling the instrument out of his bag. The noise was increasing both in pitch and volume. Mr. Deedle, a voice called stridently. James turned in his seat and saw Professor heretofore approaching along the aisle, her sharp features pinched into a scowl. How many times must you insist on disrupting this library? Sorry, Ralph said, still fiddling with the sneaker scope. It must be malfunctioning. I can't see how to turn it off. Professor heretofore shook her head in disdain. She produced her wand and flicked it deftly. The sneakerscope emitted a sudden squawk and fell silent. There, she said venomously. It's off. Now please vacate yourselves from the library, the three of you. If I see you in here again for the rest of the day, there will be deducted house points, even if you are a member of my house, Mr. Deedle. Now off with you. Stupid hunk of junk, Ralph muttered as they threaded towards the door. He stuffed the sneakerscope in his bag and shouldered it. It wasn't malfunctioning, a voice drawled. James glanced up as Scorpius fell in line with them, walking out of the library. It was doing exactly what it was meant to do. Getting us kicked out of the library? Ralph asked derisively. Scorpius lowered his voice. No, Deedle, alerting you to the presence of untrustworthy people. James frowned at Scorpius. What do you mean? Not here, Scorpius said. Follow me. I'll tell you what I can along the way. For several minutes, Scorpius led James, Ralph, and Rose through the hall silently. Eventually, they came to an old part of the castle which was rarely used. It smelled vaguely mouldy. They passed no one else in the halls. I understand you had a rather illuminating conversation with Tabby, Scorpius finally said, glancing at James as he walked. How do you know about that? I hear things, Scorpius replied vaguely. Tabitha has somehow come to believe that I am a Slytherin in disguise. She thinks that I detest the lot of you, and am therefore on their side. You have me fooled for a while, too, you know, James admitted. My bed still has the words whiny potter git on it. Where are we going, Scorpius? Rose asked suspiciously. It looks like we're headed to the same place where we found the mirror of Erised. Scorpius nodded. That's the spot, Weasley. Nothing gets past you. Scorpius, James said, narrowing his eyes, if I didn't know any better, I'd say you were nervous. Scorpius stopped suddenly in the hall. He turned to face the other three. What I am about to do, I do against my better judgment, he said in a low, serious voice. If my grandfather knew what I was about to show you, he'd probably kill me, and that's not an exaggeration. What, Scorpius? James asked, lowering his own voice to match the pale boys. Do you know something? Scorpius looked away. Remember when I told you that I hadn't seen my grandfather for years? That he was in hiding even from the rest of the family? James and Rose nodded. James said, It's not true. He's not in hiding. Yes, he's in hiding, but it isn't true that I haven't seen him. I've seen him plenty. Scorpius sighed and looked at James, Ralph, and Rose. It started two years ago. I hated the way my father had turned his back on his upbringing. The reason he had begun studying the Founders was to find out the truth about Salazar Slytherin. He had been raised to believe that Slytherin was a revolutionary thinker and a hero. But the more my father studied, the more he began to believe that Slytherin had simply been a vicious, power-hungry madman. 
When I was quite young, father and grandfather had a serious row about it. They ended up wand to wand, although neither actually cast a spell. It disgusted me that my father would deny his family heritage. Once grandfather disowned my father and moved into hiding, I determined to join him and prove my loyalty. My mother helped me locate Grandfather Lucius. He was quite happy to have me visit him in secret. He told me of his plans. Yes, I know about the gatekeeper and how it came to descend into the world. I know that my grandfather believes he is carrying out the final solution of Salazar Slytherin, finally bringing about a world of pure blood perfection. But the more I listened to my grandfather, the more I realized he had gone completely mad. Both he and his partner, Gregor Tyrannicus, Gregor was once wizarding royalty in Romania, but he lost power and was kicked out by his own family. Both he and my grandfather Lucius will do anything to get that power back, and more. They truly mean to be rulers of a new pure-blood kingdom, with the gatekeeper as their strong arm. So they really do think they can control it? Rose breathed. They are mad! They're mad, yes, Scorpius answered, but who's to say they can't control it? If they can possess both halves of the beacon stone, they may indeed be able to protect themselves and their kingdom from the gatekeeper, although it will hate them all the more for it and will destroy them all the quicker if they get careless. So what is it you want to show us? James asked, firming his jaw. What does your grandfather not want us to know? Scorpius seemed to be struggling with himself. His eyes were locked on James's, his lips pressed together. Finally, the boy nodded slightly. Come on, he said, and quickly turned. They walked a little further till they came to a large, heavy door. Scorpius produced a tarnished brass key and turned it in the lock. My father gave me this key so that I could help you come back through the mirror, Potter, Scorpius explained, pushing the heavy door open. I don't know how he came to possess it, but I suspect it had something to do with one of the lesser-known shops in the dark corners of Nocturne Alley. Still, I doubt even my father knew what this key would also give me access to. What's the big deal? Ralph asked as they entered the cramped storage room again. The mirror of Erised showed their reflections in its dusty surface. All around it were crates, trunks, and locked cabinets. Don't look too closely into the mirror, Scorpius said, walking past it and approaching one of the cabinets. Without its focusing book, it'll just show you distractions. The real surprise is over here. Whose stuff is all this? Rose asked, looking around slowly. I thought it was just a bunch of stored junk when we were here last, but that was before I knew how powerful the mirror was and where it came from. Nobody would just throw that in with a bunch of random crates. Scorpius wrenched a lock loose from one of the cabinets and swung the door open. All of this, he said, glancing back at Rose, is the contents of Albus Dumbledore's office while he was headmaster. He'd willed most of it to his brother Aberforth, but when Aberforth died, he willed it right back to the school. It's all been stored here ever since, hidden even from the new headmasters according to Aberforth's instructions. Not the most trusting fellow was old Aberforth. We'd never have found it at all if we hadn't used Ravenclaw's signal to locate the mirror. Wow, James breathed in awe. I bet my dad would love to know about this place. He and Dumbledore were pretty close. Look, is that Forks the Phoenix's perch? I bet it is. This stuff is probably really valuable, Rose said, picking up a heavy book from a table. Most of these books are one of a kind. They're hand-printed and illustrated. That's all well and good, Scorpius said, stepping aside and gesturing at the open cabinet. But this is why I brought you here. Ralph and James peered into the cabinet, confused at the display of dusty tools and ancient gadgets. A large bowl-shaped object on the top shelf emitted a pale glow. Rose gasped, her eyes going wide. Is that the pensieve? she whispered. Dumbledore's pensieve? Scorpius nodded. I came here once on my own, the night before James's return. I sneaked out of the dorm and used Ravenclaw's signal to find this room. I wanted to be sure it really existed. When I found it, I explored a little, 
and found the pensive. It contains many of Headmaster Dumbledore's memories, and Severus Snape's as well, since Snape apparently kept it in the Headmaster's office and used it after Dumbledore died. I knew the memories would be rather faded now that Dumbledore and Snape are both dead, but there was one set of memories in particular I was curious about. Grandfather Lucius had already told me his side of the story, but I wanted to see if Dumbledore's and Snape's version was any different. It was a little. James asked in a low voice, What's the memory about, Scorpius? Scorpius looked James in the eye again. He didn't blink as he answered, Something my grandfather and Gregor call the bloodline. It's about who the bloodline of Voldemort is and how they came to be. There was a long moment of perfect silence, and then, firmly, James said, I want to see. Scorpius nodded. I thought you might. He gestured at the gently glowing bowl. How does it work? Ralph asked, following reluctantly as James and Rose stepped forward. Does it, like, make a film or something? How does it know what memory we want to see? Will it hurt? Shut up, Ralph, James said, not unkindly. Just hold my hand. You too, Rose. I think we just have to look, that's all. Slowly, carefully, James, Rose and Ralph leaned over the stone bowl. The surface of the liquid inside the pensive looked uncomfortably like the swirling, mercury smoke in Merlin's magic mirror, except that it glowed rather more. It lit the three students' faces. And then something began to swim up out of the depths of the pensive. It seemed to come from far deeper than the mere depth of the bowl. James held his breath as the light intensified. The swirling increased, becoming larger as the liquid in the bowl rose. It filled James's vision, and then, swiftly and painlessly, it seemed to grab him. At once, James, Rose, and Ralph fell into the pensive, as if it had grown to the size of a pool. It swallowed them completely, and, for better or worse, there was no turning back. They were a part of the faded memories of Albus Dumbledore and Severus Snape. Each of the three experienced it uniquely and separately. When James landed in the middle of the first memory, neither Ralph nor Rose was anywhere in sight. As Scorpius had said, the memories were slightly faded. James felt more as if he was dreaming them than living them. As the world of the memory resolved around him, he found himself standing in the headmaster's office, but not as he had ever known it. It rippled and swam like a scene witnessed underwater, but then it began to solidify. Forks the phoenix preened on his perch, proving to James that he was seeing the room as it had looked during Dumbledore's term as headmaster. We must be prepared for the eventuality, Severus, Dumbledore was saying, not looking at Snape, who stood by the window, looking out at a black sky. It cannot be assumed that Voldemort will be too proud to resort to such a tactic. If he comes to fear that his plans, and therefore his life, are in jeopardy, we must assume he will prepare a successor of some kind. The Dark Lord is not given to preparations for failure, Headmaster, Snape said. His vanity will not admit the possibility of defeat. The sheer number of Horcruxes he has prepared is evidence of his assurance. I disagree, Dumbledore said, steepling his fingers as he sat at his desk. James saw that one of the old Headmaster's hands was rather horribly blackened and sickly. One Horcrux would be enough for a confident villain. Voldemort's substantial collection of them proves quite the reverse. He lives in terror of death, believing nothing but the most extreme measures will ward it off. This is not the behavior of a man confident in his immortality. If, in time, he fears that even this collection will fail him, he will turn to even more desperate measures. You will know this when the time comes, and if it does, your duty will be clear. Snape turned away from the window and approached the desk. It pains me to admit it, but this task is very nearly beyond me, Headmaster. You are far better equipped to manage it than am I. Dumbledore nodded slowly and smiled. 
I will not argue that, Severus, but we both know it is unlikely that I should still be alive when the time comes. The task falls to you by default. Nevertheless, I am quite confident in your ability to do what is necessary. Despite what you believe of yourself, you are rather uniquely qualified for this type of work. As Dumbledore said this, the memory slowly dissolved. The room faded into obscurity, and both Snape and Dumbledore vanished. An indeterminate amount of time seemed to pass, and then James found another memory solidifying around him. He was in a drawing-room in a grand house, although it was apparent that the house was quite old and its best days were behind it. A large crystal chandelier lay shattered on the floor like a corpse. Bits of broken crystal lay everywhere, sparkling in the firelight. Potter! a high, silky voice said. James turned to see a horrible cloaked figure standing in front of the hearth. It was like a man, but only just. Beneath the cowl, the face was so pale as to be nearly translucent. There was no nose, save for a pair of grotesquely flaring slits, and the red eyes glowed with thin, vertical pupils. James's knees went weak with fear as the figure seemed to stare coldly at him, but then it turned its gaze away, looking askance at a woman huddled at the end of a nearby sofa. I thought I was quite clear. The high, cold voice went on, and James now recognized the figure for who it was. This was Voldemort himself, in the flesh. I was not to be disturbed for anything other than Harry Potter. Bellatrix here assures me I was, indeed, rather specific about that requirement. And yet... She herself is the one responsible for interrupting my work without any Harry Potter to present me upon my return. Bellatrix sobbed and rolled off the sofa, throwing herself onto the floor at Voldemort's feet. He was here, my lord, I tell you. He was my prisoner when I summoned you, otherwise I would never have dared. Lucius and Narcissa can attest to the fact, but we were betrayed at the last minute. Bellatrix flung an arm towards a man James hadn't noticed yet. The man stood in the shadows, his face deathly pale and blank. His hair was long and white. Tell him, Lucius, Bellatrix implored. Tell the Dark Lord that we had Potter in our grasp. When the man didn't respond, Bellatrix's face contorted into desperate rage. Then perhaps you should tell him how you were bested by the boy Potter. Tell him, Lucius, how you were stunned unconscious mere moments after they burst upon us. Tell him, Severus, Voldemort said, ignoring the woman's raving, sobbing protests. This unfortunate occasion has pressed me to consider an option that I had hoped would be unnecessary. James turned and saw Snape standing in front of the closed door of the drawing room. He knew neither Snape nor Voldemort could see him. Nevertheless, he felt very uncomfortable standing between them as they spoke. He moved into a nearby corner opposite the staring figure of Lucius Malfoy. Snape merely stood and waited, looking unflinchingly at the awful, snake-like face. I have summoned you from your post for the same reason I have dismissed Narcissa, Greyback, and Lucius's son. No one else need know of the duty I am placing upon you. Lucius himself will have his own role if he chooses to accept it. I have every expectation that he will be eager to prove his worth after recent events. But you, Severus, will perform a very important duty in this arrangement. Whatever you wish, my lord, Snape said evenly. Voldemort went on, stepping away from the hearth. As you know, Severus, I have prepared Horcruxes, creating an unbroken chain of immortality for my ascendants. 
As Voldemort slowly crossed the room, the broken chandelier rose silently from the floor, allowing him to pass beneath it. The shattered bits of crystal rose with it, turning and glinting in the air like water droplets. I am quite confident that these horcruxes will serve me well. However, in the extremely unlikely event that any of them should be destroyed... Never, my lord, Bellatrix cried, still groveling on the floor. It is impossible! I have prepared one final horcrux, Voldemort went on, completely ignoring Bellatrix's outburst. It is rather unique. In fact, I am quite confident that such a thing has never before been created. Voldemort reached the center of the room and stopped. As the broken chandelier hovered over him, he reached slowly into his cloak and produced a long, narrow dagger. It was singularly ugly, made of silver with a jewel-encrusted handle. The blade was tarnished to a dark glint, as if it had been rubbed with soot. This dagger, Voldemort went on, turning it slowly in the firelight, is rather special to me. It has long travelled with me and served me on many occasions. You may be interested to know that it once belonged to my father. I took it as an inheritance from his dead hand. Thus, it is quite fitting that this dagger, Severus, is the final and perhaps most important of my horcruxes. I am entrusting you to safeguard it within the protection of Hogwarts until the time comes for its use. I will guard it with my life, my lord, Snape said, inclining his head. I am honoured to be entrusted with a task that will only add to your long life. Alas, Severus, Voldemort said, pulling the dagger away, as if reluctant to give it up. This is not that sort of horcrux. With this relic, I am thinking only of future generations. Never let it be said that your lord is not gracious, for this horcrux is not to be used for myself. As I have already told you, this horcrux is special. The part of my soul that it contains is shut off from me forever. I cannot reclaim it. Thus, if, in the remarkable and unimaginable event that every Horcrux but this were destroyed, this dagger would not assure my survival. Bellatrix gasped, but her eyes were huge and avid as she watched Voldemort. Her gaze never left the dagger as it flitted and glinted in his pale hand. The part of my soul locked within this dagger is a gift, my friends. It is meant to be passed on. Lucius, my loyal servant, I have asked you to remain because I know your desperate and justifiable desire to prove yourself to me. It shall be your duty and honor to bestow the gift of the dagger should that day ever come. For the first time, Lucius Malfoy's face flickered with life. He blinked at Voldemort and then stumbled forwards, not quite daring to touch his master. Thank you, my lord. It is my honor. I will not fail you. I am certain of that, Lucius, Voldemort said smoothly, almost kindly. For if... For some reason, you fail the dagger. It will find you. I have bound it to you and your family. In the event that something unfortunate befalls Headmaster Snape, you must retrieve the dagger from him. I will be waiting for you. And in the event that the time passes for its use, and you have not yet fulfilled your role, it will seek you with its own intent. It will come for you and your family. I do trust that you understand. I do, my lord, Lucius rasped, nodding. 
I will perform whatever duty you entrust to me. I vow my oath, master. Voldemort nodded slowly. Then your work begins this day, Lucius. Find for me a worthy vessel. Find a family whose blood is pure, but whose loyalties will never be suspect. When the time comes, go to the woman in that family who is with child. She must take the dagger unto herself, and by her own hand use the dagger to trace my symbol, the first initial of my name. Upon the swell of her unborn son, drawing it in her own blood, let her willingness infuse the life of the dagger into that mother's blood, taking it to the child. Thus, this relic of my soul will be passed on. The boy will carry my essence, made anew, ready to serve yet another generation. This is your duty and your oath to me, Lucius. Swear it. I swear, my lord. Lucius rasped, falling to one knee. My lord! Bellatrix cried breathlessly, crawling to her knees and imploring with one hand. Choose me! Let me be the vessel of your gift to future generations! I will raise the boy to be your perfect image! I am willing! I am eager! Yes, loyal Bellatrix! Voldemort said softly, not turning to her. Bits of the floating crystal chandelier revolved in the air between them. But your loyalties are your most damning quality for this task. No one must guess in whose womb my soul is to be reborn. Despite your greatest wish, this duty cannot fall to you. Bellatrix sobbed. Then why have you kept me here, my lord? She wailed desperately. Why have you retained me, only to see my greatest desire plucked from my grasp? Voldemort sighed indulgently. Your very question contains the answer, dear Bellatrix. But do try to look on the bright side. I had considered simply killing you. For allowing Harry Potter to slip through your grasp this night. Instead, I have merely killed your greatest dream. No! Bellatrix shrieked, crumpling, and James's hair stood up. It never heard a more despairing, hopeless cry. Voldemort strode forwards, smiling as if Bellatrix's wail of agony was the sweetest music. He held the dagger out to Snape. As Snape took the dagger, the suspended chandelier fell again. It crashed noisily to the floor behind Voldemort, shattering like a bomb and drowning out the pitiful wail of Bellatrix Lestrange. The memory shattered as well. There was a flash of swirling smoke, and then one more scene materialized, swimming out of the mists like a fever dream. In this memory, James saw Severus Snape again. He was pacing in the headmaster's office, which was his own office by this time. You seem to misunderstand, Albus, Snape said, speaking apparently to the portrait of Dumbledore on the office wall. It will not be a request. Slughorn is the man responsible for the Dark Lord's ability to create Horcruxes in the first place. He understands them better than I do. He owes his service to the world to render this one useless. If only that were possible, Severus, the portrait of Dumbledore replied. But it is not. You may destroy the Horcrux, yes, but no one can simply render it ineffective. Besides, I seem to recall that my instruction was to simply poison the instrument. "'assuring it would kill both the mother and the son it was meant to infiltrate. "'I cannot destroy the dagger while the Dark Lord still lives,' Snape replied. "'He has bound it to Lucius Malfoy. "'He will know if it's been compromised, and my loyalties will be revealed.' "'Then do as I instructed,' Dumbledore insisted ardently. "'Poison the blade. It is within your abilities.' 
There are any number of undetectable poisons in this very room. Let the same instrument that carries the dark soul also carry its doom. You might have been able to oversee the murder of the woman and her child for the greater good, Albus, but I am afraid that that ability has fled me. The portrait replied sadly, Then you are a fool, Severus. The fruit of this Horcrux will be on your head, not Horace Slughorn's. Snape exhaled slowly, thinking. Finally he glanced up. Perhaps not, he said, as if to himself. Perhaps there is another way. You are mistaken, Severus, Dumbledore replied. My way is the only responsible method. Otherwise the boy will be born with the thread of Voldemort himself, beating in his veins. Snape smiled slowly, coldly. Perhaps not, he said again. Surely you do not doubt that the dagger Horcrux will transmit the remnant of Voldemort's soul? I do not, Snape said, narrowing his eyes. But perhaps it will not be transmitted into a boy. Dumbledore sighed patiently. This is not the time for conspiracies, Severus. Indulge me, Snape replied slowly. I am merely speculating. The Dark Lord believes his soul will pass into a boy-child. He is, in his heart, that most arrogant of men, the sort that believes unquestioningly in the superiority of his own gender. But what if Lucius's judgment were to become impaired? What if his divinations were clouded? And, as a result, what if the final Horcrux were transmitted to a girl-child? That is not evidence that his soul would not dominate the child's personality. She would still be influenced by his living essence. His quintessentially male essence, Snape muttered, hardly listening to the portrait. But how would that balance against the unexpected polarity of her own female heart? How indeed... The portrait interrupted gently. This is speculative foolishness, my friend. I tell you, poison the dagger, or if you cannot, destroy it when the proper time comes. Snape looked up at the portrait, his eyes narrowed. He took the dagger out of his robes and held it in his hands. It glinted darkly, just as ugly as James had last seen it. Snape nodded. Yes he agreed. You're right, of course, Albus. When the time is right, I cannot destroy the Horcrux yet. There is too much at stake for my loyalties to be challenged. In the meantime, however, perhaps I will experiment. Lucius Malfoy is bonded to the dagger. I may be able to use that bond, pervert it, cause it to cloud his mind in the event that it does survive. If Lucius succeeds in using the dagger, he will accidentally use it on an unborn girl-child, thus foiling his master's wishes. Perhaps, just perhaps, that would be enough to tip the balance. Otherwise, I will destroy the Horcrux myself when the time is right. Forgive me, Severus, Dumbledore said, looking him evenly in the eye. But what if you do not live that long? I have more than one reason to stay alive, Albus, Snape answered, slipping the dagger back into his robes. As you well know, destroying this mysterious object is not even the most important. Trust me, I shall be careful. On Snape's last word, careful, the memory rippled and faded. Swirling, silvery smoke filled James's vision, and he realized he was leaning on something hard. It was uncomfortable, so he pushed back from it. As he did, he drew his face away from the bowl of Dumbledore's pensive. Disoriented and dizzy, Ralph and Rose pulled away at the same moment. They clutched at each other, struggling to stay upright. Did you see it? Scorpius asked. James blinked, recovering his balance. Scorpius was seated on a trunk in the corner of the storage room, leaning languidly against the wall. Did you see the dagger? I did, James said. Did you, Rose? And Ralph? I never saw either of you in there. 
Rose shook her head in dismay. I saw it all. I saw Headmaster Dumbledore and Professor Snape talking about the possibility of some sort of successor. And then I saw him, he who must not be named. He was awful. I didn't understand a lot of what he said, but I think I got the gist of it, Ralph said, his face pale. Those Orcrux things were supposed to keep little bits of Voldemort's soul safe, so even if he got killed, he wouldn't really die, right? But the last Horcrux, the one embedded in his father's dagger, was different, Rose nodded. He couldn't reclaim that part again, no matter what. It was meant to be passed on to a baby boy, carrying that bit of his soul to a new life. James furrowed his brow. But why would someone so obsessed with immortality waste a Horcrux on someone else's life? Ralph shrugged as if the answer was obvious. It still is life, but hidden away. Who'd suspect it? As long as Voldemort was inside Voldemort, all the good wizards in the world were gunning for him. He knew that at least a few people, like your dad, James, would never stop until every last Orcrux was destroyed and every shred of Voldemort was killed. Hiding one last little bit of his soul in some anonymous new baby was sort of genius. I mean, you saw the way Voldemort looked. It wasn't like he could pass himself off unnoticed in a crowd, was it? But if he was part of some little kid, who would ever think to look there? It's the perfect disguise. But even so, he wouldn't be that little kid, Rose said, screwing up her face in disgust. That little bit of his soul would have to compete against the whole soul of the person it was inside of. Or work with it, Scorpius said. If it could find some weak place in the host's soul, it could exploit it somehow bend it to Voldemort's will. Even a tree can be bent if it's manipulated from the time it's a seedling. Voldemort was very patient and wily. His essence would take the time to prune and bend that new soul to his will. So what happened to the dagger? Rose asked, seating herself on a crate. We have to assume that Professor Snape was killed before he got a chance to destroy the Horcrux. But did he succeed in hexing the dagger to fool your grandfather? Not according to him, Scorpius said, smiling grimly. My grandfather knows nothing of the pensive or the memories it contains. He tells the entire story rather differently, of course. Scorpius launched into the rest of the tale as he knew it. It began, he explained, with the death of Severus Snape at the hand of Voldemort. Killed not because the Dark Lord suspected his divided allegiance, Scorpius himself hadn't even known of that until he discovered it in the pensive's stored memories, but because of the mistaken notion that Snape must die for the Elder Wand, the unbeatable instrument of magic, to belong fully to Voldemort. Snape had not expected this, and thus had not destroyed the dagger Horcrux. Snape had, however, been wily enough to hide the dagger extremely well and to tell no one of its location. Shortly thereafter, after Voldemort himself had been killed and his Death Eaters scattered, Lucius Malfoy had gone after the dagger Horcrux, fanatically intent on fulfilling his duties to his dead master. He crept into the school shortly after the battle was over, while its defences were still very weak. He used every art at his disposal to search for the dagger, but even though he could sense its presence, he was utterly unable to find its hiding place. It drove him mad with fear and rage, for he believed that if he failed, the Dark Lord would exact his revenge even from beyond the grave. While he was still searching Headmaster Snape's office, Lucius's presence in the castle was detected. He fled, masked, and cursing everyone and everything in his way. As he escaped through the Forbidden Forest, however, his heightened sensitivities detected a powerful magical object lost there. He had no time to search for the object, but he determined to return as soon as he could, for he believed he had quite by accident stumbled upon the hiding place of the Dagger Horcrux. Time passed, however, and Lucius was unable to return to the forest. Most of his fellow Death Eaters were in hiding, or had already been captured and imprisoned. Lucius covered his tracks exceptionally well, but lived in abject fear that he was being watched, that at any moment he would be found out and apprehended. His wife, Narcissa, had left him shortly after the battle, and even his son, Draco, seemed to want little to do with him, so Lucius went into hiding. He used the last of his money to buy a run-down manor house on Cannery Row, protecting it with the best secrecy methods he knew. 
There, alone, he began to plan his return to Hogwarts Castle to capture back the dagger. Unfortunately, in the time that had passed, Hogwarts had been rebuilt and fortified. There was no way for someone like Lucius to get inside the grounds undetected. He needed partners, and he needed money. Soon enough, he encountered both in the form of Gregor Tyrannicus, a soft but hate-filled refugee from his own royal wizarding family in Romania. Gregor came with a small fortune in gold, granted to him by his father in an effort to assure he left quietly and never returned. Gregor was instantly enthralled by Lucius's tales of his dealings with the famous Dark Lord, and vowed every bit of his treasure in support of the search for the mysterious dagger Horcrux. In exchange, he merely asked for his own position of power once the predicted pure-blood kingdom was established. Lucius graciously accepted Gregor's support, even catering to the man's rather obsessive infatuation with collecting relics from the Dark Lord's life. Together they assembled a small team of thieves and murderers, training them for the death-defying siege of Hogwarts Castle. In reality, Lucius had no intention of accompanying the siege. He planned to use the distraction created by the siege to sneak alone into the Forbidden Forest and seek out the hidden dagger. Despite his and Gregor's training, in fact, Lucius fully expected the siege team to be captured and sent to Azkaban. Frankly, so long as they provided the short distraction Lucius needed, he didn't care. They would be one small sacrifice in the ongoing work of the fallen Dark Lord. The siege never happened, though. Less than a week before the planned trip to Hogwarts Castle, Lucius was alone in the manor house on Cannery Row when one of the thieves he had hired for the siege team, a young man named Malcolm Baddock, stepped out of the shadows, a knife glittering in his hand. The man grinned, ordering Lucius to turn over the gold hidden somewhere in the house. "'Give it to me, and maybe I'll only cut out your tongue, old man,' Baddock had said. Lucius had merely sighed. He closed the book he'd been reading and, almost lazily, produced his wand. He fingered it idly, not really pointing it at Baddock. "'And what makes you believe, young man, that you won't be killed where you stand by this very wand?' Baddock's grin widened eagerly. "'Because this is my lucky knife, it is,' he said, displaying the darkly glinting blade. "'It's not failed me yet. It'll kill you three times before you hit the floor, you daft old coot. No one's ever been any good against it before, and yours won't be any different. Now take me to the gold. Lucius narrowed his eyes. Tell me, my friend, he said silkily, does your lucky knife know when a wizard is going to do this? In one deft movement, Lucius drew a short flick in the air. A thin red line slashed across Baddock's throat, and he flinched. Blood began to bead from the cut. It dribbled down his throat, and Baddock tried to look down at it, frowning rather comically. His face contorted with rage, and he reared, hoisting the knife by its tip. As he opened his mouth to speak, however, his head quietly toppled backwards off his shoulders, separating neatly along the line of blood. It fell to the floor with a thunk. Lucius was already pocketing his wand and wondering if he'd tell the rest of the team what had happened to Baddock when something poked him in the stomach. He looked down curiously and noted the hilt of Baddock's knife protruding from his robe. A moment later he heard the thump of the man's headless body striking the floor, dead. Truly it had been a lucky knife. If Baddock had succeeded in finishing the throw he'd begun while his head was still marginally attached— Lucius reached for the knife to extract it from his stomach. It would hurt, but it wouldn't be fatal, not to a wizard like Lucius. He stopped, however, before his fingers touched the hilt. His eyes widened slowly as he stared at it. The bit of hilt he could see protruding from the slowly darkening folds of his robes was quite ugly and jewel-encrusted. Lucius recognized it. Slowly he wrapped his fingers around the silver hilt and pulled the blade out of his gut. He barely felt it. He slid to his knees, holding the dagger up, turning it, and watching the firelight play on its dark, bloody blade. He began to laugh, 
Thank you, my lord, he cried through his laughter. Even dead, your word rings true. Your final horcrux has found me. Thank you, I will not fail you. Your final task will be completed. Lucius laughed until he was hoarse, only remembering to heal the wound in his stomach when he noticed the blood soaking the front of his robes and pattering to the floor. It had been over two years since the Battle of Hogwarts, since the inconceivable death of the Dark Lord, but Lucius was finally able to complete his duty. He told Gregor of the surprising appearance of the dagger, and they dismissed the rest of the siege team with a small payoff in gold, warning them that if they told anyone what they knew, they would experience the same fate as had befallen their mate Baddock. Lucius had long since determined the family that would play host to the Dark Lord's gift. They were pure blood, but lowly and poor. Lucius spied on them and discovered that a young woman in the family had just become pregnant. Her name was Liana Agnellis, and her husband had recently been apprehended by the Ministry, suspected of low-level involvement with Death Eaters in the last days of Voldemort's reign of terror. Lucius had vaguely known the man whose name was Wilfred. He had indeed been a tool of the Death Eaters, although he himself barely knew it. The young man had been extremely simple and gullible, and Lucius himself had even used him as a messenger. It was Lucius who had anonymously informed the Ministry of Wilfred's Death Eater connections, knowing full well that the pathetic man would never be able to implicate anyone by name. Lucius and his cohorts had been far too careful for that. Wilfred was interrogated by the Wizengamot, and eventually imprisoned in Azkaban until such time as he might choose to divulge the names of his purported accomplices. After Wilfred's imprisonment, Lucius paid a visit to the young, quite pregnant Liana in her tiny flat. He ingratiated himself to her, claiming to be a concerned friend and former associate of her incarcerated husband. Liana made tea for the two of them, and they sat at her rickety kitchen table. Lucius explained that he had both the money and the influence to see to her husband's release if she was willing to perform a small service on behalf of her husband's benefactors. Liana was desperate. She fell upon Lucius, sobbing and promising she'd do anything to get her Wilfred back home. She asked what Lucius required of her, and he balked, suggesting that she might think twice once he told her. He asked her to take a moment to consider it while she refilled his tea. As she returned to the stove, sniffing and wiping her eyes, Lucius peered into Liana's empty teacup, examining the shreds of tea leaves scattered in the bottom. He had to be sure that the child in the woman's womb was a boy child. Surely Lucius was wizard enough to ascertain something as simple as that. He looked closely, squinting, but for some reason the tea leaves blurred before his eyes. He blinked, trying to focus, to concentrate. In his robes, the Horcrux dagger seemed to vibrate. He felt it reaching into his mind, calling him. It was distracting him. Lately, Lucius never went anywhere without the dagger, but now he suddenly wished he'd left it at the manor house. And then, just as Liana was returning, settling Lucius's own cup onto the table, the strew of sodden leaves became clear. Lucius stared at them, even reaching for the woman's cup and tilting it to the light. Yes, there it was. There was no question. The child in the woman's belly was a boy child. The leaves proved it. Lucius sighed and smiled with relief. The dagger in his robes went still again. What? Liana had said nervously, sitting back down. What do you see in the leaves? Am I going to get my Wilfred back? Lucius looked at her with gently shining eyes. He placed his hand on hers comfortingly. You will both be together very soon, he promised, if you do as we require. You may do it today, this very afternoon, if you wish. I will assist you, but you must do it with no hesitation and no questions. It may shock you and even pain you, but only a little, and it will be over in mere minutes. Can you do that, my dear Mrs. Agnellis? She nodded nervously, but with great resolution. I knew that Wilfred's bosses weren't the nicest of people, and that the things they made him do were sometimes awful. I told him then what I'm telling you now, sir. I don't want to know anything about it. I'll do what you want me to do, but don't make me know any more about it than I have to. 
I just want my Wilfred back, and after that we'll take our leave of the lot of you, if you don't mind. Lucius nodded understandingly, patting her hand, but Liana seemed to have nothing more to say. The firm line of her mouth proved to Lucius that the simple-minded woman had determined to do nearly anything to get her husband back. She seemed to sense it would be rather horrid, but she had a look on her face that Lucius knew well. It was the look that said, I will do whatever it takes, and then I will never speak of it or think of it again. No one will know, and I will forget it myself. I am already forgetting it. My mind is a blank. Please just get it over with. When Lucius was quite confident that the look of resolve was fully solidified on Liana's face, he reached slowly into his robe, maintaining his expression of kind concern. He produced a folded black cloth and laid it on the table. "'Unwrap it, Mr. Zagnellis, he said quietly. "'It is for you.' She reached and pulled the folded cloth to herself. She unwrapped it and stared blankly down at the ugly silver dagger. Lucius continued to smile at her. "'It'll only hurt for a moment,' he said reassuringly. He began to explain to her what she must do. "'That's absolutely horrible,' Rose said, her voice shaking. "'Your grandfather is a monster!' Scorpius didn't respond. He looked away, glancing at the dusty mirror of Erised. Ralph frowned. "'So how did that Baddock bloke get the dagger Horcrux?' "'He was a seventh-year student at Hogwarts right before the battle,' Scorpius said. "'My grandfather thinks the dagger somehow allowed Baddock to find it, "'knowing it could use him to get to where it wanted to be.' "'Poor stupid git,' Rose said, sighing. "'But if the dagger was with Baddock,' James asked, "'then what was the magical object your grandfather sensed in the Forbidden Forest?' "'He stopped suddenly as the answer came to him. "'Rose's eyes widened as she also made the connection.' "'The Resurrection Stone,' she breathed. "'That's how they found it. "'He got lucky enough to get near it when his senses were on high alert. "'He felt the lost Resurrection Stone and mistook it for the hidden dagger. "'He must have realised that as well,' James nodded gravely. "'He probably didn't know what it was, "'but after Baddock tried to attack him, "'he knew the thing in the forest couldn't have been the dagger. "'Eventually he snuck out into the forest to look for it. "'Bloody hell! "'He must have wet himself when he found out "'it was Slytherin's half of the beacon stone.' "'Scorpius shook his head. "'I don't know anything about that part, "'but yes, it would make sense.' So, James asked, that's the end of the story, then? This poor Liana woman scratched Voldemort's initial on her belly and gave birth to a baby with part of Voldemort's soul in it? Scorpius nodded, still averting his eyes. She was sick with what she had done, and, of course, my grandfather did nothing to see that her husband was released from Azkaban. Not that he really could, even if he wanted to. All of that had been lies. Eventually, as Wilfred wasn't released... Liana became convinced that she had done something awful, and for no reason. She became very sick and was taken to St. Mungo's Hospital. That night she died giving birth to her baby. Ralph's lips were pressed into a thin line. He shook his head and said, This is awful. I didn't need to know any of this. Rose looked up, her eyes shining. Whatever happened to the baby's father? Wilfred stayed in Azkaban for years. He knew his wife had died giving birth to his child, but he never saw the baby. He demanded to be let out so he could raise his child. He became irrational and was put into solitary confinement. A short while later, he was found dead in his cell. My grandfather believes he was thrown into the Dementor pit by some of the guards. The Dementor pit, Ralph said, shuddering. Rose sighed shallowly. The Dementors used to be the guards at Azkaban. When they were deemed untrustworthy, most of them were rounded up and imprisoned there themselves, in a virtually lightless cell deep underground. Just like with the Borleys, the Dementors are creatures of shadow. Without light to show up against, they're helpless. Azkaban's dark pit keeps them imprisoned and weak, but mad with hunger. If a human was thrown into the pit with them, it'd be an extremely horrible death. Ralph asked, but why would the guards throw that poor sap into the pit? Revenge, Scorpius said simply. They believed he was holding out, protecting the worst Death Eaters, the ones who hadn't yet been captured. Most of the new guards at Azkaban had been former Aurors and Harriers, 
They had seen loads of people killed by the Death Eaters, and had no mercy on someone they believed was protecting those responsible. Nothing was ever proved, though. So the baby was an orphan, James said quietly. Just like my dad. Scorpius nodded. To my grandfather's great anger, the baby was a girl child. To this day, he has no idea that it was the hex of Severus Snape that clouded his judgment, working through the dagger itself. He refuses to refer to the child as a she, calling it either the bloodline or even it. He simultaneously despises her and obsesses over her, knowing she bears the last shred of his dead master. The baby girl was raised by Liana's parents, who were not particularly loving. My grandfather has spied on them regularly through the years. The grandparents were never overly cruel, but grandfather believes they secretly blame the girl for the death of their daughter. Rose shook her head. Stop! I don't want to hear any more. It's just too beastly. James's face had grown hard and resolved. He looked at Scorpius. No, he said. You've told us everything else. Now tell us the most important part. Tell us who the bloodline is. I thought you would have figured that bit out by now, Scorpius answered. She is the only known orphan girl currently at Hogwarts, although she never speaks of it. She has her mother's dark hair and her father's height, but everything else she gets from the persistent dark influence of the dagger Horcrux, from the last fragmented wisp of the soul of Voldemort. She was standing right next to you this afternoon, hidden behind a bookshelf in the library, listening to you three. It was her presence that set off the sneakerscope in Ralph's satchel. You know who I mean. Tell me her name, because I can't bring myself to say it out loud. My grandfather would kill me, and he'd probably use that stupid dagger to do it. James looked at Rose and Ralph, measuring their faces, and then he looked at Scorpius. The bloodline of Voldemort is Tabitha Violetus Corsica, he said firmly. Somehow I've known it all along. Then you know something else as well, Scorpius said, sighing and standing up. What? Ralph said, looking one by one at everyone in the room. Rose answered calmly. We know who bloodline is, so we also know who the host of the gatekeeper is going to be. Both are Tabitha. James shook his head slowly. The only thing we don't know, he said, is how and when it's going to happen and what we can do to stop her. Chapter 18 The Triumvirate Last year, during a rather harrowing adventure in the Forbidden Forest, James had met something called a dryad, a living spirit of a tree. The dryad had been quite beautiful, in a sort of sad, hypnotic way, and she had warned James that the blood of his father's greatest enemy beat in a new heart, not one mile hence. The dryad had also said that James should beware. Your father's battle is over, she told him. Yours begins. James hadn't known what the Dryad meant by that, but he had had a nagging idea of who the bloodline of Voldemort was. He'd suspected Tabitha Corsica all along, even though others had told him she was simply a smart, rather devious girl with some nasty delusions about recent history. Now that James knew that Tabitha was, in fact, the bloodline of which the Dryad had warned, he felt increasingly helpless. There was nothing he could do to stop Tabitha's plan mostly because he didn't know what the plan entailed. Scorpius insisted that his grandfather had never told him the specifics of how the bloodline was to become the gatekeeper's host, apart from it being a test that would prove Tabitha's willingness and commitment to the gatekeeper's purpose. James would have liked to ask Merlin about it, but his latest interview with the headmaster had only increased his worries and fears about the great sorcerer. Similarly, James might have written a letter to his dad explaining everything and asking for his help, but his dad already had his hands full with the sale of the burrow, providing living arrangements for Grandma Weasley, and heading up the new sub-department for quelling the mysterious Dementor uprisings in London. Besides, in his last letter, James's dad had admitted that they believed the whole gatekeeper affair was a complicated ruse created by enemies of the Ministry to sow fear and instability. How could James ask his dad for help fending off something that his dad believed was imaginary? 
More and more James found himself thinking of the Dryad's last words. This wasn't Harry Potter's battle. It was James's. Scorpius had suggested that the best they could do was to simply watch Tabitha as closely as possible, a task that was increasingly difficult as the end of the term neared. James saw her regularly during rehearsals for the Triumvirate, since Tabitha was the assistant director, and increasingly in charge of the rehearsals while Professor Curry attended to final production planning. Tabitha's malicious critiques of James's performances had not let up. If anything, she was even harder on him, always apologizing for making him repeat his lines in front of the rest of the cast, as if she was trying to assume polite responsibility for his apparently woeful performance. After all, James had heard Tabitha saying quietly to Professor Curry, I did consent to his receiving the role, along with the rest of the casting committee. Nevertheless, hindsight is always clearest, as they say. The main task of observing Tabitha fell to Ralph, since he shared the same house as her. Apart from the same general moodiness, however, Ralph couldn't report anything unusual about Tabitha's conduct. To James, she seemed either vaguely impatient or even more ingratiatingly polite than ever. Classes began to wind down as the final performance loomed. Loads of parents and family were travelling to attend the show, including James's mum and sister. His dad, much to his own disappointment, was needed in London for the first crackdown by the Dementor task force, and therefore would not be able to attend the show. Ginny, however, had promised to record James's performance on a borrowed set of omnioculars so that Harry could watch later. In light of the suspected large audience, Professor Curry's intention of conducting an entirely non-magical, muggle-style production had been overshadowed by her students' increasing determination to put on a wholly sensational show. James had seen evidence of secret magical enhancement in nearly every aspect of the production. From the treadle-powered wind machine running mysteriously without anyone manning the treadles, to unplugged electrical spotlights that still glowed. In fact, since Hogwarts Castle had no source of electrical power, several small muggle generators had been delivered to the school to provide power for the lights. Even Professor Curry, however, had failed to realize that the generators needed a constant refill of petrol to run. In the interest of expediency, Damien had surreptitiously charmed the generators to emit an industrious chugging sound, and, just for the look of it, plugged all the electrical cords into them. Professor Curry had wisely stopped asking after the generators and turned to more pressing matters. Petra's timetable seemed to consistently conflict with James's, so that he really had the opportunity to rehearse with her on stage. This was unfortunate, Professor Curry admitted, but not a great problem since Tabitha Corsica had arranged for an understudy to fill in for Petra whenever she couldn't attend rehearsals with James. Josephina Bartlett's vertigo had abated to the point where she could read through the lines on Petra's behalf, and, having originally been awarded the part of Astra before her unfortunate accident, she was the logical choice to serve as Petra's stand-in. She did so with a kind of resigned fervour, caught between her embarrassment at having to serve as understudy and her desire to prove how much better an Astra she would have made. She lurked on the stage, arms folded, and barely noticing any of the other actors until Astra's lines came up. At that point, she would launch into her readings, switching from apathy to full melodrama in the mere blink of an eye, and then switching back to apathy the moment Astra's lines were completed. She barely seemed to notice James on the stage, even though many of her lines were meant to be directed towards him. For her own part, Tabitha seemed pleased with Josephina's discomfiture, smiling smugly whenever her lines came up. James was especially annoyed to have to practice the climactic kissing scene with Josephina, especially since he'd never once rehearsed it with Petra herself. "'Don't you dare try to kiss me, you little upstart!' Josephina muttered as she leaned in, smiling mistily. "'Wouldn't dream of it,' James growled through his own loving smile. "'Just try not to fall on me, all right? You're still looking rather tipsy.' He made sure to miss Josephina's lips by a wide mark. A moment later, the lights extinguished, and Tabitha called for a ten-minute break while the stage crew refilled the rain machine. That night, James had the dream one more time. Although this time he felt that it was a true dream, and not a direct vision into someone else's reality. 
It began, as always, with the flash and wicker of blades and the rattle of old wood. The figure in the dream walked towards the rippling pool and looked in. As always, two faces swam up out of the depths, a young man and a young woman. This time, however, they looked different. He recognized them vaguely as his own long-dead grandparents, his dad's mum and dad. They didn't seem to be looking at the girl with the long, dark hair. Instead, they seemed to be looking directly at James, where he floated in the darkness next to her. Their faces seemed grave and worried, and although they couldn't speak, they communicated with their eyes. Beware, grandson. Watch closely and step lightly. Beware. The dark-haired girl turned away from the faces in the pool, and James looked up at her. Even now that he knew she was Tabitha Corsica, her face remained lost in shadow. James tried to speak, to tell her not to hide any more, that there was no point, but his lips felt as if they were sewn shut. He moved along with her as she passed the pool, and as she moved, the dream changed. The mossy, dark walls faded into distance and were replaced by cold wind on a grassy hilltop. A huge full moon burned overhead, yellow and bloated, as if it meant to fall on him. The Tabitha shape continued to walk, and James saw that they were in a graveyard. A leaning, wrought-iron fence marched drunkenly on the right, embracing a collection of worn headstones and crypts. "'I've never been here before,' a young man's voice said. James looked and could just make out a tall silhouette walking next to the Tabitha shape. Tabitha herself seemed taller as well, and her voice was rather different when she spoke. Why would you have come here before? My grandparents are buried here, the young man's voice said somberly. I've no memory of visiting their graves. How sad for you, the Tabitha shape said. If you say so. They came upon a glow in a hollow. It emanated from a lantern hooked onto a post. Near it, a stooped man was scooping earth from a grave. He straightened as they approached, surveying them with a cold, appraising look, as if he'd been expecting them. Whose grave is this? the Tabitha shape asked. The young man sighed, and suddenly James recognized who it was. It is mine, Albus answered, turning to the Tabitha shape. James finally got a good look at him in the lantern glow. He looked about seventeen or eighteen, handsome but sallow, gaunt, as if he hadn't eaten in days. You knew this day was coming, he said, removing his wand from his robes. All sides have been chosen. He senses you are here. He comes now, flying like the wind. But there is something you must do first. And Albus handed the Tabitha shape his wand. Even knowing this was a dream, James tried to cry out, to warn Albus, but his lips wouldn't obey him. He could do nothing but watch. The Tabitha shape raised Albus's wand, pointing it towards the sky. She sniffed, and her shoulders hitched as if she were crying. Then, without warning, there was a burst of green light and an awful hiss. The stooped man with the shovel looked up first, and then so did the Tabitha shape. Albus didn't raise his eyes. Finally, James found he could look up. Spreading overhead was a bright, shimmering shape. It was a huge green skull, its mouth open. Out of the skull's mouth poured a leering snake, its jaw unhinged and menacing. The eerie glow of the dark mark lit the entire graveyard. On one of the nearer headstones, James saw his and his sister's names. His blood chilled, even though he knew these were the names of his dead grandparents. There was a loud crack, and another figure appeared, wand already out and pointing. Stop! the figure cried, and James thought the voice sounded oddly familiar. Both of you! I know what you think you have to do, but it doesn't have to be this way. Albus, don't let it end like this! Do it! Albus said, but James couldn't tell if he was speaking to the newcomer or the Tabitha shape. No! the newcomer cried, and there was an edge of desperation in his voice. The rest are coming, and they won't waste time on words. We only have a few seconds. Albus, don't be a fool! I'm sorry, Albus said, still looking at the Tabitha shape. He nodded slowly to her. She lowered the wand, aiming it at him. 
The newcomer stepped forwards, crying the name of the Tabitha shape, appealing to her. Please don't! This isn't who you really are! You're right, James, the Tabitha shape said quietly, almost sadly. As of tonight, I will be known by an entirely different name. There was an ear-splitting cry and a blast of light, obliterating everything. James fell into that light, struggling to maintain the dream, but it broke apart like glass, like a scene glimpsed in a shattering mirror. James woke up, panting and slick with sweat. He scrambled to a sitting position on his bed, his heart pounding. The phantom scar on his forehead throbbed so hard he thought it must split his skull open. He clapped a hand to it, hissing through his teeth. When he could bring himself to do it, James turned to sit on the side of his bed. He opened his satchel in the darkness and rooted inside, searching for his quill and a bit of parchment. Finally, just as the sweat on his body began to cool in the midnight air of the dormitory, he leaned over his bedside table and scribbled three words. He stared at his own handwriting in the moonlight. It didn't make any sense. Probably it was meaningless. It had only been a dream, and not at all like the other dreams his phantom scar had induced, but it had been wrong in some fundamental, very worrying way. For reasons he couldn't bring himself to admit, he felt that it was important to remember it. Finally, now shivering, James folded himself back into his covers. He had no idea what time it was. Tomorrow was the official performance of the Triumvirate, and after that, the last week of school. Somewhere out there, perhaps not far away, the gatekeeper was lurking, waiting for its human host. And here, inside the very same walls, was that host, preparing herself for the task that would make her worthy. And somehow, in some way, James was meant to stop it all from happening. Your father's battle is over the dryad had said. Yours begins. They were not comforting words, but they were the words that rang over and over in his head, following him as he descended, slowly, into a fitful, dreamless sleep. Nearby, Scorpius Malfoy lay awake, watching, not speaking or moving. When he was certain that James had finally drifted back into sleep, he slid out of his own bed. Tiptoeing, he crossed the room, passing before the window, and casting his shadow over James. Scorpius leaned over carefully, squinting. He didn't have his glasses, but the moonlight was very bright, and Scorpius could just make out James's handwritten words. He scowled at them for a long time, unmoving in the moonlight. Finally, Scorpius made his way back to his own bed. Unlike James, Scorpius did not sleep for the rest of the night. "'Today's the big day,' Noah proclaimed, plopping into a seat next to James at the breakfast table. "'Eat up, Tres. Can't have you fainting on stage, can we? After all, you don't have an understudy.' James groaned. The tables seemed unusually crowded this morning, since some of the families planning to attend the performance had arrived the evening before. Ralph's dad, Deniston Dolohoff, sat with him at the Slytherin table, smiling uncertainly at the noisome throng. Noah's own parents sat at the head of the Gryffindor table with Stephen, his brother. "'Shouldn't you be sitting with your family?' James asked grumpily. "'Bad luck, mate,' Noah said wisely, tapping the side of his nose. "'None of the family are supposed to see you before the performance. It's tradition, isn't it?' Sabrina shook her head, wobbling the quill that was stuck in her red hair. "'You're thinking of weddings, you prat. Grooms and brides aren't supposed to see each other.' "'Well, where do you think they got the idea?' Noah asked around a mouthful of toast. "'After all, what's a wedding but a big real-life performance?' "'You're not nervous, are you, James?' Sabrina asked, ignoring Noah. "'I might be a little,' James admitted. "'I mean, I never expected we'd be packing out the amphitheatre. "'A lot more people are coming than I thought. "'Seems like everybody's family is going to be here, doesn't it? "'My mum's coming.' Sabrina said, nodding, and my uncle has to her. He went to Hogwarts himself about a hundred years ago, and this will be his first time back. Graham piped up. Both my parents are coming, even though I'm just a page boy. I only have one line, but they act like I'm the star of the whole show. I wish you were the star of the whole show, James said, slumping onto his folded arms. 
"'Does somebody have a spot of stage fright?' Rose asked brightly, settling into a seat opposite James. "'He's got it bad,' Noah said, nudging James with his elbow. "'At this rate he'll be useless by the time the curtains go up. "'I might have to play both parts. "'Fortunately, I'm up to it.' "'Treus and Donovan's sword fight might be a bit of a challenge,' Graham suggested, squinting thoughtfully. In an effort to change the subject, James asked, "'Where's Petra this morning? Are her parents coming?' "'I saw her in the common room this morning,' Noah answered, "'looking like she was working on her lines still. She was studying something pretty hard. I didn't interrupt her. I assume her family is coming, but she hasn't talked much about it.' "'I asked her yesterday if her parents were coming,' Sabrina nodded. "'She said she'd be seeing them both tonight. "'It'll be cool to meet everybody's families, don't you think? "'The only other time we see them is on platform nine and three quarters, "'and that's always so rushed.' "'Yeah,' Graham said, rolling his eyes. "'Nothing I like more than getting my cheeks pinched by everybody else's grandma.' "'If only your cheeks weren't so ruddy cute,' Noah said, reaching across the table. "'Graham batted him away, scowling. "'James found it difficult to concentrate on any of his classes. "'In fact, with so many parents and family members arriving throughout the day, "'few professors seemed to expect much from their classes at any rate. "'Regardless, James was glad of the distractions. "'He tried very hard to take notes during divination, "'despite the fact that Professor Trelawney seemed to frown on anything other than practical demonstrations.' "'Divination is an instinct, not a study, Mr. Potter,' she trilled, stopping next to his desk and tapping his parchment with one long purple fingernail. "'Your work is to hone the latent ability inside, the gifted witch and wizard, not merely to repeat techniques and theories. Let go of your boundaries and allow yourself to truly see, my boy. What fate do you divine for yourself in the octocards?' James blinked up at Trelawney, then glanced down at the strew of octagonal cards on the table in front of him. "'Oh, er, uh, I see this one, which has a star on it,' he said, pulling a card out at random. "'Stars represent pain and, er, uh, Christmas. It means that I'm going to be run down by a lorry next holiday, but that I won't be killed, just really, really hurt.' He looked up at Trelawney again, judging her response. "'I'll probably die weeks later, in the hospital, uh, right?' Trelawney's face changed to a bemused smile as she ruffled his hair indulgently. "'You are trying too hard, dear boy. You chose a star, because that's what you shall be this night.' Trelawney sighed mistily and drifted towards the front of the room. "'Few people know it, but I was a rather gifted performer myself in my younger years.' "'There are those today who still speak of my singing performance "'in the Hogsbeat Players' production of The Amazing Azariel's Show of Shows. "'Alas, I submitted instead to the burdensome calling of seer and teacher, "'thus curtailing my own storied career on the stage. "'I am fully assured, however, that your performance tonight, Mr. Potter, "'will be a delight, both sublime and breathtaking. "'I have already foreseen it.' "'She smiled back at James, her eyes magnified ridiculously in her enormous spectacles. "'James glanced aside at Ralph, whose face was as pale and worried as James felt. "'Considering Professor Trelawney's track record with predictions, "'her assurances about tonight's performance were anything but comforting. "'For the rest of the afternoon, James couldn't help reciting his lines over and over in his head. "'He was terrified that he would step onto the stage and completely forget every word. "'It didn't help that everyone seemed to think he should be enjoying the excitement. "'As he moved through the halls, even older students grinned and clapped him on the shoulder, wishing him good luck and telling him to break a wand. He saw his mum and sister fleetingly after dinner on his way to the amphitheatre. They'd just arrived at the castle, having taken the train from London. Lily was wide-eyed, so enamoured by the castle and the bustle of the students that she barely noticed her older brother. His mum, on the other hand, seemed almost impossibly proud of James. "'Oh, you've just become such a man,' she said, brushing his shoulders and straightening his tie. "'You'll be simply wonderful, James. You aren't nervous, are you?' 
between people telling me how great I'm going to be and asking me if I'm nervous, James said, sighing. I'm wondering why I ever signed up for this part to begin with. Ginny clucked her tongue. You signed up because you knew you could do it, and obviously everyone agrees. Now just try to relax. You won't do yourself any favours by worrying about it. Easy for you to say, James grumped. It is, actually, Ginny agreed, smiling at her son. Because unlike the rest of the people here, I know exactly what you are capable of, James. Relax. You'll remember this night for the rest of your life. Try to enjoy the moment. James nodded. Did you bring the omnioculars? Your Uncle Ron has them, Ginny replied, rolling her eyes. He insists on recording the play himself. I told him he could do it so long as he let Hermione help. They stopped over in Hogsmeade to meet up with George, Angelina and Ted. They should be here in half an hour or so, and they're bringing a little surprise for you. James had forgotten how many of his own family and friends were going to be in attendance. He felt another pang of nervous fear, but quelled it. Truthfully, now that the moment was nearly upon him, he felt a little better about the performance. One way or another, it would be over soon. After the production, Professor Curry had arranged for something called a rap party in the Great Hall, complete with punch and an array of sweets. All the cast and crew would be there, along with their families. It was a great relief to know that in less than three hours, James would be there as well, eating cake and congratulating Petra, Noah and the rest on their completed performance. Thinking that, James left his mum and sister, telling them he'd see them afterwards. Ginny smiled and nodded, shooing him away. The ushers outside the amphitheatre's main entry saw James coming. Hugo Paulson, resplendent in his red coat and pillbox cap, opened a door for him. Gary was looking for you, he said as James passed. They want to get you into your beard right away. Jennifer insists she could try me to grow a real one for the night, but Curry isn't going for it. Looks like it's glue and goat hair for you after all. James nodded, hardly hearing Hugo. As he came into the amphitheatre, he stopped and looked down at the stage. It bustled with activity as the crew manhandled the castle backdrop into place, and Professor Curry marched around, testing spotlights and calling for last-minute adjustments. On the stage, Petra glanced up and saw James. She smiled and waved him down. James smiled back, and for the first time he felt a thrill of delight untainted by fear at being part of such an elaborate production. He ran down the main aisle, taking the stairs two at a time. There's our trace, Curry acknowledged as James climbed onto the stage. Your costume is in the dressing room. Get into it, and then get down to makeup, Mr. Potter. Your beard awaits. James looked around, but there was no sign of Tabitha Corsica. She was probably backstage, overseeing the costuming and makeup. He hoped he wouldn't see her as he ducked behind the castle backdrop, heading for the makeshift changing rooms. The boys' dressing room was crowded with bustling characters, struggling into tight-fitting coats, leotards and baggy pantaloons. Cameron Creevy stopped James as he passed. "'Is this hat on right?' he asked, turning the strange headwear this way and that. "'It's a five-corner hat, right? But what corner goes in front? Does it matter?' "'You'll have to ask Jennifer, Cam. I don't have the foggiest notion. Looks fine to me like it is.' "'Jennifer's busy in the girls' changing room,' Cameron fretted. "'I just don't want to look like an idiot in front of everybody.' Noah called over from the three-way mirror. "'Honestly, I think you have it upside down, Cameron. Try flipping it over.' James stopped Cameron as the boys scrambled to invert his hat. "'He's winding you up, Cam. Leave it alone.' "'And you've got your cummerbund on all wrong,' Noah added. "'You're supposed to wear it over your bum like a nappy. See how Graham's wearing his.' James rolled his eyes and took advantage of the overall confusion to slip past Cameron. Sure enough, he found his costume hung on a hook next to his locker. His name had been pinned to the front on a piece of parchment. The curtain wasn't scheduled to go up for nearly an hour, but James couldn't help feeling that he needed to hurry. He was buttoning the last of the many buttons of his vest when a voice spoke directly behind him, startling him badly. "'Hiya, James!' Zane chirped. "'Can you give me a quick boost here?' James turned, exasperated and bemused. "'Zane! You have to stop popping up like that!' Impatiently, James produced his wand and shot a quick stinging hex at the blonde boy, who yelped in pain and dropped the huge bouquet of flowers he'd been holding. 
Wow! Zane cried, clutching his bottom. That really smarts. What was that for? Zane? James said, reaching out to touch his friend. It's really you? I thought you were another mad doppelganger message. What are you doing here? Well, I was trying to reach that vase on the shelf there, Zane said, rolling his eyes. But now I'm thinking I'll just leave this good luck bouquet right there on the floor. What do you say? It really is you, James said, struggling not to laugh. I'm really sorry, mate. I thought you needed a magical boost like the other times. I really didn't mean to sting you in the... But how do you get here? Zane shrugged and grinned. I got out of school day before yesterday. When I talked to your mom over the holidays, she asked if I'd like to ride along with them to see your big performance. How could I turn it down? My parents agreed, and I rode the flu network over to your place in London first thing this morning. How about them apples? That's excellent, James exclaimed. How long are you here for? Rest of the week, if it's all right with old Merlin magic pants. You two still on the outs? James opened his mouth to explain, then shook his head. I don't know. It's complicated. Ask me after the show, all right? You got it, Zane nodded. I better get back out front. Your mom is saving me a place, but it's going to be standing room only, and some of those parents can get pretty cutthroat about seats. By the way, it's probably best if you don't get too close to the red flowers with the yellow tips. Those came from George, and he was grinning an awful lot about them. James nodded seriously, glancing down at the bouquet on the floor. Understood. Thanks. Damien Damascus pressed towards the boys, a prop sheep under one arm. James, come on, he called. Jennifer's going to have twin hanky-punks if you aren't wearing a goatee in five minutes. Hey, Zane, need a zap? Nope, I'm good for the night, Zane said, patting his backside. See you at the party, you guys. James scrambled after Damien, struggling to button the last of his buttons and already hot in his tights and waistcoat. After a moment, he stopped, ran back, and grabbed the enormous prop sword and scabbard. Clanking, he trotted to make up, his stage fright mostly forgotten in the rush of simply getting ready and his happiness at seeing his friend. Jennifer was holding James's goatee in her hands as he ran up and plopped into a chair. Honestly, she said, swabbing the beard with a foul-smelling yellowish glue. For the amount of trouble muggles have to go through to put on a show like this, I'm surprised they do it at all. Maybe that's why they watch so much telly, Victoire commented from a nearby chair. My mum says muggle children spend more time in front of the telly than they do asleep. Damien was still standing nearby. He sniffed. But not as much time as Victoire spends in front of the mirror every day, so that's all right, then. Victoire scoffed, ignoring the laughter that followed. Five minutes later, James stood off stage alongside Petra, who looked beautiful, if a bit overstuffed, in her huge pink dress and curls. James peered carefully around the edge of the curtain. The amphitheatre was indeed almost full, with loads more people still filing in, seeking seats, and babbling enthusiastically. James scanned the crowd, finally finding his mum in the middle section, ten rows back. Aunt Hermione and Uncle Ron sat on her right, apparently arguing over who was going to handle the omnioculars. Ted Lupin sat next to Ron. He'd shortened his hair again, although it was still longer than it had been when he'd been in school last year. He looked much better than the last time James had seen him, although still slightly bedraggled. On Ginny's left, Lily sat up straight in her good yellow dress. She spied James and grinned, waving excitedly. James smiled back at her and waved surreptitiously, trying not to attract anyone else's attention. He placed a finger to his lips in a shushing gesture, and she nodded, pretending to zip her lips. As James watched, Zane sidled past a group of annoyed parents, heading towards the empty seat between George and Lily. Satisfied, James turned back to Petra and the assembling actors. Nearby, Scorpius was dressed in a soldier's outfit similar to James's. He didn't seem to be enjoying it. Nervous? Petra asked quietly. Yeah, James nodded, but excited too. You? Petra turned to look out at the dark stage behind the curtain. She shook her head slowly. Not any more. It'll all be over tonight, no matter what. Jason Smith trotted out of the backstage darkness, his wand lit. Anybody seen Corsica? he whispered harshly, looking from face to face. James shook his head. She's not out front. She's supposed to be managing the ushers. 
None of you, Jason asked, dismissing James. Bloody hell! As he stalked away again, muttering under his breath, Henrietta Littleby shrugged. I saw her an hour ago, but that was before any of us were supposed to be here. I guess that doesn't count, does it? Where was she? James asked, turning to Henrietta. She were in the second floor girl's bathroom, Henrietta replied. I didn't hang around in there when I saw her. She gives me the eby, she does. James frowned, thinking. Henrietta, whose reputation as a gossip was well known, went on. Strange thing was she wasn't really using the bathroom, at least not the way one normally uses it. She was just standing there, looking at herself in one of the mirrors, talking. The first thing I thought was that she was practising her lines, but then I remembered she doesn't have any lines, does she? She's the assistant director, Henrietta giggled. She was talking to herself, James asked curiously. What was she saying? Henrietta blinked at him. How should I know? I didn't hang about long enough to notice, but it sounded kind of foreign now that I think about it. How weird is that? Pretty weird, if you ask me. Yeah, James nodded thoughtfully. Weird. Standing nearby, Scorpius narrowed his eyes. Places, everyone! Curry suddenly rasped, approaching the gaggle of costumed students and making shooing motions. Behind the curtain! Come now! It's almost time! James followed Petra as she ducked behind the curtain, moving to her opening mark. James found the little taped X on the floor, marking his position for the beginning of Act One. His heart was pounding, but he was no longer nervous. Somehow he had left his stage fright backstage. Now that he was standing up front, waiting for the curtain to rise, he simply felt excitement. It thrummed in his arms and legs like magic, and in that moment he thought he understood why even muggles went to all the trouble to put on productions like this. One could come to love this feeling if they weren't careful. He gulped and looked aside. Petra saw him and smiled a crooked smile, nodding once. Across the stage, Noah and the rest of the actors shuffled nervously into place, lost in semi-darkness behind the huge, thick curtain. Through it, James could still hear the babble of hundreds of voices. Then, finally, there was the clack of Professor Curry's heels crossing the stage on the other side of the curtain. A spotlight clicked on, framing her. James could see her shadow on the back side of the curtains, caged in the centre of a perfect circle of light. The crowd fell silent, and a round of polite applause wafted into the air. It sounded eerily close. Curry held up her hands and nodded. "'Thank you, ladies and gentlemen,' she said loudly and clearly, not using her wand to amplify her voice. "'And thank you as well for being here tonight. I know that many of you have come from quite far away, and on behalf of the students who have worked so hard to prepare tonight's production, many thanks indeed.' My name is Tina Grenadine Curry, and as many of you know, I am Hogwarts Professor of Muggle Studies. I believe tonight's presentation will be particularly interesting, not only because this is such a classic tale of the wizarding world, but because, as a year-long exercise for my Muggle Studies class, this production shall be presented in an entirely non-magical fashion. As such... Prepare to be amazed, amused, and delighted, my friends, by the extremely creative and unconventional methods we've implemented to portray this beloved story. And now, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, may I present your sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, friends and family, as they depict for you this Hogwarts Muggle Studies rendition of The Triumvirate. Applause rang out again, deafeningly this time, as Damien Damascus and Ralph began to hoist the curtains. Jerkily, the red velvet rose, and as it did, the applause grew louder. Spotlights came on, picking out the revealed stage elements. One of them glared on James, blinding him temporarily and hiding the audience. He struggled not to squint, remaining perfectly still until the curtain was entirely raised. And then, finally... As the applause diminished into silence, the scene on the stage launched into motion. Everyone moved at once, bustling and passing one another, forming a passable representation of a busy medieval square. And then, exactly as planned, 
Noah's voice cried out, articulating his lines with meticulous care and volume. "'Tis fine a day to praise the troops, my king,' he blared, stalking across the stage next to Tom Squallus, who had a pillow stuffed into his vest, creating a fat belly over his skinny legs. "'Indeed,' Squallus bellowed, turning and jamming his hands onto his hips. "'And more the better time to ease my daughter's wonderment for the peasant life. "'But look, my Astra comes!' "'And Petra moved into view, stepping out from behind a painted wooden rampart "'and into the light of a golden-tinted spotlight. "'James didn't have to act as if he was astonished at how beautiful she looked. "'She smiled fleetingly at the fat king, and then turned to James.' allowing her smile to grow more genuine. The crowd tittered and began to applaud again. Many of them knew this scene well and knew its significance. This was the moment that the princess first spied the army captain with whom she'd soon fall in love. James, on his cue, stepped out of the line of soldiers and bowed over one outstretched leg, doffing his cap grandly. The applause was delighted and amused, and James suddenly decided that acting was a lot easier than he had expected. Act One proceeded with nearly effortless speed and ease. James found his lines coming easily to his tongue, and he pronounced them loudly and carefully, always being aware to face the audience and keep his chin up. During Donovan's famous address to the troops, James allowed his eye to wander out over the crowd. He could barely see through the glare of the spotlights, but he could just make out the delighted smile and straight posture of his mum, the grim concentration of Lily as she tried to follow the story, and the crooked half-frown of Zane. During the scene change for Act Two, James was hastily stripped of his waistcoat and given a sailor's kerchief. As he moved on stage, preparing to give his rousing and very well-known rallying speech, he saw Graham and Jason Smith manning the treadles of the wind machine. He launched into the speech, trying to summon the same anger and determination he'd felt when auditioning for the part early in the year. "'Wizards and men! Forth draw ye wands and wits!' he cried, unbuckling his scabbard and letting it fall to the floor. He produced the oversized prop wand and raised it. "'To fight the violent seas this night, that by the morn we'll hold our win, "'or lie in beds of ocean sand, our beaten glory's shrine.' "'Just off stage, Graham and Jason treadled furiously as the crowd burst into applause "'and even a few hoots and whistles. "'The prop sail flapped in the increasing mechanical wind as if in the teeth of an oncoming storm.' and the enormous painted backdrop trundled aside, revealing an angry cloudscape painted with blues and purples. The presentation marched on with its own strange inertia, bowling over the myriad little bumbles, forgotten lines, and missed cues that Professor Curry had promised would happen, and assured them the audience would barely notice. Graham appeared on stage for his scene, his face beat red and his eyes as round as plates. He'd been so worried about missing the cue for his only line that he interrupted the line before it, answering the question that hadn't even been asked yet. Tom Squalor sputtered, trying to make sense of his own scripted response, as Graham grinned in relief, looking out at the audience and struggling not to wave at his parents. A bit later, Ashley Doon performed such an enthusiastic presentation of the Marsh Hag that James heard children crying in the audience. And then, during the magical sword-fight between Treus and Donovan, which was performed in mid-air while suspended from a complicated system of ropes and pulleys, James's sword was accidentally knocked from his hand during a particularly enthusiastic parry. It clanked to the floor, and both James and Noah stared down at it dumbly for a moment. Then James, in a fit of inspiration, furiously unbuckled his scabbard and waved it triumphantly over his head. Noah grinned as they finished the sword fight, clanging sword to scabbard as the crowd laughed and cheered. Finally, the climactic finale of Act Three was upon them. The king was dead, Donovan was defeated, and Treus, mortally wounded but clinging to life, had rescued Astra from the vengeful sleeping potion of the Marsh Hag. The castle had been struck by lightning and was crumbling into flames as a magical storm beat upon it, and James felt pretty sure that he knew now why this story was known as a tragedy. He limped across the stage, leading Petra towards the huge prop gate. 
The gate shook back and forth as Ralph and Sabrina stood behind it, rocking it with all their strength. Jason and Graham had once again manned the wind machine, billowing the castle's banners with a good imitation of a magical gale. Swinging orange spotlights mimed the effect of raging flames and lightning. James stumbled dramatically as he led his beloved Astra towards the gate. "'Advance! We're nearly free!' Petra cried, dropping to one knee next to James, as if imploring him. "'The castle's doomed, but hope prevails! Oh, Treus, curse it not!' James was sweating under his costume, and it gave his face a fittingly dramatic sheen in the flashing lights. He smiled weakly at Petra and reached for her face. "'I curse not hope,' he said, and then coughed. "'I braved the tempest's watery wrath and fell that sorcerer's might. "'I've cursed them all to gaze upon your loving face, but hope. "'What life I've left, I live in barricades of hope. "'Though God himself may shake this world to fall upon itself, "'my love and hope remain. "'Depart, my dear, and leave me now. "'I walk to death in peace.' "'Pray no, beloved,' Petra cried, and even James was impressed by the mixture of anger and desperation she put into those three words. "'For months and years I've longed for thee alone. My dreams, the home of thy desperate love. I'll not depart my place at body's side, lest unrequited dreams shall crush my soul.' "'Then give me now a testament to love,' James said firmly, struggling to his feet and pulling Petra with him. "'A kiss to cure the pains of death, this one to stand for all.' Petra hesitated, her eyes shining with emotion, and James was impressed with her acting. For a fleeting moment he was quite glad that they had never rehearsed this scene together, for he felt sure that the spontaneous chemistry of this moment could only happen once. Petra leaned towards him, still holding his right hand. She closed her eyes as the lights began to dim, and the wind machine cranked up to full power, streaming through her long hair. And then, as James closed his eyes, not even remembering to miss Petra's lips, a bolt of blinding pain sank into his forehead. It burned through his phantom scar, worse than anything he'd felt so far, and he stumbled, yanking his hand from Petra's to clap it to his forehead. The lights blinked off, and the stage fell into pitch darkness. The wind machine hadn't stopped, however. In fact, it seemed to be far stronger than James had ever felt it. It pushed him as he reeled, and he fell to the floor in the darkness, his right hand still clamped to his forehead. There was a long, ominous creak, and then a resounding crash. Dimly, James understood that the wind machine had blown over the gate prop, and that it had just missed him. Petra! he shouted, struggling to get up. There was movement all over the stage, and even now the wind machine hadn't stopped running. Something was very wrong. Wands were lit on the stage, and James had a sense of stagehands rushing about, struggling to keep the rest of the set from blowing over. He scrambled to his knees, trying to make sense of what was happening. Shut it down! someone rasped desperately. I can't! It's running by itself! It's shaking apart! Look out! Suddenly spotlights illuminated the stage again, blinding James. At that same moment, the wind machine produced a loud screech and rattle. One of the fan blades wrenched free and spun through the air, slamming into the turret backdrop. Off balance, the machine shook violently and tilted over. Stagehands scattered as it loomed slowly and crashed to the stage floor, where it finally clanked to a halt. Amazingly, no one seemed to have been hurt. James spun on the spot, looking for Petra. As he'd suspected, the enormous prop gate had fallen at his feet. For a moment, James was sure that Petra was beneath it. He dropped to his knees, but could find no sign of her. She must have fallen safely on the other side. The house lights came up as Professor Curry rushed out on stage. The audience was babbling with alarm. Many people had stood, peering anxiously at the stage, and calling the names of their children and relatives. Please calm down, Professor Curry called, but a voice was lost in the rising chaos. No one is hurt. Do return to your seats. Everything is under control. A woman's scream pierced the amphitheatre, and James gasped. The crowd fell silent as everyone looked to the source of the scream. James, from his vantage point on the stage, was among the first to see 
and his blood chilled. Ginny looked down at the empty seat next to her, her eyes wild and stunned. She's gone, she cried desperately, trying not to panic. Lily's gone. Where'd she go? She was here just a moment ago. Where's my daughter? Zane stared down at the empty seat between him and Ginny. He glanced up at James, making eye contact, and then ducked down. He reappeared a second later, holding a pair of small yellow shoes. His eyes were deadly serious as he held them up. Something had taken Lily, taken her right out of the amphitheatre in that moment of dark chaos. Ginny took the shoes from Zane and looked around her, her eyes pleading. Lily! She suddenly shrieked, her voice cracking. As if on cue, the audience exploded into frantic motion, scrambling for the exits, rushing the stage, calling names and babbling raucously. James darted off stage, stripping his costume coat off as he went. In the confusing backstage darkness, he could just see the doorway that led out to the seating area. He had to get to his mum and find out what had happened. He angled towards the door, but something moved out of the darkness, blocking him. James looked up, scrambling to a halt, almost running into the large, dark shape. Come with me, boy, a voice rumbled, and a very strong hand clamped onto James's shoulder. Instinctively, James pulled away, but the hand held him firm. Let me go, James exclaimed, anger and panic mingled in his voice. You must come with me, Merlin answered, his voice low and calm. The gatekeeper is afoot, James Potter, and it seeks you. No! James cried and pulled away with all his might. He wrenched loose from Merlin's grip and struggled to produce his wand. Merlin stepped after him, and James saw that he had his staff with him. There was no fighting the headmaster. Without thinking, he ducked and leapt under Merlin's arm. James! Merlin roared after him, but James refused to listen. He threw himself through the doorway and fell into the crowd, bowling several people over. Mom! he called, climbing onto a seat and scanning the crowd. Mom! A hand tugged at James's sleeve, and he lunged away, toppling off the seat and landing on a large figure who grunted. Ow! You're heavier than you look! the figure bawled, struggling out from beneath him. Ralph! James cried, getting up. What's happening? Zane appeared next to Ralph, helping them both to their feet. We have to get out of here, he said over the noise of the crowd. This place is a mess, and we know Lily isn't here. Rose is waiting for us just inside the castle. Come on. Where's Mum? James called as the three threaded through the crowd. Your Uncle Ron and Aunt Hermione took her inside as well, Zane answered. George and Ted are already planning to search the castle. Since it's impossible to separate from the school grounds, Lily must still be here somewhere. Ralph's face was tense with anger. Who did this? Do you think this is what Corsica's been planning? Does it have to do with the gatekeeper? It's the only thing that makes sense, James replied as the three ran through the archway, leading into the castle. Rose had been watching for them. She jumped forwards to join them, her face pale and scared. Panting, James took a moment to tell them of his encounter with Merlin. He said the gatekeeper was looking for you, Rose asked. What's that mean? Why? James shook his head. Who knows? The point is, he knows something big is going down tonight. He wanted me out of the way. Nobody has seen Tabitha all night, Ralph interjected. She never showed up for the play. Curry was right mad about it. She must be behind Lily's disappearance. She's involved, no doubt, a new voice answered. James turned to see Scorpius approaching, his face tight and anxious. He shook his head. Look, this isn't how Grandfather said it'd happen. It's all wrong. I came to help if I could. Rose spoke up. You said your Grandfather never told you how Tabitha was supposed to become the host of the Gatekeeper. Yeah, Scorpius said quickly, meeting Rose's eye. Well, I know a little more than I let on, all right. I can explain now, or we can start looking for James's sister. What do you think, Weasley? What else haven't you told us? James demanded, advancing on Scorpius. Scorpius averted his eyes impatiently. Look, all I know is that this isn't how the plan was explained to me. I don't know the details, but I do know this is all wrong. The longer we stand here arguing, the more danger your sister is in. Do you understand? James narrowed his eyes. You must be Scorpius, Zane interjected, sticking out his hand. I've heard loads about you. I'm Zane. I may have to curse you later, so I thought it best to get the introductions out of the way now. 
Ralph rolled his eyes impatiently. Come on, let's just go to the Great Hall. That's where your mum went with everyone else. We can help with a search party. No, James said, still looking at Scorpius. There's only one place we need to look, isn't there? Second floor girls' bathroom, where Henrietta last saw Tabitha. Rose frowned. Why would she be there? I wondered the same thing when Henrietta said that, James replied, already leading the way down the corridor. But then I remembered, that's where Moaning Myrtle lives. Moaning Myrtle? Zane repeated. Who's she? Oh, she's a resident ghost, Rose replied. Lives in the bathroom because that's where she was killed decades ago. Zane screwed up his face as he walked. She died in the party? That seems pretty unlikely, doesn't it? It's complicated, Rose answered wearily. It wasn't just a bathroom. It was also a portal to... to... Rose gasped. James, that's it! James glanced back over his shoulder, nodding. Henrietta said Tabitha was up there talking to herself in the mirror, using some sort of foreign language. Rose's eyes were wide. Of course! The bloodline would be a parcel mouth, just like Voldemort! She'd be able to open the Chamber of Secrets, even though it's been closed and sealed all these years. That must be where she took Lily. I've been seeing it in my dreams all along, James said. If only I'd have recognised it before. Hey! A voice suddenly called, halting the five in their tracks. James spun, expecting Merlin to come striding out of the shadows, his staff at the ready. Instead, two figures ran out of the darkness, one small and skinny, the other tall and bedraggled. Albus! Rose cried. Ted! Is it you? <sighs> yeah, Ted panted. Your mum sent me, James. She's worried sick about the lot of you. And I came mainly because I sneaked away when mum wasn't looking, Albus proclaimed. I couldn't bear just sitting around and doing nothing. Ted, how'd you find us? Zane asked, frowning. Ted blew out a deep sigh. I have skills. He tapped his nose. Werewolf skills, if you must know. Between Rose's soap and the peppermints in Ralph's pocket, you lot are easier to sniff out than a dead Grindylo. Tell Mum we're going to find Lily, James said, straightening. We know where she is and who has her. Do you now? Ted replied seriously. That's pretty amazing, considering your aunts and uncles are currently scouring the entire castle for her. What gives? It's too much to explain, Rose said. Just pass on the message. We're going to go and get her back. Nothing doing, Albus said, shaking his head. She's my sister too. If you know where she is, I'm coming along. Albus, it's Corsica who has her, James exclaimed. Tabitha Corsica took Lily, Ted interjected. Why would she do that? Are you sure? We're sure, Ralph answered, nodding, and we don't have much time. What are we waiting for then, Albus said grimly. I don't care who has her. We'll figure out the details after we get her back, all right? Come on! The group trampled along the corridor, now running full out. As they filed up the stairs, James heard Ted behind him, speaking in short bursts. I'm sorry, Ralph. About the old trying to rip your arm off thing. It's OK, Ralph panted. Don't mention it. I was angry, Ted went on. Petra and me, when we talked that day, it just brought everything back. Since she was going through so much of the same kind of thing. James interrupted. What do you mean, Ted? I thought you two were talking about why you broke up with her. They reached the top of the stairs, and Rose turned a corner, leading them towards the bathroom. Me, Ted said. Who told you that? She broke it off with me months ago. I thought everybody knew that. No, James said. We all thought she'd gone into Hogsmeade that day to try and get back together with you. You think that's what we were talking about? Ted chuckled dryly. Hardly. We were talking about her parents. I thought you lot knew all about it. You saw the package she got from the ministry, didn't you? James was about to answer when Rose turned, pushing open the heavy door to the second-floor girl's bathroom. She barreled in, followed by Ralph and Scorpius. A red flash suddenly glared through the doorway, and there was a scream. James yanked Zane down as he ducked. Another flash jetted through the air overhead. Ted lunged through the doorway, rolled and landed on one knee, his wand out and pointing. Stop! he shouted. James was still crouched in the open bathroom doorway. He raised his head and saw Ralph splayed unconscious on the tile floor. Tabitha Corsica was standing over him in the middle of the room, grinning humorlessly. Her hair was askew and her eyes were wild. She had one arm crooked around Rose's neck, yanking the smaller girl nearly off the floor. With her other hand, she poked her wand at Rose's temple. Well, 
Tabitha exclaimed glassily. Isn't this quite the party? I hadn't expected so many of you, nor quite this soon, but it wasn't as if I wasn't prepared, was it? Tabitha, Scorpius said, stepping forwards, his own wand out. What are you doing? This isn't the way it's supposed to happen, Scorpius said, taking another step forwards. I never agreed to a kidnapping. Your grandfather knew you wouldn't have the stomach for what this night truly required, Scorpius, Tabitha declared triumphantly. But you were never really necessary anyway. Ever since the little service you performed last summer, you've been merely a pawn. Your grandfather told me so himself. What service? James demanded, getting to his feet and producing his own wand. What's she talking about, Scorpius? James, get down, Ted exclaimed, not taking his eyes off Tabitha. All of you, get back while you can. James, Rose murmured, trying to twist away from Tabitha's wand. Just go. Tell them, Scorpius, Tabitha commanded, renewing her grip on Rose's neck. Tell them just how much of a trustworthy friend you are. Tell them how you've played them all for fools. Scorpius's wand trembled in his hand as he pointed it at her. He glanced aside at James, his eyes bright and scared. Tabitha laughed again. You might do yourself a favour, James Potter, by wondering how I knew so many of you were coming, and exactly when. Ask yourself how I came to be so well prepared for your arrival. Can you guess? I think even you can. It was Albus who answered, calling over James's shoulder. You have the Marauder's Map, he said, both shocked and disappointed. But Tabitha, why? Oh, my dear Albus, the important question is not why, it is how, Tabitha replied. You see, Lucius Malfoy has a rather good thief in his service, doesn't he, Scorpius? Scorpius shook his head angrily, interrupting her. All right, just shut up, Corsica. If you insist, I will tell them. It was I that took the map and the cloak. Are you happy? He lowered his wand and turned to James, his face tortured. Look, I lied. It was me. I rode along with my parents the day they went to your grandfather's funeral. I told them I'd wait in the car, but that's not exactly what I did. While they were gone, I sneaked out of the car and crept into the house. I found your parents' room and searched it as quickly as I could. I stole the marauder's map and the invisibility cloak, all under my grandfather's orders. You have to understand, James, I was confused. I wanted to impress my grandfather and prove myself as a Malfoy and a Slytherin. I wanted to show him I was better than my own turncoat father, but I didn't expect it would lead to this. I swear it. James was completely stunned. Breathlessly he asked, And the doll? Scorpius couldn't meet James's gaze any longer. He dropped his eyes and nodded. That hadn't even been part of the plan. Grandfather hadn't known of it. I saw it on the bedside table and thought it might be helpful. I thought it'd impress my grandfather, and it did, oh yes. He had grand plans for that doll, although they didn't work out quite like he'd wanted. I knew you were a rat, Albus cried, pushing forwards. I smelled you a mile away. James held his brother back, and amazingly Albus relented. But why did you tell us about Tabitha? James asked. Why did you show us the memories in the pensive? Don't answer that, Scorpius, Tabitha said. Enough talk. It's time for the real work of this night to begin. All of you, away, or Weasley dies. If you think I'm bluffing, you'll know better when she lies dead on the floor, and I've descended to the chamber. Now go! Tabitha, you're as deluded as my grandfather, Scorpius cried angrily. Let her go. What do you think you're doing? I'm doing the work I was created for, Tabitha shrieked, jabbing her wand into Rose's temple. One thousand years planning has come to this. I am the edge of the blade of revenge. I am the hand of balance. I am the bloodline of Lord Voldemort. You? Scorpius scoffed, stepping forwards boldly, not even raising his wand. If you believe that, then you're as deceived as I've been. We both should have known my grandfather wouldn't tell anyone the whole of his plan. Put down your wand and let her go! No! Tabitha shrieked again, closing her eyes and crumpling. Her wand wavered and her grip loosened on Rose. 
Suddenly, impulsively, she pointed her wand at Scorpius. Avada Kedavra! She screamed, her face twisting in rage. Green light erupted from her wand. Scorpius lunged, instinctively turning sideways, just as they'd practiced in defense club. The jet of green light missed him by inches, striking the wall behind him and exploding in a burst of sparks. Scorpius's maneuver knocked him off balance, however, and he struck his head hard on the edge of the sink as he fell. At that moment, James saw Rose's mouth tighten, and she kicked backwards, connecting with Tabitha's shin. The taller girl's wail of anger turned into a cry of pain, and she stumbled. Rose ducked from beneath Tabitha's arm, and Ted leapt forwards. He captured Tabitha as she collapsed, but the fight had completely gone from her. Tabitha dropped her wand and sank to the floor, slipping through Ted's arms. Is he all right? Rose called, jumping to Scorpius's side. If he isn't dead, Albus announced, striding into the room and pointing his wand, I'll kill him. James gently steered his brother away from the bleeding boy on the floor. Back off, Al. You can deal with him later. I think you'll be all right. There was a groan as Ralph sat up, rubbing his head. Uh, what happened? he moaned. Am I dead? Tabitha stunned you, Zane answered, helping Ralph to his feet. Be glad that's all it was. She stopped it crazy a few blocks back. I am the bloodline, Tabitha sobbed. I felt the guiding hand of the Dark Lord. I was promised. My parents would be avenged. No one else meets the requirements. I am the only orphan left within these walls. It must be me. Ted glanced sharply down at Tabitha. What did you say? I am the only orphan left, Ted Lupin, she cried, raising her eyes angrily to him. Now that you've gone from these halls, it had to be me. The prophecies say that a child of tragedy would be the host of the gatekeeper. My parents are gone, dead these many years. And Lucius Malfoy has confirmed it. He told me how the ministry killed my father and how my mother died when I was born. Ted was shaking his head slowly. That's not true, he said. He glanced back at James, his face grave. Then none of you know, do you? I assume she told you, just like she told me. James shook his head. Who? Told us what? That day in Ogsmead, Ted answered. She needed to talk to me because she just found out about her parents. She wanted to talk to someone who'd gone through the same kind of loss. She never knew until the package came. It was too much for her to bear to find out so much, so fast. Petra, James said, stepping forwards. You mean the package from her father? Ted frowned and shook his head. James, it wasn't from her father. The ministry sent it. It was all of her father's belongings. He'd willed them to her when he died in Azkaban years ago. When she turned seventeen, the ministry released them to her. She never even knew he'd been incarcerated. Amongst the old shirts and shoes, there was a note. It was addressed to the baby daughter he'd never met. He told her he believed that the guards would soon kill him, but that he couldn't do anything to stop it. They thought he was protecting his former Death Eater employers, but he really wasn't. He didn't know anything about them. They'd never told him their names, or even showed him their faces. He wanted Petra to know that he would have turned his bosses in if he could have, and that, well, that he loved her and that he was sorry he'd never be there for her. It was Petra, James whispered, barely allowing himself to consider it. That can't be. Ted nodded seriously. She doubted it herself. She went to Merlin about it and showed him the letter. He offered to show her the truth in that magic mirror of his, but he warned her that she might not truly wish to know. She looked anyway, and she saw it all, exactly as it had happened. They threw her father into the Dementor pit. It was... it was awful. She was completely devastated. Rose glanced from James to Ted, her eyes wide. But she never told anyone she was an orphan, did she? We all assumed she had a mum and dad like the rest of us. Petra was raised by her grandparents, but she never told us that, Ted replied. The gremlins and I, whenever we saw them at the station, we just assumed they were her parents and that they'd at her late in life. She never talked about them, and we always sort of guessed that she didn't have a very happy home life. They'd only ever told her that her mother had died in childbirth, 
They never spoke to her father at all, and Petra learned not even to ask. I should have known, James said, touching his forehead. I saw her in my dreams over and over. I believed it was Tabitha because I couldn't see her face, but it all fits now. The dark shape in the corner. It talked about restoring the people she'd lost. It told her she would be allowed to avenge them and even get them back. I even saw them, her parents, reflecting in a sort of glowing green pool. Petra believes the ministry killed her father and her mother died as a result, and now she's going to do what she thinks she has to do to get them back. The dark shapes in my dreams, it said there was only one way to do it. Blood for blood. Lily, Rose gasped, covering her mouth. She wouldn't, Albus said, shaking his head. Petra would never hurt Lily, would she? Morganston, Tabitha half sobbed. Impossible. Not really. A different voice answered mournfully. If you think about it, I mean... Everyone turned to a ghostly figure seated on the windowsill in the corner. Myrtle! Rose cried. How long have you been there? That's moaning Myrtle? Zane asked, arching an eyebrow. I expected something a little more... Uh... It's rude to speak of people as if they aren't there, Myrtle chided sadly. Even if, technically speaking, they aren't. But don't worry, I'm used to it. She sighed hugely. James spoke up. Sorry, Myrtle, but this is really important. What do you know about this? Oh, now everyone runs to Myrtle, don't they? What have you seen, Myrtle? Tell us everything you know, Myrtle. But I know how it goes. The moment I tell you, you'll forget about poor, pathetic, moaning Myrtle. It was the same with your father, James Potter. Your brother looks a lot more like him, even though he's not got that silly fake scar on his forehead. What's she talking about, James? Albus asked out of the corner of his mouth. James shook his head. I'm sorry, Myrtle, but this is really serious. Our sister is in trouble. You have to help us. I know, Myrtle cooed. Poor little Lily. Perhaps she'll keep me company here in the toilet. Myrtle! James cried, exasperated, but Rose placed a hand on his chest, stopping him. She turned to the ghostly figure, a thoughtful look on her face. You know, Myrtle, if you help us, I bet Lily's father would be really grateful. I bet he'd even come to visit you, to tell you how much he appreciates all your help. Myrtle looked petulantly at Rose. Hurry! He wouldn't, would he? He probably doesn't even remember me. I'm certain that he does, Rose said confidently. I've heard him speak of you. He'd probably be very pleased to uh, catch up with you. Myrtle seemed to brighten a bit. Do you really think so? Oh, it's been so long, but I knew he'd come back some day. I've always had a special place for him. Yes, Rose nodded. But first, do tell us, what have you seen? What do you know about Petra? Oh, yes, Myrtle replied morosely. Poor thing. She never once spoke to me, you know, all the time she was here. She probably believed I couldn't see under that invisibility cloak, but those things only work on the living. Zane stepped forward. Petra has the cloak? When she was here, Myrtle, what did she do? Myrtle flitted down next to Zane and placed a ghostly arm around his shoulders. Oh, often. She spent most time down there over the holidays, when few other people were in the school. But she's been down there at least once a week lately. I don't know what she does down there, of course. I uh, don't follow her. But then, not twenty minutes ago, she came through with little Lily, just before Tabitha came back again with that silly map. Where did Petra take Lily, Myrtle? Ted asked impatiently. Did they go into the Chamber of Secrets? Well, of course, you silly boy, Myrtle said, tilting her head coquettishly. Where else? Albus shook his head, exasperated. Why didn't you tell anyone? Myrtle peered at him mistily. Because no one ever asked, she answered simply. James turned, stalking back into the centre of the room. How do we get down there, he demanded. Where's the door? Ha! 
Tabitha exclaimed, still crumpled on the floor under the watchful eye of Ted Lupin. You'll never get through. If I couldn't open it, no one can. Only the true bloodline can speak the incantation to open the Chamber of Secrets. Is that true, Myrtle? Rose asked, turning back to the ghost. Oh, no, Myrtle replied, shaking her head slowly. No, no, loads of people have opened the chamber. That horrible Ron Weasley opened it years ago, just by imitating the sounds Harry Potter had made. If he could do it, anyone could. You worthless little, Tabitha cried, straightening. All that time you watched me trying. You let me make a fool of myself. You didn't need any help. Myrtle sniffed. Myrtle, James said seriously, stepping carefully towards the ghost. We don't have much time. Can you tell us the incantation? Don't you dare, Tabitha exclaimed, her voice splintering. That's enough out of you, Corsica, Ted warned, raising his wand. Shut up or I'll stun you. It's the least you deserve. <laughs> it's an awful sound. Myrtle said, ignoring Tabitha. It gives me shivers to hear it, and I'm dead. I always jumped down into my U-bend before Petra said the incantation. Please, Myrtle, Rose begged. How does it go? We have to get down there. Myrtle looked sideways at Rose, raising one eyebrow. You really think Harry will come and see me? You promise? I promise, Rose nodded. Please tell us. Myrtle sighed and flitted slowly to the centre of the room. Carefully, she opened her mouth and produced a horrible, hissing noise. It was guttural, almost gurgling. It made James's hair stand up. When she was finished, Zane looked around and asked, So, who's gonna do it? I know I can't make a sound like that. Ralph took a deep breath. I'll try it, he announced, sighing with resignation. After all, I'm a slivering. Nobody argued. Ralph opened his mouth and imitated the noise as well as he could. James thought he did a remarkably good job, since the same sounds in Ralph's mouth still sent chills down his spine. As soon as he finished, a grating rumble shook the bathroom. The sink directly behind Ralph began to lower, receding into the floor. Tabitha gasped and moved aside, her pale face a mask of awe and jealousy. "'Come on,' Ted said grimly. "'We have to hurry!' You can't go, Ted, Rose said, touching Ted's arm, unless you plan on taking Tabitha along, too. She's a seventh year. I might be able to guard her, but I'd feel a lot better if you did it. Ted grimaced in frustration, looking away and fingering his wand. Finally, he turned back. You go, he said reluctantly. I'll guard Corsica, but we won't leave until you come back, understood? Besides, it's just Petra down there, right? You'll be able to talk sense into her. She'd never hurt anyone. James nodded, but he wasn't at all sure that Ted was right. Ted hadn't had the dreams. Right, let's go. He took a deep breath and turned towards the ancient stairway. And James, Ted called, tell Petra the same thing she told me. This isn't the way. Tell her I said that, all right? James nodded and then plunged down the stone steps, his friends following closely. Chapter 19 the Sacrifice James illuminated his wand as he trotted down the ancient stone staircase. Rose and Albus followed, eyes wide, with Zane and Ralph in the rear. James's phantom scar had been aching ever since that horrible burst of pain when it moved to kiss Petra. Now, as he entered the dark chamber, the ache increased to a throbbing pulse. I was in the Chamber of Secrets once before. Rose called, her voice echoing in the dark, cavernous space. Years ago, when it was still on the Hogwarts tour. My parents refused to go down with me because they'd already seen it, of course, and didn't want to relive any of that, so I went with Uncle George. There wasn't much to see, really, since they'd taken the dead basilisk out years ago. It was just an open space underground. Most of it had caved in. James gasped and stumbled to a stop, throwing out one hand to warn the rest and holding his wand high in the other. "'Was this a part of the tour when you were here, Rose?' he asked breathlessly. Rose stopped behind him, her eyes widening. Behind her, Ralph and Zane clambered to a halt as well. The floor ended at James's feet as if it had been broken away. Beyond it, seamless black space 
indicated a chasm of unimaginable depth. Ominous whooshing sounds wafted out of the blackness, and as James raised his wand, its light glinted off the edges of huge, swinging blades. No, Rose breathed. This was definitely not a part of the tour. Where did it come from? I'd say it was opened only recently, Zane said, pointing. Look! James saw what Zane was pointing at. A pair of huge stone doors stood open on either side, overlooking the depths of the chasm before him. How did Petra open those? Rose asked incredulously. They must weigh tons. I'm more interested in how she crossed that, Ralph said, gesturing at the chasm and the huge swinging blades. We'll never be able to follow her. James stooped down and hefted a medium-sized rock. He weighed it thoughtfully in his hand and then heaved it out over the chasm as hard as he could. It tumbled into the darkness, turning slowly. And then there was a flash and a spark as one of the magical blades swooped down. It pulverized the rock in mid-air and then sucked back up into darkness. James looked aside at Rose and Ralph, his eyes wide. Ralph shrugged helplessly. Albus drew a deep sigh. I think I might know a way to cross that, he said, as if he dreaded admitting it. What, Al? James asked, but his brother had already turned. He walked a few paces away until he stood at the base of the stone steps again. He glanced back. Dad taught me this one, he said. It saved his life once. Maybe we can use it to save Lil. He turned back to the stairs, raised his own wand, and as loudly as he could, shouted, Asio Broomstick! Almost a minute passed, and James had begun to doubt the spell had worked, when an exclamation of alarm echoed down the stone steps. No! Tabitha's voice cried. Not my broom! You can't! Ted called over her. Incoming! The broom dipped down the stone steps and halted next to Albus. James, standing nearby, could hear the faint hum of the broom. He remembered it well from his doomed attempt to commandeer it last year. You can't be serious, Zane said, stepping forwards and examining the broomstick. This is Tabitha's broom, the bogus Merlin staff from last year. You're not going to try and ride it across that chasm, are you? It's my broom now, Albus said grimly. Tabitha gave it to me, although she may well be regretting it. Rose proclaimed, But you can't just fly across. You saw what happened to the rock. I don't know how Petra made it across with Lily, but there must be some other way. Albus strode to the edge of the chasm and straddled the broom. This is no ordinary broom, Rose. I don't know where Tabitha got it or how it works, but it knows where it needs to be. In a way, it's kind of the reverse of James's Thunderstreak. It knows where to go, and it puts it into the mind of the rider. The broom won't let us get chopped, and besides, we don't have a choice. Hop on behind me, James, and hold on as tight as you can. James gulped and climbed onto the broom, wrapping his arm tightly around his brother's waist. Wait! Rose cried. This is mad! That's why we can't wait, Rose, James said, gritting his teeth. If we wait, we'll realise how completely daft this is. Go, Al! James felt Albus tense. Together they coiled, and as Rose reached forward to grab James, her face terrified, Albus threw himself forwards, taking James and the broomstick with him. The broom plummeted under the weight of both James and Albus, and James squeezed his eyes shut, hugging his brother as he leaned over the broom, struggling to pull it upright. The broom corrected swiftly, angling upwards and accelerating. James still had his lit wand in his fist. He gripped Albus with his left arm and held the wand aloft, fighting the force of their momentum. Wand light flashed off a long, steely blade as it dropped alongside them, scything the air. Albus lurched sideways as the broom banked away, and James nearly dropped his wand, fighting to hold on. The air hissed on all sides as huge, curved blades sliced the darkness, dropping like swords and barely missing them. Amazingly, the broom seemed to determine the course on its own, dodging with lightning speed through the flashing, deadly barrage. James struggled to hold on, trying to keep his body as close to the broom and Albus as possible. There was a high, rasping sound as one of the blades sliced a neat seam in his robe, and James felt the chill of the metal whoosh past his skin. He yelped and leaned away, pulling the broom slightly off course. Albus swore, trying to correct, but it was no use. The broom seemed to have lost its bearing. 
It pushed upwards beneath them, and James had a sense that they were nearing the other side of the chasm. Suddenly a rough stone wall loomed into view, as if it were falling on them. Albus pulled up, trying to help the broom reach the ledge, but it was too high. The broom struggled, flying nearly straight up, still weaving past falling blades. And then, suddenly, there was light and space, and James was spinning off the broom, flailing for something to hold on to. He landed hard on stone, rolled and scrambled up, his chin scraped and bleeding, but otherwise unhurt. Albus lay ten feet away, dangerously near the edge of the chasm they had just traversed. He moaned and clutched his head. Al! James called, stumbling over to him. Are you all right? I think we crashed, Albus replied, shaking his head as if to clear it. That was just sick, wasn't it? Ow! James glanced down. Oh, no! I think we broke it! My leg? Albus asked, examining his shin critically. Ouch! I'm pretty sure it isn't supposed to bend in that direction. But it's nothing Madame Curia won't be able to fix, right? James blinked at Albus's crooked leg. Oh, ooh! No, that's not what I meant. Sorry, Al. I meant that! He pointed at the broomstick, which was splintered messily into two pieces. Oh, no! That hurts even worse than my leg! How are we going to get back now? Albus exclaimed, picking up one of the pieces. James shook his head. Like you said, let's just rescue Lily, and we'll figure out the rest later. Albus started to scramble to his feet, and then hissed in pain, falling back. I'm no good, James. Unless you plan on carrying me, I'm stuck here. Come on, I can't do this by myself, James said, feeling a sudden helpless anger. Well, if you hadn't pulled us out of control back there, I wouldn't be in this condition, you stupid Burke. Me? Whose idea was it to ride the broom from hell across the pit in the first place? Well, you sure weren't coming up with any brilliant ideas, were you? Shush! James suddenly hissed, half turning. Don't shush me, you big git! Albus cried. If my broken leg wasn't still attached, I'd beat you with it! Shush! James insisted, waving one hand frantically. He cocked his head, listening. Albus stopped and listened as well, furrowing his brow. It's a voice, he whispered. Sort of. That's creepy. It's coming from that cave over there, James pointed. As his eyes adjusted to the gloom, he could see a greenish light flickering from the mouth of the cave. Go, James, Albus whispered urgently. Go get Lily back if you still can. And if you can't, I swear I'll kill you. James nodded. All right. I just hope nobody else beats you to it. He took a deep breath, still staring at the green glow of the cave mouth, and then began to walk towards it. James's phantom scar began to sing a long, high note of pain. It rang in his ears, throbbing with the steady thrum of his heartbeat. Petra wouldn't really hurt Lily, would she? He truly wanted to believe she wouldn't, but he remembered the dreams, remembered the coaxing, lulling, infuriating words of that phantom voice. It had promised Petra she could get her parents back if only she was willing to make the hardest choice of all, to repay blood for blood. Petra was obviously not in her right mind. She was in a sort of trance, wasn't she? She was under the control of that horrible voice and the last shred of the soul of Lord Voldemort which beat in her veins. But even as James approached the entrance to the cave, he knew that was not entirely true. Petra was being influenced, yes, but she wasn't being forced to do anything. The shred of Voldemort wasn't enough to completely control her, only to sway her, to coax and persuade her. The greatest influence inside Petra was her own broken heart, and her deep, unspoken rage, and the desperate, bottomless hunger for judgment on those who had taken her parents from her. In the thrall of those emotions, James knew that Petra may well do almost anything if she was convinced that it would satisfy those needs. Thinking that, James shuddered. He stepped into the mouth of the cave and saw it all. There was the flickering green pool lit from within, and there was Petra, still dressed in her pink costume dress. The curls had begun to fall from her hair, and her makeup had run forming tear streaks down her cheeks. Her eyes were dry now, however. She had her wand out, pointed at Lily, who stood before her, expressionless and limp like a puppet. The high, horrible voice was babbling, and James could only now make out the words. 
The boy James comes, the voice said with delight. Look upon him, my dear. He comes, just as predicted. James gasped, hearing his name in that awful voice. But then Petra turned to him, and his gasp turned to a violent shiver as the pain in his forehead spiked. Petra's eyes were eerily dead. In the flicker of the greenish pool, her face looked like a mask. She held his voodoo doll in her free hand, and James could see that someone had drawn a crude green lightning bolt onto its forehead. James, she said blankly, still pointing her wand at Lily, you shouldn't have come. Now it's too late. James stumbled forwards, moving into the light of the cave. Petra, what, what are you doing? Petra shrugged slightly, and then turned her gaze back to Lily. What I was made for? she answered, sounding eerily like Tabitha Corsica. She nodded at Lily and said, You know what to do, dear. Without blinking, Lily walked slowly around the glowing pool, her bare feet making no noise on the stone. On the far side of the pool, James saw that a series of steps led down into the water. Quite slowly, Lily began to descend the steps. With a shock of horror, James realized that his sister was under the imperious curse. "'I'm sorry, James,' Petra said. "'I know you can't possibly understand why this has to happen. It seemed awful to me at first, too. But now I know it is the only way. It really is best for everyone, even Lily. You have to trust me.' "'Have to trust me!' The horrible, keening voice echoed. It seemed to be speaking constantly, muttering under Petra's words, almost as if it was feeding them to her. Lily! James called, stepping forwards. Stop! Lily's eyes didn't so much as flicker. She took another step into the eerie green pool. James reached desperately for his wand, but it wasn't in his pocket. Too late, he realized he must have dropped it when he and Albus had crushed the broom. He ran forwards, meaning to drag his sister bodily from the pool, but just as he was within reaching distance, something repelled him. He hurtled backwards through the air, as if pulled by a rope around the waist. He struck the mossy stone wall and fell, the breath knocked out of him. "'One at a time, James,' Petra said sadly, still pointing her wand at Lily. "'I'm sorry. Please don't try that again. I really don't want to hurt either of you before it's all over.' James gasped for breath, and the phantom scar on his forehead burned like a branding iron. The awful voice echoed Petra's every word, and for the first time James wondered if Petra was even aware of the voice. Was it possible that she didn't realize how it was influencing her? He glanced around, looking for the source of the voice. Just as in his dreams, it seemed to emanate from a shadowy figure in a dark corner. It stood perfectly still, apparently wearing an old bowler hat and a dusty coat. Its arms hung loosely at its sides. James struggled to get up, but he felt weak and heavy, as if something was pushing down on him. It was the awful weight of some new presence, filling the room like black smoke, darkening it. It was the gatekeeper, silently, eerily, unseen. It descended into the chamber, watching preparing to enter Petra once she completed the necessary rite of willingness, murdering Lily. Lily took another step into the pool. Her yellow dress began to float about her, sinking into the murky water, and as she descended, something else seemed to be ascending from the other end of the pool. James recognized the shape. It was the young woman he'd seen so often in his dreams, Petra's mother. As Lily lowered into the water, Liana arose from her own reflection, smiling at her daughter, raising her hands. Petra's eyes shone as she looked at the ascending shape. Petra! James called, catching his breath. That can't really be your mother. It's a trick. She's not real. Don't listen to him, the high voice whispered, wheedling. He is the son of those who let her die. He is full of lies and deception. But his voice will soon be stopped forever. And with his death, you shall have your father back as well. Then all will be prepared. Balance will be restored. 
The new age of judgment will be at hand, and all because of your sacrifice. All because of my sacrifice, Petra said quietly, tears running down her face again, smearing her makeup. Lily's chin touched the surface of the pool. A drop of water hung there, and then she stepped forwards again, her mouth dipping below the surface, her hair spread around her, floating on the water like a corona. The ghostly figure of Liana Agnellis put one foot onto the stone floor. She wasn't even wet. This isn't real, James screamed desperately, struggling to his feet. It's all coming from that voice. What is it? There is no voice, Petra sang lightly, rocking her head back and forth. There is no voice other than the voice of my dead father. You see, I have brought his things here, where they await him. His shoes and hat, his coat, even his cloak of invisibility, which I've used myself these many visits. He'll be so happy to see them again, don't you think? James shook his head fervently. That's my father's cloak, Petra. You're being deceived. Petra didn't seem to hear him. Her eyes gazed trance-like at the shape of her mother, but her wand was still pointed at Lily as she descended the last step, slipping beneath the surface of the water. The heavy, dark sense of the gatekeeper's presence increased. The task was nearly done. Lily would soon be dead, and the gatekeeper would unite with Petra, its host. Then there would be no sending it back, no stopping it from running rampant upon the earth. James wanted to lunge towards the pool again, risking everything to pull his sister out of the water. But even in his desperation, he knew Petra would easily repel him once more. There was no hope, and yet James realized this was his last chance for action. Frantically, he looked from his drowning sister to the shadowy figure in the corner. He could see now that it wasn't a figure at all, but simply an assembly of clothes, Petra's father's belongings, propped like a scarecrow. The voice came from within, hidden somehow. Suddenly, horribly, James knew what he had to do. "'This isn't your father!' he exclaimed, scrambling across the room, skirting the pool and his dying sister. "'Petra, look!' Before Petra could stop him, James grabbed the empty arm of the coat. He pulled as hard as he could, yanking the coat loose. It tore away from the shape that had supported it, knocking the hat loose as well, and the horrible voice cried out in fury. No! It keened. Beastly boy! How dare you touch me! James stumbled backwards, nearly fainting at the intensity of the pain in his forehead. Petra gasped, and her wand wavered. James, what have you? she exclaimed, and then her voice changed, becoming very slightly doubtful. Father? The coat had concealed a portrait in a frame. James could see instantly that the portrait had been quite severely damaged, almost entirely destroyed, and then very systematically sewn back together and repainted. The repainted portions didn't move very well, giving the face a twisted, maimed look. But James could clearly see who the portrait represented. One eye stared blankly, while the other followed him malevolently, glowing red with one snake-like vertical pupil. Petra's face contorted in involuntary disgust. You're not my father. You're... you're... Finish the task! The portrait hissed furiously. Kill Lily Potter first, then James Potter! Correct my one fatal mistake. It matters not who I am. All that matters is what was stolen from you, and making those responsible for it pay. It is the only way to return those you've lost. Correct your mistake, Petra said, her expression melting slowly into horrified revelation. But I thought, my single mistake! The portrait of Voldemort shrieked urgently. Killing James Potter first, leaving the stronger one to protect the boy. It was old magic, but powerful magic, and I forgot it. She should have died first, leaving the man and the child to wither before my wand. It was my single fatal mistake. 
I was foolish, yes, but now the circle will be closed. You, my soul's final vessel, will kill the girl, Lily Potter, and then the boy, James Potter, and then... The voice dropped to a seething, greedy hiss. Harry Potter will come, and finally, finally, we will kill him. Harry Potter? Petra whispered. The doll was meant to summon him, the portrait said quickly. The plan seemed so simple. Add a scar to the forehead, thus making it the father instead of the son. Surely once Harry Potter's scar reawakened, he would come, and then he would be ours. But instead, we have lured the boy James, granting him the phantom scar and the ability to know our plans. And this, my dear, is even better. I might have foreseen it. My one mistake will be rectified. The order reversed. Lily Potter dies, then James, and then... Finally, Harry Potter will lie dead at our feet. Wonderingly, Petra said, But my parents, the promise of balance and perfection, you used me. Her voice rose, became angry. You used me! That is because in your heart you and I are one and the same, the horrible portrait rasped. Your living soul carries the last vestige of my own, like a flame in a lantern. We wish for the same things, but from different directions. In the end, we arrive at the very same place. Revenge! Petra shook her head sadly. What have I done? I didn't want revenge, she said. All I wanted was justice. She turned away from the portrait and looked back at the woman standing on the ledge of the greenly flickering pool. Petra's mother smiled back at her sadly and nodded. Petra hitched a sob. Justice! And my parents back! she said, her voice cracking. She raised her wand. Wingardium Leviosa! No! The portrait screamed so loud that it seemed to shake the walls. Lily flew up out of the pool, limp as a rag and streaming water. The shape of Liana Agnellis fell in on itself, reverting to water. It splashed onto the stone floor and screamed back into the pool. Petra screamed, unable to resist reaching out to the departed shape, tears shining in her eyes. I'm sorry, Mum! Dad, I'm so sorry! I couldn't do it! James ran forward to the suspended shape of his sister. He reached and pulled her to him, hugging her. She was as limp and cold as death. Gently he laid her on the floor and placed his ear to her chest. Her heart's still beating, he cried. You foolish girl! The portrait roared, its face distorting grotesquely. It is the only way! The part of me in you rebels even now! Resist at your own peril! Kill the girl! It is not yet too late! Petra shook her head slowly, approaching the portrait. You can't destroy it, Petra, James called, cradling Lily in his arms. Look at it. Other people have tried. Portraits can only be destroyed by the painter, remember? Petra was still shaking her head, tears streaking her face, but her expression a mask of stern resolve. That's not entirely true, James, she said quietly. With both hands, she gripped the portrait by its frame and lifted it. You are the host of the gatekeeper! The high, cold voice of Voldemort proclaimed urgently. Even now it awaits you! You can feel its presence! You have been chosen since the time of Salazar Slytherin himself! Hundreds of years of prophecy lead you! You cannot turn aside from the weight of that destiny! It will crush you! Tam! Back! All is not yet lost! It is not too late! 
There are two people that can destroy a portrait, although the second person is really ever available to do it, Petrus said, speaking to James and ignoring the raving voice. She held the painting out with both hands, levelling it over the rippling surface of the pool. A portrait can only be destroyed by its painter, or, if fate allows it, a portrait can be destroyed by its subject. No! The portrait shrieked, and James saw the canvas bulge slightly at the force of it. Petra dropped the portrait, and it fell into its reflection, splashing heavily. The voice of Voldemort's painted visage continued to scream furiously, bubbling as it bobbed for a moment. Horribly, the painted face began to run and streak, as if the liquid in the pool were acid rather than water. Paint bled over the sinking canvas and mingled with the glowing waters, diluting and thinning, drawing feathery black tendrils into the depths. The voice gurgled and faded, ran out of breath, rasped desperately, and then died leaving only its echo in the Chamber of Secrets. The portrait frame sank out of sight and was lost forever in the bottomless pool. "'Is she breathing?' Petra asked, dropping onto her knees next to Lily. "'I don't know!' James exclaimed, hugging her wet, slight body. "'She's so cold!' Petra nodded and levelled her wand at Lily's throat. "'Expelli aqua!' she said firmly. Several seconds went by, and James was sure the spell hadn't worked. But then Lily suddenly lurched in his arms. She coughed thickly and vomited a quantity of water. James helped her into a sitting position, pounding her gently on the back. She coughed more water and gasped a great, ragged breath. James was so preoccupied that he barely noticed the sense of the gatekeeper fading from the chamber. Its host had failed the final test. Petra had not killed for it. Weakened and silent, the gatekeeper streamed away. "'James?' Lily croaked, looking blearily at his face. "'Where am I? What happened?' James shook his head and laughed with relief, tears welling in his eyes. "'You're with me, Lil. That's all that matters.' "'Hi, Petra,' Lily said weakly, glancing aside. "'You were great. I cried when you drank the marsh hag's sleeping poison.' Petra smiled wanly. "'Thanks, Lily.' James and Petra helped Lily to her feet, and James put his arm around her, leading her back out of the cave. Petra gathered the invisibility cloak, but left the eerie collection of her father's clothing. She looked back only once, her face flushed and sad. "'Hey, Petra,' Albus said gamely as they approached. "'You feeling a bit more yourself, are you?' Petra nodded, but didn't reply. Silently, she knelt next to Albus and examined his leg. You're pretty good at this, James said, watching Petra tear a strip of ribbon from her dress. Carefully, she used the ribbon and a length of the broken broom to splint Albus's leg. When she was done, she stood and pulled Albus to his feet. Hey, Albus said, surprised. That feels loads better. How do you do that? It's a sort of talent, Petra answered, averting her eyes. Besides, it was just a fracture. You'll be fine in a day or so, once Madame Curio has a look at that leg. James didn't say anything, but he had the distinct sense that Petra was lying about Albus's injury. It had certainly been far more than a fracture. James himself had seen the ugly angle below Albus's knee. Now he was standing on it with the help of a simple splint. It was as if Petra meant to repay them for what had happened, but secretly, and using a rather extraordinary kind of magic. Petra stood again, gathering the voodoo doll and the invisibility cloak. She looked at them in her hands. These aren't mine, she said, and then handed them to James. I wasn't even aware of the doll until the portrait mentioned it. I was carrying it the whole time, but somehow I barely knew it. I'm so sorry, James. I don't know what else to say. James accepted the doll and the cloak. You were being deceived, he answered simply. Petra nodded morosely and looked out over the chasm. I was, she agreed. But mostly I was deceiving myself. I can't deny that. You've got reasons to be angry and hurt, Petra, James said quietly. That wasn't the way to deal with it. Ted wanted me to tell you that, but there are other ways. The feelings are real. You just have to figure out what to do with them, right? Petra nodded slowly. In the darkness, James saw one more tear track down her cheek. You still in one piece, Lil? Albus asked his sister, looking her up and down. Why are you all wet? 
Lily frowned and looked down at her sopping yellow dress. Honestly, I don't have any idea. Explanations later, Albus sighed heartily, hopping on his good leg. First, how are we going to get back across that? He gestured towards the dark chasm. Same way I got here, Petra answered softly. We walk. Albus grimaced. Walk? What are you, a ghost? No, Petra replied, almost to herself. Apparently I'm the bloodline of Lord Voldemort. She stepped forwards, walking straight off the edge of the cliff. James gasped, horrified but unable to look away. Petra didn't fall, however. Her footstep was supported by a small stone platform, rather like a stepping stone, that had appeared out of nowhere. She looked back, one foot still on the edge of the chasm. "'Stay close and try very hard not to think about what you're doing,' she said, and James shivered. She didn't sound entirely confident that it would work, but what choice did they have? James hesitated, but then he realised that, for the first time in nearly an hour, the phantom scar on his forehead didn't hurt. He sighed and moved in behind Petra, herding Lily and Albus in front of him. "'This is completely insane,' Albus commented. "'Don't look down,' Petra answered. Without a pause, she began to walk. Jerkily, Albus, Lily and James began to follow her. Against all probability, none of them fell as they moved out over the depths of the chasm. Neither did the swinging, whooshing blades descend on them. James's footsteps landed on rough stone steps, each about the size of a dinner plate, and the moment his heels pulled away from each step, they sank away quickly, falling into darkness. Dimly, James heard the clank and rattle of machinery, and he recognised it. It was the same sound he'd heard in his dreams of this place, only now he knew what it was. Somehow the stones were raised mechanically, operated by the sheer magic of Petra's passage. Perhaps the mechanism could only be summoned by the bloodline, or perhaps it merely responded to anyone who knew the proper talisman, as Petra obviously did. Either way, it definitely helped not to think about what one was doing, or to look down. As James placed his last footstep on the opposite ledge, collected into the waiting arms of Rose, Ralph, and Zane, he couldn't resist looking back. The last stepping stone fell away into darkness, attached to a complicated rigging of struts and coils. It squeaked and rattled as it retracted, and then it was gone, as if it had never been there at all. Petra! Rose exclaimed, weak with relief. Lily! Everyone's all right! Zane grinned incredulously. I thought you both were goners for sure. What happened? James crashed us, Albus griped, shaking his head. About broke my leg off. It's a good thing Petra here is a quick one with a splint. Yeah, she's a great one to have around in a medical emergency, Ralph agreed, looking at Petra a little worriedly. "'Lily, you're soaked!' Rose exclaimed, laughing and wiping a tear from her eye. "'Here, let me help you!' Rose produced her wand and waved it at Lily in a complicated gesture, pronouncing the proper spell. Hot air suddenly blew from the tip, drying Lily's dress and making her giggle. "'What are the gatekeeper?' Zane asked James, as the group made its way towards the stone stairs and the light beyond. "'Gone,' James answered. "'I felt it leave. For good?' James shrugged. It didn't get Petra as its host. She wouldn't kill for it, not in the end. It doesn't have a foothold here any more. It's finished. Zane nodded, frowning a little. If you say so, mate. Let's get out of here. This place creeps me out big time. Yeah, there's a reason they call it the Chamber of Secrets, Albus agreed. James nodded, glancing back. Fervently, he said, let's just hope that was the last of its secrets. And that's the story as well as I can tell it, James said, sitting back in the single chair across from the headmaster. It was the next day, and the bright sunlight and birdsong of late morning wafted in through the open window. We came up through the girls' second-floor bathroom, and Ted led Tabitha straight here to your office. The rest of us took Lily to the Great Hall to meet up with Mum. She called Aunt Hermione, Uncle George and Uncle Ron back from the search— and everybody decided to go ahead with the rap party after all, although it was more a celebration of Lily's return by that point. Merlin nodded slowly, his fingers steepled. He shared a look with Harry Potter, who stood nearby, arms folded and staring at the floor. "'And Miss Morganston attended the party?' Merlin asked. James shook his head. "'No, I think she thought it would be best for her not to be there. I mean, considering everything.' 
Harry spoke without raising his head. It wasn't her fault. She was being deceived. It was not entirely her fault, Merlin corrected grimly. She was being deceived, yes, but she was allowing the deception to occur. She has admitted so herself. The fact that she was able to throw off the deception in the end is proof that she could have done so all along, had she so chose. She is cursed with the last ghost of the soul of Voldemort in her very blood, Harry said, finally raising his eyes. He was a wily liar and a master manipulator. Far greater witches and wizards than Petra Morganston succumbed to his deceptions. Merlin nodded, and they were all so responsible for the choices they made as a result. James sat forwards in his seat. What are you saying? You think Petra is evil just because she was unlucky enough to get chosen for that stupid Horcrux dagger? No, James, Merlin said gently. For that she is truly unfortunate. To the extent that Petra allows herself to be influenced by that accursed soul, however, she may still choose to do that which would make her evil indeed. She has admitted that she was the one that cursed Josephina Bartlett with the vertigo eggs, knowing everyone would blame Miss Corsica, all just to prove to herself that she could do it. She came very close to making the ultimate evil choice last night, and nearly doomed all of mankind in the bargain. Had you not been there at exactly the right moment, revealing the mysterious portrait, all might well have been lost. You don't know that, James said, but uncertainly. Oh, but I do, James, Merlin said, looking James in the eye. And for that, I owe you an apology. An apology? Why? Merlin sighed deeply. I was very wrong about you, James Potter. The big man paused as if unwilling to elaborate. He was gazing straight ahead, and James realized that he was looking past him at something on the rear wall. James turned and looked over his shoulder. The portrait of Albus Dumbledore was meeting Merlin's gaze. He smiled slightly and nodded. Then, barely noticeable, Dumbledore winked at James. James frowned and turned back to Merlin. "'I've been advised,' Merlin said sardonically, "'to avoid the temptation to keep secrets or tell half-truths. "'Your Albus Dumbledore and I have discussed the topic at great length, "'and I admit that, until recently, I did not much agree with him. "'Regardless, recent events have shown the validity of his argument. "'James Potter, in the presence of your father, I will tell you the whole of the truth.' "'Merlin sighed again, and then stood. "'He moved from behind his desk, passing in front of Harry. "'It is true.' he explained. I was well aware of the possibility that the entity called the Gatekeeper might follow me back from my long journey outside of time. Salazar Slytherin made it very clear to me. He hoped and planned for it, and my heart was in such a state that I did not much care. Damn the world, I thought. If the Doombringer is to come, then fate will save mankind, or it will not. I washed my hands of it. Last year, when I returned to the world of men, I despised this age. I determined that if the gatekeeper had indeed followed me, I would not even use the small power at my disposal to keep it at bay. Merlin held up a hand, displaying the glinting black ring. And then I discovered the presence of the Borleys. Nuisances, really. The magical equivalent of cockroaches. And yet it proved to me that things had indeed followed me from the void. If the Borleys were here, then surely the gatekeeper was as well. I determined to capture the Borleys using the best tool for such a task, the Dark Bag, which, as you know, contains the last earthly shred of pure darkness from the void. I imprisoned the Borleys inside it, dozens of them, although at the time I could not say why I chose to do so. It seemed merely right and responsible. The truth is that I was coming to know this age, and while there was, and still is, much of it that I find wretched, I discovered I did not hate it as much as I'd thought. More important, I had come to care for some of the people in this age, chiefly you, Mr. Potter, and your rambunctious, irreverent friends. As I realized this, I knew I had but one choice. I must do what I could to rid the world of the gatekeeper, whose very presence in this sphere was my responsibility. Having decided that, I came to know that there were those in this world who knew of the gatekeeper and wished to use it. 
These were the disciples of Slytherin, who, like him, had fooled themselves into believing the gatekeeper could be controlled and used as a hand of vengeance. I knew of the other half of the beacon stone, and sensed that it was in the possession of these bent individuals. I followed their progress as they sought the gatekeeper. I watched and waited, using this very mirror. He indicated the Amsera Serth, which stood hooded nearby. My devices could sense events of dark magical power, pinpointing their location. When that happened, I watched in the mirror. Eventually I became involved, travelling to the place where the agents of Slytherin met the gatekeeper. I suspect that you witnessed this, Mr. Porter, along with Miss Weasley and Mr. Deedle. I found them in an unplotted forest at the tomb of Tom Riddle. There the gatekeeper had revived the memory of Voldemort, forcing it to speak through the grave statue. The gatekeeper demanded to be led to the human who would best serve as its host. The statue told of the boy who had defeated Voldemort, and the gatekeeper assumed that this boy, Harry Potter, would be the logical choice for its host. I sensed it turning towards you, Harry, homing in on you. Merlin looked up at James's father. It located you without even leaving the grave. It sensed you in the web of humanity, and determined that it could not have you. I felt it turning you over in what passes for its mind, felt it dismiss you, not as unworthy, but as unconquerable. It knew it could never bend you to its purposes. Harry visibly shivered. I remember that, he said in a low, wondering voice. I was in the aura offices at the Ministry, talking to Kirkham Wood. All of a sudden, it was like I was outside myself, looking down on my body as if I'd been shoved aside, while something else rifled through my brain. It only lasted a few seconds, and then suddenly it was over. Kirkham hadn't noticed a thing. I decided I'd imagined it, or that I was just a bit overstressed. But it must have been that thing examining me. Merlin nodded. It would take a powerful wizard to sense it. The gatekeeper numbs its prey so that few ever remember its passing. Surely that fact alone was part of why it knew it could never claim you, Harry. So it moved on. Even as that demented Lucius Malfoy spoke to it, beckoning for it to join them, telling it that they had prepared a bloodline to be its host, I sensed it moving on, past you, Harry, looking further, looking for you, James. Me? James exclaimed, shocked. Why? It makes perfect sense if you think about it from the gatekeeper's view. The prophecies all claim that the host of the gatekeeper would be a child of great loss or an orphan. It sought out Voldemort, the orphan who most represented the gatekeeper's aims, and found him a corpse. Thus it logically sought out the one powerful enough to have bested Voldemort, and found yet another orphan, Harry Potter. He, however, was too strong and therefore of no more use to the gatekeeper than the dead Voldemort. So it looked just a bit further to the first-born son of Harry Potter, and it found, interestingly, that that very boy had recently experienced his own tragedy, the sudden loss of your grandfather. Further, it sensed that you were in attendance on the very night that the gatekeeper had arrived on the earth, and that you, James Potter, had even helped facilitate its descent. But I didn't mean to, James blurted. I was trying to stop it. Merlin held up a hand. It matters not to the gatekeeper. I sensed it homing in on you, learning of you, all in that moment in the graveyard, even as Lucius Malfoy was speaking to it. I sensed you in its thoughts, James, and that is when I stepped out into the open to distract it. I called to the gatekeeper, identifying myself as the bearer of the beacon stone. It remembered me from my time in the void. The first thing it did was ask for you, James. I told it as sternly as I could that you knew nothing of it, that you would never consent to be its host, but it laughed. It told me that you had already sorted out, and that you were watching at that very moment. Lucius Malfoy looked and saw you, reflected in the window of an abandoned shack nearby. He pointed at you, and the gatekeeper smiled. It had known you'd been watching from the moment it turned its attention to finding you, James. I turned and saw your reflection for myself. I knew I had to get back to warn you, but you closed the focusing book, shutting me out. It took me much of the day to get back to the castle by other methods, and by then I had determined a rather different opinion of you, I'm afraid. You decided I was on the gatekeeper's side, James asked, perplexed. 
Not consciously, Merlin answered. No more than Petra Morganston was on the gatekeeper's side. I decided you were being manipulated by it and by your own desires. I regret to admit this, James, but I feared that your desire to be like your father was being exploited, used by the gatekeeper and the forces of chaos. When your mother's howler went off, telling us all that she believed you had stolen the invisibility cloak and the marauder's map, it further convinced me that you were, in fact, working towards the gatekeeper's ends. I decided to watch and to wait, hoping that I was wrong about you. And then, when your own sister went missing on the night of the play, I knew that it was the moment of truth. I could scarcely believe you'd harm her, but those in the thrall of deception have done even worse things than murder their sisters. I planned to take you away from the school, removing you from whatever plan the gatekeeper had for you. You foiled me, of course, by the simple expedient of being young and quick. Even then, I could have taken you had I truly wished to. In my deepest heart, however, I had decided to trust you and fate. It was my own trial of the cord, much like your test, James, in the cave of my cash. You chose to hold on to the golden cord, even though letting go would have been far easier. Thus, I chose to hold on to the one thin cord of trust in you as well. If I did so foolishly, then the world would not last long enough to blame me. As it turns out, however, that moment of trust was indeed wise. In fact, I believe it saved us all. James blew out a sigh. <sighs> wow! So that was why you were so secretive and scary that day in your office. The portrait told me it was a mistake, Merlin admitted, glancing aside. "'Dumbledore did not approve of my attitude towards you, and told me so upon your departure.' From the wall behind James, Dumbledore's voice spoke. "'I was nothing if not respectful, Merlinus. But yes, I did warn you that you doubted the boy at your own peril.' Merlin nodded. "'Yes, you made your point quite clear, as I recall.' "'I'm cursed with the burden of helping those who have succeeded me to not make the same mistakes I did,' Dumbledore said, looking at Merlin, then Harry. "'I myself only learned these lessons mere days before my death, too late to make much of a difference, although I did what little I could.' Harry nodded, unsmiling. "'So what is to be done with Petra Morganston, then?' Merlin shrugged, returning to his desk. She is guilty of possession of stolen property in the form of the invisibility cloak and kidnapping Lily Potter. As head aura, the owner of the cloak and the girl's father, Harry Potter, I might ask you the same thing. Harry thought seriously for a long moment. Finally, he looked at James. I won't be pressing any charges, he said. James, do you agree? James nodded. She didn't know what she was doing, Dad. And when I showed her how she was being deceived, she turned things around really quickly. She doesn't want to hurt anyone. Be very aware of what you're doing, my friends, Merlin said quietly. Miss Morganston is a very complicated young woman. But she isn't evil, James said emphatically. No more than you are, James, or your father, or I myself. And yet I, at least, have wrought great evil, all in the name of love. We are all capable of evil depending on the choices we make and the philosophies we embrace. The greater the potential for good in any of us, the greater the opposite potential for wickedness. Miss Morganston has, to say the very least, great, great potential. The only question is how she will choose to invest it. But she did the right thing, Harry said. In my experience, those who choose to do right usually get addicted to it. The soul of Voldemort has a toehold in her. Yes, she can't help that, but she has proven that it isn't enough to rule her. It is enough to divide her, Merlin answered, and she will never conquer that one small part of her that belongs to him. It will always be there, wheedling, poisoning, tempting, lying. Further, his power is her power. She has shown that she uses that power, granted for good so far, such as in healing Albus's leg, but how long will she be able to control it? Even now, she leaves these walls to return to a loveless and bitter life. She has denied herself the return of her own parents, so that Lily and you, James, might live. Meanwhile, she watches you go home to loving parents and a life she can only dream of. 
don't think that, despite her actions, she will not lie awake on cold, lonely nights, pining hopelessly for her dead parents, and wondering, wondering if, on that fateful night in the Chamber of Secrets, she made the wrong choice. James shook his head, not wanting to believe it. She'd never think that. Petra is good. She wants to be good, Merlin agreed. I will grant you that, James. Let us hope that that is enough. Harry approached James and put his hand on his son's shoulder. Scorpius has agreed to help us locate his grandfather, Lucius. He's actually a little more enthusiastic about it than I'm comfortable with, to tell you the truth. But his grandfather's lies and manipulations have turned the boy into quite a valuable ally for us. Still, he said, turning his attention to Merlin, what of Tabitha Corsica? She's returned the map. Apart from stunning Ralph, she hasn't technically done anything wrong whatsoever, despite her best efforts. I have no jurisdiction over her at all. Leave her to me, Merlin replied, sitting down at his desk again. She is not so far gone that she cannot be helped. I have known someone like her. You're kidding, James said, getting to his feet as his father prepared to leave. You think Petra's going to go all dark lord on us, but you think there's hope for Corsica just because you've known someone like her? Merlin looked up at James, his brow lowered. Perhaps I misspoke, he said, his voice rumbling. What I meant to say was, I have been someone like her. James stared at the headmaster, frowning in consternation, but Harry steered him away with his hand. "'Come on, son,' he said, smiling a little. "'The headmaster has a lot to do. "'I saw your performance on the Omnioculars, by the way. "'You're quite the little actor. "'Makes me wonder about the time you told me "'you had nothing to do with that broken clock in the parlour, eh?' "'James changed the subject as quickly as he could. "'So are you heading home right away?' "'No, actually,' Harry answered, closing Merlin's door. "'I'm going to check in on Albus down in the Slytherin quarters, "'and then I uh, owe someone a visit, apparently.' James began to tromp down the spiral staircase. Who's that? <sighs> Moaning Myrtle, his dad sighed, smiling. Rose insisted. She said she promised. Just come and get me if I'm in there for more than an hour, all right? Chapter 20 The Long Ride Home The last week of school went by as if blown by a hard wind. Zane stayed over, spending a night both with James and Ralph in their dormitories, sleeping on camp beds provided by the house elves and staying the rest of the time in his old house dormitory. The Ravenclaws were happy to see him, and Horace Birch proudly proclaimed him a lifelong Ravenclaw, despite the fact you're a ruddy yank and a coffee drinker, even though everybody knows all true Ravenclaws live on tea and butterbeer. To James's delight, a review of the Triumvirate appeared in the Daily Prophet, carefully glossing over the kidnapping of Lily as an unfortunate scare involving a temporarily lost child, since she had turned up later that evening, apparently unhurt and perfectly cheerful. The review had called the play a surprisingly inventive and entertaining bit of academic theatre, despite the somewhat controversial muggle production techniques implemented by the director, muggle studies professor Tina Grenadine Curry. This was blithely forgiven when the reporter had discovered that the muggle generators, which were purportedly operating the stage lights, were running rather mysteriously without a drop of petrol in them, therefore rendering the non-magical claims of the production completely boot. "'Here we go,' Rose said, pointing at the newspaper at breakfast on the last day of school. James Sirius Potter, portraying the part of the beloved Traeus, proved that neither youth nor inexperience can prevent a delightful performance in someone so well-trained and obviously inspired. Young Mr. Potter's surprising thespian talent leads this reporter to muse that, in his case, the apple certainly did not fall far from the tree, even if it did perhaps fall in an entirely different vocational orchard. That's the fifth time you've read that, James said, grinning and red-faced. Not that you mind, Zane said, nudging his friend. Ralph asked, what's it mean about James falling down in a different orchard? It means James is as talented as his father, Rose proclaimed, folding the paper, just in some quite different ways. No one could ever imagine Harry Potter performing in a play, could they? I suppose not, James agreed, still grinning sheepishly. "'but I think that's about enough acting for me.' "'Zane shook his head. 
You say that now, but you just wait. Pretty soon you'll start missing the spotlight. You know, my dad works in the muggle film industry. He could probably hook you up with a part in a movie. There's even talk of remaking the movies based on that magical book series. You'd be perfect for it. Not a chance, James insisted. But he was drowned out by the chorus of enthusiastic agreement. He decided not to fight it, and in the end, everyone agreed that, in fact, Albus would probably better fit the part, despite the fact that he couldn't act as well as James. "'I'd do it, though,' Albus said seriously. "'I could even do my own spells. Would they allow that, do you think?' Zane shook his head as everyone laughed. That night, James enlisted Zane's help in removing the lightning bolt scar from his voodoo doll. Carefully, Zane used his wand to magically scrub the marking from the tiny burlap forehead. Strangely, James could feel the progress of it. It tingled, and the tingle diminished as the scar vanished. Finally, Zane handed James the doll, nodding at a job well done. Clean as the wind-driven snow, he proclaimed. James examined it. Sure enough, there was no sign that the scar marking had ever been there. He wrapped the doll in a cloth and put it in the bottom of his trunk. He wasn't sure what he would do with it now that he knew it could be used rather dangerously, but he suspected he would simply give it back to his mum. Now that she knew to keep an eye on it, he felt confident that there was no one who would take better care of it. At dinner on the last day of school, Gryffindor was awarded the House Cup, primarily because of late points added to their score by Merlin for James and Petra's performance in the play. James was very happy about the award, and as the Gryffindor table exploded into applause congratulating James and Petra, he felt, perhaps for the first time, that he was living up to his father's legend as a Gryffindor. At the end of the Gryffindor table, floating uncertainly but with a nervous smile on his face, the ghost of Cedric Diggory waved at him. The grey lady wafted next to him, her pale face inscrutable but apparently content. For the evening's entertainment, the Hufflepuffs put on a very amusing puppet show rendition of The Triumvirate, making affectionate fun of everyone involved. James laughed until tears ran from his eyes. When he looked to share the joke with Petra, however, her seat was empty. He didn't see her at all for the rest of the night. Finally, the next morning, it was time for the trip home. Zane had his small bag packed whistling lightly as James lugged his trunk out to the steps. "'It'll be great to ride the train again,' Zane said, smiling happily. "'I miss that old cart lady. She wasn't there when I rode into Hogsmeade with your mum, you know that? Apparently she only works the official Hogwarts Express runs. Better profit margin, I guess.' "'Humph,' James said, plopping onto his trunk. "'I didn't know that.' I bet she'll be there more often, though, once they open up the new route. I saw the place where they're expanding the track through the mountains. It'll connect with some new wizarding village over on the other side of some gorge. I can't remember the name of the gorge or the village, but your mom said once they finish the track, it'll save travelers loads of commute time and flu powder. I bet the cart lady will have a lot more customers then. "'I'm sure she'd be glad you were so concerned for her welfare,' James said, rolling his eyes. "'I can't help it,' Zane agreed. "'I'm just a caring kind of guy. "'Oh, yeah, that reminds me. "'I think I figured out the secret of Tabitha's crazy broom.' "'James perked up. "'Yeah? What was it?' "'Zane reached into his jeans pocket and pulled out a small envelope. "'Albus let me take a look at the bit of the broom he'd been using as a splint. "'I broke it open, and Jennifer and Horace helped me do some tests on it. "'Look!' he handed the envelope to James. "'James thumbed it open and peered inside. "'It contained a tiny shred of black fabric. "'I wouldn't touch it,' Zane said. "'I did accidentally, and it still feels pretty oogie.' "'Oogie?' James said, handing the envelope back to Zane. "'Sorry.' Technical term I picked up from Raphael back home. Hinky, creepified, completely off the spookometer. I get the picture, James sighed. But what is it? Zane plopped down next to James on his trunk. Remember last year when you explained cork brooms to me? James nodded. Sure, when a Quidditch player threads something magical into their broomstick, basically turning it into a big giant wand. "'Yeah, well, we weren't so far off about Corsica's,' Zane replied. "'We thought it was corked because it was Merlin's staff, but obviously that was a red herring. 
It was corked because it contained a big, long strip off the robe of a Dementor. A Dementor, James exclaimed, turning to look at Zane. How's that even possible? Zane shrugged easily. Beats me, but there's no question about it. Maybe Korska's people are friendly enough with those things that they were able to get a hand-me-down. After all, you said the Dementors were loyal to Voldy and his pals. They weren't so much loyal to him as they were evil like him. But still, you could be right. It checks out, Zane nodded. If what Merlin told you is true, Dementors are the same stock as the Borleys. They come from outside of time and can manipulate it a little. That's pretty much what Tabitha's broom seemed to do, wasn't it? It knew just enough of the future to know where it needed to be. Fortunately for you and Albus, it took on the purpose of its owner. Wow, James breathed, looking at the envelope in Zane's hand. I know that thing saved Albus's and my life, but still, I have to say I'm glad it got destroyed. Corked with a Dementor's robe. That's super creepy. Oogie, even, Zane agreed, pocketing the envelope. Albus said I could keep this. I'm going to give it to Chancellor Franklin when I get home so he can study it. I bet I get brownie points from here to doomsday for it. James shook his head, smiling at his friend's irrepressible temerity. Shortly thereafter, Ralph, Rose, and Albus dragged their trunks out to the step as well, awaiting Hagrid's carriage to the station. James smiled in the sunlight. It was going to be a fun trip home. You still haven't really told us what happened on the other side of the chasm, Ralph said, as the train picked up speed, leaving Hogsmeade Station. I mean, what was the real deal with Petra anyway? Was she under the Imperius curse or something? James shook his head. No, no, nothing like that. She was being deceived. She had no idea that she was the bloodline of Voldemort. Lucius Malfoy arranged for the invisibility cloak, my voodoo doll, and the portrait of Voldemort to be planted into the box of her father's things before it ever left Azkaban. She was blinded to the portrait and doll, tricked by the little part of Voldemort in her blood. Later, when she heard the voice of the portrait in the cave, she thought it was the voice of her dead father. It sounds mad, but I think she was feeling a little mad anyway after finding out all that stuff about her mum and dad. So none of the things we saw in the pensive were about Tabitha after all, right? Ralph said. All those memories were about Petra. Scorpius let us believe Tabitha was the bloodline, because that's what his grandfather told him to do, just to keep us distracted from the real thing. Is that it? I don't care what you all say, Albus said determinedly. That little squid is ten kinds of trouble. He'd just better stay out of my way. Rose closed the book on her lap and looked up. I admit he started out pretty awful, what with stealing the cloak, map and doll, and then lying to us about the bloodline. But all of that was on his grandfather's orders. You can't really blame him for wanting to live up to the legacy of his family. He didn't know any better. Besides, even by the time he was showing us the memories in the pensive, he was beginning to have doubts about his grandfather's plan. That's why he didn't actually say Tabitha's name. He was halfway hoping we'd figure out it was Petra after all. And he did do the right thing in the end, James added. He never knew that hurting Lily was part of the plan. When Lily was kidnapped, he totally gave up his grandfather and Tabitha. We'd never have learned the truth about Petra if Scorpius hadn't been there with us in the bathroom. I think both of you have crushes on him, Albus said dourly. I'm not falling for that I'm just a poor misguided bad boy bit. Some day he and I are going to finish what we started on the train ride here. I'd be careful, Albus, Zane commented, raising his eyebrows. I saw Scorpius at the last defense club meeting, and he's gotten pretty slick with that artist deserto stuff. He was waxing on and waxing off like a boy ninja. Albus rolled his eyes. Whatever. Ralph stood up and peered out the compartment door. Hey, that reminds me. Which direction are Louis and Victoire in? He asked, peering up and down the train corridor. Louis has a book in Middle Eastern defensive magic he said I could borrow over the summer. Victoire stayed behind, Rose answered. She's staying with George and Ted in Hogsmeade until George and Angelina's wedding, and I usually try my best not to know where Louis is. Ralph stretched and said, I'm going to go and walk a bit and try and find him. Who's coming? I'm in, James answered, standing. I'm going to fall asleep if I stay here. We shouldn't have stayed up so late playing Winkles and Augers last night. I'm going to ask the cart lady about her working hours, Zane interjected, opening the compartment door. Louis has a book on magical martial arts, Rose asked Ralph as the five of them filed out into the corridor. 
He's really got into it, Ralph nodded. Posters all over his dormitory of the Harriers and famous wizard martial artists and stuff. He even asked his mum to order him one of those hoods with the eye slits in it so he can look all mysterious. Our Louis, Albus exclaimed, stifling a grin. I should have known there was a repressed fighter buried under all that stuffed shirt. Debello says he's got some natural talent, Ralph said, shrugging. Of course, he said the same thing about you, James. And I got top marks on my Wizlit essay, Rose said pointedly, steering the conversation away from Professor de Bellows, for whom she still had little respect. Professor Ravalvier said my insight on the golden age of wizarding literature was... James suddenly stopped in the corridor, forcing everyone to pile up behind him. Ow! Ralph, get off my toe, you bloody dump truck! Albus cried. What gives? Do you see it? James whispered urgently, pointing. Everyone stopped and craned their heads, looking in the direction James was pointing. What are we looking for? Zane asked after a moment. Rose said, I don't see anything there, Albus interrupted, pointing over Zane's shoulder. Something moved inside the network of flickering shadows near the end of the corridor. It's like a living shadow, Ralph said. It's the last Borley, Albus declared, pushing past James. And he's mine! No magic, James commanded. Remember? That's how it grew last time. The Borley capered in moving shadows as the train pushed through the forest. It teased and cartwheeled, as if begging to be hexed. Suddenly, the door at the end of the corridor slid open, letting in the noise of the rushing wind and clacking wheels. All five students cried out in warning, stumbling over each other. But the Borley took advantage of the opening and leapt through the door just as it was sliding shut again. "'How very curious,' the newcomer said in a deep voice. James looked up and rolled his eyes. It was Merlin, wearing his travelling cloak, his staff at his side. Merlin, uh, headmaster, Rose exclaimed, pushing forward. It just went that way. The Borley, James added hastily. The last one. It must have been on the train this whole time. Merlin's face darkened slightly. We mustn't take any chances this time, my friends. I will follow it and corral it. Mr. Potter, you know what the dark bag looks like, do you not? It is in my compartment, two cars behind you, number six. It will allow you inside. The trunk beneath the seat will open with this key. Meet us as soon as you can. The big man produced a golden key on a long loop of chain and held it out to James. James took it, feeling rather important. Quickly, Mr. Potter, Merlin prodded. We haven't a moment to spare. James turned on his heel and ran back the way they'd come, fighting the disorienting sensation of running full out in a moving, swaying train. He passed through two connectors and came to the compartment marked number six. The windows were smoked, but the door was unlocked. James entered quickly and saw the headmaster's trunk peeking out from beneath the left side bench. He dropped to his knees and heaved it into the light. The small golden key fit snugly in the lock and turned with a minute click. When James threw the trunk open, he was surprised to see that the dark bag was the only thing inside it, folded neatly on the wooden floor of the trunk. Of course, he realized, this was one of those magical trunks which opened onto different contents depending on what key you unlocked it with. Considering the great importance and potential danger of the dark bag, which imprisoned the rest of the starving Borleys inside its seamless dark, James felt particularly honoured to have been asked to retrieve it. He touched it a little fearfully, remembering Merlin's warnings about it, but it felt perfectly normal. It was simply a large, heavy, black cloth bag, cinched shut with a golden cord and bearing a long shoulder strap on the top. Having assured himself that the dark bag was relatively safe to hold, James slung it around his neck and over his shoulder, wearing it like a backpack. He slammed the trunk, hung the key around his neck on its fine chain, and ran back towards the front of the train. He was rather out of breath by the time he found everyone again. They were gathered at the head of the first carriage, staring hard at the door. Merlin looked up as James entered. His face was grim, but James thought he could sense some enjoyment in the big man's expression. The headmaster was pleasuring in the hunt. We chased it here, Zane said, grinning. It slipped right through the crack in the door, but the next car is the coal car. End of the line. Miss Weasley, Merlin said, turning to her. You will open the door on my mark. Mr. Deedle, your wand has rather unique properties, as you know. 
"'If the Borley manages to get past me, then you and only you may attempt to stun it. "'Your spell will not halt it, but will distract and attract it, giving me the time I need. "'I will place the Borley in a trance. "'Then, Mr. Porter, I will require the dark bag.' "'Ralph gulped audibly, producing his huge wand. "'Got it!' Rose said, a little breathlessly. "'James nodded, understanding. "'Albus stood back. "'Last time it was standing on that metal bit that holds the carriages together,' he explained. "'So aim low.' "'Thank you,' Merlin nodded, smiling slightly. "'Rose gripped the door handle, and everyone took a deep breath. "'Merlin nodded at her, and she pulled, jerking the door all the way open "'and letting in a push of warm, noisy air. "'James squinted in the barreling wind and smoke, and then gasped, his stomach plummeting. "'Merlin slowly took a step back, spreading his arms to keep everyone behind him. "'I may not know what I'm talking about here,' Zane said weakly, his eyes bulging. "'But I'm pretty sure those aren't Borleys.' In fact, the Borley was exactly where they'd expected it to be. It danced on the huge iron knuckle that connected the train to the coal carriage, teasing them. Over it, however, darkening the air all around the coal carriage, swarming like a malignant living cloud, were dozens, perhaps hundreds, of Dementors. It's the entire hive, James called over the sound of the clacking wheels and rushing wind. All the way from London! Why are they here? Merlin didn't take his eyes from the horrible swarm. I think, he said slowly, the answer to that question is all too clear. Rose looked from Merlin to the open, howling doorway. The gatekeeper is up there, she said, nodding towards the engine, which was just visible over the length of the coal carriage and the swarming Dementors. Suddenly the train's whistle blew, shrieking a long, deafening note. Rose clapped her hands to her ears and winced. Simultaneously, the engine seemed to lurch forwards, picking up speed. James tumbled as the train rounded a turn, rushing through it at dangerously high speed. Look! Zane called, gripping the open doorway and pointing. James peered aside, looking through the gap between the carriages. Trees whipped past in a blur, and then something else flickered past. "'wooden signs and piles of gravel and railroad ties. "'It's the new extension!' Zane yelled, his face very pale. "'The new what?' Rose cried, shaking her head. "'Didn't you read the sign?' he called, exasperated. "'It's the new track extension over the Sparrowhawk Gorge. "'We're off the main track. We've been switched onto the new extension!' "'Don't tell me!' Ralph yelled, slumping. "'The extension's not finished yet, is it?' Now, the bridge over the gorge is hardly half done yet. It's not supposed to be completed until next year. Albus nodded seriously. This is bad. Very bad. Merlin stepped forward, his face determined and his staff held before him. The wind whipped his robes and streamed through his hair and beard. Instantly, the cloud of Dementors condensed, collapsing onto the doorway and blocking it. The students stumbled backwards, terrified and falling over each other. The Dementors hissed and roared, and James felt his blood chill at the sound of it. He had never known Dementors could speak. The boy! They hissed in unison, and their voices were horrid, buzzing like hornet wings. James Sirius Porter! The boy must come! Merlin had not stepped back in the face of the angry swarm. Now, however, he turned slightly, looking back at James over his shoulder. His face was cold, his eyes like diamond chips. "'It would appear you were being summoned,' he said, his voice carrying easily over the noise and wind. "'No!' James cried. "'I don't want anything to do with that thing!' "'The gatekeeper believes differently,' Merlin replied. "'and it is going to kill everyone on this train if you do not meet its summons.' "'James shook his head adamantly. "'I can't face that thing alone!' he exclaimed, terrified. "'You will not be alone,' Merlin answered, smiling humorlessly. "'I will be accompanying you.' "'James looked into the sorcerer's face. "'What he saw there was complete confidence and determination. "'The Dementors may try to stop Merlin, but they would not succeed.' James nodded slowly and stood up. 
As he stepped tentatively towards the open doorway, the cloud of Dementors backed away, allowing him room. They swarmed feverishly, and the sight of them made James shiver. Don't! Rose called, grabbing James's sleeve. There's got to be another way. You don't have to do it, James. James shook his head. I think I do, Rose. It'll be all right. No! she cried. You're daft. You can't defeat something like that. James shrugged. I have to try, at least. Zane put his hand on Rose's shoulder, and Albus reached for her hand. Don't do anything stupid, big brother, Albus called. Here, Ralph suddenly yelled, pushing forward. He held his wand out to James, handle first. James shook his head. No, Ralph, that's yours. I couldn't. Shut up, James, Ralph said, and James was shocked to see the ferocity in the boy's eyes. Merlin's right. My wand has unique powers. You might need the boost. You're not going to keep it anyway. I'm lending it to you. Understand? James nodded solemnly and accepted Ralph's huge wand. I'll give it back to you when I return, he agreed. No! The Dementors hissed in their awful monotone. James Sirius Potter! Keep your cowls on, James muttered nervously, pushing into the wind and blasting cinders. The rear of the coal carriage bore an iron ladder. James began to climb it, fighting both the howling air and streaming smoke from the engine. Beneath him, the track blurred past, and the clack of the wheels was loud enough to hurt his ears. Before Merlin could move to follow him, however, James decided to try the bravest thing he could think of. He took out Ralph's wand and pointed it at the great iron knuckle that connected the coal carriage to the rest of the train. Convulsis! he called, attempting the destroying spell he had last seen Rowena Ravenclaw use on the painting in Salazar Slytherin's quarters. The spell struck the knuckle and exploded brightly. When the sparks cleared, however, James could see that it had had no effect on the knuckle. A worthy attempt, Merlin called, glancing up at James. But the gatekeeper has foreseen such measures. James nodded, disheartened, and continued to climb the ladder. The Dementors swirled around him, but kept their distance. James scrambled over the lip of the coal carriage and dropped onto the irregular pile of coal inside. Behind him, he heard Merlin's voice call out firmly, Crea Patronim! There was a burst of silvery light, and the swarm of Dementors broke apart, repelled by the force of the glare. James glanced back and saw Merlin clambering onto the pile of coal behind him, his staff glowing greenly in his hand. In front of Merlin, standing between him and James, was a large, ghostly jackal. The silvery light pulsed from it, and it bore its shining teeth in a silent snarl, forcing the Dementors back. James felt a little better, seeing Merlin's ferocious Patronus, and he wasn't surprised at the form it had taken. He turned his back and slowly began to force his way along the length of the coal carriage, struggling over the rough chunks of black coal. Trees whipped past, and James could tell that this length of track was unfamiliar. He had no idea how long they had until the train met the unfinished bridge. Panic tried to grip him, but James fought it back, concentrating on the task at hand. Finally, he met the other end of the coal carriage and clambered through an open iron door. A shovel rattled on the small platform behind the engine, but there was no one in sight. Merlin climbed through the iron door behind James, but his Patronus jumped over the front of the coal carriage, landing on the platform with its hackles raised. The noise of the engine made it almost too loud to speak. Merlin nodded towards the closed door in the rear of the engine. It was painted bright red, just like the rest of the engine. Across it, in gold letters, were the words, Hogwarts Express, Engineers Only. James reached for the door handle and heaved it open. It was pitch dark inside the engine compartment. James took a deep breath, steeled himself on the swaying, speeding platform, and stepped into the waiting darkness. The noise and wind vanished instantly. There was no sense of speed or motion at all, nor did the space inside the engine feel hot or confined as James had expected. It felt huge, silent, and eerily cool. James. A voice said comfortably, How good of you to come. James glanced around, but he couldn't see anyone. 
There was no sign of Merlin or anything else for that matter. The space seemed completely dark and featureless, but for a pool of dim light that James stood in. Where am I? he asked, gathering his wits. Where's Merlin? He's near, the voice answered cryptically. Interesting fellow, Merlinus, don't you think? He was the first human I ever met, you know. His fear tastes particularly piquant. The voice sighed in a self-satisfied manner. As far as where you are, that's a rather more difficult question to answer. I didn't want you to be overly concerned about your friends, so I took us away, outside of time, outside of, well, everything, really. Where are you? James demanded, glancing around. Oh, I keep forgetting, the voice said, laughing lightly. You humans don't much like the whole godlike voice out of nowhere sensation, do you? I'm right here. On the word here, the voice localized. James turned towards the sound and saw a figure standing before him. It was exactly the same figure he had seen in Merlin's magic mirror, right down to the tattered robe with no feet and the dark, featureless hood. James scrambled back from it, gasping. "'I apologise again,' the figure said, reaching up. "'Perhaps this is a bit better.' The figure of the gatekeeper touched its hood and then swept it back. James was afraid to look, but couldn't help himself. He winced at the revealed shape and then frowned a little. "'You're the gatekeeper?' he asked, stepping forward again. "'You look a little like... like my dad, but not exactly.' "'This isn't how I truly look, of course,' the figure said offhandedly. "'I'm still learning about humans, I admit. "'But I've come to understand the sort of ships you find acceptable.' "'The gatekeeper smiled disarmingly. "'You expected something awful, I presume. "'A thousand eyes and a long forked tail, that sort of thing?' "'James nodded and then shook his head. "'I don't know what I expected. "'It doesn't matter, really. "'What do you want?' "'Right down to business,' the gatekeeper said, nodding curtly, still smiling. "'That's what I respect about you, James Sirius Potter. No sentimentals. I'll tell you what I want. I want to help you.' James shook his head. "'I'm not buying that. You're a liar. You want me to be your host so you can stay here on the earth and destroy everything. I've learned all about you. You just want to use me.' "'Alas!' the gatekeeper said, frowning a little. Put like that, it sounds rather awful, doesn't it? On the surface of it, I mean. Well, James said, a little uncertainly. Yeah, it does. The gatekeeper nodded, pressing its lips together. I guess that settles it, then. You say no to me, I get no human host. Shortly, I lose my footing on this earthly plane and be forced back to the void. You win. The figure shrugged, as if mildly disappointed. Yeah, James agreed tentatively. I guess that's pretty much it. In that case, do you mind if we just chat for a moment, James? There's no harm in that, is there? Uh, I guess not. You fancy Miss Morganston, don't you? The gatekeeper said, arching an eyebrow at James and winking. I don't blame you. Really, I don't. Delightful girl. She and I were supposed to be very close. I have to admit, though, that I had my doubts about her. Your dead Voldemort has his rather devoted followers. They insisted she was the one for me, but I suspected differently. And of course I was right. I'm always right, James. That's not pride talking, mind you. Uncertainty is the hallmark of time-bound creatures. I see history as an open book from start to finish. I know how things are going to happen, because, metaphorically speaking, I've already skipped to the last page. The gatekeeper sighed indulgently. Let me ask you something, James. Do you know who I really am? It asked, tilting its head. You're the gatekeeper, James answered carefully. You're evil. Yes, yes, the figure said, waving a hand impatiently. But besides all of that... I have loads of names other than that one, you know. There is one that I'm particularly fond of. I think it'll amuse you. James shook his head, feeling increasingly cautious. I don't know what you mean. Then let me illuminate you, James, the gatekeeper said, suddenly approaching James and dropping to one knee. 
It looked closely at him, its eyes sparkling mischievously. James, my boy, do you remember the story? The one your friend Ralph regaled you with in wizard literature class. You do, don't you? James nodded, perplexed. Sure, but I don't see. You don't see because you don't look, the gatekeeper interrupted. It lowered its voice and said in a conspiratorial whisper, Oi, James, and the king of the cats. James backed away as fear tingled up his back. Think about it, the gatekeeper insisted, standing again and following him. I sit at the base of the steps, Lord Guardian of the doorway between the living and the dead. I determine who passes through the void, who proceeds into the everlasting. And, I might add, I am also the Lord of who comes back. The gatekeeper deftly snapped its fingers. Another pool of light appeared, and James couldn't help glancing at it. A figure was climbing to its feet in the pool of light, looking around in surprise and wonder. James gasped, and his heart leapt. Grandfather, he said, taking a step forward. James, Arthur Weasley said, laughing a little. What are you doing at the ministry? And what in the world was I doing on the floor? I must have tripped. Clumsy me! Grandfather, James exclaimed, moving to run to him, but the gatekeeper placed a hand on James's shoulder, stopping him. You cannot touch him, James, the gatekeeper said sorrowfully. Not yet. Perhaps in time. But how? James cried. Arthur Weasley tilted his head and smiled crookedly at James. Is this part of your grandmother's secret design? he asked. It is, isn't it? I know she's been planning some sort of surprise party. She's never been able to fool me, although I let her believe she can, the dear. Where's everyone else? He cannot see me, the gatekeeper said, looking back at Arthur. Those that pass through never do. Uh, are you real? James stammered, giddy excitement welling inside him. Is it really you, grandfather? What kind of a question is that, James? Arthur said, looking around. Where are we, anyway? This isn't the Ministry, after all. I have to admit, I'm rather dumbfounded. Did I get off at the wrong gate on the flu network? No, Grandfather, James cried. You're... you had a... Shh, the gatekeeper said. Don't tell him. Why are you doing this? James suddenly demanded, looking up at the robed entity before him. That can't really be my grandfather. He's dead. Death is just a doorway, the gatekeeper replied, shrugging. You never knew that it was a two-way door. You love your grandfather, do you not? What would you know about that? James demanded, fighting tears of frustration and anger. I admit the concept is foreign to me, the entity answered. But I have learned enough of humans to know it is of great power to you. You'd have your grandfather back if you could, wouldn't you? James bit his lip, his emotions raging. In the second pool of light, Arthur was patting his pockets distractedly, as if looking for something. Wrong address, he muttered, laughing a little nervously. Where'd I put that packet of emergency flu powder? Molly always insists I carry it. She'll crow for days about the fact that I finally needed it. Yes, James blurted, tears welling in his eyes. I love my grandfather, but he's gone. You can't trick me. I won't do what you ask, even if it means getting him back. Selfless, the gatekeeper said seriously, nodding. A very respectable trait. I admire it. I really do. It raised its hand and snapped its fingers again. A third pool of light appeared. James turned to look, blinking through a blur of tears. A figure seemed to stumble backwards into the light. He was tall and thin, wearing dark robes. His long black hair was ratty and matted with sweat. He caught his balance and spun on the spot, his wand out. Wild eyes spotted James, and the man stopped, breathing heavily, obviously confused. Harry? he called, frowning in consternation. You're not Harry, are you? James couldn't believe his eyes. Sirius? he gasped. You're Sirius Black! Ten points for you, Sirius replied. Where am I? Where's Remus and Harry and the rest? Where's bloody Bellatrix for that matter? I'm not through with that witch. Sirius, 
James called, hitching a sob, completely at a loss. It's over! You were... The dead don't wish to know such things, the gatekeeper interrupted, shushing James. But surely you can see who this is. Sirius Black. More importantly, your father's long-lost godfather. James nodded, barely hearing. The gatekeeper went on. Deny yourself all you wish, James. Return your grandfather to the realm of the dead. But will you be able to live with yourself, knowing that you turned down the opportunity to give your father the one man whose love he has ached for every day of his life? Will you ever be able to look your father in the eye again, knowing you have denied him his greatest wish, to have his godfather return to him? James's mind was reeling. But they're not real! What does that even mean, James? the gatekeeper demanded. Look at them. They know not their own fates. For them, no time has passed whatsoever. They believe they are real. Who are you to tell them otherwise? I don't know, James cried, clutching his head. It is so simple, James, the gatekeeper soothed, advancing on him. I am the king of the cats. You may join me and see all those you've lost return to you. Your grandfather, your father's godfather, even your long-dead grandparents. There is no drawback, James. Only one small price. A price you won't even mind paying, I assure you. A price you'll be glad to pay. What is it? James asked helplessly, looking back and forth between Sirius Black and Arthur Weasley. A small thing, a trifle, the gatekeeper said, reaching out to James and placing its hands on his shoulders. A service to the world, really. I'm not going to kill anyone, James said, shaking his head, tears streaming down his face. Look, the gatekeeper whispered gently, turning James around. Look before you answer. Behind James was another pool of light. One last figure stood inside it, seeming rather surprised to be there. Long white hair hung on either side of a haggard face, and the eyes were filled with hate. James could instantly see the family resemblance. It was Lucius Malfoy. What is the meaning of this? Lucius breathed. He reached for his wand but couldn't seem to find it in his robes. "'Where is my wand?' he said, looking past James to the gatekeeper. "'I demand to know where you have taken me, you foul creature!' "'This is the man,' the gatekeeper whispered over James's shoulder. "'On his hands is the blood of dozens. "'It was his plan that both you and your sister die in the Chamber of Secrets.' He is responsible for the death of Petra Morganston's parents, and it is by his will that she has been cursed with the demented soul of Lord Voldemort. Even now, this merciless wretch plots murder and death. His heart is a black box of hate. Kill him, James. Rid the world of this madman. Surely he deserves it. Kill him. Do it now. As it spoke, the gatekeeper backed away, as if giving James room. James had meant to refuse. It was on his tongue to say no, but suddenly he couldn't bring himself to do it. The gatekeeper was right. Lucius Malfoy did deserve to die. He was irredeemable. James felt the wand in his hand even before he realized he was reaching for it. It was Ralph's. It felt hot and huge in his palm. It felt deadly. What is this? Lucius purred, narrowing his eyes. You send a boy to finish me? I know this one. He is as weak as his father is stupid. He will not do it. He hasn't the strength. He taunts you, the gatekeeper said silkily, eagerly, its voice coming again from the air all around. Show him how wrong he is. Kill him. James's hand trembled as he levelled Ralph's wand. It seemed to hum in his fist. It wanted to kill Lucius as much as he did. And then, when the deed was done, and Lucius lay dead at James's feet, he'd have his grandfather back. And Sirius Black could be Dad's godfather again, just as he always should have been. James glanced back and saw both Sirius and Arthur watching him. They were both frowning slightly, as if they couldn't quite see what was happening. "'James?' Arthur said, his voice worried. "'Be careful, son!' "'James?' Sirius said to himself, glancing at Arthur. He looked back at James, realization dawning on his face. 
We're dead, he said simply. And somehow, some way, you're Harry's son, aren't you? Who is that beyond you? Lucius Malfoy! Beware, James Potter! James turned back, looking up into the smug face of his nemesis. Do it! the gatekeeper hissed. Keep him now! Lucius growled. You cannot! You are weak! I'm not! James sobbed. He tightened his grip on the wand and pointed it directly at the taller man's heart. And then, with blissful suddenness, assurance washed over him. He wasn't weak. He could do exactly what he had to do. In his mind, he heard both Helga Hufflepuff and Merlin's voices. The right thing to do is always simple, but it is never easy. I am a warrior, James whispered to himself, gritting his teeth. And the sign of a true warrior is knowing when not to fight. With that, James lowered the wand. He dropped it and then turned his back on Lucius Malfoy. Slowly, he began to walk away. James, Sidious Potter, the gatekeeper shouted. You cannot turn aside. Kill him. You owe it to the world. You owe it to yourself and your father. You cannot deny the power I'm offering you. James looked at his grandfather sadly, his heart breaking. Arthur smiled proudly and nodded at him. Strong that boy is, Sirius said, his eyes black and sparkling, just like his father before him. Slowly, the pools of light faded. Arthur and Sirius descended into darkness. James kept walking. He was nearly at the edge of his own circle of light when he heard Lucius Malfoy's voice behind him. If you will not kill to become the host of the gatekeeper, he said, his voice oozing hatred, then I will! James knew that Lucius had picked up Ralph's wand. He felt it pointing at him. He stopped in his tracks, not turning around. Avada Kedavra! Lucius hissed, spittle flying from his lips with the force of his rage. The bolt of green light sizzled through the air and struck James squarely in the back. James felt the force of it, and it pushed him forward slightly. Still, he did not turn. He stood precisely on the edge of light and shadow. Lucius stared at the boy, his eyes narrowed and a grimace of hatred carved on his face. The boy should fall now. He was dead. Lucius waited, still holding the rough, green-tipped wand, still pointing it at the boy's back. There was a faint ripping sound, a long, ragged tear suddenly separated along the fabric of the dark bag on James's back, spreading from the point where the killing curse had struck it. James felt movement in the dark bag. Something was awakening inside it. Many somethings, in fact. And they were hungry. What kind of trick is this? Lucius drawled nervously, taking a step backwards. He eyed the rip in the dark bag as a noise began to emanate from it. James steeled himself, curling his hands into fists. The noise increased, becoming a loud, busy thrum, and then, violently, the dark bag erupted. Borleys poured from the hole where Lucius's killing curse had ruptured it. They tasted the raw magic of the curse, and they wanted more. They streamed through the air towards Lucius like a cloud of bats. Lucius's eyes bulged at the sight of the advancing Borleys. Instinctively, he waved the wand at them, firing spells randomly. Jets of light bled from the wand, and the Borleys went into a feeding frenzy, ravenous and strengthened by the magic. They fell on Lucius in a cloud. James finally turned, letting the shredded dark bag slip from his shoulders. When he looked back, Lucius was completely engulfed in the Borleys. They swarmed over him, devouring him alive. He screamed as they feasted on him, sucking the magic from him, vampire-like. He seemed to be shrinking. He collapsed to his knees, unseen through the boiling, shadowy mass. It was horrible, and yet James couldn't bring himself to look away. Finally, Lucius's body seemed to completely come apart. He dissolved into a sort of crumbling ash and crumpled to the floor, his last scream rasping, echoing into nothing. Satisfied, the Borleys exploded away, screeching and vanishing wildly into the darkness. Within seconds, they were gone, lost in the void. James stepped forward. 
What was left of Lucius Malfoy poured out of his sleeves and the neck of his robe like ashen powder. James knelt and very carefully plucked two things from the crumbling dust of Lucius's hand. As he stood, he pocketed one of them, Ralph's wand. The other he held in his hand, feeling the small, dark power of it. Put that down, the gatekeeper ordered, and its voice had changed, becoming deeper, less human. You know not what you have done. James shook his head. I know exactly what I've done, he said. You cannot defy me, the gatekeeper roared, and it revealed itself once more. It no longer looked human, however, but like an enormous cloud of swirling smoke and ash. Eyes swarmed through the cloud, all of them furious, glowing red. No one can defy the gatekeeper. Release the stone. You cannot contain its power. That's true, James said, no longer afraid of the gatekeeper. But I know someone who can. He turned, somehow knowing that Merlin would be standing nearby. Perhaps James had even somehow caused him to be there. He walked over to the big wizard and held out his hand. In it, the ring sparkled brightly. Darts of light flashed off the black facets of the beacon stone. Merlin smiled a slow, humorless smile. Gently, he took the ring and placed it on his finger, seating it alongside its twin. And now... Merlin said, raising his hand. As your earthly ambassador and bearer of the complete beacon stone, I command you. This is not your world, nor shall you occupy it. Be gone, beast of the abyss, gatekeeper of the void. I banish you to the nothingness that shall forever be your home. Depart this moment and never return. The cloud of ash and smoke roared. It made to fall upon Merlin, attempting to consume him, but a sudden, enormous crack of vivid light appeared in the darkness, slashing it open. The roar of the gatekeeper turned into a shriek as it was pulled upwards towards the crack. It fought against the force, spinning and writhing, and for a moment James thought it looked like a huge, inverted cyclone. And then, with a blinding flash and a clap of thunder, it was gone, banished back to the void from which it had come. James blinked in the silence. He took a deep breath and turned back to Merlin, exhausted. Is it gone? he asked. Gone for good? Merlin nodded slowly. The door between the worlds is shut. It was over. James turned to look back curious to see if there was any remaining sign of that blinding crack into which the gatekeeper had vanished. There was nothing but blackness and silence. And then there was a flash, and James stumbled. Light and noise exploded around him. He squinted, gasping for breath in the sudden noise and rush of air. He was back on the rear of the Hogwarts Express engine again, as if he'd never left it. Trees blurred past, just as before— but when James looked out over the coal carriage behind him, the air was bright and clear. The Dementors are gone, he called to Merlin. Sent back to the void along with their master, Merlin agreed, nodding. James grinned in relief and then suddenly remembered the train's perilous destination. We have to stop the train, he yelled, his eyes widening. It's going to go off the unfinished bridge. Everyone on board will be killed. Merlin nodded again, his face turning grim. Once again, James opened the door of the engine compartment. Instead of darkness, however, this time he found a cramped interior space, stiflingly hot. At the front of the compartment was a bank of incomprehensible dials and gauges. Above this, two broad windows looked out over the oncoming track. Which one is the break? James called, scanning the dials and levers helplessly. That large lever on the floor, Merlin replied, pushing up his sleeves. Grip the handle and pull as hard as you can, James. No matter what happens, don't let go. James wrapped his hands around the large lever, which was nearly as tall as he was. He coiled to pull it, but then made the mistake of looking out the front windows. The trees had cleared ahead, revealing a broad, mountainous panorama. The tracks stretched out before them, spanning a dizzyingly deep rocky gorge, but only partially. Less than halfway across, the bridge stopped, unfinished. James's knees went weak. 
Pull it, James! Merlin ordered, raising his arms, his face hard as granite. Don't let go under any circumstance! James gasped a breath and yanked the lever as hard as he could with both hands. Gears below the engine's floor screeched and clanked as the braking mechanism engaged. Steam released explosively from the boilers on either side of the engine, sending up great white clouds. The train lurched and began to slow, but James knew there was no way it would stop in time. Next to him, Merlin held up his arms. He was muttering quickly under his breath, his eyes closed. James looked up at him from where he stood, tugging the brake lever. The great sorcerer was trembling very slightly, nearly vibrating. Sunlight suddenly poured in through the engine's windows, and James knew they had cleared the trees at the cliff's edge. The train had begun its journey over the gorge, swiftly approaching the end of the bridge. Behind James and Merlin, nearly all of the students of Hogwarts and their teachers were hurtling along, breathless, probably even clueless of their fate. The train continued to slow, its wheels grinding, screeching, sending up sparks, but it was no use. James craned to look through the windows and saw the end of the track approaching alarmingly fast. A wooden X had been erected across it to keep workers from accidentally walking off the end. It looked pathetically fragile as the huge crimson engine bore down on it. Then, fleetingly, James saw motion at the end of the track. Something green was moving just beyond, so fast that he could barely see it. Even as James watched, however, the end of the track disappeared beneath the sightline of the engine's windows. He gritted his teeth, pulling the brake lever with all his might, and waited for the long, sickening drop. The engine lurched noisily, as if it had bumped over a curb, and James nearly lost his grip on the brake lever. Next to him, Merlin swayed but remained upright, hands still raised, still muttering under his breath. Amazingly, the train did not fall. It continued to move forwards, pushed by the weight of the cars behind it, slowly, almost imperceptibly. Like Merlin, the engine suddenly seemed to be vibrating. As it gradually lost its momentum, the vibration increased, becoming a noisy, jarring shudder that threatened to shake the engine apart at its bolts. One of the windows exploded in a starburst of glass, peppering the inside of the compartment with glittering shards. James winced as bits of glass and warm autumn air blew past him. A moment later, he craned to look through the broken window, his eyes wide and disbelieving as the gorge spread beneath the advancing train. The engine slowed, rattling and grinding, until finally, after what seemed an eternity, it lurched to a halt. The sudden cessation of inertia threw James off balance, and he stumbled to one knee, still gripping the brake lever. Silence descended on the engine, shocking after the noise and chaos. It rang in James's ears. Shuddering, he took a deep breath and struggled to stand, shaking bits of glass from his hair. That was, he began, and then jumped up, throwing his shoulder under Merlin's arm as the big wizard began to collapse. Oh, you're uh, heavy! What's wrong? Merlin struggled to hold himself up. He groaned and clapped a hand to his head as if to keep it on his shoulders. Slowly he managed to support himself and leaned against the wall of the engine compartment. James glanced up at him, frowning curiously, and then peered closer. "'What's happened to you?' he asked breathlessly. "'You look old!' Merlin's face, not exactly young to begin with, was lined with wrinkles. There were heavy, dark circles under his eyes. Even his beard and hair seemed to have grown and become threaded with iron grey. He looked up wearily, saw James's concerned look, and smiled ruefully. Twenty years in thirty seconds,' he said, his voice dry and cracked. "'Losing two decades that quickly does tend to take it out of someone.' James boggled at him. "'Where'd you lose it?' "'Right beneath this train. Merlin said, pushing himself up and turning. Come, I cannot guarantee it'll hold much longer. We need to get everyone off this train, and quickly. James followed the great sorcerer, and as he did, he felt the strangest sensation. It was as if the engine was swaying slightly, like a tree limb in a stiff breeze. As they clambered over the coal carriage and into the first passenger compartment, returning to the joyful congratulations of Rose, Ralph, Zane, and Albus, James couldn't help glancing down. 
The wheels of the train seemed to be choked with fresh green leaves and vines. Butterflies flitted amongst them, their wings flashing in the afternoon sun. Half an hour later, James stood with the rest of the train's passengers, a quarter of a kilometre away, spread along the edge of the gorge. They were awaiting a second train, which had been dispatched to carry them the rest of the way home. Zane kicked a stone over the ledge and watched it bounce down the crags into the trees below. "'What was it like up there in the engine?' he asked James. "'Terrifying,' James said with feeling. "'I thought we were dead. No question about it.' Rose asked, "'Did you see him do it?' I saw him do something. I didn't know what he was up to. Twenty years' growth in thirty seconds, Albus said wonderingly. I wouldn't believe it if I wasn't looking at it. The thing that amazes me most, Ralph commented, staring out over the gorge, is that he got the tree to grow in the shape of the tracks. Once more James looked out over the forested gorge between the mountains. From this angle he could see it clearly. The unfinished train bridge ended less than halfway across. Growing from the end of the bridge, however, spreading another third of the way across, was what appeared to be a huge oak tree, grown perfectly sideways. The tree was lush with foliage, billowing slightly in the freshening breeze. The Hogwarts Express sat atop it, steam still issuing from its boilers in a long white ribbon. "'He sent twenty years of his own life into making that tree grow,' Rose said, shaking her head in disbelief. "'Talk about communing with nature!' Zane nodded. Yeah, he's still down in the hollow right now, communing with the tree sprite of that oak. I'm just glad Merlin's the one that gets to explain to that tree how it grew so fast, he said, grinning, and why it's got a steam train sitting on its trunk. James, Rose, and Albus sat in the tall grass of the garden, blinking disconsolately in the morning sunlight. Nearby, Harry, Ginny, Ron, and Hermione stood talking quietly. James looked up, peering along the length of the dirt drive. "'See anyone?' Albus asked, kicking his heel in the grass. James shook his head. "'They're late.' "'Why should they hurry?' Albus griped. "'They already paid for it. All they have to do is sign the papers and get the key. Not that they'll ever use it.' "'I wish this was all over,' Rose said, sighing sadly. "'I know it was my idea to come and say goodbye to the burrow, "'but now that I'm here, I can barely look at the old place, "'just knowing the new owners are going to tear it down.' "'Grandma and Lily are looking into flats in the city,' James commented. "'That could be nice. It'll be easy for her to take care of. "'And we could go and see her whenever we want.' "'Albus muttered. "'It won't be the same, not without the burrow.' "'James sighed. George and Angelina's wedding had been the day before, and, not surprisingly, it had been a very spirited affair. Everyone had been there, including Hagrid, Neville, and even Professor McGonagall. The former headmistress had even danced a little, which had left the students slack-jawed with amazement. By contrast, sitting in the garden of the burrow for the last time, waiting for the new owners to come and take it over, felt particularly disheartening. A beginning almost always means an ending, James's dad had said as they got ready that morning. But James hadn't found that particularly comforting. Not for the first time, James found himself thinking of the final dream he'd had when he still had the phantom scar. The dream in which a somewhat grown-up Albus had given his wand to the young woman Petra in the graveyard, who had proceeded to launch the dark mark and then turn the wand back on him. Obviously that had never happened, and yet James simply couldn't shake the feeling that it was a sort of prophecy or prediction. Tabitha had told James that Albus was a boy with great potential, and that, James felt sure, had not been a bluff. Tabitha believed it. What did it all mean? James gazed at his brother in the sunlight. His brother, who bore the names of both a great Gryffindor and a great Slytherin, who looked so very much like his father, the boy who lived. Here they come, Rose said morosely. James followed Rose's gaze and saw a cloud of dust approaching from the end of the drive. The three stood and brushed themselves off as the vehicle neared. They walked slowly over to stand by their parents. Harry squinted and adjusted his glasses. They have a different car than the one they drove to the bank, he commented. Ginny said, You would notice that, Mr. Aura. Must be nice, Ron mumbled, buying a house and a new car all in the same week. Shh, Hermione said, but without much feeling. Harry was frowning slightly. That's not exactly a new car. In fact, 
Suddenly his face broke into a wondering grin. I'll be a hinky punk's uncle. What? Albus asked, standing on tiptoes and shielding his eyes from the sun. James looked as well. As the vehicle rolled closer, he could see that it was certainly not a new car. It was, in fact, very old but carefully restored. It bounced and jogged on the uneven path, winking sunlight off its chrome bumper and huge windscreen. It's the Anglia, Rose cried, jumping up and down, clapping her hands. Grandad's Anglia! But how? Harry was shaking his head, smiling. Ron frowned, puzzled, as the car ground to a squeaky halt directly in front of them. The driver's door swung open, and a large figure climbed out. James didn't recognize the man at first, since he still wasn't accustomed to that suddenly aged face. Merlinus, Hermione said, stepping forwards to meet him. What are you doing here? How did you get Arthur's car? I am happy to say, Merlin replied, that it came with the house. This is the correct address, is it not? I assume I'd not find the lot of you standing in front of anyone else's soon-to-be-reacquired home. Ron laughed. This is the place, I guess. But what do you mean? Where are the Templetons? Happily negotiating the sale of a condominium in Kensington Knob, I believe, Merlin answered, carefully closing the door of the Anglia. After the rather unseemly amount I paid them for this charming domicile, I suspect they were able to increase their home-buying budget rather a lot. You bought the burrow? James exclaimed, a grin spreading across his face. But why, Merlin? Harry asked, shaking his head in wonderment. Merlin looked surprised. I would think the answer to that is quite obvious. I am still rather new to this age, and in need of a home for myself. The offices at the school are quaint, but a wizard of my temperament desires room to spread out. I find this cottage to be perfectly suited to my needs, if perhaps a bit too large. That's why I was hoping I might persuade the previous owner to stay on, to keep me company, and manage the place during the school terms. "'You want Grandma Weasley to come live here again?' Rose cried happily. "'Hooray! That's wonderful!' Ron asked. "'Are you serious? You'd really want Mum to keep living here?' Merlin nodded dismissively. "'Perhaps she'd indulge me with a cup of tea now and then. I, on the other hand, can help her to magically support the place. Seems a fair trade, does it not?' Hermione grinned happily. "'You'd have to lock Molly in the attic to keep her from making tea for you.' "'Really, Merlinus, this is more than we could have hoped for. "'But where did you get the money?' "'Merlin narrowed his eyes conspiratorially. "'Did you know that Gringotts Bank is over twelve hundred years old? "'It's truly remarkable what a small investment could turn into over a thousand years. "'Let's just say that I will not be lacking for income for quite some time.' "'You made a deposit before you zapped through time,' Ron exclaimed, his eyes going wide. "'That's genius!' What fun is it being a sorcerer if you cannot manipulate temporal loopholes to your advantage? Merlin agreed, matching Ron's grin. Let's go and get Grandma and Lily, Albus said excitedly, before she does anything stupid like renting some flat in the city. We can move her back in today, right? I don't see why not, Harry laughed. If it's all right with Merlin... I'd not have it any other way, the big man replied. In fact, we can take your grandfather's delightful vehicle. I believe we'll all fit inside if we don't mind getting rather close. The Anglia? James asked, as everyone began to clamber into the old car. It'll take us forever to get into the city in that. I think you'll be surprised, Merlin answered, climbing into the driver's seat and smiling cryptically. Hold on to something, everyone. This might be a little bumpy. Carefully, Merlin pushed a large button on the car's dashboard. With a jerk and rattle, the huge canvas wings erupted from the car's sides, protruding from behind James's head where he sat in the back seat. Noisily, the wings began to flap up and down, assuming a steady rhythm. The wings work! Albus laughed. You've got the wings working! Excellent! Slowly, accompanied by a rising cloud of windy dust, the car lifted off the drive. Ron whooped from the passenger's side window as Merlin steered the car in the air, aiming it towards the western horizon. To the sound of delighted laughter and Hermione's shriek of happy terror, Merlin stepped on the accelerator, pushing it to the floor. The wings buzzed and the car nosed down, darting like a bumblebee over the garden of the burrow and casting its shadow over the garage as it went. For miles around, muggle children looked up, 
wondering about the mysterious sound of laughter that passed quickly, fleetingly overhead. <laughs>